My father spent most of his childhood years in the village. This happened when he was like nine or ten years old, as he remembers. I need to mention that he was never a religious person, or anything like that. He was a normal person, but had a very realistic perspective on life. He didn't tell this incident to anyone other than his mother when he was young. But when he heard similar stories from his relatives from the village about that specific area, he did believe that his experience was probably not a dream, nor a hallucination. My father's house was outside of the village and also on the top of the hill. It was difficult to reach their house on foot, but there was a shortcut that goes around that hill and people who knew about that shortcut would sometimes prefer to use this path. It was a pathway rather than a road, narrow but less rough than the other road. Those who know this road also know that the path is an uncanny place. It has not a very clean past. There's a story about that road my father heard from his father. Four or more centuries ago, when the Mongol invasion of Anatolia, Mongolians attacked this village and killed every living being in the village in this place and put their heads to the spikes along the path. People used to call this place Kabatas because it's also full of steep and sharp little stones. It means rough stones in Turkish. The thing is, no one would love to use this path if it's not really necessary. As I said, because this place has not a very pleasant past. One summer afternoon, my father started walking towards his house. He used this way because he needed to hurry. The road was not that long. There were even neighbours living in their own houses just beyond the bifurcation at the end of the road. He walked a little more on the stony road, then stopped. More precisely, he had to stop. A stone protruded wall appeared right in front of him, a wall he had never seen before. Why would anyone build a wall on that narrow pathway anyway, he asked himself. But the path was continuing just behind the wall after all. It was like a newly built stone wall. He first thought was whether the neighbours knitted it, it was odd, but the wall wasn't so long. The height of the wall was probably 150 to 160 centimetres, and the length of the wall was approximately 200 centimetres. But of course, it's beyond the height of my father, who's still a small child. It was still a simple wall that he could overcome in two moves. No passing from the right to the left of the wall, and as the weather started to get dark, he wanted to climb the wall and continue on his way in order to return home. When he climbed the wall and gave his hand to where we thought the stones were over, he realised that the wall was not finished. However hard he tried to climb, he couldn't reach the top of this wall. It seemed ridiculous. He probably thought the reason why he couldn't reach the top was his plastic shoes, but he was sure that he had been firmly on its feet and touched at the top. He asked himself, oh my god, how is this possible? Why is it not ending? Now he's tired of climbing. There was a growing feeling inside of him that someone was watching him and maybe playing with him. He's just starting to get scared. The weather was almost dark. He thought it would be bad if I fell, even if I could break my bones, because he was sure he was very high from the ground. He felt the fear in his heart. In that case, a person like my dad started to pray to God. Then he fell to the ground with a bang. The wall collapsed on its own and my father was buried under the rubble. He couldn't get up from the ground. Then he thinks he passed out there, and a few hours later, my uncle saw my father lying there. A little boy, half of his body under the stones, caught his attention. He saw this child as my father. He fainted. He held him and carried him home. He tells my grandmother where he found my father. My grandmother said, oh my son, were you so tired? Haven't you found another place to sleep than the cursed land? My father told her about what happened to him. There's a widespread belief in that region, especially expressed by the ancients. If you're wandering alone at deserted places, something would play games to you. Like the short wall that never ends when climbing. Maybe it's just the games of our minds, but I'll try to prove otherwise. Regardless of my scepticism, I've experienced three incidences that I've never been able to explain. They happened between the ages of 13 and 18, and even now, more than 20 years later, they keep me up at night as I try to make sense of them. The first incident is as follows. 
Back when I was 13 years old, I was living in Manchester, UK with my mother. We had been staying in a semi-detached house for a few years, but were in the process of packing for a move to a new house in the same area. One night at approximately 7pm, my mother and I were sitting in the living room watching TV. There was a knock at the door, so I got up and answered it. A friend wanted to know if I was playing out, but we just ended up chatting on the front doorstep. Suddenly, in the middle of our conversation, I hear a woman's voice shouting from upstairs. The voice said, hello, can you hear me? I'm over here, can't you see me? Immediately, my mother screamed hysterically from the living room. I ran into the room to check on her, and she was sitting on the couch, shaking and truly looking terrified. I asked her what had happened. She told me that a woman's voice had whispered something in her ear. What did it say? I asked. Hello, can you hear me? I'm over here. Can't you see me? Word for word, my mum told me the same thing that I'd heard shouted from upstairs. The first half-decent weapon I found was a tennis racket, so I took upstairs and searched everywhere. I looked in every room, under the beds and in the wardrobes. Couldn't find anyone. My friend didn't see anyone come down the stairs. It was late in the evening and I was in the living room watching TV. Bored with what was on the TV, I looked for the remote so I could change the channel. I checked all over for the remote on the couch, under the cushions, by the TV, and on the floor. After an unsuccessful search, I gave up and decided to read a comic. As we were mostly packed up for a move to a new house, the main living room light fitting had been removed. This meant that I had to take my comic to the opposite end of the living room, where the lamp was. As I was reading, the TV turned off. At first, I assumed that a power cut was the cause, but I quickly ruled this out because the lamp was still on. I went over to the TV and noticed the red standby light. This meant that the TV had been switched off by the remote. I then turned around and saw the remote resting on the arm of the couch, pointing at the TV. Given what had happened two weeks earlier, this was my cue to go upstairs to bed. I took my comic book up to the bathroom and continued to read it on the toilet. During this time, I heard movement outside the bathroom door. I called out, Mom, is that you? I got no answer. The movement stopped. Again, I called out and the movement commenced. I leaned down to inspect under the door. Two distinct shadows were moving about like shuffling feet, blocking out the landing light. Now a little scared, I said, Mom, if that's you, say something. This isn't funny. The movement seemed to get closer to the bathroom door and that's when the door handle started moving downwards as if someone was trying to get in. Luckily, the toilet door was very close to the door, so I quickly reached out and locked the door. The door handle went back up, and the movement became more distant before stopping altogether. I sat on the toilet for another 20 minutes before I had the courage to leave the bathroom. When I finally left, I checked my mother's bedroom door, which was still firmly shut. I then ran into my room and jumped into bed and under the covers. I have considered the possibility that my mother was sleepwalking and simply didn't hear me calling out. Maybe I didn't notice the sound of a door opening. After the first noise, however, I was on high alert, listening for every sound, so I'm certain that I would have heard her door close if she went back to her bedroom. I'm not claiming that a ghost was responsible. It's just another experience that I've never been able to explain. Me and my mum moved to this innocent looking small and weirdly pink house. It was a duplex and the whole neighbourhood was really nice and quiet. House was probably built before World War II. Strange things started happening about five months after we moved in. At least to me. First pipes, radiators and sinks started leaking. Water was literally coming from the floor of the basement, from under the bathtub, from the roof and even from walls in some parts. It was a newly renovated home, but since some mistakes can happen, we called my father. He's a plumber, so he could evaluate the situation. He couldn't explain what was wrong, but tried to fix the radiator, sink, and bathtub. At this point, we were thinking that there were some construction problems in the basement, 
and maybe because the home was old, we should call some other specialist, and we did. At this point, I started to experience this foul smell waking me up in the middle of the night. A smell that reminded me of an animal of some sort. I was feeling watched at these instances, and after a while was even experiencing this feeling of something sitting on top of me. I was studying psychology at that time, so I was almost 100% sure that this was sleep paralysis. And I tried to stay calm and not worry too much, even if I was sure that this is not normal. There were many situations when I was hearing noises from the attic and felt that I was being touched, but I was always blaming it on my imagination. We were often fighting, so I left the doors to the porch open. You see, they had this tendency to stay open, even when I made sure to close them with the key and check the handle to be super sure. My mom was a bit obsessed about those doors, and now I know why. Two years have passed, and my grandmother and her man were visiting. So I was sleeping with my mom in the same room, and grandparents in her bedroom on the first floor. I was awoken by noise from the kitchen, and decided that I should go to the bathroom, since I was awake. Past the stairway, I saw the light, and heard noises of someone making tea or something in the kitchen. When I came back to my room, mom asked me, they can't sleep or what? I said that probably, and went to bed. In the morning, when we were eating breakfast, mom asked them why they were so loud at night, and obviously they said, we thought it was you. At that point, my mom said, oh, so ghosts again. This was so random, because we haven't spoken about it ever. She said that she experienced some messed up stuff here, and that she even called two exorcists. The first one helped for about a week, and the second for half of a year. I was shocked, since my mom was always so sceptical, and was almost making fun of paranormal stuff. That changed. I was upstairs having my fun with an attic dweller, and she had her burglar coming from the basement. She was even sleeping with a knife for a while. Besides the doors opening randomly, we had this intercom that wasn't working. We were sure that it's out because the cable was cut and visible. So we had to go to the garden gate and open it for the guests by hand. Despite this, some guests were hearing the sound of the intercom and the gate was opening for them without our knowledge. There were many more strange things happening, but I don't want to bore you. One thing I can say is that the longer we stayed and ignored it, the calmer the house was. When we were moving out, my mum asked this old neighbour if he would like to take our garden table and chairs, so we came to pick them up. He gave us some backstory to this house. He asked why we were moving out, and my mum said that the house is not great for us, and he answered, Yep, yeah, I know that you wouldn't last long. He said that none of the previous families stayed in it long, and they almost all had some family problems after a while. After a hesitation, he said that there was a murder in our pink home. Some two guys were holding this girl hostage. They did some bad things to her that I prefer not to mention. After hearing that we were really glad we left. But not really. I think something has moved with me. While getting ready for work this morning, I remembered I needed to go into our attic and count a few things for some renovation work I'm doing on our house. We have a pull down attic access that's located in the ceiling of our main hallway and is almost directly above our bathroom door. My wife was in the bathroom applying makeup in front of the sink while my 22 month old daughter was sitting on the bathroom counter just six inches away from my wife playing with a toothbrush when I heard my daughter say hi which I thought she was directing the hi to my wife, which is something she does a lot. So I thought nothing of it, until I closed the attic access and entered the bathroom, where my wife had an odd what the fuck look on her face. I asked her why she has that face and she says, when you got in the attic, Quinn, my daughter, looked up and said hi. When I looked at her to say hi back, I noticed she was looking at the wall and said hi again. Then, slowly lifted her head up as if she was watching someone walk closer to her, then tucked her arms into her side and giggled. My wife asked my daughter who she was talking to. My daughter didn't say anything back, but just at that moment, the plastic makeup container my wife was holding closed, as if it was slapped shut. By this time in the story, I had come down from the attic and entered the bathroom. Not seeing anything happen with my own eyes, but I did hear the conversation my wife and daughter had. 
This is the first ever experience my wife or I have had since we've lived in our house, besides some odd giggling and random pointing that my daughter has done throughout the past year. Like I said, nothing wild, but definitely made an impact on my wife, who isn't a I believe in ghosts type of person, and usually calls bullshit on ghost stories. This happened to me as a kid, and I still think about it a lot. At the time, I was about 12 or 13, I think, and I was doing a kayak trip down a river in a very rural part of France. This was an autonomous trip, as in we were carrying tents and all of our stuff, slept in the wild or campsites, and went down a significant portion of the river as a group, with other kids and a couple adults. What I saw happened about one week into the trip. It was a three-week trip. So we were pretty far into the wild. We stopped for the night on a riverbank. I pulled my kayak onto the beach and wandered a bit further to check out where we could sleep. Just to explain the location, we stopped on a rocky riverbank that was slightly inclined towards a thick line of large trees with a clearing behind them. Suddenly, as I approached the trees, I felt extremely strange, kind of woozy and felt compelled to look up towards the trees. I saw the clearing in between the two trees with a very long open plain stretching up behind it, with a deep blue sky and the base of hills on the sides. This seemed strange to me, as there weren't many plains where we were, and the view seemed very surreal, like it wasn't the same time and space we were supposed to be in. It felt like a fantasy landscape, even though it wasn't very far from some landscapes I've seen. In the background, I heard a sort of musical piping, but it felt very ethereal and weird. I could hear it very distinctly, yet it felt far away, like an echo. The closest I've got to that sound since was hearing a high-pitched harmonica, but it wasn't exactly the same. What I heard sounded more like a crystalline and pure. I stared at the opening for what felt like hours until someone called me and I snapped out of it and looked away. I turned back and the opening wasn't there anymore. Just a regular clearing, no more planes or anything. I honestly don't know what happened. I don't think it could have been heat stroke or something, as I felt absolutely fine afterwards, and we hadn't even been that active that day. Weirdly, I felt a sense of longing every time I'd think about those planes, like I was supposed to go in or something. So I rented this house, but it's been in the family of my landlord. Nancy, since it was built in 1929. She lives one and a half acres behind me in her own home, and she also owns the house next to mine on the corner. Her house was built on family land in the 1980s, and there's approximately 35 acres of bean farm that's also a part of this large plot I live on. So the home I live in is the original farmhouse for the Miller family here in northwestern Ohio. Now we, my husband, our two kids, our dog and I, moved in here on the 1st of April of this year. It's a quaint little farmhouse with two bedrooms, original shiplap along the mudroom walk, and original millwork along the window casings and floorboards. The newest part of the home is the garage, which is completely made of cinder block and no frills. I absolutely love old homes with original details, and we've been fixing it up a bit, as Nancy, our landlord, is suffering from cancer and I want to make sure she's looking after herself and not worrying about us or peeling latex paint on the doors. Everything was normal about this place, aside from some well water issues that were quickly fixed with the installation of a water softener, but we really enjoyed being here. It's a quaint little house, just big enough for us and I love living here, until one morning when I was getting ready for school. I'm going back to school for a degree in physical therapy, after not being able to find a job in my original major, early childhood education. I get up every morning at the same time, six o'clock. And this particular morning, my husband, who's a police officer, had the day off. So he was going to let our kids sleep in with him, instead of making me haul them off in the dark to the sitter's house. I was getting dressed in our living room, so as not to wake my husband or my son, who likes to co-sleep, with the lights on in our room, when I saw it. The door to my children's room was open. Someone was standing there staring at me, half hiding behind the door frame. That someone was about a head taller than either of my children, with a full head of dirty blonde curls. 
In a second, it slowly pulled its head back and vanished. And now, for reference, my daughter's bed is up against the wall, and the foot of her bed is right at the door frame to accommodate both twin-sized beds, and their dresses in the same room. So there is in fact no way anyone could stand at the end of a bed and hide behind the door frame at the same time. I raced into their room and not only was my daughter asleep at the top of her bed, but she was holding her giant cow stuffed animal and they were both tucked in. I woke my husband up and he saw that I was visibly shaken up. He said my pupils were huge and I was shaking. After explaining what I saw, he went in to check for himself and when he came back, I wasn't in any better shape. He asked if he should treat me for shock and I said no, but I know what I saw. This was about two months ago and the reason I'm sharing this now is because another incident happened tonight to my husband. He was brushing my daughter's hair after a bath and he said a black shadow crossed the threshold in my children's room and he yelled for me. Goosebumps were all over his arms and legs and my daughter was asking, who's in there dad? She's three years old. Then, as we're putting them to sleep, A little tyke's toy circus goes off on top of their toy box several times. My husband calls to me from the bathroom to come and see what's happening and it goes off one last time while I'm approaching it. None of their toys have ever gone off by themselves since moving here, especially not this one. It's a tiny circus that only makes music when the little acrobat is on the tightrope and you lift one side to make him slide across. We plan on installing cameras in their room and the toy area to keep monitoring the situation this weekend. But the 1929 farmhouse seems to have come with a lot more than was listed in the rental agreement. I've been married to my husband for five years. He's a Marine Corps veteran of nine years. Two tours to Afghanistan during his first push through Maja with OEF, totaling 14 months. He's now a police officer and his one year on the streets has seen more than I'd like to acknowledge. He jumps at loud noises. He hates watching the ends of military movies where they show memories of fallen service members. He always sits where he can see the door at a restaurant, but he's never had a nightmare. Not in the five years we've been married. Last night, it's about 1.15. We'd been comfortably asleep for quite some time, and out of nowhere, my husband started making these sounds deep in his throat. At first I thought it was our dog, Nike, who sleeps on my side of the bed. It took a minute and it happened again. I called out to her to shush, and she got up and put her head on the side of the bed. While I'm reassuring her, he does it again. Finally realising it's my husband, I shake him awake. His eyes fly open after a minute and he whispers, I saw it. Instantly, my blood runs cold. He grabs my wrist in the dark and says a little louder, I saw it. Trying to remain calm myself, I ask him what he saw and what he's talking about. I'm terrified there might be someone in the house and I ask if I need to get the kids. He tells me everything. He thought it was real. Our daughter had run into our bedroom crying, saying there's a woman in her room and she was scared of her. My husband picked her up and comforted her, tucking her in between us. She settled in and he looked out our door into the living room before our son came in moments later screaming. This is a common real life occurrence. They come in crying or not and want us to cuddle them back to sleep. He asked our son what's wrong and though his speech isn't as good too as his sister, he said, saw a lady. Don't like lady daddy. She's scary. At this point, my husband says a black shadow stands in the doorway and the kids start screaming. Apparently through all this commotion, I didn't wake up. He pulls a gun, not knowing what good it will do, and that's when it happened. His whole body freezes up, and he cannot make a sound, and he cannot move. He's trying to scream and wake me up to get the babies, but he can't. And that's when I heard his sounds in his throat, and woke him up. It was a nightmare. His first experience with sleep paralysis, and I could tell he was shaken up. I told him I was going to check the kids, and I'd bring him some water. The babies were fine, sleeping soundly. He was upright in bed, staring at his hands when I came back. I felt awful. I explained sleep paralysis to him and told him to Google it when he was ready and see if the symptoms matched what he felt at that moment. I'm not sure if sleep paralysis and spiritual activity are associated, linked or correlated. But he seems to think it has to be. 
With activity gearing up in our home, he wants to know everything he can about how to deal with the effects of living in a home with ghosts. I have no way to tangibly prove the story I'm about to tell outside of my own words, as it was a one-time anomalous event that myself and my sister experienced almost 10 years ago, but it has nevertheless remained stuck in the minds of my immediate family. When I was about 10 years old and my sister was 11, me and her were hanging out in her bedroom at about 11 p.m. Our bedrooms were right next to each other, so it was common for us to meet in her room late at night to talk and play on our DSs and such. After a while of sitting around and talking, me and my sister heard something very strange and startling that we've never been able to explain. We heard what sounded like an incredibly automated, emotionless, disembodied voice speak. I have no recollection of what specifically it said, but I remember its tone of voice like it was yesterday. It was vacant of emotion, almost robotic, and sounded deep and masculine. My sister had nothing in her bedroom that could have generated this noise naturally. This was in around 2009, so smartphones and the like weren't readily available as they are now. We were obviously incredibly shaken by this, but decided not to act on it immediately out of fear of annoying our parents and older brother and giving away that we were staying up late. We rationalised that it might have been someone outside her window on the street or a nearby car radio. However, minutes passed and we eventually heard it again. It sounded more hurried and apprehensive this time. At this point, me and my sister were scared out of our minds, so we ran to alert our parents. We were in my sister's bedroom on the second floor of our house and elected to run downstairs to tell our mother. When we got downstairs, however, we found our mother collapsed on the couch unconscious and foaming at the mouth. We immediately woke up our father and brother, who promptly called 911 and got my mother help. We would later come to know that my mother was having a seizure caused by a brain tumour. This tumour would later be successfully removed and my mother is still alive today. I personally don't believe that there's any correlation between the voice me and my sister heard and my mother's seizure. I do, however, believe wholeheartedly that had me and my sister not heard that voice, my mother might not be alive today. Had we not heard it, we would never have gone downstairs and found her having a seizure. Today, me and my sister regularly recollect on this occurrence, and my mother claims that it may have been a guardian angel of sorts. Regardless, I still owe a lot to that strange disembodied voice that me and my sister heard. I've recently started working at a seasonal hotel on the Italian northern coast. Since I've always had an interest in the paranormal, among the first things I did once I'd started my job there was asking the owner and his mother, who got hold of the building back in 1973, every possible detail about the hotel and what it used to be. The owner's mother explained to me how it had been a hotel for several years before they bought it, but that it had been left closed for so long it was an absolute wreck before then. It was a hospital for young pregnant women who didn't have a husband or a family to support them. When she told me that, during the first two months on the job, so halfway through it, I wondered how it could have been possible that no paranormal activity had ever been recorded there. I even got to learn from my boss at the very beginning of the job that a man died there just a few years back and really thought he was making it up to spice things up a bit and make me more excited about starting. Turns out it was absolutely true. An old man died due to extreme heat after getting back from the beach. It's not something so unusual here, and I guess it applies to any area that gets through very hot summers. The hotel has been closed since mid-September. I worked there for about three months and a half, stayed a bunch of nights even, without ever experiencing, sensing, or hearing anything that seemed out of place. I did think that it might have been because the nightlife was way too much, and too many people were in the hotel, basically causing an energetic pollution that would prevent paranormal occurrences from manifesting. Then, the dead season for our area came. Everything grew silent and rather gloomy, and I, having become close with my boss, kept going to the hotel, even for several days in a row, listening to and making music, playing video games, experimenting with cuisine, even through a couple parties. It was just the two of us and his dog a good 85% of the time. 
Things started getting weirder then. He noticed a foul smell coming out of some spot under the reception desk. Something like sewer smell, changing slightly from time to time, within a spectre that went from, let's say, decomposing flesh to rotten eggs. It was never too strong, and be, you'd be unable to smell it after stepping just a few feet back from the desk. What got us puzzled was how the smell would come from a spot where only wires and electronics would be, rather than the bar sink, for example, which is just about three metres far from the desk. Not to mention my position was exactly that of reception and marketing, meaning I would be sitting at that desk for several hours a day and never smelling a thing. My boss said he had definitely smelled it this summer too, though it was a lot fainter. I actually have quite a efficient sense of smell, and it did surprise me how he was so sure it has happened a couple of times through the summer too. Since my boss is quite a sensitive person, when I got to lose over my sensitivity to paranormal matters after dealing with it in a way that was stressing me out, I just realised perhaps the smell wasn't something completely physical and normal. My doubts got stronger after noticing his dog seemed to take an interest in the area the smell was coming from, without really acting like the lively and goofy dog he is. He'd rather stop a few feet far from the spot and stare at it. One night, while we were in the hotel kitchen making dinner, the dog started looking towards the door to the reception as if he heard something, then ran through the corridor to the desk. I followed him, thinking there could have been someone at the door. Instead, he stopped at the desk, staring at the spot the smell came from. He's a very loyal and clingy dog. He doesn't leave his owner's side easily. Still, he did that thing of running to the desk and staring at that same spot a bunch of times. I don't understand how he could sense something normal going on in there from another room, several feet away, since he can't even really hear you calling him in a normal voice tone from the same distance. To add up to it, this is where surveillance cameras come into play. One night, some guys attempted to get inside the hotel, thinking it was empty. My boss, who was actually sleeping there, heard them and called the police, with whom he got to check the security camera's recordings, which he showed me the next day. I was definitely hype about getting to see the videos, honestly hoping to spot something odd, and I wasn't disappointed. Two things caught our attention. A strong glare on the back door's glass, which looked like a flashlight being moved from not too far inside the hotel, behind the curtains. A tall wall stands between our hotel and the neighbouring one, making it impossible for the light to be coming from there. It lasts just for a few seconds. It just goes on and then off. This happens about an hour before the culprits come in, at around 3.30am. Then, between 4.30 and 5am, a white figure comes out of a dark area in the back of the hotel, running, without activating the motion lights. Then just seconds later, one of the intruders runs back into the same spot, activating the motion lights. What's odd about the first figure is, needless to say, how they don't trigger the light. The fact that they have no discernible traits, just a white, human-shaped figure. And lastly, how it was coming out of a spot that had no way in. There should have been a piece of the tape where this person was walking in before running out. Something tells me there's a way for the person in a light-coloured hoodie to look like that, and that they somehow managed to run past a blind spot for the motion detector, though neither I nor my boss can wrap our head around how that person got in that spot without taking the only possible way in. The second figure looks so much more human, a shady yet casual guy in a hoodie. You can see where the hood ends and a few facial traits, not much, since his head is turned almost completely back to the camera. It's rather puzzling how contrasting the two images are, even before the light goes on. The camera catches the second man's details, not making him look like some sort of apparition, as it is for the first figure. Being a bit of an anxious guy, my boss didn't really feel like further investigating the surveillance camera tapes and didn't bring up the odd parts of the event again. We both moved back to our places just a couple days ago, so the hotel is currently unattended and will stay so for at least another month or two. I really wonder if anything weird will be taking place there when no one is watching. I was on a car ride with my mother earlier today, going back to the family house from the city. We were taking the usual road, when at about six minutes from our destination, in an area just behind our neighbourhood, we saw what seemed to be a massive dim light, 
smoke or fog, which moved slightly from the tree area down to the side of the road and then flew right away at a considerable speed, disappearing into thin air as soon as we approached it with the car. I'm really trying to figure out a more, let's say, realistic explanation for this that doesn't involve some kind of spirit or apparition, etc. Not because I'm an absolute skeptic. I've had at least another notable experience in the past, actually. But this one feels so weird to me. I'm wondering if this just wasn't some kind of rare atmospheric phenomena. To go further into detail, we were just about six feet away from the thing before it took off. It was rather large, but despite the size and short distance, Neither my mother or I could discern any trait at all. It was like a shapeless mass of white smoke. When we got close enough to almost drive through it, it flew off and disappeared mid-air, without changing its shape, like smoke or steam would normally do. It just gradually turned transparent and disappeared within seconds. Another thing that weirds me out is how it didn't seem to follow the airflow of the car at all. It just moved slightly to the left, opposite to where it came from, and then flew straight upwards, and it was way faster than the car. Since whatever it was, my mother obviously didn't want to hit it. I immediately looked up, trying to follow it with my eyes, but I couldn't see a thing at all, which also doesn't really make sense to me, considering how visible it was before the car lights were close enough. It didn't seem to disappear into darkness, but rather to dissolve. I'm wondering if this can be compatible with any known atmospheric phenomena. If any of you have any similar experiences, or anything. When I was somewhere around four years old, I had an experience that has become one of my most vivid memories of my childhood. My mum had put me to bed and went to my sister's room to get us situated for the night. I could hear them talking clearly as I wrestled with the monstrously heavy quilt to get myself ready to go to sleep. My mum had decorated this room, as she had for all of the rooms in the house, with antiques and various oddball decorative embellishments. My room was painted in an odd cross between a light beige and a light green that always reminded me of a watered-down goose poop. The bed was an old rope bed that had been converted to be able to accommodate a regular double-sized mattress, and during the winter, was draped with the most beautiful and heaviest crazy quilt I've ever seen. At the foot of the bed was an old rectangular steamer trunk. Ironically enough, it's against the floor of my office, about two feet from where I'm typing this. It's one of the few objects that I've been able to keep a hold of during my more than chaotic lifetime. On this night, my eyes were drawn to the foot of the bed. I saw something glowing, something that my child's mind could not comprehend at first glance. I sat up quickly and saw three glowing heads. They resembled the styrofoam mannequin heads used to display wigs, but they were glowing with a white luminescence that emanated from within, but not really bright enough to shed light on the rest of the room. The heads were featureless and smooth, and I could only see the lower half through the spooled spindles of the footboard, but the tops of the heads were fully visible above it. In my room, there was silence. I could still hear my mother and sister talking in the next room. The light from the hallway spilled in through the two or three inch gap of my partially open bedroom door. I tried to scream for my mom, but a high pitched whistle was the only sound that escaped. I could barely breathe, let alone scream. The heads were still there, still glowing and still silent. I finally inhaled deeply and let loose a scream that caused my sister to scream and my mom to drop whatever she was holding onto the white shag carpeted floor with a muffled thump. She ran into the hallway and threw open my door, allowing the large wrought iron and milk glass pendant light that hung over the stairwell to flood my room with light, and the luminous heads were gone. I finally let go, bawling my eyes out and trying to explain to my mom what I saw. She looked at the end of the bed and even went as far as opening the trunk, but I believe in hindsight, that this was more to console me than anything else. She sat at the edge of my bed and told me that those were probably my guardian angels watching over me and that there was nothing to worry about. I was finally able to go to sleep, partially from my mother calming me, but mostly from the resilient temporary amnesia that all children seem to possess in the face of fear. This, however, stuck with me, and it's one of my first memories that I can recall with utter clarity. 
I know that memories are malleable things, but this one stands out with the level of details that I remembered. I was actually talking with my mother about this some years back. And she didn't recall any of it. She also said she believed that the light fixture I was talking about wasn't even purchased until the late 70s, but this was proven to be untrue. As I was going through a photo album with my kids, there was a picture of me sitting at the top of the stairs with the massive light fixture visibly hanging down. It was dated September 1970, which would have been right before the incident I just recounted. This incident could just be put off as a childhood bogeyman encounter that resolved itself as nothing more than the overactive imagination of a child projecting their fears into the darkness. I could have even left it at that, if it wasn't for incidents that occurred in 1983, as I was in the middle of my teenage years. Incidents that have remained unexplainable to this day. I'm trying to write all of these memories down as I'm getting older, and want to get them out while they still remain clear in my head. I've had a few unexplainable experiences before, but they've always been few and far between. Ranging from when I was a small child and into teenage years and young adulthood. However, as I went through my early and mid twenties, I had fewer strange experiences and overall became less spiritually inclined. Didn't really believe in that sort of stuff or didn't want to. I'm not gonna get into the past experiences or why I started not believing in this stuff, but just know for background that it happened. The past few nights have been a slap in the face and has brought everything back to a deep-seated fear of myself. I usually stay up very late. Midnight, 1, 2, or even 3am is normal for me to stay up till. Generally, when I do go to bed, I'm very tired and just pass right out. These past few nights, I've been barely able to sleep. It started a few days ago at about 1am when I laid down to sleep. I got comfy and closed my eyes but didn't fall asleep. Instead, my body started feeling strange. It began with heat building up over my stomach and lower abdomen. The heat intensified until it felt like someone had built a fire on top of me. The rest of my body felt cool, so I knew it wasn't just me getting too hot under the blanket. And mind you, it's about 55 or 60 degrees in my room when I sleep. This wasn't the first time I had that kind of sensation, and I thought to myself, maybe I should just relax and let whatever is to happen, happen this time. So I relaxed and didn't fight it. The heat spread across my body to my limbs and then everything started to vibrate. I use the word vibrate, but it's a bad descriptor for what the sensation was. I simply lack a better word to describe it. My body itself was not physically moving or trembling. Rather, it felt like everything around me was thrumming and vibrating with a metered pulsing kind of feeling. This too, I had felt many years ago when I was meditating. So again, I just kept relaxing and let it happen. The vibrations got more intense and then I started seeing an orb of light above me, even though my eyes were closed. It moved and shifted colors between a purplish to a white. I opened my eyes, but only saw the darkness of the room around me. I thought maybe it's just my mind being weird and closed my eyes again. Then I heard a sound to my right near my computer. It was like a snapping sort of clatter noise, like something hit plastic. I sat up and looked around, but again, I saw nothing. At this point, I started getting a little freaked out, but my dog who sleeps in the bed with me was resting contently as if nothing was wrong and he had heard nothing. So again, I thought I was just being paranoid and my mind was playing tricks. So I laid back down. Almost immediately, the sensations returned along with the light moving above me. This time, I felt an odd touch along my forehead and the sides of my head, like something was grabbing me. Then, I felt something shock me, like a jolt of electricity touching my leg and then my arm. I thought to myself, okay, something is not right here, and decided maybe there was something there besides my dog. My older sister had given me a small pouch of stones and said she had cleansed them, and they would give me good dreams and stuff like that. So I thought, maybe I should grab that pouch. I heard in my mind, no, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. At that point, I got really freaked out because it wasn't my own thoughts, at least. I don't think it was. Why would I think to grab the stones but then immediately tell myself no? It was strange. 
So I grabbed the pouch of stones and held it to my chest while I lay back in bed. The heat was then gone from my body and concentrated in my hand that was holding the stones. It grew even more intense than before and I had to use all of my willpower to not throw the pouch off me because it felt like burning coal on my chest. After some time, maybe 10 minutes, I'm not really sure how long it was, the heat faded and then everything seemed normal again and I fell asleep holding the stones. I was kind of freaked out the next day but didn't think it was real. Maybe I dreamed it all up even though I woke up holding the stones. So I went about my day and such until the night returned. I lay down for bed once again. The heat and vibrations returned almost immediately. I was a bit more prepared this time, so I tried to focus the sensation and make some kind of barrier around myself with it. I don't really know what I was doing or if it even worked, but I started seeing the light again. This time, I had completely turned off my computer and all electronics. So it was pitch black in the room, no light at all. Yet when I opened my eyes this time, I saw a light in the room. It was over by where I heard the noise the first time. It moved. There was smoke or mist within the light and it kind of floated around my bed until it was at the foot of my bed. It wasn't bright at all, just a very subtle glow that made the smoky mist visible in the darkness of my room. The light shifted between purple and white again, sometimes being a pinkish colour. I sat up and once again grabbed the stones and then stared at it. The pulsating light extended from the ceiling down to the floor and just hung there in the air at the foot of my bed. I don't know how long I stared at it in silence, but eventually it faded away and I laid back down. Once again, my dog just laid there totally oblivious to everything that was happening. I fell asleep and woke up holding the stones again. Last night, basically the same thing happened. Previously, when this kind of stuff happened to me, it was only once and then it didn't happen again for a long time and I could brush it off and forget about it. Convinced that it was just something weird that my brain was doing or it was a dream of some kind. Three nights in a row where I'm most definitely awake and physically feeling and seeing shit. That's new and has me wondering what the hell is going on. Am I going crazy? I thought I had slipped through not being afflicted with any melting illnesses. But now I'm full of doubt. Maybe it was just late manifesting itself and now I'm losing my mind. Otherwise, there's something visiting me while I'll sleep. I don't think either of those options are good and I have no idea what to do about it. Has anyone had a similar experience or have any advice on how I can deal with this? I'm sitting here not wanting to go lay down because it's just gonna happen again. I know you can go without sleep for a few days, but I'd really like to get some frickin' rest. I've had something haunting me my entire life. My older sister, who's had the same experiences, believes it happened when we played with a Ouija board without knowing the possible consequences. Anyway, the point of this post is that I thought it was gone. Two plus smudgings, but tonight makes me believe it's not. I also say demon because it tries to scare and or upset me and tends to bring the foul odour of faeces. From what I've learned over the years, demons have a foul odour and can get their energy from negative emotions. Tonight, I was taking a short nap after Thanksgiving with the family. I was woken up by a strong smell of faeces. Now I have cats, so it's entirely possible it was one of them having a particularly bad night. However, the litter boxes are on the opposite side of the house and it was so strong that realistically, the cat would have to poop right next to my bed or someone would have to have waved it under my nose or something. Neither of those were the case. So I wake up, trying to ignore the smell, thinking it was a particularly bad night for one of those cats and go to my computer to relax. I'm not sure how much time was in between my waking up and this next incident, but it was at least a couple of hours. I look down towards my tower and I see my cat that I had to put to sleep two weeks ago only it was his dead, lifeless body. This is different from all the other times I've seen these cats since he's passed. This is particularly upsetting because I loved that cat like he was my child and he only lived half of his life, but his body was shutting down on him. This thing knows how to get to me and I think it never left, just grew weak. And now that my family has been dealing with an early loss, it's gained some strength back.
I'm Native American and I live in a First Nation community. It matters to this post because so much history has happened on this land. Also, my neighbour has a sweat lodge and is a good person, but practices bad medicine. My cousin went twice, and each time a dark human-shaped figure followed him back home. I have countless stories that happen to me personally, and endless stories that happen to family in my community and other First Nation communities. I'm only going to type some of mine. I won't list them in order, but I live alone and a strip of huge cedar trees separates my home and my neighbours that have the sweat lodge. I don't have any mental stuff like schizophrenia, and I drink a few times a year. I smoke weed, but not that much. Green Orb Three years ago, my sister lived with me. I just closed my bedroom door, turned off the light, and laid my head down. My window is locked, with closed blinds, a blanket thumbtacked, and my room is pitch black. I can't see my hand in front of my eyes. The only light is my alarm clock I have on top of my shelf. Seconds after I laid my head down, a basketball-sized green translucent orb came through my door. I could see my alarm clock. The orb was bright but didn't give off light. A flickered light illuminates the room. This orb was bright and translucent, but my room was pitch black. It made a U-shape from the window and my ceiling and hovered above my face. Then the way water flushes down a toilet is absorbed into my left eye. At this point, I yelled out, what the fuck? God, don't let the aliens take me. Then I yelled for my sister. She ran in and didn't believe me. Red orbs. My left neighbour has a sweat lodge. My right neighbour is my gram. And our homes are very close and share a driveway. My sister would smoke outside and a few times at 3am, she would see a floating red orb. Always at the edge of the brush. My gram saw the red orb, same time, but it was right outside my sister's bedroom window. I saw this red orb. It was right outside my side door, one metre from the ground, but five metres from the door, in between my grandparents. I thought about going outside, but I just prayed. Any time one of us see these orbs, we all had terrible or tortured and haunted dreams that night. Voices, eh? I used to clean while listening to YouTube stories about skinwalkers. At the end of one, they said a skinwalker's name. I remember thinking they were stupid. I think it triggered my sister and I hearing each other's names for a while. I was doing the dishes and I heard her say Brittany, except it was from my feet, underneath the sink. Also, for both of us when this happened, it would sound similar to in real life, but also like telepathy. She would hear me call her name too. It was always when we weren't in the same room. Voice B. When my sister moved out, I lived with two cats. One time around 3.15am, I was awoken by my dad's voice going, Hey! It was so loud, my cats ran from my room. I jumped and prayed. He lives down the road from me. He didn't answer my text, and then next said he confirmed that at exactly that time he yelled hey in the same tone of voice. He almost won Pug G or Pug 1 and lost. Not sure how these things happen. Church bells. I barely ever drink. One of the times I did, it was late in the morning and as I was walking to the bathroom, loud old style church bells rang three times. Creepy spirit. This one is so creepy. I was at my mom's house. My 20 year old sister just left to go back to our home and my mom was in the tub. I was cleaning downstairs. I felt this urge to look behind me and I saw a child-sized version of my sister. She was on her knees, held her head in her hands and was looking at me from the couch. She then ducked down, hiding, and I ran over and it was gone. Also, instead of having a face, it was all hair. Weird ghost thing. Back to my neighbour practising bad medicine. It was night time and I had my windows open. I was smoking weed and I closed the window because I felt bad energy. My sister ran into my room and said to call the cops. There was screaming coming from the cedar trees. I said, no, listen carefully. That's paranormal screening. It's not a human scream. It was like a cross between animals and humans screaming. Some are weird, like gross chanting. And also, it felt like a wave of water and heavy wind in terms of evil energy flowing over us. Coming from the cedar trees. So often we would sleep together because creepy things were happening outside. 
My sister moved out sadly, but the second time this happened, I was alone. It was the summer before I'd moved for college. My cats would move to the next door with my grandparents, but I still wanted to teach them to be brave. The same screaming woke my cats and I up, but the energy just felt so evil. My cats would t could tell it was supernatural and they looked so scared. They didn't run from the bed when I got out of bed. Then I walked into that room, my cats following. I was yelling and praying and banging on those windows with a flashlight at all those evil screams. It didn't stop. So I went back to my bedroom window and banged the air, yelling and praying at these demonic spirits. Then this pure white solid man-shaped figure sprinted out of those woods and looked directly at me. I was so scared, I dropped to the floor and laid there for hours. I think I waited till sunrise to sleep. Aliens. Now I can go on and on. My cousin and I, when I lived with my parents, we would hang out all night on my porch and at the lake and look for these weird stars. Now before you say they're planes or satellites, they aren't. They were stars, but red and white. They would remain stationary while these red stars would move around in different shapes like scribbles and disappear. Or like the sun or moon follows you when driving. The red stars would move similar to an airplane in terms of leaving the white stars stationary. But it would follow us down the road, stop when we did, and follow us back home. So one night, my cousin banged on my window with a friend. They were drunk. I was sober. I fed them and walked them home. They lived two hours down. I stopped them and said, holy shit, there were nine red stars in the sky. As I said that, they simultaneously started to move. The nine red stars formed three triangles each. Then, the three slowly moved towards each other and then formed one big triangle. The nine red stars and huge triangle slowly lowered from the sky and shockingly lowered beneath the tree line and I could see them almost touch the ground. I looked at my cousin and that sucker abandoned me and was sprinting and almost at a front door. I did the same and hid under my covers. Banging. I hate this one. My sister's room leads to the back of the brush. It's very hard to push open and it's always locked. At 3am, three times in a row, we heard a huge bang and the door slammed open. I put on several weight and this hasn't happened since. But it has mostly happened during nightmares. My sister has bad ones, but they're getting better. Unwilling astral projection. This makes me mad and irritated. My grandpa had surgery and is completely amazing and healed now. But at the time, he was really scared. After his surgery, he missed church for the first time. I don't go often, but I went and I wrote down everything. When I got home, I was reading to him and three knocks happened from their back door. I pretend I didn't hear it. He asked me if I did and I confirmed I heard it too. I didn't have to look to know nothing was there. We prayed together after... So mean, these spirits. In our culture, the three-knock thing doesn't symbolise anything good. When my grandpa goes away for meetings, I sleep over with my gram and sleep in his room. She sleeps in a different room. Last time, I dreamt that all of their radios had gross chanting and it was very static. I astral projected and unwillingly and as I was watching myself sleep. I said God's name and I was back in my body and I woke up. As I did, my grandpa's bathroom door slowly opened. I just prayed. The first time I astral projected, I was at my house. I again was floating at the ceiling watching myself sleep, but there was this creature chanting demonic stuff on the floor in my corner. I kept trying to say God's name and I was muted. After a while, I finally said it and I was back in my body and rolled over and went to sleep. So the first thing I want to put out is I had multiple paranormal experiences throughout my life from age five, even till this very day. A little about me is I'm an empath and I can read people's energy. And I don't know if that's the reason I have paranormal experiences, but I'm going with a yes. I could tell you all my stories, but I want to tell you one of my experiences that takes the cake. So I was about 18 and I still lived with my parents at the time. I was sitting at the kitchen table one day, watching one of my favorite shows on my laptop. The show I was watching was Ghost Adventures. Ironic, I know. And I know what you're thinking. 
you're probably thinking, well, you were watching a ghost show, so you probably got scared or paranoid, or it's probably the sound from the show. Well, I hate to burst your theory, sadly, but you're wrong. So as I was saying, I was sitting watching Ghost Adventures when I felt a presence coming towards me, but I ignored it. I usually ignore anything paranormal, so they don't bother me, and eventually they get the hit, but sometimes they don't. This spirit didn't. So if you've ever seen Ghost Adventures, you know that they show a scene as it comes to an end. And in one of the episodes, the last scene, Zack was sitting on the couch talking to the spirits when a lamp moved across the table. As soon as that happens, I pause the show because I felt the presence behind me. And I'm not kidding you guys. I hear a man's voice whisper in my ear saying, oh, that's crazy. I felt his warm breath on my ear. After that, I asked him respectfully to not do that ever again and to walk away. And he did. So when my grandma was alive, I was really close to her. And I used to call her mommy. My grandma was very protective over me because I was born really sick. She would yell or fight anybody who she thought was a threat to me or my health. My grandma passed away in 1999, so I was three years old at the time. Her death was very traumatic for me. I remember being at a funeral and my aunt telling me to try not to wake her up because she'll be sleeping for a long time. And of course, I didn't fully understand what my aunt was talking about and decided to try and wake her up. I remember saying to my grandma, Mama, wake up, and Mama, please wake up, as I put my toddler hand on her chest, shaking her to wake up. I remember my shock when feeling the coldness of her body. I told my aunt to get Mama a blanket so she wouldn't freeze. After saying that people started crying more, and then nothing, because I can't remember after that part. The next day, we went to visit a grave, and I remember asking my mom, where's Mama at? My mom pointed and told me that she was underneath the ground. And I freaked out and tried to dig my grandma out of the ground with my hands so she could get out after her long nap. I got frustrated because I couldn't get it and started crying. Anyways, four months after her death, I went to get my heart surgery because I was born with two holes in my heart. I remember waking up after surgery to see a young woman holding my hand as she smiled at me. There was no talking, just her staring at me with so much love for me in her eyes. She started rubbing my head after she tucked me in. It was so soothing after a while, I started falling back asleep. I felt her giving me a kiss on the forehead and heard her footsteps as she walked away from me. I didn't know who she was, but I felt like I knew her. Years later, my mom showed me pictures of my grandma when she was younger and I was shocked by what we saw. The young woman who was being so caring to me was my grandma. I think my grandma came to visit me to see if I was okay. She knew I was getting the surgery before she died, so I think she just wanted to just be there for me. I used to live in the Philippines, and the house I lived in was built when the Philippines was being occupied by Japan during World War II. It had two small walkways, one on the side of the house and one at the back of the house. At the corner where the two walkways meet is where my dog's huge wooden house dog house was. I say huge because I could literally go in and sleep in it comfortably and I was a huge kid of 12 years old. One night, I was told by my uncle to go and feed Casper. Of course, I said yes right away because I wanted to play with my dog, so I went. Now Casper is a happy dog, always running around and always happy to see any of my family. But that night was different. While I was walking towards his dog house, I realized that I didn't hear him barking or running around. So I thought he was at the back walkway. So I just continued towards the dog house. It was nighttime around eight o'clock. I stopped halfway through when I noticed that Casper was inside the dog house. Now this was worrisome, for he always runs at me when he sees me, so I thought maybe something was wrong, like he was sick or whatever, so I quickened my pace to get to him. Once I got there though, he seemed fine. I put down the food next to him and filled up his water bowl and had no reaction whatsoever. Casper was just staring towards the back hallway. I got curious, so I looked towards where he was looking at, 
And what I saw still gives me chills when I remember that day. I saw a man standing there, just staring at me with a blank expression. He was wearing some type of military uniform and was holding a rifle. I'm not a gun expert, so I can't tell you all what kind it was. At the tip of the gun rested a bayonet. What got me focused on what it was, was a bloody bayonet. At that point, I was just frozen. I remember the fear and thinking, this is it. Someone is here and he's going to kill me. I don't quite remember what made me look away from the bayonet, but when I did the first thing, I noticed was how the man was now missing half of his face. Seeing him only have half of a face jolted me out of my frozen state, and I ran for it. I didn't care to look back to see if he was following me or not. I even tackled my uncle who was coming to check on me. I cried so hard when I realised that I was on top of my uncle. He took me inside and waited for me to stop crying. I fell asleep and then from crying. The next morning, my uncle talked to me about what happened and I told him everything. He was genuinely worried when I finished because he told me that I was out there in the walkway for an hour and it was the reason why he was coming to check on me. He also told me that I wasn't the only one to experience such things in the house. I later found out what the uniform the man was wearing was the standard Japanese military uniform at the time of World War II. I was playing a game on my phone whilst listening to music when I decided to look out the window and at the other house's windows. All the curtains were open on every house we were passing, yet only light made it through them. I thought this was normal and looked back at my phone. Whilst my dad was doing the roundabout, I decided to look out the window again. In one of the windows I saw was a woman. She was slim and had her hips on one side and her chest to the other, as well as being very black. So black in fact that I couldn't make out what she was wearing on her face, like a silhouette. Still though, I thought nothing of it and continued playing. I wish I didn't, but I did, and looked out the window one last time after a couple of minutes. The exact same woman was in the same window in every house. She just stared at me, not a care in the world. I tried telling my brother and my parents, but they disregarded me. I was genuinely scared and I didn't want to leave the car. I was forced to, but when I did, I immediately rushed towards the door, praying that the woman wouldn't answer. Luckily it wasn't, and for a good hour or two, I felt safe. However, my phone died, so I went to one of the bedrooms to charge it. I also decided to relax a little and I lay down on the bed. I couldn't help but shake the feeling of being watched. There was only one window in the room, so I looked over there. And there she was, still pitch black. This time, she wasn't in a normal position. Her fingers were beside her hips and her head rotated to look at me. I obviously screamed and I ran out of the bedroom without my phone. My parents got worried and came. I tried to tell them everything, but they didn't really buy it and we left early because they thought I would ruin the game. I didn't look out of the windows for the rest of the trip. It was three years ago and I've gone over it since, but I've never seen her since. But what I didn't realize then was that all the bedrooms in the house were on the second floor. I know no one will believe me, but at least I've got that off my chest. I leave my front door wide open at night. I also make sure that the sliding door in my kitchen is too wide open and the screen door removed. I check every night for any closed windows in my house and open them. I put my valuables on the dining table and my most prized trophies on an easily accessible shelf in my living room. I always try to remind myself to make sure that my two bedroom doors, my bathroom door, my garage and my gun rack are unlocked and open. All of my floors are carpet to help dampen the sound of footsteps and I make sure the hinges on my house's doors and knobs are extra oiled so they won't make a single sound when they're being pushed open. I put in earplugs in a blindfold and snore loudly to signal that I'm asleep. I also make sure that I get two of the latest 40 to 50 inch flat screen TVs with 4K and I choose the ones that are specifically easy to install, uninstall and reinstall and put the second TV in my guest bedroom. 
I also have the latest generation of gaming consoles and a $5,000 computer that I meticulously built from the ground up. I also have more than 500 of the greatest games in total, both on PC and console. When I first got this house, the first thing I did was reinstall my power box on the outside of the house so that it can easily be disarmed from the outside. I have no outside lamp, no camera and pets or animals of any kind. Coincidentally, this house is the farthest from any cell towers or police station. I live in an abandoned neighborhood with no neighbors and I have no fence. I also put my social security number, credit card, and $600 worth of Yu-Gi-Oh cards right beside my trophy collection. And if I'm subscribed to any paid services, I make sure to write down the information on a piece of paper and stick it into my fridge. In my garage, I have two $1,000 bikes and a motorcycle that can put anything you can think of to shame. Finally, I, if I clean, if heaven is dirty, then take me to hell because I'll be damned if I'm living in a dirty house. I don't consider a spot clean unless I can eat it. All my shoes are put through the washer and if I even suspect it of being dirty, I manually hand wash it myself. I take long hot showers with soap, both with a bar and in a liquid. I put on three brands of shampoo and three brands of conditioner. Three brands of deodorizer when I'm done taking a shower. I clean it too. I floss each tooth of mine and do 10 minutes of brushing with an electric toothbrush. And finally, I mouthwash. If you haven't got the messenger yet, I'm trying to make people break into my house. Because if they do, they'll be the new owner of the house and be unable to leave it. They will own everything inside it, including my hunger. You know? That gnawing sensation as though a black hole has taken residence in your intestines. Never will they be able to satisfy this one need, and never will they be able to die from it. Or from anything so long as they own the place. They will live in a clean house as a husk, and they too would want to clean it to increase the temptation of taking something from it. I know somebody will take the bait. After all, it worked for me. I lived on the second floor of an old apartment building. Recently, everybody on the first floor moved out. It was slow at first. A family moved out after their baby wouldn't stop crying. A couple felt something wrong while they were having sex. And police arrested the person who lived below me because they shot at the floor due to what they called hand rats, which is not what it sounds like by the end of this. There's a housing problem from where I live and many people were eager to take the old homes of my first floor neighbours. However, they'd usually last about six months before moving back out. The longest I've seen someone stay was about a year, but they were batshit crazy at that point. One day, when I was returning home from work, I spotted the landlord, Adam, looking down at me from the roof. Now, I happen to be friends with the landlord and I know that he isn't suicidal, so I got two beers from my fridge, went to the roof and offered him one. Of course he said yes to a bottle of natural light beer. We both looked at the town around us. It was crime ridden, drug ridden, all the worst kinds of ridden. The only driver it wasn't was the police. I looked over at Adam and completely at random I asked, Hey, do the people on the first floor always move out after just moving in? Adam broke a sweat. They're not dying. What? Not enough people are dying. And now they're coming for us. What do you mean? Adam pointed to the apartment building across the street. Look at that one. Know how many people died in there? How many times have you been woken up to the sound of gunshots every night? Because of what goes on across the street? I looked at him, then back at the building. Yeah, too many times to count. Adam shook his head and sat on his knees. In the past few months, they've been getting less and less police calls. Less and less murders. They have their own security team. People have been dying there less. I moved away from him for a bit. Uh, isn't that a good thing? He cut me off. Look at the building beside us. They've had a prostitution and drug problem there for decades. Now they hold free rehab sessions every Saturday and are practically surrounded with undercover cops trying to dismantle the prostitution rip. I yelled, hey, why is all this a bad thing? Adam stood up, 
chugged the rest of his beer, then looked at me and he said, you'll find out. He threw his bottle in the trash can below and walked away, leaving me. Over the coming months, our relationship soured more. He clearly liked the problems that plagued the other buildings and he always found it douchey of him. But in the end, he was right. I would have still had my other hand had the other buildings not improved. A year passed and people have started leaving only after living in the first floor apartments for three months. People on the higher floors were getting just as concerned as I. One of the people below me, a female cosplayer named Chloe, was planning on moving out after only living on the first floor for a month. Apparently, her complaints of her clothing being ripped went unanswered. A few weeks later, I saw her heading towards Adam's apartment in order to give the key. Just as she was about to knock on the door, I stopped her. I said, hey, uh, can I borrow the key before you give it to Adam? Borrow? Take it. It's not mine to deal with anymore. She then dropped the key into my hands and walked away. I contemplated giving it to Adam, but he's been too distant. I decided to do some investigating. That night, I went downstairs to Chloe's old apartment and unlocked the door. The entire apartment was filled with nothing but concrete pillars. It was hard to navigate around them. They were so tightly packed together. I couldn't imagine living here for a week, let alone a month or three, or a year. I touched one of the pillars. They felt unsettling. I left after two minutes. I was planning on going to Adam and giving back the key, saying the previous tenant dropped it. But my body moved on its own, and before I knew it, I was laying down on my bed, about to fall asleep. I almost died that night. I felt that same feeling, that same unsettling feeling I got from touching one of those damn pillars. Except that feeling was wrapped around my ankle. But I didn't panic, even though I felt it again around my wrist as well. I only panicked when it was around my neck. I opened my eyes in panic as I realised I wasn't breathing. I didn't turn off all the lights when I fell asleep and I saw two more hands emerge, attempting to grab my other free hand and leg. I looked over at my dresser and reached it with my free hand, the concrete coming closer and my breath ever fading. I opened the drawer, but from where I was laying, I couldn't see what was in it. I was panicking. I needed to feel for a curved piece of wood. I felt round metal and the grasp of the hand on my neck tightening. I felt as though I was about to pass out. I almost did. Just as my eyes went black, my hand acted on its own and I shot the hand holding my neck with a sawn off shotgun. I immediately retreated and I shot the concrete hand holding onto my ankle. Some shrapnel hit my foot, but I was too panicked to care. The other hand was able to grab the shoe of my other foot and I immediately kicked it away, my shoe going with it. I immediately got up, but I realised there was one more hand holding onto my wrist and more wanting my other hand, and several more slowly rising up. Even with one hand made of concrete holding onto my wrist, I was still able to come up with enough force and speed to run out of my window. Just as I was about to fall onto the dumpster below, the concrete hand broke my fall midway and slowly began to rise up. I panicked. I wasn't thinking straight. A flurry of emotions, dreams and things I wanted to do flew around my head. I started crying as my free hand reached into my pocket and pulled out a switchblade. I started screaming shortly after. It's been two weeks since that night. I've been typing this entire thing with one hand, as painful and tedious as it is. But I have to get the story out there. I've been living with a friend whilst I find another place to crash. A couple hours ago, the local news reported that the old apartment building had apparently closed. All of the tenants suffocated to death. They were found within the floorboards. The prison I work in holds no prisoners. It's pretty weird, yes. The only time I get to see them is when they arrive. The guards have to stand in a line facing the new inmates as they head into the prison, never to be seen again. I don't know what's weirder. The fact that our prison doesn't have a name, or that we never see the inmates at all. Not to mention, some of their sentences are pretty harsh considering what they're being convicted for. All the prisoners are on death row, 
However, we're not in charge of giving the executions. That's the job of the warden himself to deal with. When you hear death row, you usually think the worst of the worst. The people who you wouldn't mind, they commit suicide one morning. But these prisoners' bad deeds range from gambling, intoxication, over-smoking, and sometimes, for some fucking reason, sex. That's right. Some prisoners are put on death row here for having sex. Every part of the prison is completely divided via airlock doors that need administration's approval for entry and exits. So if you want to make it to the cell blocks, you need to radio in with them. And yes, there are airlocks for the men's and women's bathroom each. All prison personnel are not allowed to be in the same parts as the prisoners. So if they're in the cafeteria, we can't be in there or in the kitchen either. If you fail to finish your duties, let's say cleaning in time, you're getting a reduced pay for that week. And if you ever wind up in the same areas as the inmates, you're considered dead and a letter is sent home to your loved ones. It's really backwards if you think about it. The inmates who are on death row practically have ample opportunity to escape at literally any point they want to. I mean, it's not like the guards can do anything about it, because we literally can't. But our job isn't to think about that. Our job is to make sure nobody gets in or out. I don't know. And personally, I don't want to know. I've seen the stories online. How people's curiosities and attitudes lead them towards a life of torment and pain. I've seen and heard all the warning signs to get to know that not some, but a lot of things in life are much better left unknown rather than anything else. So I never questioned it. Never gave up one thought of my mind in my 15 years of serving this prison. And never, ever did the unanswered question ever consume me to the point where I just had to know. Unfortunately, I couldn't say the same things for one of my work friends. His name was Sebastian. He was in his mid-twenties, was a fucking idiot, and therefore was always curious. He told me his dream job was to work for NASA or SpaceX or any company studying space. He always loved learning and loved talking about education. That and the weird-ass prison we worked in. I think it was about two years of working there that he completely broke and decided to do some investigating on his own. Reception, administration, the warden, not even some guards were willing to say anything to him. And eventually, all of his pent-up curiosity was finally answered to him with his death. It was 11pm, the time when all the prisoners were asleep. I was on the night shift, making sure everybody besides some guards and janitors were off the site. Sebastian wasn't supposed to be on site today, so I was pretty surprised to see him there. He was very distinguishable from the other guards, what with his baby blue eyes and his almost perfectly white hair, not to mention his under average height. I asked him, what the fuck are you doing here? Sebastian stammered, uh, just doing some overtime. <laughs> I knew it was bullshit, and he did too. We didn't do overtime at this nameless prison. He knew that I knew it was bullshit, so I told him, follow me outside, come on, and he complied. We walked together from the indoor courtyard to the indoor gym, to the indoor administration, where he was given a stern talking to by the head of security, and eventually to the outdoor area, when that son of a gun tased me till I blacked out cold. I was awoken by the head of security, where he told me that he climbed into the vents, what with his small stature and all. My job was to track him, as he was moving fast and I was the only one who knew him really well. Administration gave me permission to check every single part of the prison. I only asked to check the cell box. They told me it was suicide because that was where all the prisoners were being held. I told them that Sebastian would be there or I would quit tomorrow morning. They let me through. I ran as fast as I could. From the indoor administration to the indoor gym, through the indoor courtyard to where I was stopped by an airlock. I radioed in with the reception. The fuck? I thought I just said to let me through the cell box. The only reply I got was static. I told them otherwise, said a deep voice behind my back. I turned around and saw a man wearing a two-piece business suit and a pure Damascus 14k gold sunglasses. He had no face, no ears, no hair, and his skin was pure grey. He was the warden. I... I need to be let in here. He's going to be considered dead, but I can still save him. He ignored my statement, walked over to me and said, Do you ever wonder what we keep in here? What kind of sick and twisted things are stored in this prison with no name? 
What kind of people come in here with deeds so vile you just want to kill them yourselves? Just as he finished talking, I heard yelling from the other side of the airlock. Help me! Open the airlock now! I looked through a window on the airlock to see a faint silhouette of a man. The warden continued on. Well, we don't house inmates in this prison. As the screaming man came running at full speed towards the airlock door, I saw a horrific sight. We house wolves. The screaming man was Sebastian, and his face was mauled off. You could see his skull. His left eye was missing, and his other eye was crying blood. He was begging to open the door, all while me and the warden stood there watching him. One man stood in defeat. The other showed no emotion. Not with his stance, not with his head, not with anything. These wolves, the warden continued, are the addictions of man. Smoking, gambling, killing. Yes, even sex. They're all here as the beings they really are. Wolves slowly chowing down on their prey. Suddenly, a pair of eight footsteps came ever closer and Sebastian slowly stopped yelling and started to just cry. As he realised that his only hope had abandoned him, symbolised through the warden, walking away from the airlock. The last thing he said to me was, when you're done here, you're fired. I ignored him and watched as Sebastian stopped crying and began screaming, not for help, not for me or for the warden, but in agony and pain. He was eaten alive from the bottom up by the walls of curiosity. Me and a team of three others have been working on a paranormal investigator series, Project X, where we visit different places in the UK and try to debunk the ghost stories. We were made up of two sceptics and two half-believers, but the wealth of evidence and experiences we encountered at Clapham Wood has changed everything for all of us. The woods are a very creepy place, and we were warned before we went that we needed to be covert, as the locals do not take kindly to investigators. There's a long history of accusations that cult rituals take place in the woods, and that's exactly the vibe we felt when we arrived. We first went early in the afternoon, and immediately felt unwelcome. We felt nauseous and paranoid, and also encountered some noises we couldn't explain. We also collected an EVP that sounds like it's saying, you're standing on my grave. EVP collected at Clapham Wood. This was just the start of the weirdness. When we returned at night, someone had bound a crucifix from two pieces of wood and placed it by the entrance to ward us off. It worked. We were followed back to our hotel, and that night, Two of us had visions of cloaked figures lurking in our room. We returned the next morning and came across evidence that an amateur ritual had taken place the night before and also collected a second EVP. The cross was there when we returned but had been moved when we left despite it being 4.30am and us not encountering anyone else in the woods. For weeks after, we felt like the woods were calling back and eventually decided to check it out again. When we headed back, the strangeness started again. As we walked into the woods, a faint drumming began, almost mimicking a heartbeat. Our episodes are pretty long, but you can hear the drumming in this episode from around 10 minutes in. Paranoia and nausea set in again, and we had to leave. Before we left, there was one other piece of strangeness. The atmosphere went from dark to hella dark instantly. Like someone switching out a light in the sky. We managed to capture this on camera, and we cannot explain this. These little instances have been enough to convince us of something, but we're not sure what. My grandma's house has had weird goings on since before I was born. Mysterious ringing phones in the basement, TVs and VCRs with minds of their own, bassinets that rocked by themselves. Anyway, it seems one of them may be a mimic. My grandfather had a job that would take him out of town at times. On at least two separate occasions while he was gone, my grandma and uncle saw him walk down the hallway and out of sight. They thought maybe he had come home without them noticing, but his car wasn't in the driveway either time, and he came home later and insisted he hadn't been home. 
My mother also claimed she used to talk to her deceased grandmother at night sometimes. It scared her because she knew that logically it wasn't right. But it was her grandmother, so she felt safer about it. Knowing about mimics now, it probably wasn't her grandmother. And now my personal experience. My sister and I used to spend weekends at my grandmother's house when we were younger. We all slept in her bed, and my grandma would make us bacon and hot cocoa for breakfast in the mornings. I woke up one morning, but I was still in a state of half-awareness. I opened my eyes and saw my grandmother leaning in her bedroom doorway, looking at me. I figured she had just come up to see if I was awake yet, but then she leaned backwards out of the doorway and out of sight. Something about the way she moved just wasn't quite right. And that's when I smelled and heard bacon cooking downstairs. It struck me as odd that she would walk away from bacon while it was on the stove. She was in her 70s at this time, and though she got around well for her age, taking the stairs was still a bit of a task and took some time. It didn't make sense that she would risk burning food on the stove just to come upstairs to look at me. She could have just yelled up at me to see if I was up. I called out to ask if she was upstairs. From where I was, I could see out the bedroom door and down the stairs. She walked from the kitchen to the bottom of the stairs and said no. She was making bacon. I freaked a little, got out of bed and booked it downstairs. My sister was already awake and downstairs with my grandma, which is why she was already making bacon before I was up. Both of them said she had not been upstairs, so I told them what happened. That's when my grandma told us the stories I told above about seeing my grandpa and when he couldn't have been there. This story took place in the winter of 1997. Me and my friend, who I'll call Will, were camping in Zion National Park, Utah. I'm not sure whether or not camping is was legal at the time, as we were both from Maine. We're both devout Mormons, so we were visiting the area to connect to other like-minded people. We first went to the park sometime in the middle of January, so the weather was very frigid. We decided to make a camp in a small clearing somewhere near the Great Staircase. We smet a small tent up underneath a few trees. Things went fine for the first few nights. On the third morning, Will woke up in a cold sweat in the wee hours. He had had a vivid nightmare of a creature with matte black eyes following him through the canyon. We brushed it off as just that, a nightmare. Later that morning, we went up the ridge and to do some sightseeing. Will was eerily quiet. I asked him if he was all right, and he told me he had been to this part of the park before. Neither of us had been here in the days prior, and he realised he had seen it in his dream. We were both spooked, but brushed it off as a coincidence. We went back to camp later that afternoon, and we thought nothing of the coincidence from earlier. That night, when we went to cook up some of the hot dogs we'd brought along with us, we searched and searched for them, but they were all but missing. Once again, we just assumed we mustn't have packed them, but Will was certain he saw them earlier that day. We decided not to worry about it, and we ate some protein bars we had packed for hiking. Things went fine for the rest of the night, but we couldn't help but feel there was something wrong. Two days later, Will woke up in the night again. This time was different, though. His nose was bleeding, thick, black blood, and his shirt was covered in dirt and mud. One of the minor detail I forgot to mention is, he woke up two miles from the tent. I only found him because I heard him screaming from out in the bush. I went and found him and helped get back home to camp. When he, we returned, we found a small bird skull on top of Will's bedroll. The howls of the coyotes and other similar creatures we had heard in the nights prior were non-existent, leaving the canyon strangely silent. Later that day, we went out for another hike. We were about eight miles from our camp at this point, and being that it was the days before cell phones and we were in a canyon, there was no way we could contact for help if we got lost or injured. Our car was at least a six hour hike from where we were camping. We happened upon a small clearing and at the edge of the tree line, we found a small cave. Being the naive, curious young boys we were, we ventured out in search of an adventure. Inside the cave, there was no sound but the echoes of our footsteps. The ground was strewn with bones of small birds, 
not dissimilar to the skull we found on Will's bedroll. Will went to expect on one of the skulls. However, upon picking it up, we both had an overwhelming sense of dread filling us both. Our ears began to ring intensely, and our heads began to vibrate violently. The sound was like static from a radio, and it caused us both an immediate terrible headache. I screamed at Will. We needed to leave, but he couldn't hear me over the static ringing. I couldn't even hear myself. I grabbed his arm, and we ran for the mouth of the cave. We decided we'd had enough, and we were going to leave. The ringing subsided as we got further from the cave. However, as we neared the camp, the sense of dread became even stronger. The camp had been destroyed. Our equipment was left dangling from trees. We tried to collect our things, but we were too overcome with fear. We didn't hesitate. We picked up what things of value we could carry, and we began the long walk back to my car. It was about 5pm by that point, and if we started walking now, we'd be back in the car by about 11 we trekked back with no issue for about two hours. By 7pm, it was pitch black and there was no light, except for Will's lighter. The forest was suddenly filled with the sounds of hundreds of creatures howling and crying. We could make out the silhouettes of several tall deer along one of the high cliff faces. The deer looked sickly, and their eyes were blacker than the sky. We tried to ignore them, but it seemed they were following us. We dropped everything and just began to run. Somehow, we made it back to the car in just a couple hours. The sounds of the forest didn't die down for the entirety of the journey. Once we got back to the car, we assumed the battery would be dead, as we had unintentionally left the car lights on for several days. Luckily, almost as if it were a miracle, the car started fine and we got out to the park without a hitch. As of writing this, it's been 23 years since this happened, but the story still haunts me. I hadn't seen Will in several years, as he had moved away to a different state. I decided to write our story in honour of his memory, as I learned this morning of his passing. He had been suffering from mild depression long before our experience, but I feel that the traumatic nature of the event only amplified his condition. To this day, I don't have a clue what it was in the park, as I've never told the story to a single person until now. Will and I never even spoke of the events after they happened, and I'd like to believe it was all just a nightmare or shared illusion, but we know it was much more than that. My boyfriend and I moved into an apartment nine months ago, and we think there could be a ghost kitties here. We have two cats of our own and we've seen both cats acting as if they're chasing something that isn't there. Their toys have gone missing every now and then, but what's spooky is I found two of their soft toys under our kitchen sink, behind a board that's blocking that area off. Recently, there's been activity that I don't think ghost kitties could do. Cabinets have opened, light and heavy things have been thrown, our shower curtain moves every now and then, electronics seem to die quick, and our TV brightness dims and brightens. I enjoy watching scary movies, and I decided that I'd watch one until my boyfriend got home from work. After the first movie was over, the energy in our living room felt different. I wasn't sure if it was because I was a little spook from watching The Conjuring 3 or what. Mr. B, one of our cats, was staring at the corner with his ears back for a bit. All of a sudden, my beanie that was on the table flew at him hit him, and made him run away to hide. That scared me a bit, so I went and stood in our kitchen for a while. While I was in there, a breeze flew by me. I decided I needed to step out because my stomach felt sick. When I stood outside our apartment, I heard one of the cats meow and the dishes move. I decided to go back there because I couldn't leave our babies alone there. While I was sitting in the kitchen, one of the cabinets creaked open. This is where I almost started to cry. Luckily, my boyfriend got home a few minutes later. I've experienced things happening before and I felt fine, but the energy I've been feeling the past couple of days is making my stomach knot. Another thing that concerns me is that some of our things seem to go missing. Back in October, I knew I put my earrings on our bedside table before I went to bed. I wanted to put them back on a few days later, but they were gone. We thought maybe one of the cats knocked them onto the floor, so we looked everywhere in our room, 
and we still haven't found them. We've also lost my boyfriend's main car keys. We have a big jar on one of the tables in our living room that I put our keys, wallets and coins in. If my boyfriend places his things down, I always end up picking them up and putting them in the jar before bed. Well, he came home late one night while I was already asleep and put all of his things down on the coffee table, keys, wallet, etc. Woke up in the morning and everything but his keys was still there. I've deep cleaned our whole apartment and still haven't found the things that have gone missing. I've also noticed red marks show up in my skin that weren't there minutes before. These are just a few of the experiences I've witnessed. There's been a lot more. They only seem to be the most active around me. My boyfriend has only witnessed a few things happen to him, and most of the time, it's little things while I'm in the room with him. I feel like the energy in our apartment has shifted, and now I start to feel sick almost every time I witness something happen. Is there a way to cleanse the negative energy I keep feeling? So I'll start off by saying I'm very into the paranormal. However, I maintain that I'm a skeptic. I haven't really had any outlandish experiences. Nothing like a ghost screaming in my ear or seeing a full body apparition. Mostly stuff like feeling uneasy in certain areas, hearing little whispers and creaks and groans, seeing things out of the corner of my eye. I also experience hallucinations, so I try to keep that in mind. I also like to shop at Goodwill a lot. You can get cheap junk here, and I love junk, especially dolls. I have a few haunted dolls, a few that are just decoration, but nothing I've ever gotten from Goodwill I ever considered haunted, until recently. My significant other and I went to Goodwill a day or so ago to pick up some last minute gifts, and as we were looking around, I saw this large wooden box that's mostly black with some hand painted birds and things. It's pretty old, maybe 25 to 50 years old, I don't really know but I knew my mother-in-law would love it because she has an affinity for boxes. So we pick it up and head out to there. No uneasy feeling, no feeling at all for it really, but maybe I was too scatterbrained at that time and not really listening to any sixth sense I might have. That night, I got to bed relatively early, which is unusual for me as I have a really hard time falling asleep and usually don't get to bed till around four in the morning. Maybe an hour after I fall asleep, I suddenly wake up and experience what I'm assuming was sleep paralysis. My head is tucked under my significant other's shoulder and between pillows, so I can't see anything, but I could feel that there was someone else there. I told myself to relax, it will pass, and I'll be able to sleep soon. This isn't the first time I've had paralysis, and it probably won't be the last. Granted, it hasn't happened for at least three years. Suddenly, I get the urge to turn my head and look at my door leading from the bedroom to my attic. But I know I shouldn't look because I'll probably see something I don't want to and I can't exactly move anyway. But for some ungodly reason, the urge to turn my head and look was so wrong I felt like, holy shit, I'm breaking out of sleep paralysis. Isn't that a first? I didn't look, thank God, but the presence that I felt earlier was stronger and I was getting that scary little demon girl in a horror movie vibe. Eventually, I fell back asleep without realizing it, but when I woke up, I had the worst pain in my chest and my neck was all tied up on one side. I'm talking, it felt like I had someone punching my chest every time I took a breath or moved or was alive in any way. And if I tried to turn my head, my neck would explode. This happened the next night as well but I have no idea whether or not it happened a third time because it was Christmas Eve. So it was time to wrap it up and send it off to my mother-in-law. I didn't say anything to her about it because I honestly didn't attribute what was going on to the box. I actually completely forgot all about it until I had to wrap it. Since I've given it to her, however, I've been sleeping like a baby and woke up feeling refreshed and without any aches or pains. I'm interested in talking to her a little down the road and seeing if she's experienced any of the same thing. Maybe if that box really is a spooky demon box, she'll say something before I get the chance to bring it up. I firmly believe that there are many unexplained things in this world. 
You know, the things we have a hard time discussing with others because you don't want to be labelled as crazy. But you know they are, all the same. My dad's house, I believe, contains such an entity. There really isn't one big story to tell, but rather a bunch of small ones that combine into something really hard to write off as sheer coincidence. Most of these are told from my dad's perspective, although I was able to experience one for myself. I was spending the night at dad's house one time, and we were all in the living room watching TV. My little sister was sitting on the couch with my dad and stepmom, and I was sitting in the recliner with one of the dogs. The other dog was laying in front of the couch. In between the couch and recliner was an end table, and sitting on the table was a glass box that my stepmom got from her mom. We were paying it no mind when we heard a crash. We weren't expecting it, so we all jumped. The glass box on the table had fallen off the back side of the table and broke. The glass box had been sitting a good distance away from the edge, so it couldn't have fallen on its own. No one was close enough to bump the table. It was like someone lightly pushed the box off the edge, like what a cat would do. We investigated for several minutes before chalking up to another one of those incidents. My dad was standing in the middle of the living room watching the TV. It was in the middle of the day, and he was the only one home. Suddenly, from the direction of his and my stepmom's bedroom, he heard a loud and deep ha ha. His first thought was that someone had broken into the house, so we ran in there ready to beat the daylights out of the intruder, only to find an empty room. He looked around for a while and didn't find anyone there. Another time, my dad was in the living room again. It was just him and the dogs. He got up to grab the remote and he made a comment. You know the kind you make when you think out loud? Then he heard someone hiss, silence, into his ear. My dad, the king of underreactions, simply grabbed the remote and on his way back to the chair said, how about you shut the fuck up? He didn't hear anything else for the rest of the day. One night, when my dad and stepmom had just gotten in bed, I mean they just pulled the sheets over them, the door that leads to their bathroom shook. I'm not talking about some mild shaking that may come with an old house. I mean, it was like someone took hold of the door itself and was violently trying to shake it off its hinges. Needless to say, my stepmom was glad that my dad wasn't working nights that night. Along with these things, there are some shadow people sightings made by both my dad and my little sister. One time, in the middle of the day again, my dad was in the kitchen watching one of his football shows. Something compelled him to look towards the entrance of the kitchen, and he saw shadowy, disembodied feet walk across the entrance. My dad, once again the king of underreactions, looked out the kitchen. When he saw nothing, he shrugged his shoulders and went back to his football. This sighting is something that both my dad and little sister swore up and down they saw. On the right back corner of the living room, there's a very short hallway with three doors. A door to the bathroom, a door to my room, and a door what used to be my sister's room, but is now used for storage. The two bedroom doors are on the right side of the bathroom door, right in front of them. You can see the bedroom doors from the living room. They saw a shadowy figure leave the bathroom and head into the storage room. That being said, the storage room seems to be where this thing dwells when it isn't bothering my family. It's to the point that my sister refuses to ever go into that room again. And even just walking past that room is enough to cause your hairs to stand on end. I could go on for hours, but I'm going to stop here. If any of you have any idea of what we're dealing with, please let me know. So when I turned 18, I just graduated from high school. This was 2017. After summer, I found a brand new apartment complex. Literally not one building was up. There was only a trailer for the office. I got a new two-bedroom, two-bath apartment and moved in shortly after the first half of my building was finished. Anyways, just a little intro. Nothing happened in the beginning. Everything was cool and the apartment was usually quiet. Right around before summer 2018, my roommate, we'll call her Jessica, moved out, right? So I found that my good friend was looking for a roommate, but didn't have her own apartment yet. So, you know, we hit each other up and she ended up moving in. All was fun and games, until around the two or three week mark of her moving in. Things super low-key started happening. 
It wasn't serious. They were, I would say, scientifically explainable things. The drawer would be open, our bedroom doors would be open, or sometimes we would leave them open to let the house heat up at night, and the doors would be closed when we came back. Our bedrooms were carpeted, and the door has a hard time itself opening and closing because of the carpet. A couple more weeks go by, and it intensifies a little bit. We started to hear the doors close. We would see black shadows from my room. I thought it was just because it's dark and our eyes play tricks on us. No big deal. Things were almost misplaced all the time. Things would randomly be tipped over. Okay, now, it was about the two or three month mark of her living there. My roommate came home and was taking a bath in a bathroom, and she heard footsteps in the hallway. She said she 100% swore it was me. She said my name, but nothing came. She messaged me, and I was still at work. She recalls even hearing the skin to floor as if the feet were sweaty. We can't even hear anything from our downstairs neighbours. I started hearing it a few weeks later. She only signed a six-month lease because she wanted to get her own place near the college. So I met a girl at work. She will be Grace and her boyfriend Kyle. Grace immediately caught in on the activity in the house. It was very frequent. It was like whatever it was wanted to be known. My friend Hannah liked to come and stay a couple of days and one time she was staying and Grace and I left for work that morning and Kyle was staying the night before but he had a convention at the place Grace and I had worked at. So he and Grace rode together to work while I took my own rig. About halfway through my shift, I noticed that Hannah was online, therefore must have finally woken up. Almost instantly, she messaged me and said, is Grace's boyfriend still here? And I forgot that he came to work for the convention, so I said yes. She replied, oh, okay, good. Kind of scared me. I heard someone coming from Grace's room. And I started to remember that Kyle did have to come here. So I asked Grace if he for sure was here and she said yes, because they rode together. I called Hannah and told her and she freaked out. I'd gotten home later to her with all the lights on and the curtains pulled back. She explained to me that she kept hearing something coming from Grace's room while she was sleeping and she thought it was snoring. So she assumed it was Kyle. It finally got so loud that Hannah just woke up and got on her phone. She said even then, the noise got louder until it just stopped. We discussed it with my friend, who'd suggested it might be like snarling or growling. Hannah went pale and quickly came to realise that it was exactly what it was. We shagged up the house and all, but nothing ever helped. Things continued to go on, and I was forced to move home recently, and I know it was still haunted. The footsteps down the hall were so real. There were times I thought it was my cousin or Hannah walking down while I was in the bathroom, so I thought I'd scare them while I was coming out, and they would still be sitting in the living room or sleeping. The lights also flickered the last month of me living there, and it was pretty late. It happened for no reason, and it wasn't even consistent flickers. They were random and different with each light in the house. I also sometimes woke up at 3 to 3.30 at night for no reason, and I was terrified. Absolutely no reason. When I was a child, I absolutely believed in ghosts and the idea of them fascinated me. But as I got older, seeing shows on TV or videos on the internet that were clearly fake or extremely suspicious turned me into a non-believer or at most very skeptical. Now I'm 21 and just moved out of my uncle's place into my own apartment. It's a very old building. It's a pretty large house that's been turned into a fourplex. It even has a historical building plaque outside on it, though I'm having trouble finding any info on it. Three of the four apartments were just remodelled this year. The one that wasn't is because it was occupied at the time. At the moment, it's just me and him in the building. I'm on the top floor on one side, and he's on the other side on the ground floor. I've been here for almost a week now. Of course, I've heard your generic old building noises. Creaks and snaps from the cooling fall temperatures, that sort of thing. There were a couple of times in the first two days that I thought I saw movement in the corner of my eye and didn't think anything of it. All seemed fairly well until the night before last. I was in bed watching YouTube on my phone. Lying down, not quite on my back, not quite on my side. 
holding up my phone, my arms eventually got tired. And as I was sitting down my phone on my bed, I could have sworn from behind where I was just holding up my phone. A very, very faint shadowy head or face was there and quickly ducked out of view. Now, I realise that sounds absolutely terrifying, but I was very tired and was just staring directly at the bright screen of my phone. And what I saw was very, very faint. I figured if I had really seen something, it was a minor hallucination. Slept well, got up and went to work, came home and relaxed for a few hours in a very good mood. I took a shower, got into bed and fell asleep between 2 and 2.30 a.m. I woke up at some point between 3.30 and 4. It's, it's usual for me to wake up many times a night. I turned to lie on my right side and stretched a bit and just lied for about 5 or 10 minutes. At this point, I'm absolutely wide awake. The night is absolutely still and silent. I get to the point where it's time to flip over, and as I do, the unthinkable happens. As clear as day, from the side that I'm flipping over to, no more than seven feet away from me, a female voice at normal conversation volume says something. In my absolute shock and disbelief, I didn't fully catch what she said. I'm pretty sure it was three syllables or words. The first of which, I'm fairly certain, was he's. At this point, I'm absolutely horrified and just start shaking, sweating and on the verge of crying. This voice was so incredibly clear and real that I can tell you with absolute certainty she was in her mid-twenties and that it originated from five to five and a half feet off the floor. Also, in all honesty, it didn't feel like what she said was directed at me. I couldn't tell you why, but it really seemed to me like she was answering someone else's question about me. Or perhaps it wasn't about me at all. Once I got my courage back, I tried as hard as I possibly could to recreate what I heard. I thought that my bed had just made a noise, that my brain had somehow recognised its female human speech. But I couldn't for the life of me get my bed to make a noise that sounded even remotely similar to it, let alone even close to as loud as she spoke. I've had sleep paralysis many times. This was not it. Like I said, I was 100% awake. Also, I didn't think about it at first, but the side of the room the voice came from is the same side of the room that I thought I may have seen that slight shadowy head figure the night before. I'm still in shock. I'm not sure if I'm crazy or what. But all I know for sure is that I've never had anything like that happen in my life before. If you've ever experienced something like this, I'd love to hear about it. I want to know what that I'm not going insane. Also, my mom gave me a voice recorder. I don't know how long it can record at a time, but I might just see if I can have it recorded as I sleep all night. Two weeks ago, my little dog Max died. He was diagnosed with an illness a few months ago with an uncertain prognosis, but I could tell the end was coming. My best friend was going to pick me up at 9am on Friday morning and I was going to have him put him to sleep as his illness was progressing and his quality of life had declined severely. However, the night before we were going to take him, he passed in his sleep, which I thought was a blessing. He was in his bed right beside me. Me and my two best friends had a nice little funeral service in my backyard that evening where we buried him and told silly stories about our little buddy. The whole thing was bittersweet. We shed a lot of tears, but we also had champagne and talked about this little sassy, yappy self. Two nights after Max's death, me and my young daughter were in the kitchen playing pretend lemonade stand. She was standing, and I was sitting on the floor. When I pushed up off the floor and twisted around to get up, I saw a 3D, grey, almost opaque, but just so slightly transparent version of Max. He walked from behind the kitchen island and walked right up to the kitchen door that leads to the back porch and just kind of slowly faded through it. There were no defining features such as nose, eyes or mouth, but the body shape, head shape, ear shape and gait were a complete giveaway that it was Max. He's been mine for 11 years, so I know his body and his walk as good as my own. I was pretty jarred, but wrote it off quickly, as my grieving brain playing tricks on me. 
until my three-year-old looked up at me and said, Mama, was that Black Shadow Max? How did he go through the door? I was gobsmacked. If I'd seen him myself, I wouldn't have given him much thought. But the fact that my toddler saw him too makes me think that my brain was not playing tricks on me. It still feels so weird about it. My toddler thinks it was the coolest thing ever and won't stop talking about it. Although now she's confused because I reiterated to her a dozen times that Max was not coming back after we buried him. Now she keeps saying I lied to her. When my little sister was two to six, she had two imaginary friends, Madden and Jacob. She was two when she started talking about them in serious detail non-stop. She told us their hair colour, their skin colour, what they liked to wear. We had no idea where she got the name Madden from. It seemed kind of random. She talked to them more than she talked to anyone in the family. She talked to them all the time, until one day she just stopped. She started first grade, made some visible friends, and never mentioned Madden or Jacob again. We chalked it up to childhood imagination. Well, over 20 years later, I have a daughter. She began talking at one, and by 18 months was talking like a pro. One day, I was watching her jump on the bed. She was two. As I was standing there, she looked at me and said, Mama, go downstairs. We won't fall off. So I said, Who won't fall? The five little monkeys. And she nonchalantly said, No, me, Jacob and Madden. I was floored, but I immediately called my mom and sister to see if they had mentioned Madden or Jacob recently. They both replied by saying that they forgot all about them, and we were also weirded out. I asked my daughter where she heard the names Madden and Jacob, and she simply said, they told me. Everyone I've told this is like, oh, I'm sure one of you mentioned it to them. And she was really little and forgot about it, but I know we didn't. As I said, we had all forgotten about my sister's imaginary friends until my kid said she was jumping with them. She's only mentioned them twice since then, and it's been months since she last did. A couple of years ago, my family and I had just gotten home mid-morning from a road trip vacation. Everyone went to their rooms to get some sleep, since we'd been travelling all night without rest. I wasn't too tired, so I just went to my room. Sitting on my bed, I had a direct view of my window that only had curtains, and that day, I had drawn my curtains open, because it was a quiet and calm early afternoon blue sky that looked really nice. My window was about six and a half feet tall from the ground, outside. Now from my window, I can see my backyard, which is enclosed. We have a tall fence enclosing it, and all the gates are locked. It's hard to climb up for an adult, let alone a kid. That's why what I saw next, I know didn't come from outside or another neighbour's home. I'm reading on my bed when I glance up at the window, and there I see him. A young boy was staring at me through the window. I didn't even know how to react. Did we leave the gates unlocked or something? I just stare back at him, dumbfounded. He stared back at me with a very silent and childlike gaze. Then I realised that I could see him from the chest up, but he wasn't holding onto anything, or seemingly holding onto anything as his hands looked at to be at his side. Recall that the bottom side of the window from the outside is around seven feet tall. I felt uncomfortable, wondering how in the world he was able to get up that high. Thinking I was hallucinating or something, I dove off my bed to get a rational explanation. I felt a little off-put, but not exactly scared. Approaching the window, I kept eye contact and noticed his eyes were so similar to the blue sky. And I don't even know why, but that's the only feature I can remember now. Kind of cliche, that the only colour of his eyes was the thing I remembered, but that was it, besides him being a young boy. Then when I was a foot close to the window... He just vanished into thin air in the blink of an eye. It was shocking to say the least, but looking out the window, there was nothing he could stand on and nowhere he could have ran to without me seeing him. I felt really uneasy and left the room afterwards and eventually fell asleep in the living room, away from the windows. I have no idea what it was I saw. Looking back on it now, I'm still very sure that I did see it, 
because I can remember exactly how I felt and how the events took place. When I remember it, I don't feel fear. Rather, in its place, is a sense of calmness. We were going on a hike. There's this spooky abandoned train tunnel in my state where a bunch of people died a hundred years ago. So now it's allegedly haunted. Brought one friend with me on the hike since it was a long one. The area and scenery were beautiful, but the tunnel itself was something else. My buddy, let's just call him Ed, was a bit more nervous than me and didn't want to go too far in. I wanted to go as far as I could, which turned out not to be far because the tunnel was blocked by impassable debris. But wait, there was a small hole on the side of the debris mound and it turns out I could crawl through. So I asked, hey Ed, you feel like crawling? Nah, dude, no thanks. So I took off my pack and coat and squirmed through. On the other side was the rest of the tunnel, but with water that went up to nearly the top of the mound on the other side, as far as the eye can see. Dang. I would have to swim in ice-cold, nasty water for who knows how long to keep exploring. Nah. So I decided to crawl back. My buddy Ed was nervous, but we weren't done yet. Next, we busted out just one tool for detecting ghosts, EMF reader. As someone who was pretty scientific, I tested it multiple times and made sure it was working before bringing it. We decided to try and contact ghosts in the tunnel. I was pretty confident nothing would happen. We turned off all our electronics and lights so it was pitch black with just the EMF reader on. I asked pretty basic questions to the ghost. Asked it to come in front of my scanner so I'd know it was there, etc. We did this for a while. Nada. No reading, no surprise. So we headed back. Decided to keep my EMF reader on. And then as we were walking back, suddenly it goes to two lights. Thought maybe our flashlights were causing it, so we turned them off. Nope, still two lights. Reset the device. Two solid lights. I think something's here, dude. My adrenaline started flowing into my body now, yet I was still sceptical. I started asking questions again, and then my EMF signal got even stronger, and we both were getting chills, and the hairs on our skin were standing up. Around this time, we heard something. Kind of sounded like a distant cough, but it was so fast it was easy to dismiss. I reset the device again, still getting a strong signal from something, and it's not coming for us. I then said... Is it alright if we stay in the tunnel with you a bit longer? Mita instantly went back to zero. Surprised but confident, now I asked, do you want us to leave? Then it instantly went back up high. Okay, I was pretty convinced at this point. We headed for the entrance to the tunnel and discussed our experience. However, when we were at the entrance, we noticed that the EMF was picking up another signal, just above and to the side of us now. But if you pointed it in a different direction, there was nothing. We left after that, but we think the ghost may have been hanging out by the entrance, waiting for us to leave. You could always say that the EMF was faulty, or picking up something else, but I'm sure that device was working. I tested it so many times before and after, and there was nothing on us producing EMF. Also, considering that we didn't get any reading in there for the vast majority of the time we were there. Truly mind-boggling still processing it. I've always been lonely. Maintaining relationships felt like a chore. Trying to force a smile and pantomime along with the usual script. So one day, I decided I'd make my own friend, Casper. I always envied little kids who have their imaginary friends and decided to get my own in my mid-teens. I didn't make up a lot about Casper. I always imagined a lonely boy, quiet and good-natured, there to listen, invisible to the world. It was absurd and humiliating that I made up an imaginary friend, so I'd mostly joke around about him when I was with others. But when I was alone, I'd drop to my knees and pour out my heart to an empty room, telling him my problems, my hopes and dreams, how much I hated myself as a person. That summer, I had headed down to the deep south, 
the lower border of Mississippi and Louisiana. I go down there for a change of scenery and give myself a mental health vacation. But things were bad when I got down there. I never stayed at one house for more than a day and learned to keep everything I needed in my backpack. I was tossed around from house to house, my backpack and I staying together as I was ping-ponging around. One weekend, I stayed at my cousin's house. We were only two days apart in age and shared many of the same interests. We spent the night running around with fake katanas and watching anime. My cousin has a terrible fear of the concept of other entities. So as we laid in bed together, getting ready to turn off the light, I told her that there's nothing to worry about. My best friend Casper was here. He might seem a little creepy, but he's fiercely loyal to those he loves and protects us from any harm. I pointed right next to the bed and smiled, saying, Good night, Casper. Turned out the light, and that was it. The next day, we got up early, and we were going to meet up with my cousin's co-workers to go to a haunted historical site, Myrtle Mansion, in Louisiana. All packed and ready to leave, I took one long look at my backpack and decided to leave it behind. It had everything I owned and I loved it, but it would be just unnecessary weight. So I dropped it on my cousin's bed, right on the foot of the bed. Both of us remember me putting it there. We head out, meeting our group at the restaurants they all worked at, a few miles into town. We all headed to the back, started and hopped into their truck. Sitting in the back, I feel something at my feet and look down to see a backpack, but it looked just like mine. I slowly reached down and unzipped it. It was my backpack. I had never been in this truck in my life. I didn't even know my name, much less where I was staying. My cousin and I both confirmed I left my backpack in the house, in her bedroom. Yet somehow, a £20 backpack magically appeared. I was shook. My imaginary world had just bled into the real world. I stared at that backpack for the whole two-hour car ride. When we arrived, I questioned everybody. They knew nothing. Not even that I had a bag in the first place. I looked at my cousin and then around me as the tourists bustled around us. Then I got a text. A text from an old friend who I hadn't talked to for a while who was Wicker. Randomly out of the blue, at that exact moment, they text me, asking me how I was doing. I looked up and out loud thanked Casper before going into the restaurant to enjoy my day, hugging my backpack. I'm looking for some answers to what happened to me when I was around 12 or 13 years old. I'm 23 now, and these events still loom over me. So at the time, I was living in Virginia with my parents and two step-siblings. We had recently moved into a newly built townhouse development. Our townhouse had three floors in total. The upstairs area is where the bedrooms were located, the living room and the kitchen were on the main floor, and the basement was my sister's bedroom. At the time, I was becoming increasingly interested in the paranormal. I would watch all sorts of ghost shows on television. Eventually, I learned what a Ouija board was. I wanted one, but I knew I wouldn't have the means to buy a real one myself. And I knew my parents would not approve, so I opted to make my own. I created a template on a piece of cardboard, carefully replicating what a real one would look like. For the planchette... I used a plastic square shaped lid that was the perfect size. I heard that it wasn't safe to use it by myself and I didn't have any friends in the area at the time. So I asked my sister if she would try it with me. She was reluctant at first, but after some convincing, she was game. Her uncle had recently passed away a few months prior, so we decided to try and contact him. We set the board up in the basement with a picture of her uncle next to us. We both lightly put our fingers on the makeshift planchette and I began to ask questions like, Uncle, are you here with us tonight? To our surprise, it didn't take long to get a response. The planchette moved to yes with force. At first I assumed that my sister was messing with me, but soon I would be proved wrong because she started crying very hard. After a few more questions with responses, my sister informed me that she wanted to stop. I don't remember what else we asked because it was so long ago, 
but I do remember that the planchette would move with haste after every question we asked. We ended by informing her uncle that we were leaving and moving the piece to goodbye. Afterwards, it took some time for my sister to calm down, and I was pretty blown away myself. Strange things started happening to me almost immediately after. After we had finished using the board, we both went upstairs to calm down and watch TV. 30 minutes later, I heard a bang come from the basement. I went downstairs to investigate and found that the planchette had moved from goodbye to no, and a picture on the wall had fallen down. This disturbed me, so afterwards I opted to tear up the board and throw it away. After I did this, I assumed that was the end of it, and for my sister it was but I didn't know that this was the beginning of months of pure terror for me. I don't know why, but whatever this thing was attached to me. My sister didn't have any odd occurrences afterwards. Meanwhile, I started noticing strange things happening. It started small at first. I noticed our family dog would all of a sudden refuse to come into my bedroom. I would pick him up and take him into my room anyways, and when he was in there, he would act very strange. His ears would stick straight up, and his eyes would fixate on a certain corner in my room. He would whine and bark, and occasionally his head would dart around like he was watching something move around. Then, I was sitting in my room another day on my own. I was watching TV and laughing at the show I was watching. My school binders were sitting all the way at the foot of my bed, and I was sitting at the head of the bed a good distance away. One of my binders slid all the way across my bed, hitting me in the arm. This freaked me out, and I informed my parents, but they told me that I was just imagining things. Weird things like this kept happening to me. One time, I walked into the kitchen during the day by myself, and a sponge that was sitting on the dining room table suddenly flew across the room with force. I continued to experience things like this, and they started becoming more frequent. I talked to my sister about it, and she told me that nothing odd was happening for her. I was a mess at the time. I did not want to go home, and would often try to go to a friend's house after school instead, which most of the time didn't work out. I talked to my parents again, and figured they thought I was making it up for attention again. After a little bit of going through it, I had the most terrifying night of my life. This event still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. It traumatised me, and although I've worked past it for the most part, I still try not to think about it. I've only told a few people in my life about this because it sounds like a straight up lie. This night was the climax of my experiences. After this happened, the activity completely stopped. One night, I was laying in my bed. It was two or three in the morning, and I couldn't sleep, so I was just laying there. My whole family was asleep and the house was completely dark. I slept with my door open at the time, and the only light source was a blue light emanating from my radio in my room. It was just bright enough to illuminate my room. I had my blanket over my head, covering half of my face, but I could still see my room from waist height down to the floor. To my horror, as I laid there with my eyes open, a black figure entered my field of vision near the foot of my bed. It was right next to my bed, there was no colour on whatever it was. It was a pure, pitch black with no obvious features. I was paralysed with fear. I couldn't scream or move. I just laid there as I watched this thing slowly move down my bed until it stopped right in front of my face. I then felt a hand placed on my head through the blanket that was over me. The hand rested there for a second and then began moving in a circular motion for a few seconds. Eventually, the hand lifted, and I watched the dark figure slowly move away and then out of the room. This was the last thing that ever happened. After that, it just completely stopped as fast as it started. The whole ordeal has had a huge impact on my life. This is the first time I'm sharing this story online. I haven't tried until now because I didn't want to type it out and relive it. But now I'm more curious as to what the fuck happened to me and what that thing was. I think that I should also add that aside from anxiety and depression issues, I am mentally sound. I've never experienced hallucinations or delusions, and I know that what happened to me was real.
This really happened. Take my word for it. If you wish. If not, that's fine too. As far back as I can remember, I've always enjoyed learning about history, including military history. As an early teen, my dad got me a copy of Time Life's The Civil War Gettysburg. I looked through it and read it constantly. I was particularly drawn to a photo of a deceased soldier pictured at Devil's Den. I'll never forget it. Fast forward about 20 years. My wife and I decided to finally visit Gettysburg on Halloween for our wedding anniversary. My first stop had to be Devil's Den. The Gettysburg Military Park has tons of one-way little roads. The road towards Devil's Den had a few. We missed a turn or something and we got lost. It was approaching evening but not dark. It was overcast with a little drizzle, and my wife and I were hungry, so we decided to come back tomorrow. Driving back into town, I pulled up to a deserted road that was also a four-way stop. This is where I saw it. Sitting at the stop sign, I automatically looked to make sure if it was clear to drive off. As I was about to pull away, I saw something to my left that was probably close enough to reach out and touch. There, floating midair about torso height, was what looked like a cotton button shirt that I believe was dark grey. It was torn to pieces and fluttering violently as though hurricane winds were blowing. I don't remember sounds or smells. There was no blood and I don't recall seeing any body parts, just this shirt. My brain didn't, or couldn't, register what it was seeing. I looked at this apparition for about ten seconds, then drove off. A moment after that, I turned to my wife without saying a word. She was smiling at me and asked, Did you see it? Every word of this is true, and the event happened. There's no mistaking what my wife and I saw for anything other than what it was. Every night when I settle in for bed, Almost without fail, it feels like someone else comes and lays down next to me. At first it feels like a cat jumps up like they do when they want to join up a cuddle pile. Thing is, I do not own a cat. A short while later, I feel the bed shift like it would when a significant other comes to bed themselves. This is long before I fall asleep or even get close to it. I usually watch an episode or two of something to settle my mind before sleeping. This usually happens within the first few minutes, once I'm settled in. There's no strange feelings or cold chills, nor the pressure in the chest that comes with sleep paralysis. I'm trying to remain a sceptic about this, but I swear I can feel the bed shifting with the weight of someone who isn't there. Once, I swear, I got bopped on the face by something. I've tried Google, but all I got were more people asking about this, so I know I'm not the only one. Is there a name for this phenomenon? Is it a normal part of sleep? It's far from disruptive in my life, but it's piqued my interest in a very Fox Mulder sort of way. It might also be worth noting that I work the night shift, so I end up sleeping most often during the day. It doesn't matter what hour I go down to lay down to sleep. It always happens. The very first time I ever saw these things, I was around six or seven years old. My family was camping at some lake in Oklahoma, and I saw two strange figures. I was standing outside our camper, alone, and I saw a ghostly white figure running into the woods, chased by a tall, thin, black figure. I froze and called for my dad, who went into the woods where I saw these, but he saw no footprints or anything. I moved to Aurora property in 2015, and it's definitely my home. It's my home. In January of 2016, aged 11, I was standing outside and just kind of staring out of the trees on the property. For a solid three seconds, I made eye contact with this abnormally tall, emaciated, pitch black humanoid. It was hanging upside down by its knees from a tree branch, its long arms touching the ground. If I had to guess, I'd say it was around 7 to 10 feet tall. I felt a deep sense of dread and ran inside to tell my father. When we came back out a few seconds later, it was gone. 
I hadn't started seeing them again until recently, starting in September. On September 28th, my boyfriend, brother and I were down the road from my house, trying to catch fish at a bridge. I got bored and uncomfy because there were gnats, so I started walking up the road back to my house. I was about halfway there when I saw the figure standing in the centre of the road. I froze. It froze. And we stood there for about a minute or two. It was around nine feet tall and its hands nearly touched the ground. I ran back down to the bridge and waited to walk back home with my brother and my boyfriend. I didn't speak for a solid two hours. Two days ago, I was closing the blinds to a window my cat enjoys perching at and one was straight outside the window. It had its face inches from the glass and it opened its mouth. I don't know why this one had a mouth, but in its mouth was a big bulging eye. I freaked out and curled up in my bed. Today, I saw it peeking around a corner in my living room. I'm terrified. Does anyone know anything about this? I live in Pennsylvania, and there's a creepy house called Ramers Hollow, where a murder took place in 1928. One afternoon, I was hanging out with two of my friends, and we pretty much weren't doing anything. So I mentioned checking out that house, and they'd never heard about it. So once they heard the backstory about it, they were down to visit it. When we got there, it was pretty light out still. We looked around and imagined where everything took place, and just talked about the history of it. If you're from Pennsylvania and know this place, you know they have had security over the years, so we were being respectful and just admiring the property. Once we decided to leave, my friend backed out and went the wrong way. He ended up coming to a dead end and had to back up into someone's driveway. I was in the back seat and had my head looking out the back window to make sure he was all good. And out of nowhere, I saw this woman, long black hair, piercing black eyes and a white dress staring at me and keeping eye contact in the doorway of this house. I turned around, freaking out. With tears in my eyes, I looked back and there was no one there. I had to look away for only two seconds. My friend who was backing up told me he didn't see anything. My other friend was looking down at his phone, so he clearly didn't see anything. I somehow was the only one who witnessed her. I've never felt fear like that before. The way she was looking at me will never leave my mind. I don't know if I just saw a creepy woman or I saw something paranormal. Whatever it was still haunts me to this day, after years. So back in 2017, we bought a Ouija board. I was 11 years old at the time and was obsessed with the paranormal but my mother was always sceptical with that stuff. She wasn't pure Christian, but she does believe in God and evil spirits. So f I finally convinced her to buy the Ouija board. The one we bought was actually just a piece of cloth with a Ouija board design on it. I didn't really want to buy it at first because I was afraid it wouldn't work the way a normal one would. But my mom bought it anyway, saying it would work like a normal one. So months passed and we never used it. It just hung up in my room, but I did have a weird experience after we bought it. So it was about a couple of months after we bought it, and I woke up at 5am. Even though it was dark out, I got up anyway and turned on the TV. I was just sitting in the living room watching the show Adventure Time, when I suddenly saw something out of the corner of my eye. I saw a black shadow darting from the living room where I was and into the hallway that led to my mother's room and my room where my little sister was sleeping, who was in the second grade at the time. When I turned around, of course there was nothing there. I brushed this off as my eyes playing tricks on me, but after what happened next though, I don't think that was the case. Again, let's fast forward a couple of months later. Me and my sister just got home from school, when our mom told us some shocking things. She told us she was experiencing some bizarre things. Things like her thumb going numb randomly for no reason at all, the radio and TV malfunctioning, and our pet birds acting completely nuts, like there was something else in the apartment. 
I was shocked by this news, but also excited at the same time, because I got to experience paranormal activity for the first time. But things escalated that night. Later that night, my sister was too afraid to sleep in our room, because she swore she saw a figure in there that resembled a slender man. I was pretty sceptical, because even though I believed in ghosts, I didn't believe in a slender man, but I was still scared anyway. Later, my mom told me that she and my sister were going outside to take our dog named Sophie on a walk. I was scared to stay, but I stayed anyway and tried to take my mind off any spirits that might be in our house. All was well, but then my walkie-talkie that was sitting right next to me suddenly turned on and scared me half to death. The voice coming from the walkie-talkie was male, but because of the terrible audio quality, I couldn't understand him. I ran out of the apartment and down to my mum and sister and told them what happened. My mum said it could have just been railroad workers because there was a railroad right next to our apartment and sometimes they would be up there working. But this was in the middle of the night and there weren't any workers but my mum was still sceptical. But when we got back to our apartment the TV was frozen and the screen was glitched. I woke up that night at 2am and decided to go sleep in my mom's room. My sister was already in there because she woke up before me and that's when we heard the sounds. That night, me, my sister and my mom heard the sounds of footsteps in the hallway, movie cases falling off our shelf in the living room and pots and pans in the kitchen. It couldn't have been our pets because our cat and our dog were in the room with us and our birds were sleeping in their cage. It wasn't a person, because our apartment door automatically locks when closed, and can't be opened without our key, which was with us. And the only other way in was through our windows, where you would have to climb up a four-storey building to get to. Another thing we heard that night were my walkie-talkies, which turned on again with that same male voice speaking through. After that night, some things went back to normal, others didn't. One thing was I had to sleep in my mom's room for the rest of the time we lived there, because any time I slept in my room, I would always wake up at 2am and couldn't fall asleep for the rest of the night. And my little sister kept claiming she saw shadow figures, even after we moved into a new house, she would still see them. It wasn't until early 2019 when she stopped seeing them. I'm now 14, in 8th grade, going into 9th grade, and my sister is now 11 and going into sixth grade. My mom threw away the Ouija board after that and says she's never buying one again. Okay, so just for context, my boyfriend had been living in our old place for about 10 years and I moved in and lived there for about five. I always felt a presence in the house, but over time, whatever it was, targeted me over my boyfriend. If he's someone asking me shit over my headphones, when I'd ask my boyfriend what he was talking about, he would have no idea what I was talking about. I used to have a lot of sleep paralysis in our bedroom, and there was one night I was petrified in the bedroom. So much so that I moved to the living room to sleep because of that. The spare room had some weird energy. We had a camera set up in there while we were kittens for, sitting for a mate. Anyway, back to the camera. My boyfriend said once that he thought he'd seen static-like figures walking across the screen in the spare room. So there was things like that. It all came to a head when we started packing to move to another property. During the final two or three days before we left, I started having the sleep paralysis again, which had rarely happened since I left our bedroom for the couch. Once again, I was being sexually assaulted and violently choked. I was pushed and scratched. The cat started staring and hissing at random empty spots. Tempers were flaring. The final night, we had mostly gotten all the big stuff out and really only had some leftover bits and pieces to do. We were both starving, so we decided to order a pizza, and while we were waiting, my boyfriend had a shower. During that time, I heard a fucking loud moan. 
Now the house was pretty much empty, so the sound reverberated off the walls. I thought maybe it was my boyfriend in the shower, so when he came out, I made him try and replicate the moan in the shower, with water running to try and debunk it. He did, and that was not the sound I heard. I asked him to make a moaning sound in the lounge or kitchen area, and he did. It wasn't the same moan I heard, but it captured the exact pitch. So that weirded me out. A couple of hours later, we were making a final trip to the van before shutting the door for the night, and we both heard some, like, canned laughter, and some kind of talking from a TV show in the distance. It's 3am by this stage, and I guarantee no one was watching anything that early and loudly in the morning. And as soon as it started... It stopped once we moved away from the house. I had to run back in one final time, and it started and stopped again. So this has been going on since as long as I can remember. I've always seen shadow people creeping around corners, behind people, close and far, Sometimes that would make me feel absolutely terrified to the bone, and sometimes I felt perfectly safe. We used to be a really religious family, and I remember learning about angels and demons at church, and how everyone had a guardian angel. I rationalised the shadow people as this. One would pop up and stand in the doorway, and another would pop behind, in front or next to it. So I would assume my guardian angel was protecting me from some demon, Fast forward now and only gets more frequent. They're clear as day and I can stare at them for up to 30 seconds before they leave. They will be on one side of my counter and when I look at them, they duck down and hide. Same thing behind the couch and doorways. Sometimes it's only a head and sometimes it's the whole body and all different sizes. They watch me and I've always felt like I'm being watched. I have a friend who said he's never experienced anything like this before he met me. I once randomly asked if he'd ever seen anything at my house, and he said yes. He told me when I would go to the shower, something would dash after me from my room into the hallway where the shower was. He said after seeing this stuff, he started noticing at his house. After telling one of my older sisters, she admitted she's always seen stuff like this. But the last time she was at my house, she seen something crouching almost, and it was behind her. So she went to look behind her, and it got up and ran. But it looked at her, and had these horrifying pure white eyes. She's never seen them with eyes, so she refuses to come to my house, and sages every time someone comes and leaves the house. I've had things thrown in the direction of me, including broken glass. I don't know if it's related, but my other sister has been having these dreams about this woman wanting to take her baby while she was only one to three months old. It's actually how she found out she was having a daughter. I had a dream a few months ago, horribly vivid, and I don't get nightmares really, but I can recount the absolute dread I felt when the thing came in the house after my sister let it in. My sister was blank-faced, and it was directly behind her with her face over her shoulder. She wanted my niece and nephew, and I wouldn't let her take them. She wouldn't touch me or them, but she got my sister to grab them, and when I went to grab them back from my sister, she immediately dropped her grip on them like she had no power. I told my sister later on, and described her and my sister, said she'd been dreaming of this exact woman for the past 12 years. Is it bad that I see shadow people? Could the two separate things be connected? What should I do? I'm a 26 year old student, going to university, studying veterinary medicine. We're struggling financially, and when COVID-19 hit my country, I decided that I needed to find a job. Got a job in a nursing home. I do the night shift, from 8pm till 8am. When I first started, I didn't notice anything strange, but as time went by, I'm feeling more and more uneasy. The first thing I noticed was the hand dryers in the common bathrooms, going off for no reason. 
Only for a few seconds, I thought, okay, that's weird, but oh well. The next thing that happened directly to me was really terrifying. I was downstairs and the hand dryer from downstairs is the most active one. So I was there alone and had my phone in my jacket pocket. Was walking around going to the coffee machine and all of a sudden my phone got yanked from my pocket and smashed against the floor. I picked it up and noped out of there like, fuck this shit. The screen broke. Also, once in a while, one of the emergency bells goes off and we panic because it's a really loud ring and different from the ones in the rooms and it usually means that someone is in trouble in the bathroom. So we rush there all the time and there is no one in the bathroom. One night, I was dozing to sleep for a while and I opened my eyes and saw a dark male figure sitting in the room across from me, just watching me. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me and closed my eyes and fell asleep. This happened last night. The most terrifying so far. I was feeling tired, so I went to the room next to the nurse's office. There were some long chairs there, so I thought I was going to lay down for a little bit. When I got there, I felt uneasy, like someone was watching me. But I thought, hey, stop being crazy. It's all in your head. I dozed to sleep. A very light sleep. Then like 20 minutes in, I woke up to the chair shaking uncontrollably. I got up and fell. Thought it was an earthquake. Ran to the other room where my colleagues were and asked, did you fucking feel the earth shaking? And they were confused and said, no, you were probably dreaming and laughed it off. But I know what I felt and it terrifies me. About a year ago, I would come off at work sometime around 1 or 2 in the morning, and I didn't notice at first, but when I did, I couldn't find any way to explain it, so I've come here for answers. As I merged into the freeway off my work, the first overpass I approached had what seemed to be a beam of light shining on the bridge. Now this by itself is nothing to be wary of, could be a pedestrian with a flashlight or a car's headlights. What got me sceptical was how it behaved once I approached. It would disappear. You know those moments in your life when you see or hear something you can't quite explain? But it only happens one time, so you delete it from your memory. This was different. This was consistent. Once I noticed, it was hard not to see this happen every single night. Just a mysterious looking light flashing away once I and only I, drove under it. I looked into some research to see what this could possibly be, and every time I offered an explanation, I was shut down. A car or person's lights? It was far too narrow, straight and bright to be a light like that. Train or tram passing by real fast? The overpass was just a regular four-lane bridge. Scientific experiment? There was no consistent time. This was happening in the early morning hours. That was the only consistency. Triggering a pressure plate. There were other cars on the road. Why would just mine cause the light to vanish? Car light reflection on the rail as I passed by. Like I said, there were other cars on the freeway and the nature of the light source couldn't possibly be caused by a car's headlights. As I exhausted all my solutions, I came to the conclusion that it must be a hallucination. It was a new schedule for me. I usually sleep early, but now my body is still going at two in the morning. So it must be that I'm fatigued to the point that I'm imagining things. Till I got video proof, and I showed it to my sisters just to see if I wasn't hallucinating the video too. I swear these haven't been messed with. I can't wrap my head around it. I don't understand what happened there. For the record, I only worked there for a couple of months and left March 2019. I've got no clue what this could be anymore. I don't believe in the paranormal, but this might be the one time I make an exception. What is this? This occurred while my grandmother was in a home hospice for dementia. 
This was sometime between losing her ability to walk and not understanding conversation. To put into some perspective, my grandmother was in a room towards the back of the house, while my bedroom is closer to the front. The kitchen is towards the front of the house as well. So there is decent space between my grandmother's room, my bedroom and the kitchen. I was laying in bed one night hearing a deep breathing. I have a dog and I thought that maybe he was snoring or having difficulties breathing, but it wasn't coming from where he was, which was in my grandmother's room. I return, lights are turned off and I hear that breathing again. I hold my breath and the breathing continues. That's it. It freaked me out enough to turn the lights on, say a full rosary and have a really uneasy sleep. The next morning, I whispered to my mum what happened in the kitchen. I don't remember her reaction, other than telling me I needed to tell it to go away. I go with my mum to my grandmother's room to help bathe and feed her. At some point, she apologises to me. She said that her father just wanted to look at me and he didn't mean to scare me. That's it. Really minor visitation. Towards the end of my grandmother's life, there were more visits from her relatives and friends. There were sometimes shadows and you would get a feeling of not being alone. It never felt scary beyond that first surprise. I think when she died, her father took her away. First of all, my stepmother is Wiccan and regularly practice witchcraft. When I was younger, she would often practice her craft in the basement and cast spells on me and other family members. This was one of those times. We were in a hotel in St. Louis, Missouri for a family vacation. After a long day of swimming and other outdoor activities, we turned into the hotel for the night. My little sister and I were in one bed, my older brother in the recliner, and my father and stepmother in the other bed. Just as we were getting into bed, my stepmother got up and then left the room, saying she was checking on something. When she returned, she had a far too familiar look on her face, and we knew she had done some sort of ritual while out of the room. She always got a sort of wild look when she did witchcraft, but to be fair, she often did drugs while practising as well, so that may have been it. So, we all settled into bed, without much of a word. Now, my little sister always insisted on bringing a nightlight whenever we stayed in a hotel. As you could imagine, for having a literal witch of a mother, she wasn't a big fan of the dark. I was laying in bed listening to everybody else snore away, when I noticed some movement on the ceiling. This is where things get paranormal. Despite the nightlight, there was a shadow splayed across the ceiling. It was a humanoid figure, but my body told me it was definitely inhuman. The shadow feet sprouted from the top of the door, with legs and a body protruding into the room, culminating in a head a few feet from the bed. It was completely motionless, and almost seemed to be made of smoke, as its image shifted slightly as I looked in horror. My fear only grew as I realised that despite the impossibility, the shadow had two eye holes, and I could tell it was looking straight at me. I began to shiver in fear, wanting to scream but afraid to do so. Then I heard shuffling across the room. My older brother, evidently uncomfortable in his sleeping arrangement, had gotten up to use the restroom. As he walked across the room, the nightlight now cast his shadow across the ceiling as well. As he walked, his head's shadow got closer to the other shadow's own head, and when they finally met, the shadow instantly snaked across the ceiling, almost like it was melting, back to the door and out of the room. My brother, too busy trying not to trip on his way to the bathroom, took no notice of me or the shadow. He did his business and then returned to his chair. Too scared to sleep, I laid staring at the ceiling for what seemed like hours until at some point I passed out, only waking up after being shaken awake by my father. I spent the rest of the day watching over my back and staying out of the shadows. That night shook me to my absolute core. To this day, 
I'm very wary of shadows in the dark and tend to stay away from basements because of my stepmother. I feel even more sorry for my little sister who had to live with her for many more years. For years, I've worked at a small grocery store in the American Midwest as an overnight stocker and weekend manager. The business has been family owned for generations and my family has been intertwined with them since the beginning. The owners became close friends with my family and would often go to gatherings and such to visit. The owner at the time, the father of the current owner, was a kind man who spent most of his 30-ish years of ownership at the store, working 10 to 12 hours a day. He was sort of a grandfather figure to me and many others, and when he passed in 2010, we were all heartbroken. A few years after the owner, who I will refer to as Bob, passed away, I finally got a job working at the store. Since my family was close to the owners, I quickly moved up the ranks to overnight worker and eventually to weekend manager. Over the years, me and other employees noticed certain odd things happening in the early morning hours, between 3am and 5am usually. Things would inexplicably fall from shelves, automatic doors would open for nobody, and the motion-activated lottery machines would go off, even though nobody was there. After a while, we suspected some sort of paranormal activity and reported it to the current owner. He simply said, that must be Bob. Most of the time these occurrences were harmless, likely because Bob didn't want any harm to come to the store his family had owned and operated for generations. He also never revealed himself to a customer, not that we have ever had reported at least. I had never had any direct encounter, only seen on cameras or heard from co-workers, until, that is, the night of the balloon. As an overnight stocker, I would work from shortly before closing to shortly before opening the next morning, usually 10 till 6. This meant that the only people in the store for most of the shift were me and my two co-workers. It just so happened on this night that the grocery truck was rather small, so we got all of the grocery stock up by 3am and just had the dairy products left. My co-workers, not obligated to stay for anything other than the grocery stock, promptly left. By 3.30, I was completely alone. As I filled the shelves with cheese, milk and various other dairy products, my mind began to wander. Suddenly, a face appeared in my mind, clear as though I'd seen it that day. It was the face of Bob, wearing the big smile he always had, even after a long day. I became a little sad thinking about him, so I decided to take a quick break and get a drink. I finished the box I had and made my way to the end of the aisle. As I rounded the corner, I stopped dead in my tracks as an icy cold spot hit my chest. I looked around and laid eyes on a balloon, floating at chest height a few feet away. Written on the balloon were two words, thank you, in big letters. I was completely frozen, stuck to the spot. The balloon had no business being on this side of the store. I was in the opposite corner of the building. No draft would have carried it there. After a minute or so, I unglued myself from the floor and carefully walked around the balloon, towards the back room. I went to the back office to check the cameras and ensure the balloon did in fact exist, only to find it slowly floating down the dairy aisle. Okay, Bob, I said with a slight grin. I'll get it finished before I go. With that, I returned to the aisle, the balloon floating a few feet away, and worked for another hour or so to finish. Once I was done, I grabbed the balloon, carried it back to our floral department, and deflated it. I laid it flat on the desk, and left a note for the worker who would open it in the morning. One of Bob's granddaughters. From Bob. My grandfather was a man who smoked more than any man I've ever seen. Cigarettes, cigars, home rolled, 
It didn't matter. He smoked it all. He was never really into chewing tobacco or patches, and he heavily favoured cigars over anything else. There was a particular brand he would smoke. I don't recall exactly what it was, but he would carry them around with him in a specially carved metal case and would smoke them almost all day. He worked a stressful job in the government for most of his working years, which is where he obtained his habit. And after he retired, it stuck around until the day he died. I was very little when he passed away, less than 10 years old, but I can still remember the smell of those cigars he would smoke. Not that I liked the smell. In fact, I hate smoking, but it was such a distinct scent that it only ever meant one thing. Grandpa is here. Even years after he died, my grandmother especially would claim to have visits with Grandpa, saying that they would sit and chat for hours. I always assumed this was just her way of dealing with the grief, imagining that he was still there and having a long conversation with him. She would always complain about the smell of cigars he left after he disappeared again, saying it would hang in the air for hours. It wasn't long before other family members began to have similar experiences. First my mother, then my stepfather, then my uncle. The story was always the same. They would be alone in the house or the car, and suddenly the smell of those cigars would fill the room, blocking out every other scent. It would get cold, even in the summer, and my mom even said she could hear him coughing as though he were in the walls or above the ceiling. She told me that one day he would come pay me a visit too, and I would know by the smell that followed him even beyond the grave. It wasn't long before she was proven right. My family and I took a road trip down Route 66 to Las Vegas, where we would be staying for the week. I was 16 at the time and hadn't heard anything more about my grandfather for some time. I thought perhaps he had finished whatever business he had on earth and had finally passed on, but it turned out I was wrong. We were in New Mexico, a little more than three days into our drive. It was a blisteringly hot day, over a hundred degrees and not a cloud in sight. It was just me, my mother and my stepfather in the car, a small blue sedan. There were hardly any other cars on the road, and the endless desert stretched as far as the eye could see, in every direction. Suddenly, my mother gasped as we all smelled that oh-so-familiar smell. We have a visitor, my mother said calmly. The smell wafted through the air for a few miles, filling my entire consciousness. My head filled with thoughts of my grandfather, and I began to feel an icy cold breeze, even despite the horrendous weather. After a while, the smell dissipated, and the climate returned to the obscene hotness it was. This marked the only time to date I've been visited by my grandfather, but other family members have reported him multiple times afterwards, even as recently as this year. I was working at Starbucks and was about 15 minutes into my shift. I remember being in a really great mood and right before leaving for work, my husband and our roommates were heading out the door to walk to a gas station a block away. While I'm making drinks, I hear the store phone ring across the room and I immediately look over to my co-worker and she answers it because I know it's for me. I also remember knowing that something was wrong. Right after answering the call, my co-worker looked up and locked eyes with me since I was already staring right at her, which was creepy. So in the moment, I just smiled to calm her down, but I don't think it helped when I said, it's for me. Someone stepped in for me and I came over quickly. It was my roommate. And the first thing he said was something along the lines of, first, I need you to stay calm. I said, I'm calm. What happened? Because since I had already known something was wrong before I answered, I didn't have any rush of panic. I also somehow didn't feel scared of what it was going to be. Like I already knew it was something that would pass. Anyway, he explained that while crossing the street, a huge pickup truck had run the light and hit both of them while trying to turn on the red light. 
My roommate was a big guy, so he immediately caught the driver's attention and only stumbled before the driver hit the brakes. My significantly smaller husband was thrown to the ground and badly injured from the impact. He said they were already in an ambulance and by then, he was still hurting, but was joking around with the paramedics and was optimistic about everything. They insisted he was alright and didn't need me there, which again I somehow knew before they even told me. I thanked him for the call and told my husband I loved him and joked with him a little, then got back to work. Of course, I proceeded to tell my co-workers what happened, still casual and smiling. And they of course freaked out, and the supervisor asked if I wanted to leave to go to him. But I wasn't worried or stressed or anything, and said I was fine to stay, and just treated it like a crazy start to the day. I'm positive it probably came off like a setup for getting the day off, until I rejected the offer. Especially with how obvious it was that I knew the call was for me. Anyway, he's basically fine now after some long physical therapy and goes for walks to the same gas station. I don't mind this kind of foresight if it's going to keep me from another anxiety attack. I went to the Grand Canyon Hotel in Williams, Arizona as a rest stop before heading to the Grand Canyon via the Grand Canyon Railway the following morning. We chose the hotel because it was cheap, and it was also said to be the oldest hotel in Arizona. At first sight, it was a beautiful hotel. The lobby was decorated with historical memorabilia and foreign currencies gifted by previous customers. After check-in, the front desk told us to check out the rooms and see which one we wanted to use. As we walked up the stairs, we were greeted by an old picture of an old lady. Judging from it, it looked like something from the late 19th or early 20th century. We were checking out the different rooms when my friend told me she felt like something tapped her on the shoulder. I joked around saying it was a ghost. Normally, I'm a paranoid mess, but on this night I just wanted to rest after driving all the way from LA and super excited for the next day. I chose a room next to a hallway. If you search for the hotel on Expedia or some other travel site, it's the room with the sailor uniform in it. At midnight, I went to bed. Didn't have any paranoid thoughts. Went to bed peacefully. Then at around one in the morning, I hear footsteps. I hear footsteps outside my room. Thinking it's the neighbouring guests, I try to go back to sleep. Then the footsteps reappear, this time in my room. I'm terrified at this point, so I open my eyes and sit upon the bed. Silence. So, I go back to sleep. I should also mention that the bed that I was sleeping on was an extremely soft bed. If you sat down on the left side of the bed, I would completely roll over to your side. So, I was sleeping once more and the footsteps came back. Again, in my room. Except this time, it sounded like it was running around. Terrified, I keep my eyes closed. My arms start to go up and down on the bed. There's something walking on my bed. After hesitating, I open my eyes. Right in front of my eyes were two extremely pale butt cheeks. My head is between my legs. They were small. It was obviously a child's ass. Couldn't tell which gender the body belonged to, but it was very much a child's pale blue ass. Then I close my eyes once more, heart beating faster than it's ever been. Then I open my eyes. It's gone. After a few minutes of silence, I reach for my phone and watch some of the office to cheer me up and go to bed around six in the morning. I talk to the front desk in the morning and they said there's no reports of ghosts in the hotel. If any of you have visited the hotel and have been visited by something or someone, please let me know. That was my very first haunting and I want to know more about the child that visited me in the middle of the night. I was always sceptical of the paranormal. Now, I'm a firm believer.
I stayed in this hotel, and yes, we had a strange experience. I'm from Australia, and the person I was with is originally from New York. We were on a very loosely planned last minute road trip. Just enjoying each other's company and the open road, seeing the sights and stopping overnight wherever we needed to. We had arrived at the end of the day, having driven from Vegas. No real plans to stop at Williams, no reason to. Not even sure why we did. It was just a blip on the map. This was 2011. My suggestion was always to look to the centre of a town to find somewhere historical or significant to stay. We arrived around early dinner time. We went in and the place seemed deserted. We stood chatting in the lobby, looking at historical photos and the paraphernalia. A couple emerged from behind the desk and showed us upstairs. The hallways had all these old sepia photos of people that kind of bulged out of the frame. I must admit, it was mildly creepy, but only for a moment, as the adventurous feeling of finding the nostalgic place overrode the creepiness. There were different rooms. The nautical-themed ones seemed the nicest, but I wanted a street window room. We ended up in the honeymoon room, or something like that. It also had a nice ensuite. The room had an old wedding dress hanging on the wall next to the bed, and yes, that was creepy. The woman told us that it was inside a chest that they found in the desert. My friend and I glanced at each other when she said that and raised our eyebrows, but again, I didn't think too much about it. After booking in, we walked up the street to a rock and roll hot rod style diner and had a meal. Upon returning, my friend said she didn't like the old dress hanging on the wall, so I carefully hung it in the cupboard that was between the ensuite and the door to the room. It was a bit off-putting, and the first thing your eyes went to in the room. There were also a pair of long, white, debutante-type gloves hanging over a little shelf on the other side of the bed, up above the radiator. The warm air from the radiator below made the fingers move. We knew the gloves were moving due to the heat from the radiator, so it was more funny than creepy. We went to sleep, and then around 3am, I was woken by creaking floorboards near the door. The sort of thing where I would normally just check into the sound in my mind, listen for a minute without opening my eyes, and go back to sleep. The floors were creaky, so I thought it was just other guests that had booked in. Then I realised the creaking and shuffling sounded more like it was inside the room, not out in the hall. I could feel my friend in the bed next to me, so it wasn't her going to the bathroom. I opened my eyes and lifted my head to see if someone else was in the room. I didn't see anything. It was weird. I lay there listening, but I drifted off, relegating the sound to being an old building and me being half asleep. Then, about an hour or so later... It woke me again. This time, the creaking sound like actual footsteps walking across the room towards the bedside. It sort of repeated a couple of times as I was waking up. No mistaking it. I lay there still for a moment, gathering my thoughts, thinking there's someone in the room, and I need to take action. My friend had obviously woken too, and nudged me as if to say, Did you hear that? I quickly sprang up and peered around the room. There was nothing, but it definitely sounded like someone had walked across the room and stood next to the bed, then went back towards the door, then back to the bed again. Coincidentally, the path of the steps was from over near the door, next to the cupboard with the wedding dress, across to the side of the bed where the wedding dress had been hanging. It was very clear, and almost like you could feel someone standing next to the bed. I switched on the lights and checked the door, went to the toilet while I was up and kind of walked around the room, in an effort to make my friend feel safe and show her that everything is okay. I basically stayed awake for the next hour and a half, maybe dozing slightly, then getting up at some time around six. Having dozed a little more deeply for a little while, once the morning light made the room feel a little less ominous. We mentioned it to the people the next morning as we checked out, and they just looked at us blankly, not really engaging in the subject. They weren't rude, just awkward. 
We then went and had breakfast in a snowboarder cafe back up the road near the diner and recounted the events, both agreeing that something unexplainable had happened. Not sure if the wedding dress really had anything to do with it or not, but it was definitely hard to explain away as nothing, and we both felt it wasn't random old building noises. So yes, there is something weird about the place. When I was little, three to five years old, I had this big football that hung on the wall with hooks on it for backpacks and jackets, etc. My earliest dream memory was a repeat dream of looking down the hall and seeing this figure just standing in front of that football. It never noticed me, but I noticed it. Next, we moved to another city in the second grade to an old house. Week one, sleep paralysis. Definitely something holding me down to the bed. Couldn't even scream for my parents. This is actually my first telling anyone about that. When I was about 10 to 12 years old, my grandmother passed away. And no joke, this woman hated me. Couldn't stand her much either. But a few months later after she passed, she came to me in a dream. She was black and white while the dream was in colour and looked very, very dead. Black eyes, tattered clothes, only thing, she had this glittery rainbow ambience. She looked at me, told me she was okay with it and picked up a dog and I woke up. Next day, her asshole dog we ended up adopting vanished. Poof, gone. Month or so after that, my GPA announced he was getting remarried. While night before the wedding, sitting around the table, playing 750 with dice, late at night, he asked my dad, his son, if he thought Mama would be okay with him remarrying, and I just chipped in with no thought, saying yes. She said she's happy with it. Didn't realise I had spoken till the words were already out. My time in the Navy, as an early adult, I kept having these dreams of people with no face, and all of them gave me this feeling that I knew them, some recurring. And when I'd wake up, I'd have this urge to go and find them, like you lost your brother or sister, and your mama makes you go find them, gut feeling. I always felt bad because, to me, they were real and seemed to need help. But they had no face and left me with no clues. So I would always be on the lookout for the feelings of those people. You know, like you can feel when someone is mad, happy, sad. But this was just their presence. Eight years Navy, similar dreams. I got out in 2012. And then demons started showing up. Had a dream that was split screen for all you gamers out there. And my grandpa, mom's dad, was on the right. And this black massive thing with body, arms and smoke for legs was on the left. Big head with three red eyes in a triangle pattern like it was showing me something. Now he has severe dementia and is probably not going to be around much longer. 2017, I had this dream that an actual demon had crawled out of me and was climbing the walls and destroying my house and it was mad, evil, angry. I mean, wanting to rip my body to pieces. And it's shown up a couple more times, just showing me things. Horrible, terrifying things with my wife, me and daughters. Deaths, burning, torture. Too much for a dad to watch two or three times a month. Now... As of two days ago, this dream went too far. I sometimes sleep on the couch. My daughters, three and four, sometimes come in and hog the bed and snuggle mama. I say fuck it and go crash on my big couch. Well, this night, I had this dream of a tall, skinny, dark shadow thing holding me down and beating the ever-living dog shit out of me, choking me, scratching me, and it was also pissed. I felt all the hate and rage. When I woke up, I was trapped in an inhale of breath and couldn't move or let it out. Had this feeling that it was actually in the room still. I could feel it, smell it, it was there. So I got up, went outside and smoked half a joint. Mind you, this is about 2 or 3 a.m. And crashed thinking it was a nightmare. It had come back, but this time was torturing my family. And I kept hearing the name Tom over and over. It was diabolical in its laughter as I watched my family being tortured. 
Then it came back to me, and I woke up in fear. Now, two days later, my wife sat me down asking for a divorce, just out of the blue, out of nowhere. I think I've had about it with all this dream nonsense, and would like for it to stop. It's now 1.30am Texas time, and here I am, a 35-year-old grown-ass Navy veteran, terrified to go to sleep. Am I bonkers? Or is this stuff actually happening? Now to this day, I still cannot explain what happened last night. So it was about 11 o'clock and I was winding down for the night. I did my normal nightly routine, which included using the restroom and leaving a light on in the bathroom. Important later. I do this so I can see better when going to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. So I climbed into bed and prepared to go to sleep. Not even three minutes into me laying down with my eyes closed, I hear very clearly the voice of a woman whisper in my ear. I am here. At that point, I shot up out of bed, but before I could do anything else, I heard footsteps walking up to my door and stopped right outside of it. Now this could have been a random noise, but what was worse is that I could see the shadow of two feet standing just on the other side of my door due to the light coming from the bathroom. At this point, I could barely move from the seated position I was in on my bed. After about five minutes, I decided to turn on my TV so I had some background noise. As the TV was powering on though, I started to hear the sound of someone breathing coming from under my bed. And I know it wasn't just me, because I could hear it even when I held my breath. So at this point, I was in absolute terror and could barely move from my bed. And I stayed that way for about another two or so hours. I don't remember why exactly, but at some point, I needed to get out of the bed and grab something. But I still occasionally heard breathing from under the bed. I felt better getting up knowing that I had a knife on my bedstand and could defend myself if needed. So I got out of bed and decided to look underneath. I grabbed a flashlight and my knife and then looked, and to my shock, there was nothing. This cleared up a little bit of terror that I was feeling, but there were still feet on the other side of my door. So I built up the courage and opened the door, and yet again, there was nothing there. Even after clearing this up, I still didn't sleep at all that night. To this day, I still cannot fathom what happened on that night. I don't know how to explain it, or if there is any explanation. If any of you guys have any thoughts on what it could have been, could you please let me know? This happened about a month ago, and I haven't had any other experiences near this since. When I was 19, I spent the night at my boyfriend Jay's house. His parents were on vacation, so we decided to sleep in their room. We watched some TV, and then Jay got up to switch off the TV. As I rolled over, I caught him staring at me with the weirdest look. I asked him what was wrong, and he said it was nothing, and we went to bed. I woke up around 3am to a little ghost girl standing next to the bed. She had short black hair and was grey, kind of like a black and white movie. I freaked out and started screaming and shaking Jay to wake up, and she disappeared. When I turned back around, the little girl had reappeared, now with a flower. I still continued to scream, and she disappeared again. Jay finally woke up and asked what I saw, and I told him I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. The next morning, Jay asked me again what I saw, and I told him I wanted to wait until we left that house to talk about it. He looked me dead in the face and said, Did you see a little girl with short black hair? I froze and asked him, How did you know? I had never told him what I saw. Jay said when he turned off the TV the night before, he saw a little girl in the reflection of the TV. He didn't want to say anything since he knew how terrified of ghosts I was, but when I started screaming, he knew what I saw. We told his parents what happened the next day and asked if they ever saw anything and they hadn't. I know the ghost was friendly, but still terrifying. First paranormal experience happened in fall 2011 at Ball Cemetery. 
about 20 miles outside of Omaha, Nebraska. This was the first time I'd gone to the cemetery, but I'd heard all about its lore from the friend I was with. Was at IHOP with my friend, about 12.30 or 1am. He'd brought up Ball and the experiences he and others had there several times before. All scary stories like being scratched, bruised and shoved. He said one girl we both knew had her eyes go completely black. May have mentioned a voice telling them to get out. I'd always been intrigued by the paranormal, but healthily sceptical. Didn't really believe or not believe him. We're at IHOP. He brings up Paul, asks, asks if I want to go. I say sure. We finish our meal and head there. The road there could not be more theatrically scary. It's pretty far out in the middle of nowhere, and you just have to know where you're going. You have to turn your headlights off when you turn onto the road leading there. Whoever the caretaker of this place was, understandably, not fond of people screwing around out there, and they apparently had a shotgun they weren't shy about firing off, and a large dog that roamed around the property. There's no trespassing signs everywhere. It's a one-way-in, one-way-out type of setup. You come to a fork in the road and curve left into a woodsy patch. The trees make this patch of road feel like a tunnel. You emerge from the tree tunnel and you're there and it's terrifying. The road is a gravel loop. The way you come in is the way you get out. The cemetery itself has a gate. It was hanging open this night, but sometimes it's chained shut. My friend parks and I don't want to get out of the car. We bitch back and forth at each other a bit. I say I'm scared. He gets fed up with me and says... I've got a gun. I'll shoot the ghost and demands I get out of the car. We went into the cemetery. It's very dark, but not so dark you can't see. Silhouettes of trees and headstones are clearly visible. I grab my friend's hand and will not let go. I'm going into the situation freaked out because one, don't want to get caught. And two, a lot of what haunts this place is apparently not friendly. My friend knows his way around. So I'm holding his hand and following him. We're in the middle of the cemetery and suddenly it gets really dark. Spongebob advanced darkness, not normal dark. I stopped walking because I couldn't see anything. We're just standing there. I moved my free hand around in front of my face to see if I could see it. I couldn't. No silhouettes or anything, just pitch black. Figured my eyes were adjusting or something. Regular dark fades back in, silhouettes are visible again, and off in the trees, in the opposite direction of where the house on the property would be, I saw two circle-shaped lights. One orange orb and one blue orb. They were just moving along smoothly and silently out in the trees, weaving around. They didn't look like flashlights, but my rational brain thought maybe they are, until they started doing this. They would never disappear but they'd be in one spot and then be in a completely different spot. They'd just be in one place and then be in another, all while never actually disappearing from sight. They'd be closer, then farther away, all while never disappearing. There was no noise. It was so quiet. If it had been somebody out there, I think they would have been making some sort of audible noise. Talking, footsteps, moving around through branches and debris, etc., He did this for a while, then just disappeared. Shortly after that, we heard a dog start barking and left quickly. When I was seven, I had my first paranormal experience. I lived in Germany at the time. I was in my room and I saw a figure that my memory has now blacked out. I was filled with a fear that was so indescribable. I fell to the floor and tried to scream, but nothing came out. I was terrified. When I was 12, I started hearing footsteps and seeing shadows. I watched a lot of paranormal content and was generally fascinated with the other side. So one could say it was a trick of the mind. When I was 13, my mental health started going down rapidly. I had a new puppy And one night, he would just stare at something and fill with that same fear I once felt at seven. 
it started to scare me and honestly piss me off because whatever it was, was scaring my baby. Anytime I tried to touch him after these experiences, he would jump, terrified of everything around him. I had to stop wearing black PJs and using black blankets because he would jump at the colour black at night. He was fine during the day for the most part. It's safe to say, sleeping was very hard after this. In eighth grade, a lot happened to me to cause my mental health to worsen. Overall, I became the perfect target for a dark entity. I started sensing something everywhere I went, feeling taps and hearing my name being called. I did my best to ignore it, as I knew giving it attention would only make it worse. I was home alone all day. My mom worked and attended school, so she got home around 11pm. I would start seeing two different shadow figures watching me sleep. Because I was scared, I turned the hallway light on before I went to be, then closed the door. I could see small feet shadows at the bottom of the door and a larger shadow at the top. My mom's closet always scared me. I slept in her room at this time. I would see a shadow figure watching me, so I started opening the bathroom door to block the closet. Unfortunately, the door didn't block the whole closet and I would see the figure peering over the door at me. I would just roll over to the other side and convince myself I wasn't scared, trying not to feed the spirit what it wanted. Unfortunately, it wasn't my fear it was feeding on. It was my depression. When I was 14, I moved again. I could tell the spirits followed me. I still felt the taps and heard my name being called, but I was used to it Is at this, at this point. My depression was at one of its worst points. I had no friends as I moved right before COVID happened. I could see shadows going up and down the halls and more things not worth talking about. One night, I was alone because my dog was scared of my room. I started to get a feeling that I wasn't alone. And I felt my leg get pulled. I froze before I pulled my leg back. I was frozen in fear. I would have left my room and slept somewhere else, but I don't feel safe anywhere. It would just follow me. I started screaming at it to leave me alone, to leave my dog alone, telling whatever it was that it wasn't welcome here. After I started doing that, it would get better and then worse, and I'd have to do it again. I would also draw protection symbols on myself. Right before my 16th birthday, I went to a psych ward. I got the help I needed and became overall so much happier. I kept telling the entity it wasn't welcome, and eventually, as I got happier, it all stopped. I'm turning 17 in a few days, and I've been safe ever since. I don't feel taps or hear voices. I truly believe that not being depressed has no reason to stick around, since I stopped being scared of it altogether around 15 and a half. My life has been so much better ever since then, and I'm truly grateful that I was able to protect myself on my own. I know this isn't the best storytelling, but I hope it made sense, because this was very real for me, and I still think about it to this day. What I just experienced is going to be hard for me to overlook. I'm not trying to be rational anymore. You guys win. Ghosts are real. Twice now, I've had a weird experience in the same place. My grandma's attic. Once a couple of years ago, and just five minutes ago the second time. Let me start with the prequel. To give you an idea, my grandma has a house and the attic is basically like a second floor over the whole house. It's filled with all sorts of things we dump up there that we don't need. Tools, firewood, old toys from childhood, etc. Also up there is a short chair and coffee table. When I take them out of the attic to the balcony, it's my favourite place to smoke in the house. I like the view and the wind. Sometimes I'm too lazy to bring them out and just smoke in the attic, looking around at all the junk. One day, I was going to go up there, when as soon as I stepped foot on the first stair, I got a fight or flight response for seemingly no reason. It was the middle of the day. I've been in the attic a thousand times. I'm not scared of it. 
I'm not a kid. But for some reason, I was getting chills and my heart was beating fast. As soon as I went up to the last step, I stopped and looked around the attic. I had nothing to be afraid of, but it's just instinct. I couldn't go into the attic without checking it out first. I spent like 30 seconds just looking into the attic in silence before the courage came back to me to walk forward. While walking towards the table for some reason, I had the thought, what are the demons watching me right now? And that's why I have a bad feeling. I instantly laughed it off and thought to myself, let him show himself. I'll show him who's boss. And as soon as I finished that thought, I heard a loud shuffle, like someone's footsteps dragged out on the ground. I instantly froze midway and just looked in the direction where that came from. I spent at least a minute just looking, frozen, expecting a big ass rat or something to pop out from somewhere over there. When I finally got my courage back again, as soon as I was about to continue to the table and finally do what I came for, another loud noise froze me. This time, a distorted piano played. I kid you not. The most demonic, out-of-tune chord you can imagine. Like a sound a horror movie producer would put on a jump scare. On cue, I of course immediately dashed towards the stairs and noped the fuck out of there. I went downstairs, entered the room my family was in, and tried my best to pretend I wasn't just running from a demon. My mother heard the piano. She thought I found my childhood toys and was fooling around with them. I went with that story and told her that, surprisingly, the batteries were still holding out. They must be good. I wasn't about to tell my family. I seriously thought there's a demon in the attic. After I spent a couple of minutes downstairs, regaining my composure, I started to think about things rationally again. I felt ashamed that I got scared of nothing. I'm an adult, damn it. I picked up my small balls and went up there again determined to find that piano and ease my mind forever. Went up, immediately walked up to the place where the sound came from and picked up off the wall a big garbage bag filled with toys from my childhood. I started taking things out and found it, a cheap Chinese dinghy toy piano. Tried pressing the keys, no sound. Flipped it around, opened the battery compartment and had a brain fart when I saw there were no batteries in that thing. Took it down with me, found some batteries and put them in. Tried playing it. Still no sound. Unfortunately, I failed to ease my mind. So over the next couple of weeks, I spent quite some time thinking of that incident. As time went on, I started rationalising it more and more. Thinking that maybe pianos like that make their final sound when their circuit board finally dies. Kind of like parting words. Maybe the shuffle I heard was from my own feet, but because of the fear, it sounded like it was someone else's. The only thing that I couldn't make sense of was how that piano that's been in that garbage bag for 15 years found energy without batteries to make a sound of its speakers, and a loud one at that. In the end, as time went on, I brushed it off, told myself I'm no engineer, I don't know how currents work and shit, There could be some weird way that what happened was normal and it was just a coincidence. I went to the attic countless times after that and nothing ever happened. No weird sounds, no unexplained paranoia, just peace and quiet, as it should be. Well, right until today. Recently, we've been doing construction work on the house every weekend. I go up to the attic 20 times a day to fetch something or have a smoke break. We finished the work and went to bed. Now, before you accuse me of being a sceptic rationaliser, I tried to keep an open mind. Recently, I've been getting into trying out astral projection. It's a nice little meditation. I haven't succeeded yet, but the effects are quite trippy, and it's fun. So I'm laying in bed, browsing the AP subreddit, before I decide I'm going to go up there to smoke one last cigarette before I go to sleep. The front door is loud, and I don't smoke in the house. So in the attic I go. In the same exact way, as soon as I set foot on the first stair, I get this immense feeling of something amiss. Now, some years have passed since the last time this happened, and naturally, 
My small balls have grown at least a little bit, so I didn't stop this time. Just went up and sat on my smoke table. I lit my cigarette, remembered the last time this happened, and the piano. Like any sane person, I started a monologue in my head to banish the potential ghosts. My monologue continued until my cigarette went out. Here's a recreation. I don't know if there's demons up here or whatnot, but you can't spook my ass. I can't touch you right now, but I'm learning this technique that lets me come into your house. Trust me, tonight I'm coming and killing your dumbass as revenge for when you scared me, etc. That was your last chance to try and scare me away. Try me, bitch. And I put my cigarette out, quite amused by my little monologue. And here we go again. As soon as I finished my monologue and said, try me, a loud sound as something on my left dragged across the floor. This time, I caught it with my peripheral as I turned around. A sack filled with dry sticks for the fireplace was moving across the floor, defying the laws of physics. Gravity can't do that, can't make it move that distance, especially when there's so much friction that it made a loud sound. I shot up and stayed fixated on the sack, convinced not to let a rat, for example, run away without me seeing it. It didn't move for a couple of seconds, so I went up to it, took all the sticks out, checked every corner of that thing. No rats inside. I put the sticks back in and said out loud, don't touch that again. I said my piece already, and I meant it. If there really was an evil entity up there, I'm going to banish it. Although at that point, I was starting to feel like I'm bluffing. I walked up to the stairs, but before I went down, I stopped and looked back at the attic. Although my knees were weak, my arms were heavy, I vomited on my sweater already, I wasn't going to give in to my fear, so I stared into the void for a couple of seconds to establish my dominance. And again, as if a reply, the sack lightly got dragged, though this time just a little bit, for a split second. I spent a couple more seconds looking at it and then slowly went down the stairs with a confident walk, shaking a little. Originally, I was going to go to bed, but adrenaline got a little high, so now I'm sitting on the toilet, writing this, maybe with a ghost proofreading over my shoulder. Sorry to make this so long. I tried my best to write it in an entertaining manner. This seemingly uneventful experience I found just too powerful. I don't think I can ever rationalise this. It's just too many things on top of each other. The strong fight or flight I get before the event. The timing that makes us feel like a reply. The hard to explain sound and movement. I'd appreciate some guesses as to what could have happened. I'm now a believer and can't over rationalise things by myself anymore. I don't know if this spirit could be good or bad. So I don't take any extra measures right now. So please don't reply with, throw salt on it, or anything like that. Unless I wake up with a cigarette burn on my cheek and come asking for help with how to banish a demon. My husband and I live in a ranch-style home. The woman that previously owned the house with her husband was killed in a car crash. We lived here for a couple of years with nothing. Then I started noticing an unexplainable perfume smell in one of our guest rooms. I chalked it up to an old spill or such, but the room has been completely remodelled and the smell comes and goes. My mother was placed in that room during her hospice in fall of 2018 and my father-in-law was also there for his hospice in spring of 2019. Both passed in that room. My mother was ready to be with her Lord and Saviour, while my father-in-law fought death and was so very scared until the end. Since we continue to have the perfume smell, which can now be smelled in both guest rooms. I have seen a smallish figure walk across the hall from the bedroom to the bathroom. We have seen multiple shadow figures, etc. A couple days ago, I was home alone and walked next door to take our neighbour's dinner, then grabbed the mail from the box. 
As I came in the door, I was sorting the mail and made it to the counter and set the mail down before I realised I heard someone talking from down the hall. As soon as I registered it and I looked up, the talking stopped. Due to past trauma, I'm an extremely vigilant person, but I didn't realise until a couple hours later that I never checked the house for an intruder. Totally not like me at all. It was like I normalised the voice and didn't feel threatened. As a side note, all the windows were closed and no tech was playing. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. Thanks in advance. I honestly can say I know exactly the feeling people get when they have to walk through a section of a building you never really felt comfortable walking through, as if all eyes turn to you, even though alone, and no matter the time of day, and how the feeling never subsides no matter how many times you walk through it. That was truly creepy, but I never felt that anywhere at the new house. Anyway, this one minor experience brought more questions and really no answers as to what I saw. It was about our third day moving from a couple towns away to our new home. We are just four in our family, although we had my uncle and aunt over, helping, as being nine years old, I just wanted to play. My aunt and uncle were with my mother out in the front yard, my brother near me standing pretty much in the doorway next to me. Just another ordinary day at the house, about to grab more, until I remember I looked down the hallway, and weirdly, I saw someone peek their head around the corner of what would be my parents' room. I was oddly curious, as the way they were peeking was like you do when you hide behind a corner of a wall, and just peer your head enough to see, like hide and seek. I looked at the face, but oddly, you could not make out any noticeable features. Just seemed blurry, but obviously someone's face peeking around next to the closet. As a kid, you aren't really aware of what can and can't be possible at certain times. For instance, even all these years later, the distance of the hallway, I for sure would have been able to make out at least some semblance as to who it was. The face, as featureless as it was, I thought at the time, was my father just having fun. Now, it was so long ago, I can't remember if I went to check or not, as I do not recall myself walking down the hallway. I only looked again when they disappeared and asked my brother, wait, who was doing that? He was busy looking elsewhere, as he gave no notice and simply responded, what was what? I told him, I think I saw dad hiding. He didn't even care as he continued talking to me and said something that hinted everyone was outside. I said, yeah, right. I just saw dad in the room. He's hiding from us. He kind of laughed if I was joking. I weirdly had no desire to check as if it was my father. I figured he's hiding something he doesn't want us to know. He did own a handgun. Then, just as I ignored my father, I heard my aunt and mother coming, followed by my uncle, then my father. I knew at nine it would have been impossible for my dad to do that peek and make it to the back door, visible from where I was and nowhere near the closet area. It was a weird feeling to come to the conclusion that who I saw was not anyone from my family. It's been a good house to us and never had any bad feelings or vibes. The only other thing I can think of is our home from which we were moving from had a death in it. The previous tenant had passed away in my parents' bedroom, but they never told us, understandably, until we moved out of that house. My mother had mentioned once in the past, our older home, as she was blow-drying her hair after she put me in the crib to sleep. She came out to the horror of finding me literally inches from the end of the bed. I was months old at the time, so I have no recollection, of course, but my mother said it scared her greatly, as I was still asleep. I didn't fuss, cry, or make any noise, as I somehow got out of the crib, either. My mother took it more as a sign to watch us closer, I guess. If the older tenant was still there and meant harm, we didn't feel it. My mother just watched my brother and I much closer. He's only 18 months older, so it couldn't have been him moving me. The only reason I bring this up 
is perhaps the older lady was making sure we were okay in our new home. My dad couldn't. How would he have gotten out without being seen if he was by the closet? As you would need to walk back in sight of the hallway to use the back sliding door. And the other back door was closer to my brother and I at the time. Not to mention, from the time, I saw the face to when I saw my father. Couldn't have been more than 45 to 60 seconds. One event in my life I still question to this day. I know what I saw, but who it was, I have no idea. The only reason it stands out as paranormal to me is the face features, or lack thereof. I should have been able to make out something at that distance, 25 feet, for it to be as blurry as it was with great eyesight is near impossible in my mind. No weird house history, to my knowledge either. Anyone else had something similar happen? Back in September, I saw two different spirits in my boyfriend's house, but I only told him about one, and now I think the other is messing with his family because they weren't prepared for it. The first one I saw was almost certainly an angel. It was a tall, faceless, paper-white figure with a pair of huge wings that wrapped around its body, and I saw it standing at the top of the staircase like it was watching over everyone. It was vivid, and I stared at it for a pretty long while, but then I blinked and it was gone. I told my boyfriend about it, and he was happy to hear it. The second was about a week later, and was just as, if not more vivid, but much more threatening. It was a shadowy figure that looked like the black silhouette of a ballerina standing on point, almost completely featureless. Except it had glowing red eyes. It was standing near where I'd seen the angel, but slightly further down the hall, outside of one of my boyfriend's sister's rooms. It gave off a horribly angry energy, and in a weird way, it gave off the impression that it was judging me, based on my femininity, or lack thereof. Like it was disgusted with me for being less womanly than it would like. Same as with the angel, I looked at it for a while, but it was gone when I blinked. I wanted to tell my boyfriend, but whenever I tell him about previous negative supernatural experiences, or even make jokes about anything other than good spirits, it makes him really uncomfortable. And having seen the angel just a few days prior, I figured his family was protected, so I didn't bring it up. But two nights ago, I found out that his older sister has been having nightmares and sleep paralysis for weeks now. And seeing a dark figure outside of her room, the same place I saw the ballerina. I don't know for certain that it's the same figure I saw. I haven't asked for details. But given where she's been seeing it, and the fact that the spirit was definitely associating itself with femininity, and his sister is the one being targeted, it feels like more than a coincidence. I thought that of all people, she'd be safest, because she's a more classically feminine girl at least compared to me. But now that I think about it, that's probably exactly why it's going after her in the first place. My boyfriend says he's going to do a cleansing of the house soon, so I'm sure she'll be fine. But I can't help but feel like if I told him about it sooner, then it could have been dealt with before his sister was affected. So this was a few years ago, but I thought I'd share because to this day, it's one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. Basically, a few years ago, my sister lived in this house share. It was a huge house, three stories with five bedrooms and two bathrooms. At the time, my sister was the only one living there, so all the other rooms were vacant. My sister's bedroom was on the ground floor, next to the kitchen. One night, I was staying there with her. She'd gone to bed a couple hours ago, and I was suffering from insomnia at the time. So I was in the kitchen, talking on the phone with a friend. It was about 3am. While I was on the phone, I got this horrible, overwhelming feeling of being watched. It was like something, not someone, was in the room with me, and whatever it was, did not want me there. 
I tried to ignore it and continue my conversation for a few minutes, but it got to a point where I straight up just did not feel safe in that room. So I told my friend I was going to bed and hung up the phone. I went into my sister's room and she'd always told me to lock the door behind me, even when there was nobody else in the house. It was a standard lock that just had to be turned. So I did, and then I grabbed my blanket and lay on the floor to sleep. I'd only been laying there for a minute or two when I heard the sound of the lock clicking and the door creaking open, and suddenly that feeling of dread was back. It took me a minute, but I finally built up the courage to turn around and check and the door was wide open. While I was staring at the door, I couldn't see anything, but I could literally feel this thing watching me, so I just froze. I finally managed to reach my hand out to shake my sister awake, and she had to get up and close the locked door, because I physically couldn't move out of fear. So the year was 2011. It's July, I'm 17, and going into my senior year. So of course, I and my friends feel invincible. At this time in my life, I'm religious, and my brother, who we will call Sam, was not. I decided I would prove to him that there is something out there, and go to any length besides a Ouija board to show him. This led us on a ghost hunt all through Pennsylvania, where we live. Now, in Pennsylvania, it is all fields and woods outside of the main cities. We all were from the woods, so walking through them at night looking for these things was never a creepy ordeal. Until the day we found what we were looking for. It was a summer night, as I said. July, so decently warm. Sam and I were back out looking for whatever we could find locally, which was nothing. So as we were waiting, my friend, who we will also call Steve, showed up. We didn't see him often, so when we told him we are doing, he said, well, my friend, about 45 minutes from here, told me there's a house out by his. Now this man is way, way out in the woods, so this house that he's talking about is, too. We asked him why he thinks this house is haunted. John told us he said that when he was a child, or early teen, he entered this house with a friend, and as they walked through the living room, the rocking chair turned, faced them, then started rocking. They had never gone back since. Of course, we were in. By this time, another friend who joined us, who we will call Hiroki. So Sam, Steve, Hiroki and I went up to Steve's friend's house. We knocked at around 10.30pm on a Saturday night. He was confused as to why we were all here so late, and once we told him, was hesitant to show us and go with. At this point, I'm scared. We had not been to a place like this one yet. With a backstory from a person and not from some online form like this. The layout of the house for this story is very important. Looking from the road to the front of the house, the home is built into the hill behind it. So you can enter the upstairs by going up the driveway or the front door by just walking over to it at the same ground level. So we walk around what we can of it due to the overgrown thorns and trees. We then walk up the driveway and enter the upper floor. The first room is a sunroom full of dead leaves from the years prior, I'm sure. Broken windows and a wooden stand that came up to about waist level. I'm 5'10", so just picture it if that helps. After leaving that room, you then met with a stairway that leads downstairs. Or a hallway with a bathroom to the left of it. And at the end of the hallway are three bedrooms. The left one is completely empty. Middle one, again, is empty, besides another stand. And the third room? The third room has two bunk beds, with beds still made, and the curtains coming off the windows to the bed frame, and wrapped around it, but in a decorative way. So now I'm really freaked the fuck out. This house has a shithole in the middle of nowhere, abandoned, old, and worn down. Why is this room so neat? As we're leaving this room, there's a thud from it but we keep moving and head downstairs, mainly to not be trapped where we were. Going down the stairs, you end up in a living room. To the left is the kitchen, and to the right is the front door. The kitchen has a basement entrance and an outside sort of stormway entrance to the store firewood and such in. We look through everything, 
Nothing is happening, but my heart is in my throat. As we all conjure back in the kitchen, there's a thud again, now in the kitchen. We all freeze, staring blankly, pointing at least three of our spotlights into the kitchen and just waiting. Now walnuts, ceiling tiles and shower curtain rings that were all on the kitchen floor literally start flying off of the ground and into the walls in random directions. I instantly turned and jumped out a window leading to the front porch, absolutely petrified. Ran onto the road about 30 feet from the porch and waited for my friends. After this, I was done. Not a single part of me ever wanted to go back into this place, but I did. I did many, many, many times and it only got worse. This night I entered the house four times. Upon going in the second time, We went on the front door. Shortly after entering the house and sitting in the living room, a shoe, old worn down dress shoe, comes flying down the stairs like an MLB pitcher through it from the top. We all jumped up and shined our lights up the stairs. Now remember that stand in the sunroom? Yeah, that stand came out of the sunroom and slammed into the wall upstairs so hard it broke through the drywall. And again, we ran. Now part three is where shit starts to get way worse. It's also the only moments I recorded. This part and the fourth time entering. So if you want to see this, I will upload this section of it. Anyways, we go back in and look up the stairs. There is the wooden stand. From behind the stand, a ceiling towel broke off the ceiling and flew down at us. Shortly after, the stand gets ripped back into the sunroom and we run. Steve is the last one out, directly behind me. We were the last two out of the house this time, and on the way out, we heard an insanely high-pitched scream, best way I can describe it. And as it happened, a big piece of glass smashed next to Steve on his way out. The fourth and final time we entered this night fucks with me till this day. As I'm typing it, my hair is standing up. Long story short, we end up in the kitchen. I'm so scared, I'm refusing to move. I stayed directly in the middle with my spotlight so I could have a 360 view and run whatever way is opposite of whatever the thing is. All within maybe 15 seconds, the storm door opens up so hard, the top hinge breaks. The only light bulb left in the kitchen breaks, basement door then closes. Then, the part that will haunt forever me, more than any other thing in this home, A glass mason jar that was to the right of me on the ground floats up into the air, over towards me at about elbow level, smashes off of my foot, and then the same scream, blood-curdling, crazy high-pitched scream happens again. I scream, and at this point, it's every man for himself, because we all heard it this time. When I got out of the house, I kept running until I got back to the car. Upon getting to my car, I realised, holy shit. My right ear is ringing like I just fired a rifle without earplugs, but my left isn't. The jar smashed off my right foot and came from my right side. Was this thing literally next to me? That close? That was enough for me. I got home that night absolutely mind fucked. Had no idea what to think at this point. Fast forward a few weeks and we're back in school. Nobody believes us. So what do we do? Go back. This time, things got worse. We all decided beforehand to scope the place out again. Then, we will all meet and sit in the living room so nobody is alone, cut off, and close to as many ways out as possible. I sat on the fold-out bed from the couch with Sam. Steve had sat in the rocking chair. Hiroki was not with us. And my other brother, who will be called Ellie, was in another chair. We had three other people with us whose names do not really matter. But shortly after getting there and showing them around the place, things again started coming up off the ground and flying in random directions. This time, it's not all at once, just one thing every so often. Now this is where stuff started to change. As we sat, we sat in total darkness and only turned on spotlights when we got frightened or heard something. I turned my spotlight on randomly, More than just once, just cause. I'm scared. But one time I did, I found my feet had been tied together. 
I never felt it. It's totally 100% dark, and the only person next to me is on the same bed. Sam could not have moved without me feeling it. I untie it and sit up. Once I sit up, my hoodie I had on hood drops as my brother's hood lifts up over his head. Now again, I'm scared as hell. We all turn our lights on and look around to find nothing. At this time, as we're settling down, a can, normal looking soup can, came from some direction and hit one of the people we brought with us so hard in the hand, his knuckles were bleeding and the can was dented. Rocks from the basement start flying into the wall, as if someone was in the basement and just throwing them. Again, at some crazy MLB speed into the wall across from it. We ran into the kitchen and shined our light into the basement, and there's no one, nobody at all. Still scared, I stayed back with the people we had brought and never checked the basement. As soon as we all got back in the living room, which is 100% visible from the kitchen, it had an open floor style to the downstairs, and we heard a big boom above us. Now, this is all happening within maybe five minutes. We go upstairs to the room with the bunk beds and can't get in. Door is jammed. At this time, we decided, might as well SWAT team style kick this door in. As we did, the bunk beds slide. The bunk beds are in front of the door. Both of them. There's no way to enter this room without coming through a window. No way out without jumping out a window. There's no way someone could have done that at all. We ran full sprint back downstairs out of fear once again. And the one recliner that was next to the rocking chair is now in front of the front door. Didn't even hear it move. Looked for scuff marks on the floor or a line like it was dragged due to how dirty the place is. It should have been easy to see. There was none. We left. Now the story of this place has hit most of the people in our grade. Small town with just 140 people in my graduating class, but still a good amount of people. We decided we would just take a few more. At this point, I've been to this house a lot. My nerves have calmed down and I know what to expect, or so I thought. Hiroki, Steve, Sam, Eli and I all entered, with the guy who lived close by and three friends from school again. This night was the last night I went into the home. Nothing was happening, nothing at all. Until Hiroki went up to a sign on the wall that said, World's Greatest Grandma. He proceeds to rip it off the wall and almost on call, it was like a tornado started in the kitchen. Things were flying in every which direction, and for the first time in a long time, I heard that same insane, unexplainable scream. I was out along with everyone else, and then of course, we went back in. What I wouldn't do to have the mind say today at 17 again. After we went back in, we all took seats in the living room again. I chose the bed again. Now, Sam and Eli are the definition of daredevil. Really never show fear, even if they are scared as hell. They decided it's smart to go upstairs alone, but Hiroki followed. Now it's just me and these three other people, plus the guy who lived close by, until he decides to join the upstairs crew. While downstairs, I'm alone on my side of the living room, as they're all in the random chairs and such on the other side. As they are all upstairs, we hear stuff in the kitchen again, just like before. I instantly shine my light into the kitchen to see this thing. Black, completely black, slender and insanely tall, like so tall I never saw its face, even with the area on it that I shine my light, which mind you, is a spotlight, so it's a large beam. All I could see was a torso and dangling arms, no waist, legs or head. As soon as my light hit it though, I didn't care to see the rest of it, because what I saw was enough. I was out, screaming and yelling I left that place. I never saw it again, and I never want to. I've never heard the scream again, and I don't want to. But it doesn't end here, and this last part is all coincidence. Or at least that's what I'm saying. Sam took his then girlfriend at the time, a friend of ours we were called Vic, and his girlfriend as well but they went up to play a Ouija board in the home. The board didn't move for any single question, as I'm not sure what they had asked, but the only one it did reply on had them shaking badly. 
They asked who would die first. The board spelled Sam. This was late 2013, and in November 2014, Sam was diagnosed with cancer. He fought for almost a year with a 3% chance of living, multiple surgeries, and ultimately, entire organ transplants. Sam walked out, and is still with us today. Closest person to me, as well, besides my child. Either way, I could go on forever about this house. So many things happened, and that was the best spark note one I believe I can do. If anyone has a similar story, or would like the footage I have, which is of the wooden desk of me in the kitchen, where you can hear the screams and see the door fly open, please let me know. I would like answers if anyone has any. This memory still makes me get chills and my hair stands up to this day. Seven years later, still the most insane experience of my life. The weird thing is that Matut was not real. I know there's a lot of stories with imaginary friends, but this one, I think, curious rather than scary. I grew up in the jungle side of my country, a zone very close to Brazil, with my grandparents. They had this beautiful orchid which led to a small laundry room at the end of the house. My sister and I spent a lot of time there just playing and running, but most of the time, I'm the oldest one, would tell her that she had to leave since my class was about to start. Note that I was like three or four years old, and since the town was so small, I wasn't even going to preschool at the time. To her, everything seems cool, just two kids and an imaginary friend, but things started to get weird when my parents and grandparents noticed I was genuinely learning stuff. Things that they hadn't taught me or my sister. And when they ask me who taught me that, I'll always smile and tell them, the two teaches me everything. Things got even more weird when I wasn't just learning stuff like names of animals and planets or some basic math concepts, but I could tell when someone would come to the house or tell my grandmother that someone would look for her later in the day. And as before, when they asked me how I knew, I would respond, the toot knows and he tells me. My mother told me that once I told her I was sad because Matute told me that my grandparent was about to get ill, which indeed happened, and that he said it was a secret and my grandma couldn't know. She naturally got scared and told me not to listen to him. I haven't seen my imaginary friends since we moved to the city and haven't been able to tell any future events or learn stuff by myself, like with Matute, since then. So my question is, can a child generate knowledge such as the one I had from nowhere? Has anyone experienced something alike? Or is it that someone was truly teaching me? And about the future things as well? When someone close to you dies, it seems to put you into some other vibe and things happen. When my father died, there were a few things. I couldn't put it all into one story because if I did, then this would be an obscenely long post. So I'm going to share one thing for now and write more about it in other posts. This happened a few months after he passed. My roommate that moved in when he passed away had a vivid dream that I'd rearranged my whole house so that the acoustics would be the best possible for playing music. There was a certain spot that I was extremely adamant in the dream about, putting on the drum set. My friend wasn't aware at the time that my father and I had already had this discussion when he was alive, and we'd already had the talk about the placement of the drums being in that spot. She hasn't got one musical bone in her body, so there's no way she could have come up with this herself. The perfect placement for the drums was in the dining room, facing the back slider doors, and in her dream, that's where they were to go, which would require basically the whole house to be rearranged. I took the dream to mean that it's time to move the furniture. Spent two days rearranging. When all was said and done, we were sitting there admiring our accomplishments. And then it happened. My father's guitar was in its hard case, and it was positioned on its edge or side, rather than laying flat. The edges are about seven to eight inches wide. It had been sitting like that for days. When we noticed it moving, we both watched it as it slowly rocked from one side to the other. 
It would go one way and rest there for a second, and then come back the other way and rest on the other edge for a second. This happened for a few minutes. I assumed it was the cat or something, and I called for the cat to come out from behind the guitar case, and no cat came. My roomie then tell me all the animals are outside at that time. I got up and looked behind the case, while it was still rocking back and forth, and there were no animals there to be the cause. When it stopped, I moved it myself to match what it was doing, before to see what could have caused it. To match the movement, I had to tilt it one way, and hold it on its edge, and then slowly move it the other way, and hold on the edge a few seconds, and then back the other way. No windows open, for it to be the wind. And if you pushed on it to let it rock itself back into place... The rocking would be somewhat fast and settles back to a still position rather quickly. This rocking was slow and calculated, like taunting. It would go one way and rest on the edge and then stall. Then go back the other way and rest on the edge and stall, repeatedly for several minutes. I know it was the old man and I was so happy to know that he had been there. We're from a small but rich anomalous country in the middle of Europe. Me and my friend Ilya are researchers of the paranormal. We've been doing this for over 15 years. Here are some stories from our expeditions. Perhaps you've heard of similar things. Story 1 of Michael's superpowers. This story about human superpowers was told to us by Mikhail a resident of a farmhouse located in the wilderness of the Pervin Marshes. The swamp is there on 900 acres, and the small house is located on a small hill in the epicentre. Up to 12 years old, Michael did not even get out into the civilization. He lived with only his mother and was engaged in housekeeping in a little forestry. He grew up literally like Mowgli among animals. And what else to do if there was no electricity, telephone, radio, and even postmen did not visit them in the house? Mikhail told us that since childhood, he had a very good intuition. Before talking to his peers, he thought that this was a common phenomenon for any person. Mikhail could feel any person approaching their farm from about one kilometre away. According to him, In the area of the solar plexus, he had a sweet feeling that had a delicate light green colour. From this glow in the brain came information who was approaching and on which path. Misha warned his mother that he was running away to meet a friend of Lenka's, for example. She was very surprised when her friends came into the house together after a few minutes. Another superpower was the ability to tune in to a dead relative's or neighbour's canal. But this channel was one way. One could hear a relative talking to someone, but it was impossible to enter into a dialogue with him or her. One day, Mikhail remembered a Polish neighbour who had died, and he seemed to speak Polish from the next room. When the boy walked into the room, of course, there was no one there. Usually, such cases happened on the anniversary of the memory when a mother and her son remembered the kind words of their deceased relatives. These abilities accompanied a teenager under 15. Then girls and alcohol came into his life. Super hardness disappeared forever and did not recover, even when, as an adult man, Mikhail decided to get rid of all the above-mentioned obstacles. Also, Michael told the story of the meeting with the Yeti. The event took place under the sunset of the Union. Mikhail went to the next village by car, Moscovich 2140. The car was old, so the man constantly pressed on the accelerator and tried not to stop. In the evening on the forest road, another car catches up. He looks, and animals come out of the forest ahead of him. Any driver would have stopped in advance, and his old car then will not start. Mikhail drove slowly towards the animals. He decided to go around them, or stop at the very last moment. He comes closer and sees that the animals are very strange. They look like big primates. They went straight ahead on two legs. Short black hair shone in the sun. A male was walking ahead three metres tall. 
The female followed him half a metre lower. The primates froze for a moment in the middle of the road and looked at the approaching threat. The man's sweat was made worse by the look of their black, sunken eyes. They watched with absolute consciousness how a reasonable creature looked, and they accelerated a little so they wouldn't get caught up in an unfortunate automobile. As a result, a car with a petrified driver drove five metres away from the hominoids, drove smoothly around the corner, and there, safely stalled. A few seconds later, a second car arrived. A disturbed man flew out of him and started yelling, Did you see that? Did you see it? Mikhail said, I saw it from afar. I thought it was moose. What a fucking moose. We're running away before we're eaten. Mikhail jumped into a car with his neighbour and the men ran away. Story number two. Another meeting with Bigfoot. The meeting itself took place in the area around 2012. But all this time, the witness, Alexander, did not tell anyone except close relatives and friends about it. We were informed about it by his daughter, having stretched, thus the bridge of trust between researchers and the person who has faced the inexplicable phenomenon, and has automatically decided not to bear it somewhere else in the family circle. Below we present the literal story of Alexander, and the possible reconstruction of the creature. I went there to get mushrooms. It was four years ago, somewhere in early August. We drove into the woods to this place. We left the car. My wife moved towards the lake. I looked around. There were not many mushrooms and started to call my wife. Lena, Lena, let's go. Let's move on. She went far away and did not hear. I'm picking mushrooms and calling my wife. Next, I see. It's like a burned tree. Black. Absolutely black. Here, as they say, after the fire, you see a tree. I didn't pay attention. I'm going further. The tree stands still. I came up and thought, well, I'll see. I was kind of attracted by something. I put my head up and there's a big head, three times bigger than mine. Like a monkey's head. A low forehead, big eyes, looking at me. It's literally three metres away. So he looks at me and my face is so kind. Not scary. Pleasant. Not evil at all. I wasn't scared at all. Overgrown and black. And my face is black too. My lips, nose, seem to be human and I had a big head. But I haven't seen my torso, as you might say. I didn't see any hands or legs. I wanted to talk even, but... And I said, Ogo. Wow, in Russian. With a voice. As I just said, Ogo, he went missing instantly. It wasn't there in front of my eyes at all. It just disappeared. Then he went on. On the right side, the pine trees are high. To the lake there. There's no wind. The weather is nice and quiet. And these trees, so disperse and converge, disperse and converge. Towards the lake. 50 metres from the car, like a whirlwind. And there was no more after that. My wife came, but for some reason, I wasn't lucky after that. Not that I was touched inside or scared. I punched a wheel in one place, sat down. We drove further along the road here, the forest road. So, what did you think was a tree? It disappeared too? No, it wasn't a tree. It was the torso. And it just disappeared from sight. And three metres, maybe even more, was the height. The circumference was not big. Sixty centimetres. And the head is exactly with the body. But an overgrown head is like this. Or there could be short hair. This is the thick hair. Or he was standing sideways. But the main thing was that I couldn't see my hands or feet. He pressed them down to my torso. Story number three. Ghost from the Monastery. We found a new mystical attraction in Nesvis. And the point is not even that there, in the former cells, chapels and parcels of the Bernardine Monastery live and study 360 young girls. And it's not in this pedagogical college, the most stylish library in the country. There isn't a photo. And not that in the monastery crypts found several treasures and remains of the family Razdevilles. Not in the photo. The fact is that this place is just a museum of all kinds of miracles that are still happening. 
this otherworldly abundance was discovered during our research expedition yesterday. Now, all the miracles are in order. Ilya Butov found an article in the archives about a poltergeist who frightened the guests of the dormitory in the 90s and arranged in the former Nezvis Monastery. Now the monastery has a teacher training college named after Jakob Kolas. The headmaster at the school kindly invited us to visit and said that she would try to find witnesses. We went to Nezvis without much hope of success. Upon arrival at the site, we felt like cats fell into a vat of sour cream. We had never seen so many amazing stories concentrated in one place in our ufological practice. Ilya recorded everything on a tape recorder and later will prepare a detailed story of every eyewitness and publish it on our website. Now, I will list some miracles from memory. 1. At noon, a janitor of the dormitory with a colleague and several students saw how a white cloud flew out of the closet and along the corridor. The janitor's colleague said that he saw something like this for the second time. The janitor's wardrobe and janitor's room are in the photo. 2. Pupils living in the rooms of the monastery constantly hear strange sounds. The church choir, prayers, crying baby, etc. Different people hear it in different places. We videotaped the story of three girls. The last time we heard the prayers and crying of the children was at 6am this Monday. 3. Photographs taken inside the monastery's halls often show reflections of shadows in the form of human figures. One of such photos will be sent to us soon. Two girls were photographed in an empty assembly hall and then noticed on the computer screen that a person was sitting in a chair at the end of the hall. 4. We were shown a hook with the painting Lenin on an armoured car, hanging on it for a long time. In the photo, there was an empty pink wall with a hook. The picture was constantly falling, with the rumble of its fall frightening night watchmen. But the hook and the thread were in place. It was as if someone was shooting the picture and throwing it on the floor. There is no railroad nearby, and children do not live in that room. 5. During excavations in the basement of the monastery, our witness, a former gymnast, told us that he and his students had found two human bones and two sealed bottles of Polish vodka from the Tsar's time next to them. The photo shows this room with a miniature golf. Now a strange oily liquid stands out and hangs in small yellowish droplets on the inner vaults of the room. Local teachers call it the tears of the nuns. 6. In another basement room in the 90s, some crooks found a copper vat full of medieval utensils. The vat was so huge and heavy that it was difficult to load into the car. The crooks gently pulled the boat over Nesvis at night. But a vigilant grandmother noticed all this and called the police. Now all the vat stuffing, as well as the above-mentioned bottles of vodka, became exhibits of the museum. 7. In the current relaxation room, there is a blue bedspread with beds in the photo. Before, there was a whole attraction with spontaneous falling objects. This attraction was extended to the next gym. Everything that was bad or standing on the floor fell on its own. Dishes, foodstuffs, slippers, etc. That's all I've remembered now on the hottest trail, although we've recorded such stories, at least ten of them. Ilya also called the night watchmen of the college and recorded their stories. As new information becomes available, I will share information with you. It seems that we accidentally came across a safe house of the real Nezvisky reduction, which has escaped from the castle, escaping from a stream of distrustful tourists. But in college, this ghost has loved and considered all his leprosy good signs, pushing to comprehend the new secrets of the universe. My mum passed away in 2007. I was 13 years old, my brother 10 and my dad 46. My mum was 47 when she died after a four year long ovarian cancer battle. Growing up, my family had always been interested in the paranormal. 
my mom and I would watch movies that addressed the paranormal, and she'd say things like, if I die, I want to give you signs, that, but I don't want it to be creepy. About two years after she died, my dad, brother and I went to Costco to pick out a new big screen TV. My dad is obsessed with Costco, so he always goes all out. In this case, he decided to purchase two big screen TVs and see which one he preferred. He then returned the other TV after he decided. Both TVs were delivered to our home and placed next to one another in the basement. They sat there for longer than my dad meant for them to, and they were not flat screen. They had a box type structure in the back. These backs of the TVs began to collect classic TV dust. One day, my dad, brother and I went to Six Flags. And when we came home and went down into the basement, we noticed that in the dust on the back of one of the TVs was my mother's signature. As if she'd taken her finger and written her signature. Something that was ubiquitous to me as a kid. Having seen it on restaurant bills, permission slips, etc. It was not just her name written in script, it was her exact signature. If I go back to my childhood home, I believe my dad still has photos on the old computer. Hopefully within the month, I can go home and find them to post as a follow-up. But anyway, my dad looked at the signature and smiled, and assumed that me or my brother had preferred one TV over the other, and had written the signature as a cute tribute to my mom, and the fact that she didn't get to help pick. But my brother and I were confused, and when we saw the signature, we couldn't believe it. We all questioned one another as to who did it, but we all had been out to Six Flags all day. I wasn't scared. I felt comforted, honestly. Similarly, one Christmas, my family put up Christmas decorations, and while the whole family was out together, a similar thing happened. We came home, and my mom's stockings were hung up with our stockings. My dad once again noticed and smiled and said, who did this? Very sweet. And nobody had done it. I'm 25 now, and my dad still feels like this was my mom. I've considered that because of my mom's interest in the paranormal, she might have asked him to make it seem like she was giving signs for my brother and I. But my mom and dad have had their own paranormal experiences themselves, and I think my dad would have owned up to it in my adulthood. He actually found great comfort in these events, and got more emotional than I did. So this happened in ninth grade, and after school, me and my friends would usually take the tram to get home. On this particular day, it was only me and one of my good friends. Usually, we'd get off in the city centre to connect with another bus, but on this day, for some reason, we chose to take it to the end stop. And so we did, but this had now added an hour or so from our already long day, so we were rather keen on getting back home. Though, me and my small bladder needed to use the toilet pretty urgently. Luckily, my friend knew that there was an old metro or train station just beneath where we had gotten off. The station had a medium-sized red building that served as a waiting area, I suppose. It was cloudy outside, and inside this building or house, the lights were off. Not a single soul to be seen. The lighting inside the toilet was fluorescent as well. I go do my business, but in the midst of that, I hear my friend just completely break down. She screams at me to hurry and come out. I laughed it off, thinking she was being dramatic or pranking me, but I do eventually come back out, and she hits me with, I just saw a ghost. I just stood there thinking, what has gone into this girl? She's deluded. But she stood her ground and guided me to a mirror that was attached to a door, and told me to just stand there and wait. Not even three seconds later, this ghost, who was clearly an elderly man, came obliquely from behind and just floated forward straight through the door. It all happened very quickly, and so at that point, I'm just screaming my lungs out, and we sprint for the exit. It was a very intense and very interesting set of events, to leave it at that. I've never been opposed to ghosts existing, on the contrary actually, but I've also found it hard to believe that they present themselves so similar to real humans. Now, I know at least.
My mum passed away when I was super young, before I even really knew her, so I spent a while with my dad when I was really young. In fact, my earliest memories were living at my grandma's place. The house was a big house near the beach. My grandma and grandpa built the house, so no one had lived there before us. Anyways, I loved that house, but a specific area of the house always made everyone feel uncomfortable. This area was in the basement, near a cellar. My memory of back then is kind of foggy because it was so long ago, but I remember spending a lot of time with my grandma since my dad was working and whatnot. Now, we used to pray every night, go to church every Sunday. I was fairly Catholic at the time. Anyway, I remember eventually seeing these shadow people. They looked almost like little skeletal shadows that would peek out from behind doorways and corners, signalling me to follow them. They had glowing eyes and a sharp, almost jagged, black, shadowy, skeletal body. Now, I remember ignoring them for a long time, but one day, growing curious, I followed them. I saw one near my grandma's room doorway and walked to the doorway, turning the corner, and it was gone. Then it reappeared at the stairway to the basement down the hall and signalled me to follow again. I followed it and again it was gone, this time appearing at the bottom of the stairs in the basement. As a kid, I was terrified of the basement, so I didn't follow it. Anyways, some time more passed and eventually curiosity took the better of me and I ended up following it into the basement the next time they showed up. When I turned the corner in the basement, I remember seeing this person. They were towering over me. Then again, being like five or six years old, everyone towered over me. They had a deer skull with horns instead of antlers for a head, wore a big fur coat, and behind them was darkness. I remember them slowly pointing at me, then I screamed and ran for it, right back upstairs. Over the next couple of weeks, I'd see this thing in different places, one time hanging itself off the door, other times standing in the trees near the river. Eventually, I stopped seeing this thing in person and it plagued my dreams instead. I couldn't get a night's sleep without this thing appearing, turning it into a nightmare, until sometime I remember someone coming to me in the dream. They told me to fight and banish this being, and so I did. I remember in the dream grabbing a broom handle or stick and hitting this entity when it showed up. The dream seemed to crack and I woke up. Years went by and I forgot about the whole thing until I was about 13 or 14-ish. I was hanging out with some friends and as we were walking back to my buddy's place one night, I remember his sister turning around and asking, what's that? To which we all turned around. At the end of the street, we all saw this tall entity. A deer skull with horns and a big fur coat at the end of the street, under one of the lights. My memories came back to me and I just remember saying, we need to leave. We proceeded to run back to my friend's place and aside from some odd moments like the power going out and doors opening and closing, it seemed to leave us alone. A few months later, I'm in the gymnasium bleachers watching some sports at my high school when I suddenly start to feel tired. Now, I was resting kind of against the railing when I almost blacked out, which would have caused me to fall off the railing. Suddenly, I saw that deer skull image appear in my mind and I was snapped wide awake. The next few years, it was off and on. I'd see the entity, then some of my friends or my brother would and his friends would. When it was around, it always made everything darker and the smell of mildew would suddenly become very noticeable. He attacked one of my friends once, but that seemed to mostly be a warning to get my friend to back off. He gave me a scar on my wrist that I've had pretty well my whole life. I moved out of my hometown years ago and kind of figured he was gone. But back in February, I was walking home one night and felt a familiar feeling, only to look over at the trees and see him standing there. First time I've seen him in a few years, so caught me a bit off guard. Still no idea exactly what it is, though the running theory is a nature spirit of some kind, due to the alleged history of the land of my hometown. (laughs) 
So this happened about a year and a half ago. My best friend, we'll call her B, and I were sitting on my back patio, relaxing and talking. It was a rough day for her, as it was the anniversary of her cousins, we'll call him J, passing. Now B has had multiple instances of having dreams of certain events before they happen. The night before her cousin died, she had a dream of his death. The two were very close, and the evening of his accident, she was invited to go out with a cousin and his friends. She turned the offer down and chose to go home instead. While drinking with some friends, Jay and another boy got into an argument and began to fight. Unfortunately, this resulted in his passing. One punch landed just right, exactly how she dreamt it. Years later, she still blames herself for not going or not stopping him from going. They were extremely close and the loss hit her very hard. I try my best to console her when the anniversary comes around, but unfortunately, I never actually got the chance to meet Jay. Back to that night a year ago. B was reminiscing and again blaming herself for not being there. As she was talking, an unfamiliar voice kept repeating a phrase in my ear. Take me to the sun. So I stopped her and I explained what I'd heard. She burst into tears, smiling, but sobbing uncontrollably. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me a story about a time she'd gone fishing with her cousin and some friends. The boys had drunk too much and were sluggishly making their way back towards the car. Upon reaching a rather steep hill, just before the parking lot, Jay lied down, refusing to move. B, of course, told him to get up, but Jay said no. So B asked, where am I going to take you if you're going to be laying there? So Jay responded, pointing up to the sky, take me to the sun. I recently received a framed print of roses by Croyer. I adore this painting, which previously hung in an old military meeting hall, and my friend swapped it out for another painting for me. The same day I take it home, I'm cooking in the kitchen and see my bedroom door swing back and forth. Not in the wind, not by the draft, but clearly open all the way, and almost closed all the way. I call for my brother without taking my eyes off of it, and as soon as he walks up to me and turns to look, it stops dead in the middle, 45 degrees. Just a little later, I'm at said friend's house watching her daughter, 14, and I send the kid to get groceries 10 minutes away while I cook. I'm singing to myself, just enjoying the moment, and I'm headbanging and shit going, all I want to say is that they don't really care about us. And clear as a bell from the other side of the house, from my friend's bedroom, I hear the kid's voice repeating the line to me. I call out for her, and then literally call her on the phone and she picks up and says, I can't talk, I'm at the register. When she did come home, we checked her bank details, which confirmed she paid the minute after I called her. Me and my brother move and get a new apartment. I have a friend visiting, and she's in the bathroom. I'm cooking. I always have a tea towel over my shoulder when I cook, to wipe hands, counters, utensils, etc. I hear the bathroom door open, and my friend walks behind me, and she yanks the towel, or it hangs down my back. I turn and go, hey, but she's not there, and it yanks again. And I turn, and there's nothing. I say out loud, seriously, stop. And a minute later, my friend comes out from the bathroom, and asks who I'm shouting at. My brother says he'll hear me calling for him while I'm not at home. After the event with my friend's daughter, my friend started seeing a shadow man in her own bedroom at night. My mom thinks it's some sort of mischievous child teasing me, because I don't feel threatened. But what the hell do I do? It's more spooky than scary at the moment, but I worry it will escalate. A large part of my job is to walk around the prison I work at. I go from building to building, assisting the councillors with various things. My office is a cell in the living quarters of the inmates, so I'm used to seeing and hearing all kinds of crap every day. 
I went into the academic building, where the inmates can attend classes, to report to my supervisor's office and turn in some paperwork. Imagine a small school building that's only one floor, and basically it's just a straight hallway with classrooms staggered on either side, along with some offices. Halfway down the hall is a security bubble where they check passes and supervise the area. I walk by and have a quick banter session with the CO. I'm on duty and a co-worker, M, informed me she was going to go work in my office because her computer wasn't working. I head down to the other end of the school to the room I need. It's on the complete opposite end from the entrance of the building. I enter the office, closing the door behind me. It has a shatterproof window inset into it and a smaller window next to it and say hello to the four women that work there and sit at the table that's just a few feet from the doorway, facing the door, and begin to sort some papers. If you work in a prison, you'll learn to never be comfortable with your back to a door. I begin thinking about my interaction with M, when all of a sudden I feel weird about my sudden urge to look out the window in front of me, like I knew something bad was going to happen. I look anyway, and see a woman. She looks kind of faded and grey, I couldn't tell what she was wearing because I looked way so fast, but she had untamed, dark, frizzy or curly hair and light skin. She was looking in the window at me. After looking away, I had goose flesh and felt cold sweat, but forced myself to casually look back and saw nothing. The correction centre is all male now, but has also been a women's facility and a mentally ill children's facility in the past. I've seen things before, but not in years, and not with this strong of a terrifying feeling. I'm used to being on guard all day for safety reasons, but this really threw me for a loop. Four years back, I started my architecture journey and enrolled into this college, which was in the outskirts of the city that I live in. There, I was allotted a hostel room on the fifth floor of the block. I, being an insomniac, never questioned the lack of sleep as a sign of anything paranormal. But there my insomnia wasn't normal. I would feel a trance-like state whenever I was about to sleep. Even when I slept, and when I was at the peak of my sleep, I felt my pillow pulled upwards with a certain force waking me up. I shrugged this on the pretext that I used to be really tired, but it got really intense when a friend of mine reported the same thing happening to her. This was the red alert for me, and after that, I started noticing things. Since I used to be alone in my double sharing room, I used to lock each and every door and windows so that no one could break in, and I double checked everything. But this one time, I was woken up by my friend in the morning as she entered my room and woke me up, claiming that my door was left ajar. I clearly remember closing and locking it. There have been a lot of reports from my other friends of seeing shadows passing through my room door and I've heard knocking on my door when there wasn't anyone. This one time I was cleaning my kettle when I accidentally dropped the fork in the pot and I was laughing so hard because of the stupid thing that I did and I heard it. Firstly like a little hum and then a loud laughter coming from the back of my neck but I was alone at that time. I ran from my room to my friends and I swore to never sleep in my room ever again. I've left that place for good now and just when I left, I got to know that just below my room on the fourth floor was the room where three years ago a girl had hung herself and since then that room was locked and sealed. I've heard a lot of similar cases from different students who have stayed there and are staying there. This happened on Shore AFB in 2005. My now ex-husband was an E6 and he worked nights on the F-16. I would be home overnight with our two sons, aged five and two. First, I need to describe the house. It was a long hallway with rooms on either side. Partially open floor plan from the dining room to kitchen, where there was a half wall for part and then a whole wall. 
From my bedroom door, I could see to the back door straight through the dining room and part of the kitchen. We had a large rack by the back door where we stored dry goods. One morning, I was woken by a noise in the kitchen. I jumped out of bed, afraid my younger son was getting into trouble. I didn't grab my glasses, and without them, I'm legally blind. I can see colours and rough shapes, that's it. I looked toward the kitchen and saw what looked like a man in an Air Force uniform. Again, I can barely see, so I'm going off colour and shape. The figure is holding a box and facing the rack. Of course, I assume this is my husband and I say, Hey, you want me to cook you something? The figure moves so that it's facing me. The box drops to the floor and the figure moves to the part of the kitchen I can't see. So... My ex-husband was very unpredictable and emotionally volatile, so my assumption right here is that he's mad at me for something and I'm going to need to deal with his attitude. I turn back to my night table and get my glasses. Then I walk to the kitchen. This entire action takes maybe 30 seconds. It is a small house. I'm talking as I walk to the kitchen. Did something happen at work? You know, to defuse the situation. No response. I turn into the kitchen and there's no one there. It wouldn't have been possible for anyone to get out the back door without me hearing it, because the door squeaked. Again, this was only 30 seconds, tops. I walk and glance through to the living room, which is also empty. Then I look at the time on the microwave, 6.17. My husband didn't get home until 8. Also, a box of Annie's mac and cheese was on the floor in front of the rack. This happened 16 years ago, and I still try to sort it out in my head. I do not believe in ghosts. I can say we had a few other uncomfortable incidents in that house. There were two bathrooms, a full one and then a small ensuite to the master bedroom, which was our older son's room. He refused to use the ensuite. He said it was creepy. One time, I was taking a shower in there and I saw movements outside the curtain. I glanced out, and I swear I saw a man in a uniform looking through the window, then dropping real quick. I screamed for my husband, and he ran outside, and there were no footprints or anything. I ran a daycare out of our house, and occasionally we would hear stuff moving around in the daycare area, especially at night. That stopped after we got a dog, so I can't rule out South Carolinian giant water bugs playing with the pretend kitchen. I don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, but I know what I saw and heard. I was wide awake by the time I was in the doorway and saw him, which rules out hypnagogia. I don't know what I experienced. I am okay without knowing. I thought this would be of interest for others though. I've not shared this story before. My grandfather died after a brutal battle with pancreatic cancer when I was 17. When I was 21, I became pregnant with my elder son. We lived in a tiny Section 8 apartment in a rural town and had little decoration, no familiar pictures at all. My son was born with a defect in his ears and didn't hear very well. We mostly communicate with signed English. Once he was around one year old, I would hear him at night chattering away. Couldn't understand what he was saying, but he would laugh and it really sounded like a conversation. Appropriate pauses, etc. One day, my sister-in-law and I were sitting on the couch, with my son on my lap, as I showed her a memory book my mom had made for me for Christmas. On the second page were several photos of my grandparents and great-grandparents from both sides. They were labelled, but let me remind you, my son was about 14 months old. I flipped to this page, he laughs points at my maternal grandfather in his wedding photo, and as clear as anything says, Look, Grandpa Bob. Yes, his name was Robert, and we called him Bob. As a bonus, my second son also chatted in his room at night. I asked him once who he was speaking to, and he said, Gamma Ruth. She says she's sorry. My dad's mother was named Ruth, and she was a very unkind lady. I had no photos of her, and had never spoken about her. Even if I had... I didn't call her Ruth, just Grandma. I am an atheist, and I do not believe in the soul. I have no explanation for these occurrences. I leave my mind open, and if I ever have incontrovertible evidence, I'm willing to believe.
I was 15 when I decided to start messing around with a Ouija board because it was something the neighborhood parents would drill into our heads to not play with. As kids, we were intrigued. It was my best friend, my neighbor, and myself playing it one evening when my neighbor thought it was a big joke and made fun of us for playing. He tried to light the Ouija board on fire and it refused to flame. It just wouldn't burn at all. My best friend and I thought he was being crazy, but we didn't understand the severity it caused us. About a month later, I was sitting in my mother's room with my best friend and my little sister, listening to music, because my mother had the best sound system in the house and she was gone for the night. My sister was sitting on my mom's bed, my friend's back was facing the window, and I was facing my friend, but couldn't help but notice a blue man standing outside my mom's bedroom window. My friend saw my demeanor change, and when she looked out the window, I saw the color drain from her body, and she started to cry. I left my mother's room with my friend, and we locked ourselves in the only room without windows, until my mom arrived home. We assumed it was a peeping Tom for the longest time after this. Now, fast forward to another two to three months after that happened. My neighbor called me and my friend in a panic, saying he needed to come over because it was an emergency. We told him to come over immediately, and he did. He explained to us that he and his friends were the best group of individuals, but given their age, their decisions kind of make sense, unfortunately. Decided to light an abandoned car on fire. He said he took a picture of it engulfed in flames to send to his friends as a joke saying, campfire. When he revealed the photo to me and my friend, she again lost the color in her body and started to cry. I immediately noticed in the blue of the flame, that same blue man that was outside of my mother's bedroom window. I couldn't move, speak, or feel anything. He questioned us on what it was, and the only one who could make out words for us was my little sister as she told him, that's the blue man that was outside my mom's window. So a few years ago, I was like 10 or 11. During one family gathering, my dad and his siblings, my aunts and uncles, talked about their past experience in their old house they were renting way back when they didn't have kids. They talked about this ghost kid that's in the house running around and making fun of them once in a while. And they keep talking about how the kid also lived in the same old house and died in the house, and the kid didn't receive a proper burial. Anyway, I didn't believe that this ghost kid existed until this experience of mine a few years ago. Me and my younger sister visited my cousin's house since we lived in the same neighborhood. This cousin of mine was only four years old at the time. It was only me and my cousin, my younger sister and my aunt that was in the house. So we hung out and played until lunchtime. My aunt had to go out to buy us food so me and my sister had to babysit our little cousin for a bit. And here's where it gets weird. We were in my little cousin's room. My younger sister was in the bathroom taking a dump. I realized that we forgot to turn off the TV because I can hear it from my cousin's room. So I went downstairs, turned off the TV and went back up. But as I was heading into my cousin's room, I heard him laughing and giggling. So I assumed my sister was already done with her business and went back to my cousin's room. But when I went inside, there was no one else in the room but my cousin, giggling and facing a corner of the room. So I asked him, hey buddy, why are you laughing? My cousin answered, we were playing. And I said, we? And he didn't answer, and he just continued to giggle. So I carried him out of the room, and we went back downstairs with my little sister, and waited for my aunt to get back. For the past two years, there's been a tapping sound coming from my bedroom window. It started one Halloween night, and about a few times a month, sometimes more often, something taps at my window. There's nothing around to hit the window, and it sounds exactly like a finger tapping the glass. Me and my siblings are used to it. A few days ago, my brother started complaining that something was communicating to him from outside the den's window. Keep in mind, we live in an apartment complex, so we always have the blinds closed. 
He says that whatever it was just kept saying hello to him in a robotic, high-pitched voice. The rest of our family just shrugged it off. The day after, we go outside and there are small tracks leading up to all of our windows. I don't know what animal could have made those tracks, because I think it's bipedal. Later that year, I was in my room lying in my mind next to my window, blinds closed, and I jumped out of my skin. Someone's loudly banging against the glass, but I ignored it. I just assume it's one of my siblings sneaking up on me. I then find out that they were both together at that moment in the house while it happened. They hadn't been out for hours. The next night, my brother complained about the voice outside his window again, and we told him to ignore it. If it's something supernatural, we don't want to mess with it. Yesterday, while we were all preparing for dinner, my entire family and I heard the creature screaming outside. I was too shocked to move to grab my phone and record. It kept yelling, Hello, come out, exactly how my bro brother had described. It was so loud, we could hear it clearly from the loud kitchen and dining room. We didn't want to look outside. This morning, more snow had fallen, but fresh prints were there. I was able to take pictures before they melted. I don't know what to make of any of this, but it's impossible for this to be a prank because of the lack of human prints in the snow. I'm going to keep my phone on me tonight so that I can record the creature talking if it comes by again. I'm pretty sure it will. So I'm a fresh nurse, just finished with school and hospital experience, and waiting to graduate. However, where I live, we're in a high demand of nurses, so you're allowed to work once you pass school. Anyway, I've been working at this clinic for a couple months now. It's a private clinic, so the interior basically looks like a house. It has a pharmacy, the doctor's office, and two other offices down the hall, a waiting room and a back room. So this starts about two weeks ago. I was called in to work a full day, meaning 7am to 8pm, because my other co-workers were tested positive for COVID. So I came in as usually brought in my coffee and sat down waiting for people to walk in. We didn't have any appointments that day, so I was just chilling. Then I heard scuffling in the back. At first, I thought it was the ceiling fan since it creaked from time to time, but the more I ignored it, the louder the sound got. I got annoyed and walked to the back, thinking maybe the dog got in. The doctor's house is attached to the clinic. But as I walked to the back, I got a feeling of dread, as if I continued walking something bad would happen. I stopped halfway down the hallway. I decided to let whatever was back there stay there. Now, I didn't think it was paranormal or anything. It was the last thing to cross my mind, actually. But then, it was around 6pm on the same day. I was attending to a client, ringing up her medicine. When the box of aspirin at the top of the shelf just fell, it startled both of us. But again, I didn't think anything of it. I placed it back on the shelf the client left, and I sat back down, waiting for closing time. When closing time came, I remember I had left my purse and sweater in one of the offices without thinking much. I went to the back to gather my stuff. As I gathered everything, I heard the door open and the chime went off, so I stepped out and called from the hallway, sorry we're closed. There was no response. I walked out to check, but there was no one there, not a soul. I locked up the clinic and left for the night. The next day I came in and we were pretty busy with clients, so the events of yesterday didn't cross my mind. At 5pm, the doctor called it a day and left to go home. So I was all alone once again. I was on my phone scrolling on Instagram when the lights turned off. I thought about a great power outage, but as I looked up, I saw the lights in the waiting room were still on. I looked next to me where the switch was and it was off. That's when I got a little freaked out, but I switched it back in and continued scrolling on my phone. I got up to use the bathroom and left my phone on the counter. When I came back, it wasn't there. I thought maybe I did take it with me, so I went back to the bathroom, but it wasn't there. I looked in the hallway where I'd walk to see maybe if it fell. No, there was nothing there. I remember thinking, am I really going nuts here? When I came back to the front, my phone was on the shelf, next to the bottle of aspirin. 
Loss of words, but stuff like that kept happening every day until recently. My co-workers just got retested again and one of them still has COVID, but the other one doesn't, so that means she comes in and I get a few days off. On the day before I left for my day off about two days ago, I was once again sitting at the front counter reading a book this time. When I heard footsteps, wet footsteps coming from the back room, I thought enough was enough. I really thought someone was messing with me. I switched on the light to the back and peered in the room. No one was in there. I shook my head and turned to walk down the hallway, but I stopped. Down the hall were visible wet footprints. It was as if someone was following me. I closed up early, took my crap and went home. I got back in tomorrow and I'm convinced there's something haunting my workplace. These are just some of my experiences. I have many more from when I was in the hospital. A number of years ago, I awoke after an afternoon nap to an unexplained shadow near the edge of my bed. It seemed strange, but I didn't think it was something paranormal initially. I sat up slightly and began to look around the room for what could be casting the shadow, thinking I'd find a jacket hanging in front of a light source. I found nothing. I sat and looked at it a bit longer and then had the realisation there was no way a shadow could be suspended in the air like that. It was not cast against a wall or object. It was just sticking into the air, coming up from my bed. At this point, I was completely bewildered. It was a formless mass with no discernible features. I couldn't figure it out and decided I'd have a smoke whilst I continued to look for an explanation. As soon as I shifted to reach for my cigarettes, the shadow moved. As soon as it moved, I could make out its rough shape. The initial movement was its head raising from a slumped position. Its head then turned and looked at me. As soon as it saw me sitting wide-eyed staring at it, it jumped to its feet and ran away, straight through my bedroom wall. The shadow person had sat on the edge of my bed and seemingly fell to sleep. It's the most surreal thing I've ever experienced. The entire thing played out in about 60 seconds. I've never had anything like this happen to me before or since. I was going through some stuff at the time, and my doctor said it was likely some form of hallucination, but I'm really not sure. Has anybody else had something like this happen? I've read many stories about ghosts and shadow people since, but never heard anything similar to my experience of a sleeping shadow. Every house I've ever lived in has had some strange characteristics that came with them. When I was a child, the house I lived in had a little bear that came with it. The rental house I lived in, before moving into my current house, frequently felt freezing in the washing room, even when the washing room and dryer had been on all day, and waking up to rattling in the bathroom happened a lot. My current house had been the only one without anything weird or suspiciously paranormal happening until around last year when I got back from a camping trip. My brother was staying with me at the time and I just ended a serious relationship and needed support. My brother slept in the lounge and I slept in my room, but that night was probably the scariest night I've had. I woke up after a pretty weird dream about being chased by a rabid animal. And when I turned to face the ceiling, there was a woman clinging into my ceiling like in a classic horror movie. Sticking to the ceiling was a pile of bones in the shape of an eight, and there were scratch marks everywhere. I just stared at that for a while before my pet started drinking water really loud and the girl on the ceiling and she snapped her neck to look at me. My first instinct was to just lay on my side and force myself to sleep through whatever was happening. My brother told me the next morning that he slept great and had no idea what I was talking about. Since then, the exact same thing has happened at least once a month, and I'm really looking for what she is or what she's doing, etc. When we die, what happens? Do we just cease to exist? The answer is no, for one reason. 
Where were you before you became? Think back to when you were a child and try to remember. Wasn't there a day that it all began? A day that you woke up and thought, where am I? No matter who you are, you don't remember being a baby. You don't remember until a certain age. And I believe because that's when you finally gain consciousness. You see, you've lived before and thus you will live again. When you die, I believe seeing is how time is made by mankind and does not exist. When you pass on, your soul energy moves from your body and travels to another reality where you enter the body at the same age that you finally gain consciousness as a child. We have deja vu because subconsciously we retain memories like an imprint on our soul so that in our next life we can do things differently without realising we are. Have you ever even once thought, wait, I have a feeling I should not go do this or go there. That's your subconscious memories from your past life. So the point I'm making is that death is irrelevant and does not exist due to death being man-made as well as the psychological aspect. We cannot measure death by the body because we are the soul energy and our body is just a vessel. I work with kids, so I'm pretty substance free and sound mind. The man who killed his two dogs and himself in my house is still here. The dogs too. A German Shepherd and a Malamute. It's a backstory. Got the house cheap because of its history of a very gory previous owner suicide. He'd also attempted to murder somebody during his mental breakdown, but I do not know the details. He was a nice person that had no mental health support and decided to kill his beloved dogs and himself. I thought it was horrible. But man, I needed a place to live ASAP. So I braced myself against superstition or the creeps. The weirdness started immediately. Pounding and moaning like the house is being hit by a bulldozer. Neighbours can hear it from outside sometimes. Huge dogs howling from somewhere inside the house. Bedroom doors opening and closing. Footsteps through the kitchen hallway every night at 4am. It's nerve-wracking, but also sad. More than once, I've awakened thinking my house is being broken into. Sometimes, I feel somebody sitting on my bed, and more than once I've had my quilt put on top of me. This quilt is in my closet, so it had to be carried out and placed on me. Then I started seeing the dogs. Walking across my bedroom carpet and standing at the foot of my bed, staring at me. Startling the heck out of me because I don't have a GSD or a Malamute. I have a Sheltie with an overbite that can only make pfft noises. My own dog Kelly Barkson went crazy at the ghost dogs. And I ran all over the house making sure it was really spirits. Kelly now sleeps under the covers with me. We see their fluffy D cells and watch them disappear into the closet. I don't think he's a bad spirit and the dogs are certainly innocent. Often things go missing, and I'll ask him and the dogs to help, and the missing things reappear in totally odd locations. Like my lipstick showing up in the freezer, or my headphones under my dresser. This first experience happened about two months ago. My fiancé and I were hanging out together, because she was off that day, and we heard a lot of running and movement in the bushes and trees next to our small house. So I went into my porch with a flashlight to see what was up. I'm still hearing the sounds, but not seeing anything, so I just brush it off and go back inside. Well, the next day, she tells me her grandpa heard stuff too, and saw two glowing red eyes in the trees. He tells her whatever it was, was taller than him, and he's about 60. I hear scraping on my metal roof, which I suppose could be tree branches, but the times I hear it, there's no wind. A few times I've heard light tapping on the side of my house. Sometimes I think I hear voices outside, but I'm always watching stuff on my phone or playing a video game, so I always try to brush it off as me just hearing things. My grandfather has a dog who roams around the property at night when he forgets to bring him in or falls asleep. Fluffy has been barking randomly at night sometimes for a few minutes to a few hours. A few nights ago, I let my dogs out to use the bathroom. I have two leads for them 
because I can't trust them not to run off. I notice while I'm getting my St. Bernard off lead that my husky is staring up at the driveway at something I can't see. A few seconds later, she just starts cowering like she's scared and ends up peeing where she is. So I yell at her to go inside, which she does, and I start taking her lead off. When I notice Fluffy race up the driveway and start barking, so I look bucket inside. My husky immediately ran into her kennel and wouldn't come out the rest of the night. Not even for a treat or my fiance whom she adores. That day after the incident with my husky, I again let the dogs out. As I'm letting my dogs back in, I notice two red glowing dots through my neighbor's fence that's about 30 feet away. And from the positioning, I can tell they're four to five feet off the ground. I try not to freak out and do my best to calmly get my dogs back inside, where I almost have a panic attack. This was at 7.30 p.m. My fiance got home about 11 p.m., where I gained the courage to go back out with my dogs, where the lights still were. When I went to investigate the next day, they were gone, and that night, no lights. Yesterday, I let both my dogs out again, and was out there for a few minutes when my fiance came rushing out and asked me if I'm okay. I got freaked out and told her to stay outside with me, where she tells me how quiet it is and how she's getting a bad feeling. That's everything I can remember at the moment. I don't know what's happening and I honestly feel as if I'm going crazy. If anyone has any answers or similar experiences, please leave a comment. I'll answer any questions as best I can. I'll preface this by saying I've never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth and had been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I got. This happened last night and I can now firmly say I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail and right away, something was off. One of my friends has always seen the paranormal and he was extremely uncomfortable. He was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I could not hear or see anything out of the ordinary. So we kind of laughed it off and said he was just scared, which I now regret. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worse. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them. I did not feel and assumed was anxiety. And then my ghost seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one and he said yes. I looked into the woods and I saw it. It was a small wispy figure. It had a white grey coloration and seemed to be made out of a smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure. Not childlike, just small. And it would wave. I pointed at it and asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing. He said, oh my god, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread my other two friends felt and I couldn't shake the feeling for the rest of the night. That's all I can think about now. What was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. It didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel mocking, but it felt like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. I don't know. I'm coming to you all as an ex-skeptic begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing and all three of us felt the same thing. It was the day before Christmas in 2009, and we were all on the road, leaving my dad's quiet ranch in Tequesquite, Mexico, and headed to Mexico City. We had been on vacation in Mexico for about a week already, and planned on staying for another week or so. Me, my mom, my dad, my sister Beth, and my cousin Jazz were all headed to my aunt's house to visit for three days, and to drop off some things we brought from them for the US. Our first day there went great. We had fun talking, eating and playing games. 
I'd always been an animal lover, so when I saw they had a little chihuahua, I instantly wanted to play with him. But when I got close, it would run to the top of the stairs and just stand there, looking at me. So I figured it was a weirdo and left it alone. When night came, we all went to bed. Our aunt put the dog out on the roof patio like she apparently did every night. And my mom, dad and I went upstairs to the guest room. Beth and Jazz were downstairs on the living room couch. The part of the story is told from my sister's perspective, as I wasn't there. Because she couldn't sleep, my sister stayed up playing on a Nintendo DS. Around three o'clock, there was a scraping sound coming from across the room at the dining table. She looked over and watched for a while, when something happened that made her want to shit her pants. One of the dining chairs pulled away from the table. So far, it was about three feet away. Then she heard the sound of someone going through the pots and pans in the kitchen. And because the kitchen was around the corner, she couldn't see what was going on. Needless to say, she didn't sleep much that night. The next morning, she told us what happened and of course, my parents blew it off like all parents do. But Jazz and I believed her. Me and my sister had been through enough for me to know that she was being serious. So that night, my sister and Jazz squeezed themselves into the small guest room with us. I was on the small couch in the room, my parents were on the bed, and laying on the floor smashed like a couple of sardines was Beth and Jazz. That night at three-ish in the morning, of course, I had to pee. Scared from the story my sister told, I didn't want to go alone. I begged them to come with me, so the three of us, Beth and Jazz and me, walked down the dark hall to the bathroom. We took turns using the toilet, while the other two looked at the door, praying not to see someone walk by or something. When we were done, we opened the door to go back to the room, and we saw him. That weird little dog was standing in the hallway watching us. I don't know how long we stood there, but eventually it walked away, going around the corner to the stairs and never breaking eye contact with us. The second we couldn't see it anymore, we ran. Beth and Jazz threw themselves under their blankets while I hurried to close the door, but not before making eye contact with a small dog standing at the top of the stairs. The next day, me, Beth and Jazz were pr practically crying, begging my dad to take us back to the ranch. But he was never the type to believe in ghosts, aliens, or anything supernatural really. So of course he just laughed and said no. In fact, he decided to stay a few days more. And when we asked our aunt about the dog, she assured us she had locked it out on the roof patio like usual. For days we would hear things outside our room. The sound of little kids running down the hall, things that sounded like bowling balls getting pushed down the stairs. And if I dared to peek outside the room, that dog at the top of the stairs watching us. Finally, the day came when we had one more night. Just one more night to endure before we would finally leave. But of course, it turned out to be the most traumatic. In the middle of the night, while the three of us sat up listening to the sounds of kids running and bowling balls getting pushed down the stairs, it suddenly stopped. We watched as something big stood right outside our bedroom door. And slowly, so, so slowly, the doorknob started to turn. Beth and Jazz hugged each other, shutting their eyes tight and through tears started to pray. I was frozen, unable to look away as whatever was on the other side was about to come in. Finally, the doorknob was turned all the way. Beth and Jazz were practically screaming out their prayer as they sobbed and I felt like I was about to throw up. When suddenly, my mom sat up and yelled, would you all just shut up? And then laid back down and went to sleep. All was quiet. Even the doorknob had snapped back into place and whatever was on the other side of the door was gone. The three of us looked at each other saying nothing and for the rest of the night, nothing happened. The next morning, we all but flew down the stairs and put our bags in the car. My parents said the goodbyes and got ready to hit the road. I sat in the car waiting to leave. I wasn't about to go back in there. Looking at the house, I could see the dog standing up there on the patio, looking down at the car I was sitting in. I never wanted to kick a dog so bad in my whole life. A few minutes later, Beth and Jazz came running out with some news. After telling our aunts about the nights we had 
She just laughed and said, Oh, I forgot to tell you. Your late grandfather died on that couch you slept on your first night here. He's not really friendly to people sitting on his couch, but we see and hear him around the house almost every night. Nothing to be scared of. I didn't even know how to process that information. And how do you just forget to tell your guests about the ghost in your house that's possessed by a specific couch in your home? Not to mention, according to my dad, he later found out that the house was built on top of several graves. But he still thinks it's just a coincidence. It's been 13 years so far, and this is still the worst paranormal experience I've ever had. But sadly, it wasn't for my sister. This story happened a few years ago. I lived in a building with my daughter who grew attached to my neighbor's husband as if he were her dad. One day, while talking with my neighbor's wife, my daughter, two and a half years old at this time, came running to the door. But rather than running into my neighbor's apartment to go cuddle up to Teddy, she froze at the doorway. She told his wife and I that we needed to be quiet as Teddy was sleeping. Teddy was not sleeping. He was in fact sitting on the couch watching TV. Teddy stood up and called for my daughter to come see him. Again, my daughter looked at his wife and I and told us that Teddy was sleeping and that we needed to be quiet. I could see she was getting upset at the fact that we were laughing while telling her that Teddy is awake and wants you to go sit with him. Teddy started approaching the doorway where we were standing. My daughter began to cry and ran into our apartment screaming, No, Teddy is sleeping. I could feel the goosebumps running across my body. The same day my daughter went to a relative's place for a sleepover, I had invited my neighbours to come over for a bit. Teddy came over and explained how he wasn't feeling the best and how he was breathing in and out of a paper bag before coming to my apartment. I insisted to go to the hospital to make sure he was all right. On the way, Teddy fell ill and asked to pull over so he could be sick on the side of the road. As he was kneeling beside the car, Teddy suffered a major heart attack and passed away while on the way to the hospital. When the service was held for Teddy, I had such a strong feeling that I had to bring my daughter with me. She brought her favourite blanket with her, of course. When my daughter and I got to the funeral home for the viewing, we were greeted by everyone in Teddy's family. They all knew who my daughter was, as Teddy used to talk about her all the time. I held my daughter close as we walked up to the casket where Teddy laid. My daughter leaned down almost as if she was going to whisper to him. She then told me that Teddy was sleeping and that he was really cold. She took her blanket and took Teddy in, then looked at me and said how he was happy and warm now. That night, as I sat alone in the living room, my phone began to ring. Four and a half rings later and still no name appeared. I quickly answered the phone in the middle of a ring only to hear the dial tone. The call didn't even show up as an incoming call afterwards. I felt like Teddy called to say goodbye to us. It was so strange that my daughter knew there was something wrong with Teddy before anything ever happened. A few months later, we went to go visit my grandmother who was passing away from pancreatic cancer. My daughter refused to enter my grandmother's room. She kept saying how my grandmother was sleeping and that everyone should leave her to go to sleep. I instantly began to cry. Only four days later, I got the call that my grandmother had passed away in her sleep. Here's a list of some creepy things I've experienced. One was when I was a child of around eight. It was a summer's day and I was playing in my scooter near a road. I walked past a house and the door was slightly cracked open. I saw what appeared to be a really weird red devil face looking at me through the bottom of the door. It didn't look human, but it didn't exactly creep me out. Maybe it was another child or maybe I imagined that one. I don't know. Two. I was around 14 years old. I was in my bed relaxing and trying to go to sleep around 1am and I saw this thing peek around my door. It had just a blackness for a face and looked like it was wearing a hood exactly like a monk. It had long pointy fingers that bent around the door from like it was grabbing on. I ran into my mum's room shitting myself and woke her up. 
The next day, she asked my auntie, who's a medium, to find out what happened. Apparently, the thing I saw was a monk called Samuel. And she said he was a good spirit and a protector, etc. My entire estate was built around an old monastery for monks. 3. The last one. I was 19 in my house. Different to the house above. Who I lived in with my friend and we were getting ready to go out into town. I was in the bathroom having a pee and I shouted her name. She called me from her bedroom and told me to come up. I was walking up the stairs to her room and it was quite dark. Only the lights from the street lights outside. I saw my friend in her room wearing what looked like a black dress. She kind of skipped and jumped out and then went behind the door. I went into her room, turned the light on and asked her why she'd changed clothes. When I went to look behind the door, no one was there. I shouted her again, freaked out, and she answered from the bathroom where she was. 4. This is the one I've just remembered now. So this occurred in the same house as the previous story. This house had an incredibly eerie vibe to it, especially on the middle and top floor. As soon as you went up the stairs, it kind of felt you were cut off from the world. It was just really uneasy. I was laid in bed with my dog once and she started going weird, looking around, pointing back, scratching on the wall, etc. Then the curtains just blew in as if a strong gust of wind blew them, but the window was shut. There were other things also, like random creaking, hearing pennies dropping on the floor of the room above me, which was wood, and cupboards banging when me and the dog went up to bed. My mother and uncles, when they were all kids, around 9 to 15, I think, played with the Ouija board. Now back then, when they were kids, it was advertised as a fun game. And kids would get one for Christmas or their birthdays. They would go to my grandparents' basement and play it, thinking of it as a stupid game. One time, when they were playing with it, a spirit or demon whose name was Ami, and age 7, started cussing my mother out, like calling her a bitch or telling her to fuck off. But one thing is, they didn't take it seriously, therefore they didn't say goodbye or play it properly. My uncles were playing it by themselves one time and came running upstairs and refused to tell anyone what happened or what the board said. They ran outside and threw it in a dumpster behind Burger King, thinking that's the last of it all. I think that made the spirits connected to the board mad. And then the next day, when my uncle was going to school, he looked behind the Burger King and the entire dumpster was burned and turned into ash. Back in 2014, my parents were downstairs at my grandparents' house and my dad walked outside and sat down. And my mom came down a few minutes after him. When turning the corner after walking down the stairs, she saw some man sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement. He wore a black suit and had no face. She blinked and he was gone. After going outside with my dad, before she had the chance to say anything about the man, my dad told her he saw a man sitting there when he looked back, thinking it was her looking at him. They both saw the exact same ghost or entity that night. Fast forwarding to now, I live in my grandparents' house, the same one they played at years back, and this basement is surely haunted by something. When leaving my room a few months ago, I looked behind me and saw a little figure of a girl standing behind my bed. She didn't say anything. Then again, I ran before she could. I sometimes hear things or see shadow figures in the basement, but I try to ignore them. I still think this is all happening because of what my uncles and mother did over 40 years ago. I live on a reservation. I'm Lakota, Native American. And there's quite a bit of superstition again amongst our culture, which is normal. There's all kinds of stories told to us from generation to generation, so you can imagine the spookiness. Maybe you can't, I don't know. But essentially, we have good, tricky, and sort of negative spirits. Wirrillas are said to be little people who just mess with you, I guess. Little shadows you might see darting around the room super fast. And other spirits who've been known to show their victims their melting face 
in dire times, usually. Seems to all serve a purpose. So I'm not going to lie and say I'm a skeptic, because there's too much weird shit in this world that it's just obvious. Oh, anyways, I didn't really get the vibe that one spirit visited the house. It felt like several, coming and going over the years. Never really felt evil or anything, but I guess over time it was a little bit of a nuisance. Chairs would move on their own, stuff would fall in the night, the usual shit that I tend to justify with common explainable things. But one experience was not explainable at all, and it was when I was 14 or 15. My room was in the basement technically, but it was more of a split level type house with the kitchen, living room, and bedrooms upstairs. And my room, along with like five other rooms downstairs, it's the common cookie cutter house you see on any res, but it was fairly large. I remember I was burning sage and sweet grass earlier that evening, as that is a big thing in our culture to cleanse and keep good energy. Some people say that sweet grass can bring about positive and negative spirits, but I really can't attest to how true that is. So I was dozing off with my little lamp on, but it was dead quiet. TV wasn't on for some reason, and all of a sudden I woke up alert as fuck. As soon as I came to, I seen my bedroom door start opening very slowly. I was like, what the fuck? And kind of scanned the room, but my focus was immediately shifted back to the door. I felt like someone was coming into my room. I fucking froze as I felt that spirit walk right up to the side of my bed. I was definitely spooked, but as I gained my courage, I looked around my room again, trying to rationalise this shit. But my window was closed, and in the middle of night, our doors were all locked and there was no draught. I mean, there was no explanation. It's like a sixth sense, the same way animals react. Anyways, I feel like this is getting too long, so I'll just add that I feel like one of the spirits would mimic my family. Maybe more than one, I don't know, but one night was older and pregnant. I woke up to what sounded like a demonic version of my mom yelling my name. That shit definitely scarred me. So eventually, I moved out of my mama's house. Many years go by with no activity. Cut to January 2022. My husband and kids are sleeping. I knew this because my kids are on the couches next to me. And my husband said he was going to lay down because he wasn't feeling well. I'm working on drawing and opening YouTube. And I forget to start a video. And if I recall correctly, the first like 10 seconds of a video plays when you're just browsing. So that had happened. And now it was just on the main page on my TV. I sat there for maybe 20 minutes in utter silence despite our heater, and after the fucking complete silence, I hear Brooke, my name, clear as fucking day. So I fucking scream bloody murder and immediately yell back, what? I was genuinely scared and sincerely pissed thinking my husband was trying to scare me. But the thing was that the voice came from very close to me in the kitchen, not even 10 feet away. And the voice sounded exactly like my own, as if I was trying to sound masculine like it was deliberately trying to scare me. I stood and yelled again for my husband, but no answer. I looked at my kids to see if they were up or talking in their sleep, as they often do that, but no. I got up and walked to the back of our house to where my husband was on the bed, sound asleep. I woke him up and asked him if he was messing with me, but he was genuinely sick and said he was pissed out the whole time. Man, that shit shook me up, but oh well, I guess. I mean, what else can you say? The most we'll ever know about other realms will come when we pass on. Until I think there's no explanation. I'm not looking for answers or anything. And if you don't believe, it's cool. I understand. I've had many dogs, all of which were wonderful. But I think for most people, there is one dog that was the special one. For me, that was my Dachshund Hunter. He was amazing. Sweet, smart, loved everyone, and just a joy to have in my life. He died at the somewhat young age, for a doxy, of 10 years of congestive heart failure. Needless to say, I was devastated. Especially as they had told me when he first got diagnosed that he had up to two years to live if I took good care of him and he took his medications. Even though I was diligent with his care and he didn't even look sick at this point, he passed away after only three months. In an attempt to cope with my grief, 
I signed up to be a foster for a local rescue group. I was by no means ready to adopt another dog, but I thought perhaps it would help me to heal to help a rescue dog while at the same time I could help get a dog ready for its forever home or adoption. The first couple weeks or so with my foster were uneventful and my foster dog turned out to be a very sweet, well-behaved little guy. At first I crated him, then let him sleep on a bed next to my bed and then eventually he was sleeping on the bed with me like my hunter had in the past. One night in the middle of the night when I was dead asleep with my foster dog on the bed with me, I felt a dog jump off my bed in the lower right corner. I assumed it was my foster, but right after it happened, I felt my foster, who was lying against my left side, lunge towards the spot where the jumping had occurred, implying he felt it too. I grabbed my foster dog in mid-lunge and held on tightly with my eyes closed in fear now realising that it wasn't him who jumped off the bed. The next morning, after finally falling asleep again, hugging my foster all night and in daylight, I searched the entire room and closet for anything that might have caused what we both felt the night before. There was nothing on the floor, nothing anywhere near the bed, nothing at all in the room that would explain it. I sleep with the door to my bedroom closed and locked. I live alone. And while I do have a sliding glass door in the bedroom, leading to a small outdoor patio, I rarely go out there, and the sliding glass door is locked with a deadbolt at top. I ended up searching the entire condo and found absolutely nothing. My foster dog, who also never reacted to anything, and if you know Dashuns, they are hunting dogs with great noses and will find anything hiding in your house. My initial reaction that it was the foster dog jumping off the bed came from that when Hunter was alive. There were a few times he had jumped off the bed in the middle of the night from that exact location. I remember the times because Dashuns are not supposed to jump because of their back issues and I would always scold him for doing it. Plus, it would wake me up like it did this time. To be honest, it was too heavy of a jump to be anything smaller than a dog as it was the exact force of when Hunter would do it and from the same spot on the bed. I might have even been willing to chalk it up to a very vivid dream if not for my foster's dog reaction. He literally lunged at the spot right after it happened, so we felt it enough to wake him up and have him react to it. I truly believe Hunter came back to visit me, but not 100% sure why. To see what my new foster dog looked like? Or to tell me he was not happy I had another dog in his bed? My foster went on to get adopted by a wonderful couple who I handpicked and I didn't adopt another dog for another two years. I never had another incident like this again, but I did see a pet medium at a street fair one time and thought, what the heck, it's only $20. He told me that Hunter has been trying to get back to me since he left and that he watches me over me. Grain of salt, but who knows? I still remember Hunter and think of him almost daily. This story happened about five or six years ago with a girl I was dating. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal. As a kid, I used to see shadow figures in my childhood home. And from a kid till about 19, I had experiences around that house in my aunt's house who lived right behind us and the land was connected. So yeah, they traveled frequently. But anyway, I went to high school with this girl and always had a bit of a crush on her but our paths never really crossed. But fast forward to 2014, we linked up and it was magical at first. We spent so much time together, it was insane. And we talked about everything, including the paranormal. I shared stories she shared, including her telling me that she was being haunted by an entity. Like I firmly believe in and have had so many experiences with the paranormal, but I didn't think it was that serious. Boy, was I wrong. It started off subtly, when me and her would spend time together and we would lose time, which is a no-no when it comes to the paranormal. Once we took a nap holding each other and when we woke up, we were so sore, like I mean running like three marathons sore. Later that same week, she was about to leave my house like normal. I had opened the door for her and we were saying a final goodbye and something slammed the door. Keep in mind, 
No one was home but us, and we were in the middle of the room making out as you do, and no one was outside. I lived in an apartment complex, top apartment. Our neighbours had moved out three weeks prior, so no one lived next to us, and it was the middle of a school day, so all the kids around there were in school. Besides that, there was nothing thrown at the door, and if someone did it and ran, we would have seen them. So continuing, the next incident happened at her house. We were getting a bit frisky. Her idea, I swear. But anyways, we were doing our thing, and I felt uneasy, like someone was watching us. But she stayed in the middle of nowhere, and it was like 2am. Well, as we were holding each other, I asked her, was it here? She said yes, and pointed to the corner of the room. And she said it appeared as soon as you came into the room. My skin was crawling after she said that. Later that night or morning when I was about to leave, we were sitting in my car talking and she fell asleep while I was holding her. She was only asleep for maybe three minutes or so before she snapped awake and said it's angry. And I swear to God, Courtney, this huge shadow figure came walking by my driver's side window. I'm 6'3". This thing would have towered over me. And do you know how when you're sitting in a turning lane waiting for the light to change and let you turn and like a semi drives by you and your car shakes from the G-force? Well, as the entity went by, my car, it felt just like that. The next incident, we were about to go out to a bar with her best friend and her boyfriend. I had just got enough work and had to come home and shower and change before we could go. Well, they picked me up at work, which was in a different town and county than where I live. But when we pulled into my apartment complex, that shadow figure was waiting as we turned in. And before someone says maybe you were just seeing things, the driver, which was the boyfriend of my girlfriend's best friend, said, there goes the ghost. We were all very shaken because we were just in the whole of the country. And here it is, just waiting for it at my house. The last incident was the last paranormal thing to happen before we broke up. Her ex upset her really badly one night. Continuing on it, it was storming really bad. I was pleading with her just to come over and stay the night at my house. She finally complied and she came over. It was like 12am at this point. We ate some junk food, watched a movie and fell asleep. I wasn't awake for this. She told me that at some point, she said she heard tapping on my bedroom door and a voice which sounded like her mom telling her to come out of the room. Now her mom is one, didn't know where I lived and two, she was in Ohio visiting a sick relative now. Oh, by the way, we were in Florida. So assuming that my girlfriend told her mom where I lived and also lied about her being out of state and also gave her a key to my house somehow, or she just made this whole thing up, which I also don't know why she would. We weren't even talking about the entity that night. This was last night. I'm currently here in Arizona. The full or almost full moon was up. Now, if you live in a city or somewhere near a forest, you probably don't know how bright it can actually get on a full moon. For some reason, I've gotten really into mapping. Me and my little cousin made one big, crudely constructed map of the desert surrounding our campground, and we waited to explore more in the night. So, when darkness set upon the desert, we ventured out into the dark. My grandpa made this super cool wooden sword for me. It has spikes all around it and would hurt really bad if you were to get hit by it. I guess that if some crazy person or a coyote came after us, I could either scare it off or beat it away. We moved around half a mile from camp and came to the wash. For anyone who doesn't know, when it rains, yes, it rains in the desert, Water could flow and create rivers. When the water is gone, the empty rivers are still there. These are called washes, and some can be huge. Some could be a few feet wide. This one was about 100 feet wide. We were walking down the wash. Being able to see everything and having a spiked club, we weren't really scared of anything. We went to see the dead, skeletal body of a falcon, which we dubbed Anakin after the Jedi who was cut to pieces by his master, and then returned to the wash, being careful around shadows in case anything was hiding in them. After about 20 minutes of exploring, we came to a part of the wash where the walls curved in by a few feet. 
the change was barely noticeable, as the wash was still huge. However, as we were about to enter this small spot, I got this terrifying feeling in my stomach. I wanted to run, to ditch my cousin and get away from there. Instead, I grabbed his arm and told him we should go back. He turned around and walked back to our camp, the whole time blabbing about a custom Smash character. I followed him, and I got that feeling again, but around five times stronger. I stopped walking and turned around. Standing where the walls curved in was what looked to be a man, but he was huge, at least seven feet tall. It looked naked in the light, but I didn't see any sort of genitals. The legs of the creature were bent backward under the knees, like wolves and dogs. Said legs were small, and the monster's arms were longer than I was tall. I'm 5'10". I couldn't see its face, but I highly doubt I wanted to. If the thing stood on its back legs, it would have been maybe 10 to 14 feet tall. The creature didn't attack, though. All it did was crawl, yes, crawl, back up the wash wall and into the bushes. The crawling was perfect and the knees didn't even touch the ground. It wasn't like a baby crawl, it was more of a girl from the ring crawl. The moment it disappeared into the bushes, I ran. I grabbed my cousin's arm and dragged him all the way back to the campsite. I've no doubt in my mind that if I'd gone any further, I would be dead right now. I don't think my pathetic wooden club would do any damage to that thing. I told my family that I saw a coyote, and that I was freaked out by it. They wouldn't believe me if I told them. I don't want to leave the trailer now. I don't want to go outside at all. I want to know if anyone else has seen something like this in House, Arizona. That thing is still out there, and I want to know what it is. There was one night that always seems to replay through my mind. Even years later, I still can't get over it. For 10 years, my brother spent the night with me as I began living with my grandparents. It seemed odd, but I remember we were in the front room and my brother was on MySpace and I was watching what I remembered to be Full Metal Alchemist on the TV. Our grandpa had a habit of turning the thermostat to below room temperature because he would get hot easily. As I watched my show, I noticed that I could see my breath. I looked at my brother and expressed how ridiculously cold it had gotten in the room. I decided to get up and change the thermostat, until I noticed the strangest thing as I entered the other room. The other rooms in the house were basically room temperature, but the dining room was practically freezing. My grandparents only had one unit, and that unit would keep all the rooms the same temperature when used. I walked back into the dining room to tell my brother what was going on until something ran past my feet and I stumbled. Now, I will state that my grandparents have a cat. His name is Harley, and he's dumber than a sack of potatoes, but very lovable. However, this wasn't him. Harley was sleeping on the sofa in the same room we were in. I looked up in the next room, and on top of his old sewing machine that my grandmother had was this strange cat-like creature. Sitting on top of the sewing machine was this somewhat large cat. It had ears, but no mouth, no nose, just two black pits for eyes and white organic fleshy material for skin. Weirdly enough, it had a hue of purple on its back, but the main attention was its dark, gaping eyes, as if they were lifeless. It stared at me for about 20 seconds before jumping down and walked towards the wall and just faded out like someone in Photoshop took the opacity and just turned it down till it vanished. My mind was stumped and shocked. I turned to my brother and realised that he had a shock look on his face. I remember the exact words that came out of my mouth that night after seeing it. Dude, did you see that freaky ass cat? This guy jumps up from the computer and yells, you saw that too? I wish we had smartphones back then. I've had three incidents where I could have taken a picture of the weird crap that goes on but it never crosses my mind because I'm trying to process what the hell is going on. The strangest part of this is that after that faded away, there were voices coming from the kitchen, as if a number of people had appeared and were throwing a party. And let me just say, these voices were loud. However, no one in the house was woken up from it. Nor did the cat, which was freakishly odd. It was 3am when all this happened. 
and it lasted till 3.04 a.m. or 3.06 a.m. I know from research that 3 a.m. is the witching hour, but is it just a coincidence? Or has anybody else experienced something like this? So when I was 16 and my brother was 14, we had both always had an overactive imagination as very young kids, and had always been scared of being alone with our grandparents because their cribs were always creepy. One day, I had to use the bathroom, and my grandparents were outside fixing up our vegetable garden. As a wuss, I asked Nick, Yo dude, would you follow me into the house so I can go to the bathroom? Nick, judgingly and disappointed, goes, Fine. As I'm in the hallway bathroom, my brother begins looking at the photos hung on the walls of our family, and I'm quickly tending to my business. The next thing I know, as I'm about to walk out the bathroom, is Nick says, Dude, there's someone in the game room. I walk out and peer into the same room he's looking into, and for the first time in my teenage life, I froze with utter confusion. Because obviously, this person was not a person, and clearly wasn't a human being. There was a translucent grey ghost that was floating at least eight inches off the floor, staring at a cross that was nailed to the wall in the game room. It had thin white hair that looked like it was thinning out from old age. It was also wearing a long nightgown, which was also a grey whitish colour. The weirdest thing that I had noticed was this strange smoky mist coming from it, which seemed to be evaporating into the air. In a floating like style, it turned around and looked at us. The ghost had no face. It looked like those depictions of Slenderman. To this day, I still can't believe how fast we ran out of that house screaming. Two days later, I came back over by myself and found that the cross had broken off the wall as it was made of marble clay. Pieces of it were still on the wall, strangely enough. Even to this day, Nick and I can describe what we saw what had happened. Our descriptions of this ghost are both the same. We never believed in this stuff as teenagers, but that day made us believe us. A month had passed after the floating man had appeared, and me and my brother were still bugged and needing answers to what had happened. Mostly because no one would believe us, not our parents, not our friends. So we decided to grab a camera and a candle for the brave mission of finding proof. After two hours of going room to room with no luck, we ended up in the master bedroom of our grandparents' house. Nick laid the candle on the bathroom sink in the bedroom, and I went to take pictures in the darkness. Out of nowhere, the camera died. We were weirded out because the batteries were brand new, as I was the one who opened the pack and slapped those energy-filled babies in. Confused, I changed the batteries with new ones that were in my pocket, which strangely also died. With the loss of our camera and no Energizer Bunny batteries, we decided to give up. I looked at Nick and said, Dude, how can we suck this bad at ghost hunting? As we laughed. We turned on the light and decided to leave, but I noticed Nick had forgotten the candle. I decided to fetch the strangely now extinguished candle as I entered the door frame into the bathroom. I froze as I noticed something was staring at me. As I looked down towards the left doorway, there was a little shadowy figure peeking over the door frame. It leaned in more to get a better look at me. It was solid black and darker than the darkness in the room, all except for its eyes, which were solid white. I jumped back about six feet from the bathroom. Nick, looking at me, goes, Dude, what's wrong? I looked at him in disbelief and replied, Look in there, and look at the bottom left. He sticks his head into the bathroom, and not even three seconds later, he screams, grabbing the door and slamming it. What the fuck? is all he could say. I pulled the camera out of my pocket and tried to turn it on to get a shot of it, but it did not prevail. We looked at each other and decided to take another look. We opened the door and the little ghost was gone. Weirdly, we didn't see this thing at the same time, so in my curiosity, I needed to know what Nick had seen. After asking him, his description was shocking to me. He describes that he saw a three foot tall little man peeking around the corner with white eyes. Freaked out, we decided to leave and process what happened. 
As we walked out of the master bedroom, the camera came back on at full battery level and working properly to our disbelief. We later named that ghost Dobby, like the elf from Harry Potter. So four years ago, I got hired to do night shift as a security guy. It's in a very old building, dates back to 1917, but fairly well renovated, except for some parts. I've worked here for two years. Part of the job is leaving the front desk and walking two big closing rounds to check for any dangers like open windows, potential fire dangers, electronics that are still on at the selling desks and the magazine rooms backstage, etc. The first time I got spooked quite heavily was because of the mannequins. When doing my first round, I walked past quite a lot of mannequins. And on the second floor, there's a lot of designer clothing I like. So I remembered how some of those mannequins were positioned. The second round I walked, some of the mannequins were facing the opposite side as they previously were. This was within my first month of working here. About three months later, while checking the stock rooms, the radio was still turned on at the third floor. While walking towards it and checking the clothing hanging there, I saw a vague pale face with black long hair staring at me from between some of the clothing hanging there. I full on sprinted towards the doors and was scared shitless. It couldn't be a person since the clothes hanging there were fairly high up and I saw no legs. At this point, I was questioning my decision to work here, called in sick for a few shifts and decided to try again one more time. Fast forward a few more months while checking out the kitchen. I heard whispers coming from the freezer area. I was scared, but I wanted to be 100% sure. So I took out my phone and started recording a voicemail and got closer to the freezer. After being there for not more than five seconds and realizing it got louder and I had actual proof on my phone, I ran downstairs and waited at the desk to finally be able to leave this place. I kept listening to the voice memo I never realized something like this would actually happen to me. I'm a very down to earth guy and never believed in paranormal stuff, but this shook me to the core. After this last occurrence, I stopped working there. When I was about 16, I met my now deceased wife. We were childhood lovers and stuck with each other with relative ease through our teen and adult years. We didn't argue that much, and when we did, it was finished pretty as quickly as it started. We have two kids together, and we have a pretty normal household. My wife was a very spiritual person. She was very much into magic and spirits. She wasn't a loony, just a tad obsessive. Anyways, she passed away two years ago due to a lost battle with cancer. It pretty much destroyed me. I felt as though the light of my life was taken away from me. I hadn't experienced that pain in my life often, but when I did, I rarely got over it. Just a few months ago, I started having problems with my sleep. At first it was little things. Waking up in a sweat, having difficulty breathing, waking up and crying. But then it slowly began to get worse. I started seeing my wife in my dreams and she kept calling help for me. I couldn't move towards her and I couldn't speak either. I always woke up from these as soon as my wife came close to me, but it didn't stop there. A few days after I started having the dreams, I began seeing my wife's face in reflections of stuff, like the windows, pots and pans, kitchen utensils, anything that was reflective. It showed her standing behind me and when it didn't, it showed her standing a few feet behind me in the corner of the room. During this time, I had my children sent to my parents due to the fact I was on medication and didn't want them to see me going through it. Anyways, I have started hearing from her. Not speak, more like when you think you hear someone call your name, but you're not 100% sure whether you actually heard someone or not. Objects in my room are moved. Not by a lot, just a few centimetres, but I can still tell. It's just one of those things, you know? But yeah, stuff is getting worse. I'll keep whoever's interested, updated.
Over several weeks, it progressed from little things to very, very strange things. We tried to get it blessed one day. This was the day I saw it with my own eyes. They were going from room to room saying prayers and saying what people say when they're trying to get rid of spirits from a home. This house was an old house. The doors have this glossy clear coat so you can still see your figure in the door. I was standing at the door while they were blessing this one room. As they started saying the prayer, I saw something go past me in the reflection of the door. And I also felt a gust of wind. I tried really hard to talk myself out of actually seeing that as I was in denial of what just happened. While talking myself out of it, I was still very curious and wanted to know if I was going crazy or if that actually happened. I wish I hadn't felt so curious. The next day after blessing the house, it was less active, but we all decided to go out to the memorial and leave the laptop camera on to see what happens when we're not home. We go out, it's all good. We forget we left the camera on and just go about our day. And after a few hours, we call it a day and head back home. Once we hit the driveway, we got excited to see if we caught anything. We were not expecting what we saw and heard. We grab the laptop. It automatically stops itself at some point and we start watching it. We had faced it down the hallway from the end room, which also captures the front door through the kitchen. My uncle waves at the camera, closes the front door. As soon as that front door closed, something was thrown at the room door from the closet in the room the laptop was in. We just saw the arm of something in the corner of the shot as the camera was not on the closet. The item that was thrown looked like a black book and what followed was a demonic sounding voice saying things we couldn't understand, followed by little kids footsteps running around the house and crying. We were so scared by what we had witnessed that we didn't watch the end of the video. We tried to look for what was thrown at the door but there was nothing. We felt a heavy urge to delete that video and not talk about it as this happened after the movie Paranormal Activity was released and we feared it would get worse if we shared our evidence. This was maybe 89 years ago and the first time I've spoken about it. A women's refuge is for women who have escaped abusive relationships. Sometimes the women are found, beaten, kidnapped, or sadly killed on the property. This was a two-story home, three bedrooms downstairs and two bedrooms upstairs, along with the kitchen and lounge. First incident, my first night there. I was last awake upstairs, having a meal in dim light. In the corner of my eye, I see a tall, shadowed figure walk out of the room of one of the women's door closed. I thought I was hallucinating, as I was extremely fatigued previously starved and sleep deprived. Incident two, my son woke us up after midnight screaming. Never had he screamed like this. I would soothe him, but every time he looked back this one corner in my room, he would scream all over again. Personally, I didn't say anything and again didn't think too much of it. Incident three, now this one happened every night and all us women on the bottom floor thought nothing of it until we all talked about it when one of the women mentioned it. So every night, us on the bottom floor would always hear the kids running around, stomping and playing. We found this weird, purely because the children upstairs always went to bed well before we ended up in our rooms, but we never questioned it, as the noise wasn't a problem. It wasn't until the mother told us her kids stay asleep once they go down, and she wouldn't let them stomp around even if they were awake, and these incidents always happen late at night. Now the next incident was what freaked me the fuck out. Downstairs, there's a door that is always opened that leads to the stairs. This door was never closed. My room was the furthest away from this door and outside my room was a decent sized area. There was a couch, a computer on a desk and a computer chair. Across from my room is the washer dryer and a shower. Note that when you walk downstairs, the door is on the left. And as you enter this door, you have to turn left again, which you will see three doors of our individual rooms. It's night, we're all upstairs in the lounge, and we hear a thud. Nothing major, but I decided to go down and check my washing that was in the dryer. As I reached the stairs, I saw the door downstairs had been closed. Weird, but I carried on. I walked down, opened the door, and noticed the hallway light was off. 
That's when I felt really creeped out. I just got an uneasy feeling. Now, the light that was falling in from behind me kind of shed some light into the dark hallway of where our rooms were. I looked in the door to the left, the computer was off, and just as I noticed that, the computer chair turned slowly towards my direction. I noped the fuck out of there and went upstairs, and just waited for someone else to go down there and I followed them. I've had many paranormal experiences in the past which I've told people about, and they called me crazy, so no, I didn't share this one with the others. Many other small things happened here, always at night, but I try not to be fearful and sometimes acting oblivious or ignoring it was my way of not entertaining whatever it was. Sometimes it's okay to not want to know what's going on. I learned this the hard way in the past. There's some things you can't unsee or unhear. If I wasn't clear in the beginning, women and children had died in this house. Since I was a teen, I've had an interest in the supernatural, though more as an artistic and cultural expression than as a real phenomenon. Overall, I'm a pretty difficult person to talk to, both because I've been around horror media for years and because of my family history, but something happened last night that I just can't explain. I was sleeping with my husband and woke up to someone calling my last name, kinda urgently. My first instinct was that there was some sort of problem in the building and these were firefighters or first responders of some kind. I sat right up and could clearly see an old lady standing by the side of my bed. I adjusted myself, completely shocked to see her there. She didn't seem evil or angry, just a nice if a bit surprised old lady in a dressing cardigan. When I reached out to her, she dematerialized in front of my eyes. My head started to hurt immediately after she basically dissolved into thin air. I know it wasn't a dream. I had to make the very conscious decision to go back to sleep and deal with this in the morning. I spent the whole day looking up what could possibly have caused this. Some places say it's sleep paralysis, but I had full control over my body. Didn't feel threatened in any way. I actually was just surprised to see someone in my bedroom in the middle of the night. I've had vivid dreams before, but this wasn't like that at all. Maybe it was, was just sleep paralysis, but it felt so real, I figured I'd share the story and see if someone else has been through it too. This is something I do not talk about. My husband is the only person that knows the entire event. I'm going to paraphrase to save time. About four years ago, we moved from Florida to North Carolina. My husband is in the towing industry. He went on assignment to Maryland for six months. While in our home alone with my dogs, I had a major shadow person infestation. My husband and I talked at night all the time, and he even saw it on a video call more than once. I felt like I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I didn't sleep at night, so I turned on every light in the house. My husband is Catholic and was very involved as an altar boy from ages 6 to 19. So much so, he had a free ride all through Catholic high school. This plays into the story later. Seeing these shadow things nightly had me to the point I felt like it was possibly the beginning stages of a full-on possession in the making. When I say I saw them, it started off the corner of my eye, and over time, I could look at it straight on. So it wasn't my mind playing tricks on me. Something in my eye, lighting, and my husband saw it twice while on video with me. My whole personality changed. I looked like I had an illness that was eating me alive from the inside out. My husband would come home every few weeks for two days. When he was home, the activity was virtually non-existent, with the exception of hearing noises that we couldn't explain. He wrote those off as noises from the woods near our house. But when he was gone, I would call him on the brink of complete panic. I wasn't afraid that it would hurt me physically, as much as the emotional, mental and physical drain it put on me. We discussed trying to take possession of me. We reached out to his Catholic priest who explained the stages of demonic possession. He told me the first thing that seemed to happen was a breaking down of the person mentally and physically. We were there. This all came to an end one night when I was alone and I freaked completely out. 
I had holy water in my home that was blessed by the Pope from the Vatican. I grabbed the holy water and walked around the house and just sprayed everything. At the same time, I was screaming, telling it that it's not welcome, that I wasn't going to be afraid anymore, and if it was coming to get me, then to fucking make it happen. I had broken. I could no longer live like this. The next morning, the whole house felt different. That night, I no longer saw the shadow figures in my home. It was an almost eerie quiet with a whole new sense of calm. We do not talk about this, ever. I can't even read or watch things having to do with shadow people because of my experience. I'm not saying it in lightest terms, but I absolutely believe I have a form of PTSD from the events that transpired. We don't watch shows with it. We don't discuss it. Fast forward a little over four years. We now live in a three-story home. Our bedroom is on the top floor. It's a very quiet country neighborhood, meaning at nine, everything shuts down. My neighbors don't have lighting on their homes other than their front porch light. We don't have parties here or the police. It's very quiet and dark at night. We were sitting in bed on the top third story floor, watching TV last night. And in my hallway, I saw like a flashlight flashing around the walls. It was very fast, but I sat there and stared at it, so it wasn't just like in a blink of an eye. It was like somebody outside was shining a flashlight on the house, and it popped through the window. This is on the third floor, so if it were a car, the light would have reached the top level. It was only us in the house that we knew of. I looked at my husband and I said, did you see the flashlight in the hallway just now? To which he responded no, and started to stare. He jumped out of bed and got his gun and his flashlight and started entering the hallway, thinking somebody may have broken in. He goes through the whole top floor, checks behind the curtain in the bathroom, turns on all the lights and finds nothing. We even looked outside on both sides of the house to see if maybe something happened and somebody was out there with a flashlight. Nothing dark, black silence like every almond light. He was in full on protection mode at this point. I told him maybe it was a car. Maybe it was a reflection off the TV. And a couple other things that could have caused it to calm him down. He sat down on the bed and I watched his frozen face as he stared blankly and fixated down the hall. He said, Natalie, I'm watching a shadow go back and forth across our hallway. There's no light behind it and I can't see it through it to the window. He said it crossed three to four times. He sat there with a blank expression I've never seen in 24 years. He jumps up and turns on every single light again. He was clearly freaked out. I was starting to freak out too. The minute he mentioned that shadow person, I thought they were back in my life again. I haven't felt this type of fear, panic in quite a few years. I feel like I'm on a super high alert today as I'm typing this out. I don't feel safe going back to my bedroom. I cannot relive this event again. I looked at him and said, we do not talk about these things. We're not talking about what happened and do not say the word shadow around me ever again in your life. You can think it, but do not say it. After a while, he calmed down enough to lay down and go to sleep. I haven't slept yet. I just had to get this off my chest a little bit so I could breathe. I'm already dreading tonight and going to bed. I cannot have what I went through for that six months back in my life again. One night, while I was in the state of drifting to sleep, I wake up in a panic to a deep, evil sounding growl in my ear. I say in my ear because it sounded so clear to the point where it was as if someone or something was lying next to me and made this horrible noise directly in my ear, ASMR style. For context, this was a few years ago when I shared a bedroom with my younger sister. I woke up with my heart racing and shaking. I stayed awake for hours after as I didn't want to be vulnerable to anything evil in my sleep. As I have a feeling it's easier for spirits to mess with you when you're in that state. A few weeks before this happened, I had gone to visit an old abandoned castle slash church with my family in the Isle of Wight. We did this because my mum loves all things horror and she loves exploring creepy places. 
While we visited, we messed about and didn't take it seriously. I remember me and my mum found a little underground part of the building that had metal bars to block it off. Since we were messing around, I vaguely remember we grabbed the metal bars and shook it well, saying, help, thinking it was funny. I now realise it probably provoked an evil spirit. I also remember at the time I had a close friend who was involved in spiritual things and could see spirits. I'm not sure if I believed it, but it was certainly believable and interesting. She used to tell me when she would see spirits, and she told me she had one that was following her at the time. I'm not sure if it was evil, but I suspect it could have been from what that as well. Maybe the spirit noticed me being close with her and was curious about me. A few nights after the growling happened, I would get woken up a lot by this time, what sounded like a man crying and whining, like an echo in my ear, and as soon as I would wake up, it would fade away. I eventually ended up saying out loud, go away, leave me alone, and it worked. It's been at least four years now since that happened, and I've not experienced it again. I still wonder if maybe I was going crazy, or if it was actually paranormal. This place where I used to work was located on a small boulevard, behind which was an alley which separated the business from a residential area, typical suburban zoning. It was my habit to walk to the nearby deli to get lunch, and then find a nice spot in the adjoining neighbourhood to eat it, typically on a curb in the shade of a tree. One day, while looking for a likely place, I noticed the tree whipping about much the way they do when winds come heralding an approaching sun rainstorm. But this was a warm, still, sunny day, with not a cloud in the sky. I looked at the surrounding trees and shrubs, but all was calm. This one tree, and this one tree alone, was aggressively swaying to and fro. So I decided to sit upon the curb opposite it, and observe the situation to see if I could determine the source of the activity. As I watched, it became clear that there was no external wind, which shook the leaves and branches. And indeed, there was no single direction in which they moved. It was as though a being was cavorting in, through, and around the tree never going so low as to disturb the grass or roil the dust in the gutter below, but content to remain up in the branches, twisting itself this way and that, seemingly delighting in making the leaves and branches flutter. I tried to see if I could use the movements to determine the directions the being was travelling, the course which it took, and so by getting an idea as to its shape and form, but it wasn't possible. So I resigned to sit and eat my lunch as I watched the extraordinary display. When my break was over, I went back to work, leaving the tree undoubtedly dancing. The next day, I returned to see if it was still there and was not disappointed. I tried to communicate telepathically with it, but didn't receive anything, nor saw any indication it was aware of my presence. It was like sitting in a park watching a child play blissfully unaware it was being observed or watching a dog cavort about not knowing it was seen. The rest of the week, I would come and sit and marvel. I figured that what I was witnessing was one of two things. Either I was watching a disconnect being displaying trying to affect physical reality for purposes unknown to me, or what I was seeing was a small wind amusing itself. I came to accept the latter because I figured that a soul with a human or djinn would recognise my attention and try to capitalise on it, but the being was blithely content to ignore me. I have since learned that such elemental incarnations are a part of the development of souls, one of the many rungs on an eternal ladder. I myself may have been such a force, learning my lessons as I assert myself over my environment, playing with clouds and birds and trees and fallen leaves, whipping the waters to froth or gently rippling their surface. Astoundingly enough, now that I look back on it, I got bored and took to finding some place less toilsome to have my lunch. In retrospect, it was my inability to interact with it that lost my interest. Curiously, I never approached it, never stood beneath the tree as its leaves and branches spasmed about, and recall that, then as now, I felt honoured to witness a wind at play 
to have been given evidence that there is more and that it was not for me to intrude. To this day, many decades later, when I drive past my old job place, I look down the street for the tree and think, that's where the wind was. I worked the night shift at a medical lab where I had a bit of a creepy experience a while ago. There's an area of the lab called STATS where we process specimens that need to be tested immediately. It's kind of isolated from the rest of the lab and usually there's only two people at the station. Earlier in the night, one of my co-workers and I were exchanging scary stories that had really happened to us. It got me in a really spooky mood because we talked a lot about hauntings and paranormal experiences. At some point when I was on a break, I was walking down a long, empty hallway. My face was in my phone, and I suddenly felt like someone was walking right behind me. I thought it was my co-worker, because he liked to prank me and scare me a lot. But when I turned around, nobody was there. The hall was completely empty, and there was nowhere anyone could have hidden. So that freaked me out a little. Especially after talking about scary experiences with my co-worker, but I didn't read into it too much and figured I was psyching myself out. At some point between 2 and 2.30, I was working at my station when I felt a distinct tap, tap, tap on the back of my chair. I turned around and was startled to see no one was there. The only other person nearby was my partner on stats, but she was working at another computer station a good 10 feet or so away from me. I had reacted to the tapping immediately and there was physically no way she could have tapped my chair and jumped back to her station in the split second it took me to turn around. That tripped me out, but again, I figured ghost stories had just psyched me up and I was imagining things. But that tapping felt very real. I remember hearing the sound right behind me and feeling my chair vibrate like someone was tapping on it. At this point, I should mention that phones aren't allowed at the stat station, so mine was in my locker which was nowhere near. When I got off work around 4am, I discovered that my girlfriend had been trying to call and text me for almost two hours. I called her back and she said how she'd had a nightmare where I was hurt and it gave her really bad anxiety and she'd been trying to call to make sure I was okay. I assured her I wasn't hurt and I got home safely and helped her calm down. Later on, I looked at her texts and calls and I noticed they'd started around 2.30. I asked her what time she woke up and she said a little after two o'clock. So she woke up with the same time frame that I thought I felt tapping on my chair. It's most likely a coincidence. And again, I probably imagined the tapping because I'd been sharing ghost stories and psyched myself out. But I also don't necessarily disbelieve the supernatural. And ever since that experience, I loved to entertain the idea that a ghost was trying to get my attention and be like, hey, your girlfriend needs you. Go check your phone. The first thing that happened was when my husband and I, boyfriend at the time, were playing hide and seek. We decided to take a break and watch a movie. I had to use the restroom, so I went away. I went into our guest bathroom which is the only one downstairs besides the one in our master bedroom. It's located in a corner hallway next to the sp two spare rooms in the house. Currently, his office and our son's room. I went inside and quickly did my business and started to wash my hands. The sink is right next to the door. While I was drying my hands, I heard and saw someone run up to the door, stop, turn around and run into one of the adjacent rooms. I figured it was my husband ready to start the game again and ripped open the door. I fully searched each of the rooms and didn't find anyone, which I should have if it was him. There was no time for him to run by the time whatever was moved from the door and I opened it, and I clearly saw the shadow go right towards the rooms and not left towards the living room. The second thing that happened was while my husband and I were playing pool, which was right next to our front door. Right after we broke, we heard a loud knock at the front door. We looked at each other, obviously confused as it was pretty late at night. 
We both went to the door and answered it. There was no one there, and we both stepped out onto the porch to take a look around. We stayed out there for about 30 seconds or so to take a look around and headed back in. We were both shocked to see that the pool balls were in a straight line down the centre of the pool table. It was very shocking since, as I had mentioned, we had just broken and the pool balls were scattered when we exited. The third and most recent thing that has happened was when I was alone in the house. Shocker. I was sweeping the steps since some of the plaster-like stuff on the ceiling had started to flake off and make a huge mess. I was cleaning up the landing at the top of the steps when I started mouthing off at the energy that I felt around me. I felt unwelcome in my own home, and that pissed me off. I know, I shouldn't have said the things I did, but I was pissed, as it's my house. I won't write what I said here, as I still live in this home and don't want to put those words back into existence, and you'll see why. There were three rooms up the stairs, and all three doors were closed during this time. Once I started getting really belligerent, all three doors started to shake violently in the door frames. It was as if there was someone behind each of them, just shaking and banging them against the frames. I immediately started having a panic attack and sank to the floor. I screamed out for whatever it was to stop and that I was sorry. And it did. I bolted down the stairs to find my phone and call my husband. As I was about halfway down, I felt a hard and violent shove on the centre of my back that almost caused me to tumble down the remainder of the steps. My husband has never felt threatened in our home, but I constantly feel it, even before I made all those comments. And this all happened before the car started showing up, and they were all several months apart. This has happened several times at this point. It started about 16 months ago when I was cleaning my house around 12am. My husband, boyfriend at the time, worked nights, so I had adjusted to his schedule. I usually kept the blinds open during the day and would go around closing them at night while I tidied up before bed. Our room was my last stop on the first night this happened. The curtains and blinds were open as I was sweeping the floor when I felt the sensation of being watched. I looked around me when my eyes focused on this silver sedan parked outside my house, mostly in the grass on my front lawn. Now for context, my bedroom window is about 15 yards from the road in front of my house. It's a small front yard in a pretty densely populated neighbourhood. Anyway, I saw the car before I saw her or him, I'm not sure, but there was clearly someone sitting in the driver's seat of the car and another person standing about five yards from my window clearly staring at me. The only reason I could see this is because the moon was fairly bright that night. I shrieked and dropped to the floor and crawled to the light switch to turn it off so that I couldn't be seen. I called my husband to ask him what I should do and he told me to call the cops. I did and of course by the time they got there the car was gone. They asked if they could see my security footage and I agreed but the footage from this section of time was just gone. It skipped over the few minutes that they would have been outside. This has happened several times since then, and I've completely given up on calling the police, as I feel as I think they're crazy. I have no proof that this is happening, but I would like to have some opinions as to what they may be doing. In the past 16 months, it's probably happened 10 times. Sometimes the person is standing in the yard, and sometimes they aren't. Also, the car has been different every time but the light is always on inside the cabin of the vehicle. But when I go to look, the people inside are never looking where I can see their faces. I'll run to grab my phone to call someone, anyone, they'll already be gone. When I was a kid, in the 90s, I would often sleep at my grandmother's house in the middle of a small village in the Giora region of France. The bedroom I would stay in was called the Room in the Back. As the name suggests, it was one of the last two rooms at the end of a main corridor, shaped like an L. There wasn't anything special about that bedroom. It was pretty small and contained a bed, shelves with books, 
and some other very basic furniture. Yet, for some reason, that room creeped me out. I felt an unwelcoming presence, and I would always struggle to fall asleep, scared of whatever invisible forces seemed to be lurking in the dark. One night there, when I was around eight years old, I woke up scared and confused. I found myself lying down on the floor and in total darkness. I feel I need to make two things clear here. This is the only time in my entire life that I've ever awakened outside of whatever bed or couch I've been sleeping in. The second thing to note is that despite the fact that the house is located in a small village, it wasn't particularly isolated and the streetlights outside would always let a bit of light filter through the closed blinds at night. So here I was, a child surrounded by total obscurity, struggling to understand why I wasn't in my bed. I tried my best to stay calm and touch around me, hoping to find the side of the bed nearby so I could climb back into it. I simply could not find it. I tried for several minutes, but it just didn't seem to be there, which was extremely strange, considering that the bedroom wasn't that big in the first place. I therefore decided to move forward in a single direction, to find a wall that I could then follow until I would find the bed. Things just got even stranger as I tried to find a wall. I would bump into furniture I would not recognise, and despite all my efforts, I simply couldn't find one. Everything around me was completely and utterly unfamiliar. I thought about calling for help. My grandmother was sleeping in the bedroom on the other side of the corridor, and my parents in the living room. However, I imagined them finding me screaming on the floor and decided not to, not wanting to face that kind of embarrassment. Finally, I fell asleep on the floor, giving up on finding the bed. I woke up the next morning in that damn bed and under the blankets. It was like the entire event had been nothing more than a weird dream, yet it absolutely did not feel like a dream. I'm a natural lucid dreamer, and even back then, I was already very familiar with how dreams feel, and this just wasn't one. Or at least I don't think it was. A few years ago, a long time after this strange occurrence, I went to England to visit my aunt, who's from the other side of the family. She claims to be a witch, and is into a lot of new age stuff. I've always been sceptical, but I have to admit that she's done and said a few strange things that got me to go from not believing her at all, to being a bit more neutral about it. We were talking about our respective families, and she went on about the only time when she had ever been in my grandmother's house, when I was a baby. I thought it was a good opportunity to see if she had sensed anything unusual there and asked her, making sure to keep the question open enough to not influence her. First thing she said was, ah yes, the room in the back. She said it in English, and had no idea we called it that way in French. There was something wrong with that room. I was spooked. Once I got back to France, I decided to confront my mother about it, since she'd spent her childhood in that house. As soon as I asked her what the hell was wrong with the room in the back, she froze, and her face became white. She explained to me that when she was little, she went into that bedroom with a few friends, and they tried to inspoke spirits, for fun. They immediately heard three very violent knocks and ran off, screaming. She told me that ever since, the room feels weird. That's it. Nowadays, the room is pretty different, but still used as a guest bedroom. It still feels weird, but I'd say a lot less than when I was a kid. I know my brothers, who were 10 years younger, have also complained about feeling uncomfortable there for some reason, but they never had any unusual experience there. This has haunted me for about a decade now, and it's time I share it. About 10 or so years ago, I have the house to myself, still living with my parents at the time, and I have a friend staying over. The night was going smoothly and normal. We're playing co-op video games, as teenage boys do. But eventually, we both end up on our phones, scrolling through Tumblr. My friend stumbles upon a 40 to 50 minute audio tape file of a private investigator talking to a high school campus about his experience during a murder investigation he's conducted. I believe it took place in Texas, if I recall correctly. Long story short, towards the end of this audio file, it all leads up to the PI believing that the victim was exposed to a demon 
or evil entity? Who was the reason for the death of this person? He states at the very end testimony of this case, that this demon feeds off of your fear, and that the more you think about it, the stronger its energy and presence gets. As far as we could both tell, it was a real testimony, and not a parody or creepypasta. So me and my friend heard the whole 40 or so minutes of testimony. We were just enthralled, almost hypnotised by it. And afterward, we tried to go back to playing our games. Well, not five minutes later, the power in my room, and my room only, goes out. No big deal. So I just go and flip the breaker and turn it back on. Three minutes later, boom, again. Flip the breaker again. One minute later, boom, again. This continues with shorter time frames until the power in my room just won't come back on. The first time it happens, we think it's mere coincidence. But by this point, fear is really happening and the thought of this entity is in our heads. At this point, about 12 to 1 a.m., my friend decides that this isn't worth it for him and he heads back to his place, leaving me by myself. So the night goes on a little bit and my friend leaves. I spend the rest of the night in my living room, lights on, and crash on the couch. I wake up with the TV still on and it's between 3 to 4 am. I don't know what the fuck possessed me to go back to my room to sleep, but for some reason I convince myself it's all in my head and head to my bed to sleep. I fall asleep incredibly fast and my dream begins with me in my bed and room just as it was laid out in real life in the pitch black. This was extremely vivid and an exact replica of my room. I was as lucid as I would have been awake. But in one of the top corners of my room, where the wall meets the ceiling, I saw a pair of angry, dirty, yellow-looking eyes that were on a pitch blacker-than-black figure hanging on my ceiling, just staring into my soul. I was fixated on these eyes, and they were fixated on me. I was just in shock and couldn't move. But the second I tried to move at all, the shadow figure zoomed to another corner of my ceiling and then launched at me. I woke up in a sweat just before I got contacted. The dream felt so fucking real and vivid and I woke up literally screaming. It was a real sense of dread that took over my entire body at that moment. I felt mentally and physically sick. Power was still not working in my room, so I went out to the living room again and finished the night with all the lights on. Nothing more ever came from that night, but as far as I can tell and find, that audio tape never existed. I've spent days upon days trying to find it multiple times all over the internet, and nothing even close comes up on search results. By the way, the power to my room worked perfectly the following day after the sun rose, and has worked perfectly ever since. This is my very real story that happened in 2014. My family flew from the US to Wales for my brother's wedding. We stayed in a very old remodeled barn party house in Abergavenny. It was right below the canal and we had a free day before the wedding party was meeting at the local pub that night. I got back from a run at the canal, showered and had time to take a nap before dinner. As I'm laying in bed, I feel the presence of a woman, and then feel the front side of my hand stroke my cheek. Then feel the entity jump on me and pin me to the bed. I'm struggling, and finally get free. I hear a woman's cackle and laugh three times. This was witnessed. My door was half open, and there was a sitting area outside, and my mom was sitting there, and said she saw me laying in bed struggling. She didn't hear the laugh. Nothing else happened during the trip. The next month, I started dating a woman who would eventually move in and become my wife. This is when things started getting weird. Anytime she would spend the night, if we fell asleep with an arm or leg touching each other, we would both have terrible nightmares. I don't ever have bad dreams or nightmares. One that I recall vividly was an extremely old and wrinkled woman in black and white, screaming at me in a foreign language I didn't understand. We would make a point to sleep as far apart as possible to avoid the dreams. Then one night, I had a dream. I'm in this astral plane and everything is blue around me. 
Standing in front of me is a young petite woman. She was short, like five feet tall, and looked very European, with a round face and dark blonde hair. She was dressed in very period correct plain clothing from a long time ago and wasn't wearing makeup. She walked up to me and said, my name is Abigail and nothing else. I tried talking to her, but that's all she said. Now, I've never heard the name Abigail in my life. Google it and see it's Eastern European for Abigail. After that, Abigail got really spiteful and tried to wreck our relationship. A couple key things that happened. Pulled my wife's hair. She was walking up our steps and was talking to me, and I saw as if someone grabbed her hair to yank her down the steps. She froze, and we just looked at each other. Bent her engagement ring. It was on the dresser, and one morning she showed me it was so smashed she couldn't get it on her ring finger. And to me, I loaded a conversation from Google Hangouts when I was talking to another woman before I met my wife. I didn't even have Hangouts installed on the phone. That convo happened on my previous phone. Thankfully, it was date stamped, and I settled her down and showed her. Other small things like hiding stuff. Stuff was going missing constantly. One time, we bought a bunch of meat and it was in this huge bag. And we set it down in the basement to put other groceries away. And it was gone. We looked everywhere and didn't find it until a year later, when there was a bag of rotting meat in the basement. As the next couple years went on, things started to die down. And when we married, they stopped. I guess she finally gave up. I never had any sage cleansing done or had a medium visit to the house because I didn't want to make things worse and present a challenge for the entity to fight. But I was researching mediums and was close. I'm a 16 year old girl situated in India with my parents and my sister. We live in a quiet street and we don't hear sounds except for occasions like someone's wedding and things like that. I live in a building where everyone moved out, leaving only my family and another guy's family. For a few months, we were experiencing paranormal stuff, but they were unnoticeable. But for a few days, it's been getting out of hand and it's noticeable, even after I did everything that was on my mind like using sage. I'll list a few of my experiences here, but before that, I'll explain how my house is. The main door and the living room are attached together, and it was a small washroom for guests. We don't use that washroom except for cleaning it once every week, and two rooms. The very first experience happened in the living room. Me, my sister and my mother were chilling, sitting on the couch, when my sister pointed at something. I didn't care at first, but when I saw something in front of the living room washroom, the door was open. It was a shadow of a whole person walking and then it disappeared. We instantly checked the washroom and no one was inside there. And there wasn't something that would cause a shadow of a moving person. Then we saw stuff like sculptures moving, doors automatically opening. Then this experience happened in the living room once again. The washroom door was open and I looked at it and I caught a glimpse of a white face, fully white, black spots on the place where the eyes are supposed to be, and then it vanished. This morning, I placed my pair of earphones on the middle of the stool, and I sat down on the bed. After a few minutes, I heard a noise, and naturally, I looked up to see my earphone floating in midair for half a second, and then it fell on the ground. This same incident happened to me when I was doing chores one day in the kitchen, but with a spatula. I had more experiences about this. My big question is, is my house haunted? This happened while I was doing my army experience in Switzerland. I'm not really allowed to talk about what we were doing, but I'll try to keep things clear. My company had installed a huge antenna and it had to be guarded by two soldiers day and night. We were on top of a hill, far away from any city and near a huge forest. It was six o'clock and I had just started my six hours with another soldier. Everything went fine. We smoked cigarettes and kept ourselves occupied until our watch ended at midnight. Then we received a call from our superior 
and he told us that one of the soldiers that was supposed to take the watch couldn't come, and one of us had to stay for another watch of six hours. We tossed a coin to know who will stay from midnight to six in the morning, with temperatures of minus 20 Celsius degrees. Of course I lost, and I had to wait for the other soldiers to come and join me for the night watch. And they didn't send the best, because I knew he would sleep all night when I saw him climbing the hill with his sleeping bag. And that's what he did. He immediately took place in the tent and fell asleep. It was the coldest and longest night of my life, but nothing special about it. The weirder part happened in the morning. We received another call from our superior, and he told us that we had an NBC exercise, which means that we have to wear our NBC suit, an anti-chemical suit. The one with the gas mask and everything that goes with it. I was really upset and exhausted because I wasn't able to sleep with that thing on and sleep was my only reward after that 12 hour watch. Well, I got out of the tent and this is where I saw something. There was a woman standing next to our antenna and she wasn't moving. She was just standing there five meters from the tent. I couldn't see her face because of the sun starting to rise behind her. Like a locked fighter in Tekken, really. I knew she was a woman because she had really long hair and she had curves. Remember that we were in the middle of nowhere and this lady was standing there, not moving like she was frozen. I started to freak out and I called the other guy to show him what I was looking at. I don't know why, but he wasn't scared at all and he told her to leave because she wasn't allowed there. But she didn't make a move, she just stood there looking at us, or at least in our direction. And this lasted for at least a minute or two. I was so confused how a woman could ignore two soldiers telling her to leave a forbidden area. I mean, we are in Switzerland. The army is not that impressive, I know, but people usually don't do this kind of thing. They would just move away, especially when it's six in the morning. And what was she doing in the middle of nowhere? Obviously not dressed for this cold weather. How long was she standing there and how she ended up there? I didn't hear any footsteps. So many questions went through my mind at that moment. The other soldier didn't think twice and started walking towards her. When he almost reached her, she started running very fast. She ran directly into the forest nearby. I saw her getting deep down in the forest and she disappeared from our sight. I'm really a rational thinker. I question everything and think that there is always an explanation. For me, the explanation is that she was simply a jogger because of the way she ran to the forest, but almost three minutes have passed between the first time I saw her and the moment she started running away. Three minutes of not moving at all, looking at me, dressed with something really tight with minus 20 degrees and in the middle of nowhere. I was driving and my brother was in the passenger seat, reading the assigned chapter for that week's EMS class out loud. We were coming up on an exit when I saw the thing coming down the eastbound freeway ramp. I have to call it a thing because I have no idea what I saw. It moved so fast. To give an idea how fast, we were about 50 yards away and I saw it at the same time I heard it zip by. It looked like a ripple. Like if you saw a heat distortion but throttling forward. It registered as a momentary blur. I don't have a reference for what I saw, so my brain instantly tried to reject it. It happened so fast, I didn't even react. Not so much as a what the fuck. I didn't even mention it. I will say this though. Traffic was heavy enough that it seems unlikely no one else saw. And I'm baffled that I, it could manoeuvre at that speed without colliding with other vehicles. I didn't think about it again until the next time we passed that exit, but even then, I thought about it for maybe a second. When we passed the exit again about a week later, my brother blindsided me. He said, bro, we have to talk about the blur. Apparently, he looked up from his book and saw the same thing I did, but his take was a bit different. He claimed he'd been trying to talk to me about it all week, but every time he tried, his whole train of thought derailed. His take definitely gave me the creeps though. He believed that whatever he saw was actively trying to make us forget about it. He also said that he'd practiced saying the phrase, we have to talk about the blur, 
several times that day just to make sure we talked about it. My best guess is that we saw an alien vehicle. I wish I had more to say on this, but that's all I have. If this has ever happened to you, I'd love to hear about it. This happened not too long ago, but I'm writing from how I remember the encounter. I'm 28, female, and always have some type of paranormal thing show up once a week, every three weeks, and so on. As I write this, I'm in Queens, but I live in the Bronx, visiting family. Anyway, I was sleeping in my bed. Just to give you an idea, my room in the Bronx is a small to medium-sized place. My room is small, but manageable enough to switch it up. My bed is near the window. The bookshelf is near the wall, next to the closet and door into the hallway leading to the kitchen. I have a dresser near my bed and a bigger dress. I only mention that because sometimes that is also where I see odd things. Anyway, it has to be around three or four o'clock in the morning when I felt something going like a crab moving on top of me in my bed. I wake the heck up thinking it's a family member or the cat, but neither. All I see is a dark shadow of something like a male figure, but a shadow, near the bottom, moving from side to side of the bed. I wanted to move, but I felt like I couldn't for whatever reason, so I just kept my eyes directly at it. It was using its arms, like a crab walking on my bed. This happened for a few minutes before I finally woke up from not being able to move, and my half-awake, half-asleep self. I looked around and went back to sleep. Anyone wondering what that was? I got my guesses. Once it was completely materialized, meaning it was using a lot of energy. Two, I could not move, which I beat was it on a fucking purpose to put me in a damn neutral state. But the arms and body, that does raise questions. I have other experiences. Sometimes around the bookshelf where I hear books or small items move, sometimes by my dresses where things get knocked into or I hear tapping. The hall is basically near the bathroom, where in that experience, I heard something in the bathroom. I know because when I'm in the dark, it happens one way or another. But you be the judge of that. Lately, I've been seeing things and I didn't think anything of it. Until tonight. I constantly hear things moving. Things that shouldn't be moving. In my home. I hear walking. Other stuff like that. Today, as I was getting ready to leave for school, I saw a strange man in the mirror for a split second before he disappeared. I was kind of shocked, but I forgot about it. I go through my day and it's time to go to sleep. It's normally really hard for me to fall asleep, and tonight was no different. I tried to fall asleep and started having some weird dreams, nightmares. I woke up and thought nothing of it. Then I tried to go back to sleep. I had another strange nightmare and this time that same man I saw in the mirror earlier in the day was there. Needless to say, I was more shaken and frightened. I awoke and ran to the restroom to try and calm myself down. Then I tried to go back to sleep. Now this is the part that's making me write this post. When I was younger, say in middle school, I used to get sleep paralysis almost every night. And seeing things has never been a part of my sleep paralysis until tonight. I had another nightmare and realized I was half awake and paralyzed. Something that hadn't happened in years. But this was different. I was seeing things, that man. All I could do was whimper because I simply couldn't move. I was in shock and then something else strange happened. I felt something enter my body, some kind of energy. I don't know how to explain it. My whole body shivered as I felt this and was having this vision. It was like nothing I've ever felt before. I got extremely cold and even more frightened. I finally got out of the paralyzed state and tried to make sense of things but I simply couldn't. I'm just really in shock and don't know what to do. So I came here. 
I just want to know if anyone has ever experienced anything similar and how they dealt with it. I'll be telling these stories like if I would have to write her in a diary. It all started in summer 2010, when I was five, and my family moved to a rather big city in Switzerland. We live in a block building which was built in 2007, so it was fairly new at the time. Ever since I moved into there, I've been experiencing a lot of activity in my home, which is strange as it was just constructed. 2011 to 2014. Every now and then, me and my brother were seeing orbs floating around the transparent people staring at us. I was able to take a picture, which I am unable to upload, as the file is on a seven-year-old hard drive, which I accidentally dropped. But I'll try to explain it. It was a pic of a doorway in my home. The door was open, and in the doorway there was someone. A completely white person. No face, no eyes, nothing. Just a white flash in the shape of a person. Keep in mind that I didn't use the flash function for the picture. And there was a second picture even more scary. I was seven and really bored. My grandma just picked me up from school in her blue Mazda 3. I, for no reason, took out my 20 francs, $24 MP3 player, which has a shitty camera, and made a photo of the huge underground garage we were in. There was it. A round, seven foot tall, completely black person. Again, with no face or anything else except eyes. It was standing right in front of my grandma and staring down at her. 2015 to 2018. My brother and I were seeing a lot of ghosts in the reflection of our windows, especially when studying. But in this time period, nothing more happened. Activities became so rare that I thought the ghosts were gone. 2020 to now. I've been hearing a lot of strange sounds coming from my room. Something even growled at me while I was playing Minecraft single player. I didn't have my headphones on as I was trying to listen to my brother who just got called by a call center scammer. Then, right behind me, a growl like a werewolf. It's still one of the loudest sounds I ever heard, but I was the only one who heard this. The day before yesterday, 1.15am. As I'm 15 years old, I live with my parents, just like any other 15 year old. So that night, I had to take a massive dump. There is a hallway connecting the kitchen and the bathroom. So I just finished taking a dump and washing my hands. My brother, 16 year old, comes bursting into the bathroom and locks the door. He said he heard a door opening and locked us in so we don't get grounded for staying up so long. But it wasn't my mom. Not my grandparents, who live with us. It was something unexplainable. So 20 minutes have passed, and we're still locked in. I can hear rustling, like someone was searching my jackets, hanging in the same hallway as the bathroom. 30 minutes have passed. I hear footsteps and have freaked out. 34 minutes later, my brother just unlocked the door, and we're making a run for it. Since then, every night, I hear footsteps coming from the same room. I need an explanation of what's going on in here, as I can't get any sleep from hearing footsteps in the hallway and kitchen. I grew up on a farm that was settled by my great-grandfather in the 1800s. To this day, whenever I go back, I and anyone with me feel like we're being watched and that we're not welcome. My childhood was filled with terrifying interactions with the paranormal. My closet door would fly open in the middle of the night. My siblings and I would hear banging and voices all night and would discuss what we heard in the mornings. On a weekly basis, I would hear this cackling, growling sound getting closer and closer to my bed, eventually hearing it right beside me and then feeling something push me into my bed and tell me it was going to drag me to the pits of hell. I would assume this was sleep paralysis, except for some noticeable things that happened afterwards. One evening after the threats, I went to my sister's room as my mother was sleeping in her bed because she was scared. I walk into her room and a floating head was on her bedpost, 
turning in circles, making the cackling sound. I went back to my room for a sleepless night. A few nights later, I heard the cackling again, getting closer and closer. I pulled the covers over my head and waited for the inevitable. My sister then screams at the top of her lungs, sending us all running to her room. She had heard the cackling and a ghost of a woman flew into her room, right above her bed. Terrifying. I won't get into details unless asked, but we messed around with a Ouija board my parents bought us for some reason. Including once when we snuck it into a church, which was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was like adding fuel to fire. Eventually, things quieted down after they got someone in, unsure who, and they determined there was a portal to hell in the closet and put some crystals around the house. The house to this day still has that eerie feeling of being watched and the feeling of not being wanted. I've been periodically stalked by entities since, but that's ended since I became a Christian. I don't do drugs or drink, FYI. This is not my first experience with things that have eye shine, other than animals. This is not my first time seeing a shadow person. However, this is my first time seeing two shadow people at the same time, and with eye shine. Through my new lizard tank I just bought yesterday. Needless to say, I flipped out and ran to get my parents and brother to come see them. When I came back, they were gone. I was not thinking well at the moment to take a pic or video of it. Damn it. But I have this story to share, and I hope someone will at least see this and tell me what the fuck I saw. I just got this new common lizard I saved at work. He or she is blind in both eyes and was very dehydrated and hungry. It wouldn't get off my finger the whole day, so my bro and I decided to get it a tank and keep him. Well, I put this tank together real late last night and went to bed. I woke up late for work, but I decided to go ahead and feed and water and check on the little guy. I put my face almost up against the glass to watch him, when on the back of the tank, I saw what looked like a shadow moving on the other side of the glass. I ignored it and didn't think anything of it until I saw a quick flash. I tracked it with my eyes and saw it flash a few times. Then it came into focus. I thought I was seeing a cat's reflection on the window that was behind me, but then I could make out a general face shape of what I imagined was a person's face, but it was all smoky shadow. Right where a human's eyes would be were two perfect eye shine globes. I could tell when it actually looked at me and saw me. It snapped its eyes on me and quickly disappeared from the back glass pane on the tank. That's when the second shadow figure appeared, with its eye shine very bright and clear. Almost like it had just walked up. And when it saw me, it started moving its head very, very, very fast, back and forth. I couldn't help it, but I started following its eye shine with my eyes when it started moving very fast back and forth. When it had my attention, it literally snapped its eyes onto mine, and I could not look away. It didn't flinch or move at all. That's when I freaked out and ran for my family to see if they could see this too. When I got there, the shadows were gone along with their eye shine. To me, it almost felt like I was the creature in a tank being watched. Freaky feeling. It's been bothering me all day, and any time I see a reflection anywhere, I'm always looking just in case I can see those things again. Whenever my grandfather would come to my house, I was 11 at the time, he would wash our dishes simply because he liked to. It gave him something to do. The funny thing about this was that he was not good at washing the dishes. They would always have a soapy taste and residue on them after he was done. We knew he liked to do it, so we never stopped him, just kind of dealt with it. Moving forward to the night he died, he passed at 6.20pm. The next morning, at exactly 6.20am, the dishes crashed. He had not been over our house for quite a few months, since he was hospitalised for a while before his passing. My family all went downstairs and just brushed it off as a coincidence and went back to bed. 
I woke up around 9 a.m. freezing cold. I still had the events from 6 a.m. on my mind. I went downstairs and stood right at the sink and just stared at the dishes. All of a sudden, I felt a rush of warmth starting at my toes and eventually making its way up to my head. I knew he was there with me. I could just feel it. I started to make breakfast, pouring cereal and milk into a bowl. I couldn't believe it. My cereal tastes soapy. It had to be a sign from him, as he hadn't washed our dishes in months. I know that this isn't something entirely too active, but it's stuck with me to this day. I think about it so often, so I figured it was worth sharing. I live in a small town, right on the edge of a very popular wooded area that attracts a number of paranormal investigators every year. There's been multiple stories of the weird things that go on in those woods. Black-eyed girl, pigman, cult activity, weird cemeteries, alien sightings, etc, etc. Most of the locals have witnessed something weird go on in those woods, which has widely been reported. But first, I wanted to talk about a few experiences I've had from living in the town. I'll start with the experiences from my parents' house. So, this town is an ex-miners community. Most of the town is now built on top of the old mines, including my parents' house. My parents' house is, in my opinion, 100% haunted. There's certain parts of the house I won't go into on my own. So, let's start from the beginning. We moved into this house back in 1999. Little things would happen, like things would go missing and turn up in weird places, but nothing major. Things started to pick up over time. One night, my dad, who used to believe there was no such thing as ghosts, was up late doing paperwork. He heard footsteps on the stairs and thought it was my mom coming down. After they reached the hallway, they stopped. He thought this was a bit odd and was about to get up to see what was going on. That was when his glass of wine slid across the entire dining room table and smashed up against the wall. Another experience my dad had was when he fell asleep on the sofa and said he was thrown across the room and he heard a man's voice tell him to go to bed. Personal experience that I've had in that house include seeing an apparition of some old style boots walk behind me in the mirror, footsteps and voices heard in the hallway and dining room at night, the whole family has seen things move across tables and the fireplace. The thing that creeped me out the most is that we've all seen the face of a man appear on the living room window. The front of my parents' house has a very long driveway, so we know it's not just someone walking past. We've all seen it, including visitors to our house and everyone has described it in the same way. The one experience that sticks with me the most is the time I was washing the dishes in the kitchen. It was pitch black outside, but all the kitchen lights were on, and you could see into the hallway. I saw the reflection of what I thought was my dad walking past behind me. I even felt someone walk past behind me. He carried on walking into the next room, which is a downstairs toilet. I started talking to him and thought it was a bit rude he didn't answer me. I then walked into the living room to find my dad sitting there. I asked him why he didn't answer me, and his response was, he hadn't moved from the living room all night, but I know I saw a man walk past me. The room that creeps everyone out, the dining room. This room is an extension onto the house and there's an archway connecting to the next room. There's something about this room and that archway that unsettles everyone. This is where a lot of the apparition activity has been spotted, including shadows, footsteps, and just a general unsettling feeling. I've also experienced someone tapping on the window from the outside of the dining room while I was home alone. The outside of the window is the garden which is only accessible through the back door of the house. There's so many experiences that I want to talk about which happened in my hometown. I just want to point out I've been on a few local ghost hunts and I've met a fair few mediums. They've all said I'm sensitive, which is apparently someone who isn't psychic but is able to sense or see more than the average person, which honestly would explain a lot because I've witnessed a lot of weird things.
I visited my parents' house this evening for dinner, which reminded me of a few more experiences that I'd had in the house, which I'd missed from my previous story. So back when I was 18, I worked nights. I came home at 7am on a Saturday morning with my now fiancé. We used to work together, which is how we met. We were always super quiet in the morning because everyone else would still be in bed. We went straight into the kitchen as usual and clicked on the kettle to make a post-work brew before bed. I also forgot to point out in my last story that the very active dining room is the room attached to the kitchen. So you walk through it to enter the kitchen. Myself and my partner were quietly chatting away when we heard footsteps in the hallway which entered the dining room and abruptly stopped. We both heard, as clear as day, a woman started laughing. We both whipped our heads around, thinking it would be my mom. But obviously, there was no one there. Everyone else in the house was still asleep in bed. The following evening when I woke up, I spoke to my mom about what had happened in the kitchen. She told me that she had also been experiencing weird things going on in the house that week. At this point, we were used to the spirit of the man that lived in our house, But this was something else. It felt sinister. The following weeks brought some odd activity in the house. I and the rest of the household on different occasions heard a little girl skipping and laughing in the hallway. Female whispers and crying could also be heard in the night. My mom went to see a friend after this who was a psychic. She explained to my mom that this little girl had come into contact with her while in the local town. The girl had taken a liking to my mom and decided to follow her home. It wasn't the first time someone had come to see this psychic about this girl. Apparently, she had followed a few people home. We decided to get the house cleansed to send this girl home. However, the male spirit that we've nicknamed John still remains in the house to this day. Although the spirit of the girl has now left the house, there was something very unsettling about it being there. That atmosphere at the time changed in the house and everyone seemed on edge. Back in the day, I had a friend who lived next door to the local high school. I stopped over one night and refused to step foot in this house again. A bit of backstory. The school was built in the early 1900s. It's got a lot of history to it. I attended this high school growing up just like nearly everyone in the town did. There were rumours of it being haunted, but most of the time everyone just put it down to it being a stupid story. Under the school was a number of tunnels. They were originally built due to the Second World War as safety precautions. The tunnels are still used to this day for storage. The story goes that one of the students was murdered in the tunnels by a group of teenagers. However, I've never been able to find any truth to the story. So, I went back to my friend's house. The layout of his house was very strange, as it used to be a pub back in the early 1900s. We were upstairs in his room, just talking. It was about 1am, and it was just the two of us in the house. All of a sudden, through his bedroom window, was a flash of light. This obviously caught our attention, so we peered out the window. Directly out of his window, you could see the assembly hall of the school which for some reason, all the lights were turned on. I looked at him as if to say, what the fuck is going on? And he said to me, just wait, you'll hear the singing in a minute. Lo and behold, we heard muffled singing coming from the hall. It carried on for about a minute and then abruptly stopped and all the lights switched back off in the school. I asked him what the hell that was and he replied, it happens fairly often. I've gotten used to it. We put a film on to calm my nerves as to what had just happened. Around an hour had passed and we heard footsteps from outside his bedroom door and it went eerily cold in his room. The pacing outside his door continued for just a minute and then stopped. I was terrified at this point, but he didn't look bothered by it at all. I told him to explain to me what on earth was going on. He said to me, this house is haunted by five ghosts. The old lady who walks back and forth on the driveway who could be seen through the kitchen window. She wore a scarf around her head and had a hunched back. The lady with no teeth who would just stare at you, smile and then disappear. 
and the two children who could be heard laughing and playing together. He said he was used to seeing them all and they were harmless. He then paused, took a breath and said, and there's the one we call the tall man. He was the one outside the door. He would only appear when renovation was being done on the house. He didn't like change apparently and he would make that known. Rooms where renovation was taking place would become freezing cold constantly. It didn't matter how warm the rest of that house was, that particular room would be stone cold. Things in the room would get thrown around at nights and someone could be heard pacing and stomping angrily about. The reason he was called the tall man was because of obvious reasons. My friend said he was seen him twice and he was nearly seven feet tall, in period clothing and wearing a top hat. After that night, he did say to me that he was unsure why he had made an appearance that night, as there was no renovation work taking place when I'd stopped there. We both got obsessed with trying to find out the history of the house, but couldn't find anything apart from the fact it was an old pub. I wouldn't go back to that house after that night, and every time I'd walk past the house on my way to school, I would get anxious and refuse to look at it. The town has a number of pubs, two of which are from the 1700s and still in use today. These two pubs are particularly haunted. The Cross Keys. The former coaching inn was built way back in 1746 and still stands and functions as a pub today. The infamous local serial killer, William Palmer, who poisoned a number of people, was said to be a regular there. There's a story of him poisoning one of his possible victims in that pub. The pub is known for cold spots, people's drinks moving, voices and footsteps in the cellar, and numerous accounts of shadow people. William Palmer was eventually caught, and he was hanged for his crimes. It's his spirit that people believe still wanders the pub. The Four Crosses. If you're ever on the hunt for a truly terrifying experience, the Four Crosses is the place to go. Declared as one of the most haunted pubs in Britain. The Four Crosses was built in the 17th century and again is still in use as a pub today. There's reports of a roundhead soldier from the Civil War who spotted in the ladies' toilets. As well as a woman called Emily who constantly cries. One of the locals from the early 2000s is said to have never left the pub after he died. A young man in the garage who committed suicide to also still used to reside here. The most common ghost is that of a little girl who's seen often in the downstairs bar. Police report this as being the black eyed girl from the local woods. But from my personal experience, it's not her. The Four Crosses hosts ghost hunts on a regular basis, one of which I attended a few years ago. We got started on our night with the usual tour of the building before splitting off into smaller groups. About six of us were sitting in one of the bedrooms, asking the usual, if there's anyone here, make yourself known. After a few minutes, the TV came on in the room and lit the room up with static white noise. This obviously shit us all up. After a few seconds, it switched back off again. Upon investigation, we found that the TV wasn't even plugged in. None of us had a logical explanation as to how this had happened. We moved our investigation into the attic of the building. Just a bit more history for you here. The wood beams in the attic were originally beams taken from a ship, so the wood beams are older than the building. This was told to us after a couple of people in my group, myself included, said we felt a bit motion sick. Apparently, it was a regular recurrence in that room. So, we got out the Ouija board to see if we could contact anyone. We did. We started talking to this little girl. She was scared and felt alone. She was trying to find her mother. She spelt out her name to us, Emily, not the woman who's supposedly meant to be seen crying. We asked if she was buried in the cemetery across the road and she said yes. A few people went over to the cemetery and actually found the grave of a little girl named Emily. Throughout the night, we conducted a number of investigations where we heard whispers, creaks and odd noises. As we came to the end of the night, we placed a torch on the table and we asked Emily to turn it on, to which it lit up extremely bright. 
This was actually caught on video. I'll have to see if I can find it. Everyone seems to have a story about the Four Crosses, and it is extremely haunted. It was one of the most active ghost hunts I've been on. It's close to the local woods, but people are unsure if they're connected. As I edge ever so closer to talking about the infamous woods, I thought I'd talk about one of the oldest locations in the town, which lies just on the edge of the chase, Castle Ring. Castle Ring was originally thought to be back in the Iron Age. Although there's no defined date, the area was believed to be over 2,000 years old. Unfortunately, only the perimeter groundwork is there today. During the 12th or 13th century, a hunting lodge was built, the foundations of which are still visible. Rich in history, this small hill fort has a lot of stories behind it. From UFOs, to werewolf sightings, to the spirit of a nun. And as always, my own personal experiences of the place. So, let's get into it. Back in 2004, a local was driving past the car park that lies at the bottom of Castle Ring, when he spotted a hair-covered humanoid figure that crossed the road. Shocked by what he was witnessing, he slowed his car down and attempted to take a photo. He was quoted as saying, It was about seven feet tall, with short, shiny, dark brown hair, a large head, and had eyes that glowed bright red. The spirit of the nun is often seen near Castle Ring, near where locals would collect water. I was unable to find her backstory. People are unsure if she drowned here, was murdered, or was just somehow connected to the area. The abandoned windmill that lies just up the road from Castle Ring also has a sad backstory. Local folklore suggested that this windmill was built on an old pagan burial ground, which could suggest why it's so active. Two children also suffocated in the flower silo who were still reported to be active in the area to this day. The legend tells of a tall, black, shadow-like figure that was spotted as the children suffocated, which is possibly the same shadow humanoid that was seen back in 2004. Earlier this year, while stuck in lockdown, I decided to take the dog for a walk as part of my daily allowed out once a day for exercise. I hadn't been up to Castle Ring for years, so I thought it would make a nice change to my usual walk. It was raining, so I knew hardly anyone would be out. I parked up and noticed my car was the only one there. I didn't think much of it, as this year has seen a whole load of weird. I started walking around the perimeter on the allocated path. As the path dipped into more of an enclosed wooded area, I started to feel very uneasy. I took out my headphones as something didn't feel right. My eyes started darting left to right as I felt like something was watching me. My dog, who loves everyone and everything, started snarling and barking at something in the woods. At this point, I decided to go straight back to the car. I picked up the pace and walked back on myself, constantly looking around. Out of the corner of my eye, something caught my attention. I snapped my head back around to catch what looked like a black shadow darting behind one of the trees. I ran back to my car and drove as quickly as I could away from that area. I now remember why I hadn't been up there in years. The last time I was up there, myself and a couple friends witnessed strange looking lights in the sky. The whole area just made me feel uneasy and even thinking about it gives me the chills. I know I'm not the only one to have experienced weird things go on up there. I thought it was about time I spoke about the woods. Stretching for 30 miles, Canuck Chase truly is a stunning place to go in the day. If you're stupid enough to wander up there in the night, make sure you don't go alone. However, just because you go in the daytime, don't think the light will protect you. The spirits and demonic entities of the chase are known to make an appearance throughout the day. In the 60s, two girls between the age of 5 and 6 were murdered. Their bodies were found on the part of the chase that is now known as Birch's Valley. This bit of history is important, so keep it in mind. So, let's get into it. 
The most famous spirit that haunts the chase is that of the black-eyed girl. She doesn't appear very often, but when she does, it causes a media storm. Back in 2014, a local was flying his drone over a dense wooded area of Birch's Valley. It was there he captured what looked like a girl with black eyes floating between the trees. It had been 30 years since the last sighting of this girl, but no one knows why there was such a long gap in the sightings. When sightings take place, a piercing scream of a girl can be heard. People flock towards the noise, thinking a child is in danger. No older than 10, the girl is known to stand there with her hands covering her eyes. She will then lower her hands to reveal the coal black pits that she has for eyes. And within a blink of an eye, she'll disappear back into the woods. Every person that has witnessed her is given the same account. She does the same thing over and over. She will also only appear in the daytime. So, the murders that I was on about at the beginning of this, some people believe that the black-eyed girl is the spirit of one of those little girls. It is said that around the time of the murders, another seven-year-old girl went missing, but her body has never been found. Just a bit more to add to this story that's slightly more close to home. Around 15 years ago, my father-in-law was driving back from work. He drove through the chase, just as many people do every day of their commute. He drove down the long stretch of road through Birch's Valley. He looked in his rearview mirror to see two very young girls sitting in the back of his car. He slammed his brakes on and swerved his car. He came to a stop and checked the back seat again. Nothing. The girls had disappeared. He explained to me in much detail what the girls looked like, from the colour of their hair down to the clothes they were wearing. He's convinced to this day that the spirit of those little girls who were murdered had made their way into his car. The chase is covered in paranormal activity, from the demonic pigman to the copious amounts of sports reported to have seen. I love going up there for the beauty of the area, but it always feels as if I'm being watched. Local folklore talks about a horrendously creepy looking creature that stalks people of the chase. Ask a local about the pigmen, they'll smile and tell you the story as if a ghost story to tell children. Ask them to go into the depth of Canic Chase with you, and you'll see the look of horror take over their face. The story goes that a woman who was accused of witchcraft became pregnant. She didn't want to bring shame on her family by having a child out of wedlock so she went deep into the woods to give birth. When her child was born, it was horrendously disfigured, supposedly due to the corruption of her practicing in witchcraft. She offered her child up to the woodland in hopes that she would be forgiven for the evil she had done. It's said she returned to the village where she soon died from a flu-like illness, taking her secret about her child to the grave with her. A few years later, people started to report a humanoid-like creature that had facial features that resembled a pig. He would watch the children from the village while he stood in the tree line, sulking. After a number of children went missing and livestock had been gruesomely killed and thrown around the farmland, the village soon became abandoned and reclaimed by the woods. Centuries went by when the local scout club was camping over the chase, close to where the abandoned village was. The scout leader recalled the story of the pigman. He told the scouts that if they sing a certain song, pigman would appear. So they all stood around the campfire and summoned a pigman. He is said to have appeared and murdered all of the group apart from one boy. From that day, the pigman has been known to roam the woods once again. Now, there's absolutely no proof to back up this story, which is why a lot of people state it as folklore. However, there have been numerous accounts of people seeing a man that stand in the tree line with unusual facial features. People have gotten close enough to see his demonic muted face. It's then that he will run back off into the tree line, making a blood curdling high pitched noise described as a pig squeal. Unusual footprints have been found in the area, yet no one can work out what animal it's meant to belong to. There have been a number of people reporting that in the evening, 
just as the sun is going down, as the chase is quiet and calm, a distant, high-pitched pig squeal can be heard from deep in the woods. Kanak actually has a large number of pagans that live in the area. It's something that always seemed to have been a part of this town. However, it's a well-known fact that cults and those who delve in dark witchcraft have practiced it on Kanak Chase. Could the pigman be a result of witchcraft? Or is this entity something else entirely? I still have more stories about the chase, but those are more UFO related. Tonight, I want to delve into Gaskin's Wood, part of the chase that lies between Hednesford Hills and Cannock Chase. This small wooded area has a sorrowful backstory. Back in the First World War, a couple lived close to the woodlands. The husband went off to fight and the wife was left at home. Months later, the letter stopped coming and the wife believed her husband had died at war. She moved on and started a relationship with one of her neighbours. She soon fell pregnant. The husband suddenly returned home from war and upon finding out about his wife being pregnant, he murdered her in a fit of rage. It is said he dragged her body out into the garden and left her rotting there for two days while it snowed. He then took her to the woods where he chopped her up into tiny pieces and scattered her body. Eventually, after she was reported missing, he confessed to his crimes. The police were unable to locate her and the husband agreed to show them where she was. He took them to part of the woods where a water container was, of which he showed the police her head. He had stuffed it between the water container and a pipe. The rest of her body was never found. The woods is named after her murder. Their last name was Gaskin, hence Gaskin's Wood. This part of the woods is a popular area for teenagers to camp, and I spent a number of weekends over there when I was younger. I used to cut through these woods on my way home and always felt on edge walking through there. Sometimes I would run through it just to get through the woods quicker. The one night, myself and a group of friends camped up there. We were pretty loud that night and were all just having a laugh, being usual teenagers. As the night drew on, we all eventually retired back to our tents. Around 4am, we were woken by the noise of a woman wailing and crying around the campsite. A couple of us got out the tent to see what was going on. Nothing. We stood about reassuring each other that we weren't going mad and that we all heard it. It was quiet. The air was still. No birds, no rustling of trees from animals, nothing. It was eerie. That's when my friend went pale. His eyes looking straight behind me, he whispered, What? What is that? We turned around to see a woman, battered and bruised, wearing a white nightdress, crying. But the thing that made us all stand there in shock and unable to speak was the fact we could see right through her. And just like that, she vanished right in front of us. It's safe to say we quickly packed everything up and were home by 6am. It's been around 10 years since I've stepped foot in that part of the woods and you couldn't pay me to spend a night there again. Back when I was 13, my great grand became very poorly. She was 93 at this point She'd had an amazing life, but unfortunately, she was suffering from cancer. At this point, she was in the hospital of an end-of-life care. We knew she was going to die, and we were trying to make her as comfortable as possible. The one night I woke up suddenly and sat in bed. I remember seeing my alarm clock that said 3.04am. At the end of my bed, I saw my great-gran. She was holding hands with my great-granddad, who had died 40 years previously. She was holding a bouquet of flowers in the other hand and she was smiling. She came to say goodbye. I woke up the next morning thinking about how weird the dream I'd had was and how detailed it was. After brushing this off as a dream, I went and spoke to my mum about it. She went pale as I explained in detail what I'd dreamed about. She told me that she had the exact same dream and she remembered the clock in her room saying 3.03am. 
My great-grandparents were both wearing and doing the exact same thing in both our dreams. At this moment, the phone rang. It was my granddad. He'd been crying, but was clearly trying to hold it together for the sake of the phone call. My great-grand passed away overnight at 2.57am. To this day, I'm convinced that it wasn't a dream, and in fact, the spirits of my great-grandparents who came and visited myself and my mom to say goodbye. The house that I grew up in was haunted, has many stories from all of my family, and from the previous owners and even the people before them. Well, the house had issues. A lot of people refused to go back after visiting just once. So with that and just how old it is, no one wanted to buy it when my dad put it up for sale in 2011. In 2014, my fiancé and I took it over. Well, apparently during those three years that the house was on the market and empty, it wasn't empty. Someone broke in and took up residency. We were both package handlers for UPS in Louisville, Kentucky. This house was in New Albany, Indiana, which is 10 or 12 minutes away. We both worked the late shift and rode together. So at 11 o'clock, we'd leave the house and get back around 5 or 5.30. Literally the second day we had gone to work after moving in, it happened. We walked in the front door. I went to the bathroom, which was after the kitchen. The kitchen also had a door, but didn't have a deadbolt, just a twisted knob type lock. I walk in the bathroom and it smells like shit. The faucet is on, and I thought my fiancé left it on. I called her to the bathroom and said, hey, what the fuck, did you leave this on? The faucet was on and it wasn't a small drip. It was as if someone was washing their hands. Suddenly, I noticed it. After I turn the water off, I'm standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She's standing in front of me, but in the middle of the kitchen, with the kitchen door behind her. The door is wide open, and I somehow didn't even notice it. She thought I had opened it to go take out the trash, but when we got home, I went directly to the bathroom. At this point, I told her to get behind me, and I unholstered my pistol, because yes, I carry. I went out back, walked around, and saw nothing. Locked the door, went back in, and checked the house. Found old food and bottles, shit stains and it reeked of urine, all upstairs in my sister's old room. Two days later, we get back from work and my back door is wide open again. This time I think it was to get their stuff. I think we almost caught them two nights prior and that's why the faucet was on. What's incredibly creepy though, is that literally the very next day after work, right across the street from my house was this homeless person. They were pushing a shopping cart with a blanket and a trash bag. This person had a creepy mask on. They were watching the house and when my car lights hit them, the person started to move it along, but very slowly. I still wonder if they were studying for hours, but it didn't matter. Same day, I went to bought multiple locks for each door. When I was either four or five, I was alone and asleep in my bedroom. I slept on a bunk bed, but my half-brother only lived with us every other weekend, so he wasn't there. I was completely knocked out, and then I started to wake up, but my eyes remained closed. I remember hearing my heartbeat fading, but with every heartbeat, I saw pulsing black and red. I was trying to completely wake up, but after maybe a minute, I took a huge breath and opened my eyes. It was still dark outside, and I was breathing incredibly heavy. I was sleeping on my side and was about to raise my head and look at my closet behind me. As a kid, I hated my closet because the door would not close. It would close just enough to leave maybe a two inch dark gap. Remember, I'm in my bunk bed about five feet high. The bed is parallel to the wall and the ladder is on the front side of the bed. My head rests right in front of the ladder my closet is maybe six feet away, but along the same wall. So suddenly, I wake up and go to raise my head and turn to look at the closet and make sure it's still as closed as possible. Immediately, as I start to turn my head, a voice from directly behind my head says, Stop. Don't turn around. I start to turn my head a little more. 
The voice then said, if you look behind you, and something along the lines of, we'll be dead and hanging on your back wall. As a stupid four or five year old kid, at this point I'm terrified, but my but turn my head really fast to face this voice and nothing. I got out of bed to turn my TV and light on and just sat there in terror for the rest of the night. It's been 21 or 22 years and I can still see it so clearly. So at the end of the afternoon, I believe, I went to the basement, which was accessible from the outside instead of the inside. There was a single bulb which could be turned on after a set of stairs with a rope slash cord. This basement was mainly empty, made of concrete floor and wood walls. There was this one couch. It projected a shadow because of the light, but suddenly, when I looked, another shadow appeared. It was the figure of a man. It was a figure on the floor as if something was standing there, but obviously nothing was. I was scared, but it got worse. It started running towards me. Have you ever had a shadow run towards you? Because I see nothing. I'm on stairs. I have a door which is easily blocked by anything. I had to almost bash the door for it to open, to which I always hated the basement and never went again. Each time I left my house, there was also a garage, which wasn't ours, but right next on our property. My friend's dad owned the garage. It was a glassless window, which was always pitch black, even in daytime. From this window, you could hear something. My name was Zachary, and every time I'd walk past it, I'd hear Zach, Zach, Zach in the wind. Not just once, many, many times. And today was no better. Lately, I've done a spirit box session, which I received answers to, but not very clear. So that's to take very lightly. Why did I do a session? Well, I'm chilling on my bed, and occasionally, once every three weeks or so, I'll feel something. Like a person climbing on my bed. Not just a little weight, no. The bed literally feels and also makes the sound of someone laying down on it. It happened to me approx four times. There was also this time when me and my sister were home, but my parents were gone for a while. And we both at the same time started to feel chills, started to feel worried. My sister also mentioned she heard on the first night, get out. I've seen shadows in my room, but not a lot of them. Only two since we're here, so it could be anything. When I was 17, I'm 24 now, I visited a cemetery at night with a small group of friends. We were just going to look at the graves give a little love to the graves that looked like maybe no one visited them anymore because they were from so long ago. We weren't going there to hurt anyone or mess around with the graves because we were, most of us still are, very spiritual, i.e. not religious. I'd always liked cemeteries and felt a kind of peace when I'm in one, so I was very comfortable there and relaxed. I think that may be why what happened happened at all. I was following near the back of the group, lingering on some graves to read what was written when everything, for me, goes blank. The rest of what happens is what my friends told me about hours later. <laughs> hey, this one's mine. I called to the person next to me in my group. He turned around to laugh and told me to quit playing around when he stopped. I should have died, really. It wasn't my fault. What? What do you mean? He asked, getting my other friends to stop and walk back to me. Well, you see... I was playing in the barn with the kittens, and the man came in with a gun, and bang! I don't think they would have believed I wasn't the one speaking if the voice coming out of me hadn't been so much higher pitched, and had a very, very, very country accent. I don't know why he did it. He was my daddy's best friend. For the next two hours, I led them around the cemetery, pointing out graves and telling them about the people buried there like I knew them. One of my friends had a phone out to use as a flashlight and recorded everything I was saying so they could face check when we went back to the house we were staying at. Eventually I stopped again, frowning at a headstone. This is my brother. He got to live a long, long time. It's not fair. I wanted to live too, I said, stomping my foot before just collapsing on the ground. I didn't wake up until we got home that night 
and I remember I had the worst headache of my whole life. My friend showed me the video, then we all looked up as much as we could on the internet to see if I had been right. I was right about everything except one thing. The grave I had collapsed on top of hadn't been the brother of the girl who had supposedly possessed me. He had been the son of a father's best friend. The same best friend who she said shot her. I've never been back to that cemetery since. I'm afraid a little girl won't be the one to possess me this time. I was around six or so and my brother about ten. We had just moved to a new council flat where the previous tenant had passed away from old age. So this was around 1997. Before we moved in, my parents got everything in the house sorted. Furniture and such put into place. Me and my brother shared a room and on the first nights when we were asleep is when we had our first paranormal experience. I won't say ghost because the way this ends may say otherwise. About two in the morning, we were both woken up to our TV bedroom, flicking on and off to static. The main light in the room flickering and the furniture cupboards and drawers opening and closing. This wasn't quiet at all. We were both so startled and scared and genuinely screaming for our parents. After about 15 seconds or so of no response from them, we ran out the room to our parents' room and found them in bed. The weird thing was the cold. We were pushing them and screaming right next to them, but they didn't wake up. They were both so cold. The last thing I remember of that night was looking into the hallway through my parents' bedroom door and there was just white light. That was it. My brother can't remember looking through the door, so it seems only I saw the light. Me and my brother then woke up from our beds about 8am in the morning or so. After my brother woke me in a panicked state and looked at each other and we talked about it. As we talked about it, we knew it happened. We ran to our parents' room again and woke them to tell them about what happened while crying out of fear. We never did find out what happened or what was the cause. We stayed at my grandma's house for a week or so before going back and having no real problems. At least not to that scale. My dad was a huge skeptic of the paranormal, but even he experienced the weird footsteps in the hall on occasion. The weird figure in front of the bathroom door at the end of the hallway. We were and still are a poor family with health problems on my mom's side, so there wasn't much we could do. It never bothered us much other than the weird sounds and sights every so often. This still happens to this day for them. I've since moved out with a friend. Me and my brother are still adamant on what happened the first night, but we still don't know what happened in the end or how we ended up back in bed. This may be a ghost story, or for all we know, an alien abduction. We have no clues and no way to find out. My parents were both born in Poland, but met and had children in Canada. My mom's house was out in the farmlands, but my dad's house was in a small town with a huge amount of history. The house he grew up in was a small house to begin with, but throughout had so many additions that it now resembles a small mansion. The house is also very poorly insulated, so the stairwell, basement, attic and all the hallways were usually freezing cold in the winter. Only the bedrooms have a radiator in them to maintain heat. The house has three main floors that are often used, and an attic with a fireplace. It really is a beautiful house. I always visited it in the summertime, and my sister and I slept on the top floor, just below the attic, which was empty during the summer since my grandparents rented the floor out to students during the school months. I usually spent my summers there with my sister, but with our own schooling getting more demanding with age, we tended to stop visiting as often and spent our summers in Canada. I signed up for a teaching retreat when I was 18, which would give me all of my required volunteer hours for high school. I took an extra year of high school, and I would get to go to Poland to teach English to students in Krakow. I would spend one week in my dad's hometown visiting my grandparents, then drive out to Krakow the day the retreat started. So I was given the top floor to sleep in, alone, in a very big, cold house. 
You may remember how I mentioned I have a friendly slash lonely presence following me around. When I was there, I didn't feel them. I felt strangely alone or being watched in a cold way. The day of the retreat, I woke up and showered. Then after putting my clothes on, I turned to open the door. This bathroom door has one of those fogged glass windows at eye level. You can't see anything really other than shapes and shadows through it. I reach for the handle and before I get a hold of it, I see a tall figure approach quickly. Not taking steps, but just getting closer without bobbing up and down. It's an old house, so I would have been able to hear footsteps. I didn't. Then the door rattles with a loud bang and the figure is gone. Now this happened really fast, all within the second of me grabbing for the handle and looking up through the window when I saw the figure. I thought, maybe my dad's fucking with me. We usually play stupid pranks on each other. So I opened the door quickly, ready to catch him. Nothing, nobody, not even footsteps running away. Just a really weird feeling of confidence in the air, but not my confidence. Still trying to find a rational explanation for this, I walk over to the stairwell thinking, maybe he's just that fast. And I hear him mid conversation with my 90 year old grandparents. All the other people in the house in the middle of a heated conversation. Most Polish conversations are. Starting to feel like my brain was short circuiting because this just didn't make sense. I ran through all the rooms, checking every curtain, window, closet. Maybe somebody broke in. Maybe a bird flew through a window and into the house even though the window was closed and it was clearly human in shape. Anything to not believe it because it really just felt unfamiliar and sinister. I later learned from the neighbor that the entire neighborhood was built on top of a very old and demolished graveyard. My mom's house always felt a little off. Not in a necessarily unsettling way, but in the way that you never really felt when you were alone. I've always been the silent and more observant type, so maybe that's why she targeted me out of my family. I never had a real definite feeling for her at first. Just this, somebody is staring at you right now feeling, which always forced me to push my back up against a wall in the living room and stare out at all the house. One time a bird flew into the window while I was doing this, but that could have been nothing to do with it. It really started to get bad after I watched Paranormal Activity, the first one. I feel like she follows me around and feeds off of my emotions. I saw this movie at my sister's boyfriend's house and couldn't sleep that night when I got back home because I felt that feeling like you know your friend is going to jump at you just around the corner. You just don't know when. I exited my bedroom the next morning to find everybody had left and I was home alone. I wanted to go to the bathroom but then suddenly heard one of the metal kitchen chairs sliding against a stone floor in the kitchen downstairs. I stopped and called out to my family again and no one answered. I went downstairs and saw one of the chairs slide back and make the same noise as I heard from my bedroom, the metal against stone, but nobody was around. I doubled back into my bedroom and blocked the door with my body weight, sat there until my parents came home, then rushed out to use the bathroom. After I moved out, that's when I felt her following me. That's also when I felt her getting closer to me and when I started to sense she was also a woman. She started sliding things across tables and misplacing things. I'd leave my phone on the table in front of the couch, not get up at all, then reach back for it and it's gone. I'd throw the couch apart thinking it's behind the cushions, check the kitchen and the bathroom and even throw the sheets off my bed thinking maybe I sat down there for a bit and forgot. I return to the couch with my hands in the air and there it fucking is. Sitting right on the center of one of the couch cushions, I just threw it apart, looking for it. At that point, I just yelled out, look, if you want to stay here, don't bother or disturb me. Don't hurt me. You can stay here only if you let me keep to myself and you keep to yourself. Or something along those lines. After that point, things I know I lost years ago turned up in cabinets I didn't have at the time I lost them. I didn't hear footsteps around me anymore. My cats stopped staring at a corner and yowling. I still feel her watching. I know she's following me, but I kind of like her now. 
but I can't stop thinking. Maybe she's waiting for something. I used to live in a neighborhood that was a plantation. I never experienced anything until living there. I was driving home from work. It was 9 p.m. I saw an old lady standing near my house. She was wearing a long white gown. It looked super old. Her hair was long and white, down past her knees. I couldn't see her face. It was like there was a shadow over her face. I parked my car and got out. I said hello and was walking away. She was saying things, but it sounded like gibberish. And I started to walk with baby steps, like she was very fragile. I got to my door and said, are you okay? She turned slowly towards me, looking at me, speaking gibberish. She went from walking very slowly to sprinting towards me, looking at me. What freaked me out was that when she was sprinting, it looked like she was running on air and not on ground. I screamed and went inside, locked my door and called 911. They came and went searching for her, but they said they never found her, nor had any reports of a woman missing or doing anything. When they left, I saw her from my window walking away like baby steps, with her head down. I didn't sleep good that night. The next day, my dad was in the garage and said to have saw the same woman, but not her face. He ignored her and went into the backyard. And then he heard my two-year-old nephew screaming because this old lady was laughing frantically at him. When my dad turned around, no one was there. We never talked about it. Until a year ago when I brought it up with my mom. She looked shocked. She told me there were two times in the 80s where a woman like that suddenly appeared in front of her in public. Telling her if she needs to tell anyone she can see her. A bad omen will happen. Then disappeared when my mom blinked. I don't know if this is the exact same lady, but that was shit scary. <laughs> I'm looking for some sort of explanation or feedback for this because me and my girlfriend are both thoroughly freaked out and she's adamant about what she saw and I am as well. I've never seen her this scared before and we've been together for two years now. Some history of the area before I get into the story so it will maybe make more sense. In the early 60s to the late 80s in the area that I live in, a small town in southern Illinois, there was a local group of Christian conservatives that was very much a cult. A large mansion replicating Mount Vernon, as in George Washington's estate, was built in the center of the property with cabins in the surrounding areas and an airstrip also on the property. Nowadays, the mansion and everything else is full of old junk and has been long forgotten and the man who built and was head over everyone is gone as well. If you want more info on the mansion and the history of the property, I can link it in the comments, but for now, I'm just gonna get into what happened. So my girlfriend and I have explored the property a handful of times, and I have with another close friend as well. This will matter later. Today, it was a nice breezy day, and we decided we were going to go exploring this evening, so we hit a couple spots and saved the mansion for last. When we arrived, we go through the mansion and had some of the property as usual, but we decided to head towards an area that is much more difficult to reach on the property that we have never experienced before. Me and my close friend have been towards this area, but we didn't go any further because he didn't want to and obviously was unsettled, but he wouldn't tell me why. We got as close as I did with my friend and I point out a clearing in some trees that has a fairly dry rock creek bed that we could cut through. The only thing that I noticed that seemed off was that the water appeared very, very dark and cold for how sunny it was outside. This occurred around 6 or 7 p.m. on a sunny evening in Illinois. It's still practically daylight outside. My girlfriend stares at this creek bed for a while and begins acting uneasy and quite afraid, telling me that we need to leave. I shrug it off and tell her we can just keep walking to where we plan to go and that she's just being paranoid and jumpy. She's still visibly shaken as we keep walking, insisting that we need to leave and that we shouldn't be there. As we are walking, we hear things from the area on the property. We were heading towards banging and crashing. We beat feet back to my truck and she tells me she saw a large gathering of men in blue forms gathered down in the creek looking away from us as if they were watching something very intently. She said that there was a lot of them and it gave her a very bad feeling watching them as if there was something we were not supposed to be seeing. Locking through the clearing, 
I'm not going to lie, I felt uneasy, and she refused to look again on the walk back. Anyone have any idea what could have happened here, or any explanation at all? It was 2008 and I was a freshman in college. My BFF, let's call her Kay, is one year younger than me, and we're still in high school. Most of Kay's friends were in my grade, so when we all graduated, she was left behind to finish high school pretty much as a loner. One day, I got a random message from Kay that said, Hey, how's your mom? I thought this was an odd question, considering my mom was a homeless drug addict, and I wasn't exactly in touch with her, and Kay knew this. I asked her why she was asking, and she proceeded to tell me that, because she was so lonely and bored, she started playing with a Ouija board, first with a friend, and then by herself. The ghost she was talking to claimed to be a teen boy named Caleb. Anyway, she was playing with the board as usual, when suddenly it spelled out my entire name, then my mom's entire name. I didn't even know my mom's middle name, but Kay did. Then the board spelled drugs. Kay asked the board if my mom was okay, and the board started going crazy, spelling out mama, mama, and she got really freaked out and stopped playing, then messaged me. I immediately called my mom's dad, who was a reverend and retired pastor, and he prayed over the situation, which made me feel better. Kay stopped playing the Ouija board, and shortly after, a lot of negative things started happening to her. There was a bad car accident in front of the house she had the board at. She was driving and our friend was airlifted, but survived. Kay failed a few classes and didn't get into college. Then she started drinking heavily and became homeless for a few years. She would see images of the devil everywhere. The corner of the room, in dreams, and even in cartoons. She was in a dark place for a while, but things were finally going better for her. I didn't talk to my mom for 10 years. Then a few years ago we reconnected and she told me about all the time she would try to get better, try and come visit but something would always go wrong. She told me it felt like something evil had control over her life. She's doing better and we talk now. Two years ago, almost to the day, my girlfriend and I were on vacation through New England. We stayed in a beautiful Airbnb in Craftsbury, Vermont for a few nights. The house was quite old. I'm unsure of the date it was built in, but it definitely started with 18 something. We turned in early for our first night there as we'd done quite a bit of driving that day. I woke up in the middle of the night needing to pee. Being that this place was in the country and I myself was raised in the country, I often pee outside particularly on a night like this where the weather is nice and the landscape beautifully illuminated by a nearly full moon. I'm in the backyard doing my business when I notice a woman standing by an outbuilding. Her features are heavily shadowed despite it being such a clear and bright night. What wasn't shadowed was her long white gown billowing in the night breeze. It stood out so much contrasted against her dark features that it almost appeared to glow. I rubbed my eyes, half expecting her to be a figment of my imagination, but she was not. She just stood there motionless, other than her gown. I called out to her, hello? I was not met with a response. At this point, I'm absolutely terrified. Goosebumps, hair, standing up, etc. I once again called out and asked, can I help you? Nothing. After what felt like an eternity of staring her, at her, waiting for her to speak or move, even vanish into thin air, I retreated back inside and smuggled up next to my girlfriend, like a child who had just had a bad dream. I stayed up for hours contemplating what I saw and somehow found sleep eventually. The next day, I opted to not to tell my girlfriend what I saw. I know she would not have ridiculed me, but I still felt somewhat embarrassed to speak up. Was it all a dream? I must have convinced myself it was because I never spoke of it for the rest of the trip or for nearly two years after the fact. Recently, my girlfriend and I were watching a paranormal TV show. Again, we are not intrigued, not necessarily avid believers. We got on the topic of ghostly encounters and I finally began telling her about the experience I just described. As I told the story, her expression changed to a look of dread. She interrupted me before I could finish. She had seen her as well. The second night in the house, she had awoken in the middle of the night, feeling like she was being watched. She sat up in bed and there, standing in the corner of the room, was the same shadow-faced woman in the white gown. She explained she tried to wake me, but admittedly, I had gotten pretty drunk that night, because I knew it was the only way I was going to sleep with the previous night's events on my mind. 
I murmured incoherently, but never woke despite her best efforts. When she looked up from trying to wake me up, the woman was gone. She, like me, chalked the whole experience up to a dream until I brought it up recently. Two years ago, my wife and I moved in with my dad to keep an eye on him, as he's getting old and his health isn't the greatest. As it turns out, the place is haunted. At first we thought it was haunted by the previous owner's wife, but now we're not so sure. The previous owners had lived there for the last 40 to 50 years, and before them, there was nobody on the property. They were the only ones to live in the home before us. The husband passed away about four years ago, and his wife about passed about 10 or so years ago. Before we moved in, my dad told me how things would disappear all the time. A month or so before moving in, we visited for the evening. We all sat in the living room, talking and watching TV. Dad said he had a six pack of beer in the fridge and how I could have one. A few minutes later, I got a beer. It was in bottles, in a six pack box. I opened the fridge, pulled a bottle out of the box without so much as touching the box and shut the door. I went back to my seat and we continued doing our thing. From where I was in the living room, I could see the fridge. My dad could see the whole kitchen and was facing the fridge. Half hour later, he said he might have one too. So we got up and went to the kitchen to get a beer. While he was in there, he said to me, you could have put them back in the fridge, they're getting warm. I said, what? He repeated himself as he opened the fridge and put the six pack of beer, sent the two bottles back in. I informed him that I hadn't taken it out of the fridge in the first place. Neither of us had even seen or heard the fridge door open or close, yet the beer was sitting on the counter. After we moved in, we experienced that going on all the time. After two years, I've lost over half a dozen DVDs. I can't begin to list everything I've gone to look for, only to have it to be gone. Sometimes I find something a while later in a completely different spot, but most of the time we just never see it again. I had to get my Indiana driver's license, which meant I had to take their test. I took a study book home to read upon what they considered to be traffic laws. It was a couple days later, and I still haven't found it. The other day, my dad was home alone, and the TV remote, which he keeps on the table next to his chair, was gone. He searched for over an hour, dissecting the bathroom, kitchen, dining room, and living room, but he couldn't find it. Finally, he turned the TV on at the TV and went to make lunch. He turned on the oven and got frozen chicken out of the freezer. He opened the bag of chicken and realized he forgot to get the bacon tray out of the oven. So he opened it and the tray was in the oven with the remote sitting on it. Another thing that happened once to me, my wife and I laid down in bed one night. Our dog jumped on it like she does and I felt her flop down. When she did, I felt her lay up against my shins, which she also does. My wife ordered to move and I felt her move away from my legs. My wife told her to move again and I said she did. My wife said she didn't move and said she had been laying right in between us the whole time. I felt, and she was, nowhere near my shins. What had sat down and leaned up against me? No idea, I had a hard time sleeping that night. My wife informed me that she feels something sitting down on our bed all the time. Other things that go on here include lights going off and on by themselves, the front door locking itself and me out, five times. The TV turned on once by itself after I had turned it off and set the remote down and we were talking in here all the time. My wife and I sit in our room a lot and usually I hear my name called from the hallway and it sounds like my dad. In the beginning I would respond or go out to talk only to discover that he hadn't called me or he was asleep or he wasn't there at all. Plus we leave our door cracked open so our cat can come and go happily. From where I sit, I can see the hall and I can easily see when he's in it. My wife has heard her name too as if he called, but not nearly as much as I hear mine. And when we hear our names called, the other of us doesn't hear it. The other day, I clearly heard my wife yell my name, which my dad didn't hear while sitting right next to me. She said she hadn't, while also having not heard it. And one day my dad, while home alone, heard someone yelling out to the living room from our bedroom. Who's there? And he didn't recognize the voice. He checked and nobody was there. Well, we always thought it was the lady who lived here before. Now we're not so sure. 
All three of us have seen a black, cloudy mist the size of a person float through here. I've seen it once or twice, my wife has seen it a few times, and Dad has seen it a dozen or more. One time during the day when it was really sunny out and the inside of our place was all lit up, Dad saw it come down the bathroom. Moved down the hall into our bedroom, and he said the bedroom went dark as if it were night out. My wife once woke me up and saw it above her and then disappeared up into the ceiling. The property we live on is 62 acres and used to be a play lake, us and campground. Over the years, many people came through and it was loved by everyone. The owner retired and closed the lake like 10 years or so ago. My dad, who has known the owner since he was a child, lived in a camper a few years before moving into the trailer and where we all live now. While we lived in the camper, Dad would often go sit outside at a picnic table and read. Right next to him was an old metal fishing shelter, and behind him was the gravel parking lot. One night, he was shocked when a man walked toward the shelter and said hi to him. Dad said hi back, and the man asked some questions, mostly about the old people who own the place. Dad said they went home if they were like to go up and talk to them, but he said no. He had to be somewhere and walk back around the shelter. My dad said he never heard a car come or go, so he wasn't sure where the guy came from or went to. We're in the country and there's nothing around us. If he had come from a neighbor's house and walked, it would have been very dark, especially if he came from the way he seemed to. It's all woods that way. My dad mentioned the man to the owners, who had incredible memories and knew everyone who ever came there to fish. They had no idea who he was. Months later, the man returned, the same way, and at night. They spoke again, only this time when the man left, the same way as he had last time, my dad followed. When dad got around the shelter, he saw nobody. After the lake closed, dad wasn't the only one renting a camper from the owner, and all three of the renters, dad included, would regularly hear cars running next to, right next to their campers, or car doors shutting, yet no cars would ever be seen. That still goes on. Me or dad are regularly going out at night to see if people are trespassing. Many have seen UFOs out there and in all areas around there. A few times I was outside at night and heard breathing, growling or footsteps that all sounded like an animal, particularly a dog of some kind. But when I went to check it out, I'd find nothing. Once I heard a cow moo and another time I heard what I could only figure out was a goose. Though I'm sure I'm really not sure what I've heard the sound before. And they both sound as if they came from the field in front of our place. Maybe a goose had been there, but it was highly more unlikely a cow was. One day I was outside and heard our cat meowing in front of our room inside. His litter box is in there, and when I take the dog out, the cat has separation anxiety from the dog. Cute, right? And we'll go into that room, climb up on my wife's desk, and look out the window at me. On this particular day, I heard him meowing and thought nothing of it, until I heard four or five very heavy footsteps walking rapidly into that room. Honestly, it didn't even sound like our floor making that noise. It sounded heavier, deeper. When the footsteps stopped, I heard my cat meow like I had never heard him meow before or since. I can't explain the sound, but honestly, it sounded like he were responding to whatever had gone in there without him. A moment later, I heard what sounded like my cat tearing out the room. And then I heard him meowing like he normally does, but from the front door. Back in the 70s, while my mom and aunt were dealing with my aunt's ex-boyfriend, my dad was dealing with something else entirely. He met a woman who told him about a friend of hers who had parties at her house all the time in Raymond. So we went. The friend, Chris, had lost her abusive husband when he passed, from what my dad doesn't know. Since he had never let her out of the house or have friends, when he died she decided to start having parties and everyone was welcome. She would always cook large meals, feed everyone, and then they'd drink, smoke pot, listen to music and party. His son Earl came home from the service, I think the Navy, and he brought home a bunch of drugs that he'd stashed while serving. Earl was a big guy, 6'6", 300 pounds, he had a lisp when he spoke and had sinus problems. The coke probably didn't help with that. One night, everyone partied and someone passed out, my dad included. Most were in the living room. 
Dad woke up and saw the living room full of smoke and thought the house was on fire. Before he could do anything, the smoke was gone and he noticed the sheet that was hung up in the doorway to the hallway was laying up on the ceiling and Earl was just beyond it in the living room with his arms up, his hands touching the ceiling. Dad looked down and saw his feet were off the floor. He had blood all over his face. Dad said several others were staring at Earl and freaking out and Earl fell to the floor while the sheet fell back to its hanging position in the doorway. Earl told him that he had gone and passed out in the bed his dad had died in. He was awakened, heard a voice that sounded like his dad say, there will be no more drugs in my house. And then he was hit hard in the nose, which shattered it. He also said he had floated all the way down the hall to the living room. Some people rushed to him to hospital. Later, the doctor told them that if he'd been hit any harder, his nose would have been pushed into his brain and killed him. My dad hung around with Earl's younger brother and searched the house for someone who might have come in and done that. But all they found was a metal bar laying on the floor next to the bed. I don't think Earl stopped doing drugs. I'm not sure, but the incident actually fixed his sinus problems and his lisp. Many things happened in and around the house, spiritually and otherworldly. The house was an old country house and had no indoor bathroom. There was an outhouse back behind the house. Dad said at night while partying, the guys would just go out on the side of the house to pee, while the women would squat or whatever. One night, Chris went out to use the bathroom and came back in, hysterical. She said she made it halfway to the outhouse when a bright light lit up everything around her from above and she began floating up in the air. She grabbed a hold of the clothesline and said if it hadn't been for that, she wasn't sure where she'd be. It continued pulling her upward for a minute and then gave up. The light disappeared and she fell to the ground. Another night, some drunk guy talked my drunk dad into taking a drive to a cemetery. For whatever dumb drunken reason, they decided to steal a bunch of tiny flags that had been placed on vets' graves. They came across a broken headstone that was laying in the grass and picked it up with the intent to set it back upon the piece it broke off from. But when they got, got it picked up, the guy said to my dad that they should take it, so they did. When they got it back to Chris's house, they leaned it up against the side of the garage and forgot about it. Later, Chris went outside to use the bathroom. It was storming out. A flash of lightning lit everything up and Chris screamed, then ran back into the house. She said when it flashed, she saw a man standing out there looking at her. She said his face was all scarred up. The guys went outside looking for him but found nobody. A while later, dad went out to pee along the side of the house. He saw a shadow on the side of the house come up next to his and he said hi, but got no response. So we looked around and saw the man standing there, scars on his face. They returned the headstone and the guy never came back. They went down the road after that to a local pizza place bar and found a guy there they knew and told him about it. He turned white, then told them about a guy who had left the bar, drove up the road and crashed his car right in front of that cemetery and burned to death in his car. It was that guy. Many years ago, a friend of mine and I started our own ghost hunting group. She lives way down in Kentucky and I live in Cincinnati, so we never got together on a hunt. She always hunted places around her and I hunted near me. We combined all of our pics and recordings on a website that I ran and after a year or so gave up on the group, though we still hunt. Except for Waverly. We got together there for a full night of hunting and was joined by a friend, or relative, I'm not sure, who she hunted with all the time. We made a group of around 10 people and I think three guides. We were given a tour and then were allowed to hunt each floor one at a time for the rest of the night. For those who don't know, Waverly Hills Sanatorium was built in Louisville, Kentucky years ago as a tuberculosis hospital. Over 60,000 people died here over the years and now it is widely regarded as one of the top 10 haunts in America. We couldn't go to the first floor that night because it was done up for Halloween, so we started on the second floor. After hunting it for a while, we all agreed to step out for a 15 minute smoke break and head back in. My friend left her voice recorder inside, recording the whole time. When we went back in, she checked it and picked up what sounded like people shuffling by, wheezing. We were also told of Tommy, the little boy who had a rubber bound ball he played with. After succumbing to TB, people reported seeing his ball roll down the hills, never to be found. On his floor, We ended up at one end of the hospital by ourselves and decided to see if we could talk with him. 
My friend was using her voice recorder and I was filming on my camcorder. She asked, Timmy, do you like playing hide and seek? From out in the hall and I heard a little boy yell loudly, no. Neither my friend or the other guy heard it, which blew me away. My friend listened to her voice recorder and there was nothing on it. Later, when I got to review my recording, my camcorder had picked it up, but it was very faint. And no matter how much I tried to enhance it, I couldn't get it to sound good. That night, we went up to the top floor roof. And while it was in the 60s that night, everyone's digital thermometers kept registering 17 degrees. We also saw shadow people running up and down the halls all night. It was so bad on the floors above us that the tour guides would often run up to those floors to investigate to make sure vandals hadn't broken in, which was a problem for them then. Might still be, probably. I guess I should explain that better. If you don't know the building, the back side of it has giant windowless openings. They believed fresh air would help get rid of the TB. Throughout the night, we would lean up against the sills of them and check evidence or whatever. And from those windows, we could look up into the other windows along the wall and see the shadows running around. Then the tour guides would radio the security people and they'd just go off the check. I loved the place and all the activity, but the general feeling in there may keep me away from ever hunting there again. Though I'd love to. In 2008, I had to move my girlfriend, my wife now, needed a place to live. So three months after we started dating, we were moving into a place together. It was a very small, one-bedroom ranch house with a basement in Silverton, Ohio. It was an older house that was designed strangely, had questionable features, and never felt welcoming. After a short time, things started going on there. Luckily, nothing too crazy, but here's what went down. The basement was very creepy, and I'm not really creeped out that easily. But when I went down there, I felt as if I was being watched. And if I didn't have to go there to do laundry, I would have never gone. The air also felt a little thick down there all the time. When letting my dogs outside, they would always stop at that door and stare at it. And every now and then there would be a bang from down there and we would hear upstairs what sounded like a trap door being released when someone was hung at the gallows. I never discovered what made that sound. The blind in the only kitchen window was the kind that rolled down and you had to tug on it to get it to roll up. Except it never wanted to work for us. If we got it down, we could almost never get it rolled up. Though sometimes it would just roll up on its own. I don't necessarily think that was paranormal, but who knows? Lastly, in the living room, the ceiling was like 10 feet up or higher. And there was a light on it that was operated by a pull string. It was a chain at the light and for a couple feet down. But there was a string tied to the chain that hung down further so it could be reached. When you used it to turn the light on or off, it made that familiar sound of the chain rubbing against the side of the hole, and then the click. We heard the chain rubbing all the time with no click, and the light never turned on or off by itself, but we gathered that whatever was pulling the string wasn't strong enough to get it to click. However, we did catch the string swaying after hearing the noise many times. In fact, one day I was sitting on the couch talking to my friend on the phone, and I just happened to look up at the string a second before it was pulled, and I saw it happen. It made the noise, and the string bounced up when it was let go of, and swung around like it always did. We moved after eight months there, and I was happy to go. Not because of what went on, hauntings don't bother me like that, but because of how I felt in the house. Not really evil, but not good, either. <laughs> One day, back in 2012-13, I was forced to sleep in the spare room in the back of the house because my sister's boyfriend was staying in my bed for the night. I always hated this end of the house because it's always cold. I mean, if the house was sitting at 30 degrees Celsius, 86 Fahrenheit, that end of the house would be sitting at less than 10 or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Really weird. In the corner of the room, there was a singular chair. No reason as to why, but aside from the bedside table and curtains, there was no other features to the room, so I always assumed it must have been to add life to the room. On this night, I woke up at a really early hour of the morning. As I sat up and looked around, there was the girl, no older than 12, in school clothes, just sitting in the chair. She wasn't doing anything, didn't have a weird face, nothing creepy about her aside from the fact that she was sitting there. 
Obviously, I shit myself in the moment, pulled the sheets over my head and enjoyed the rest of the night and never spoke of it to anyone. Roughly two days later, I was at my grandparents' house and they showed me this book that was written about our ancestry on his side. Weird flex, I know. As we were going through the book, he introduced me to a photo of his great-grandmother. It was a school photo of the exact same person when she was around 12 years old, wearing the exact same clothes. I did not know this book even existed until that day. I instantly flew out the chair and begged my parents to go home. To this day, there has always been one room in my house that is always freezing in comparison to the others, regardless of the house temperature. Scariest part, my bedroom is that room in my current house. As I finished typing this, a really loud ringing has just started occurring in my ears. Probably just convenient timing, but who knows? Ever since my family moved into our current house, my room has always been off. Always the opposite temperature from the rest of the house. Things going missing and reappearing in places I'm absolutely sure I would never put them. Just to name a few. When I was 15, I was up at around 11pm since I couldn't just fall asleep. And I think I saw someone or something standing by my closet closed door. Now, I didn't feel scared. If anything, it was oddly comforting. As if I had nothing to worry about. I didn't say anything to my parents because, as a teenager, do you really think that they believed believe me if they said there was something going on in there? Of course not. A few months of sporadically seeing the figure during the night, it, they, she disappeared, and my room was sort of stabilising in temperature, and I can remember explicitly that I felt so relieved in the winter when my room was actually warm and not freezing cold, as it had been for the past year or so. Then, when I turned 17, my room's temperature went wonky again, for a few days, and then I saw the figure again, still by my closet door even after I had moved some stuff around my room. It was also 11 again, as had happened the other times I saw the figure, and I again felt the same peace that I had felt the other times. However, this time, she, they, it, only stayed for one week, of which all seven days she was there in front of my closet door. I had almost felt a little upset, thinking that maybe I had done something to bother the figure. But eventually, thinking about my future career, dismissed what had occurred from my mind until today. Now, I turned 18 recently, and the happenings that had occurred in the past just came back to me without reason. And I commented about this to my friend, and they noticed how weirded out and uncomfortable I was with the thought of something being in my room. And she suggested that I use the TikTok filters that witches on the app that have been using to detect their deities, or what they worship. And though I thought it was most likely just a glitch that could occur, but there's always a chance it could actually be true. I still did it because, again, I wasn't comfortable not knowing. So I got the app and I quickly tested the filters before I started going around my room, not seeing anything in the living room or kitchen, which was kind of comforting, but I still had to go test my room. I enter my room and turn on the filter, starting to look at the furthest area of the room and seeing nothing, scanning around, and as soon as I turned the phone to the closet, the filter quickly worked showing something moving in front of the door. I thought to myself, no, it must be the movement from the phone that made something appear to be there. So I switched filters and switched back with very little movement of the phone, and there was still something there. Now normally I wouldn't believe that an app meant for entertainment purposes can show something paranormal in nature, but my wallet and textbook were on my higher shelf that I never moved stuff on or off, and underneath my desk respectively. So. Is there a possibility that my room is haunted? So this happened when I was a kid, December 1980. I was at a neighbour's apartment with my sister. I remember we were watching the Sugar Ray Leonard, Robert Duran, No Mass fight. I'm guessing it must have been a rebroadcast of the fight, because the fight actually happened on November 25th, 1980, and we were watching it in December. There were three of us in the room, me, 10 years old, my younger sister who was 8 years old, and our neighbour. I think she was a couple of years older than me. Our moms were hanging out on my apartment two doors down. So we're sitting on the couch, which faces the front window, TV is to our right. There's a Christmas tree in front of the window, probably 10 feet from the couch. I remember looking at the Christmas tree and seeing an ornament jiggle. I asked the girls if they saw it, and they said no. I said an ornament moved, but they didn't believe me. So, I got up and walked to the tree. As I was walking over, 
I saw the ornament jiggle again. When I was about two feet from it, the ornament popped off the tree and hit me square in the chest and fell to the ground. Funny thing was that I wasn't scared. I asked the girls if they saw that. Of course, they didn't. They were directly behind me. They didn't believe me either. I remember it like it was yesterday. When I was younger, I grew up in a house built in 1889. One confirmed suicide took place and it was a hanging in the basement. On this particular day, I heard what I assume was a gunshot for an unconfirmed suicide. I was soaking in the bathtub when I heard the loud bang. My left ear, the ear facing the door, rang so hard I quickly grabbed the side of my head with extreme pain. I then smelled the powder blast and sulfur mix as if it were a firecracker. I automatically assumed my brother slid a firecracker under the door as a prank and I confronted him. He denied it and then told me that he heard the same thing one day upstairs, but he was on the first floor in the living room. When he heard it, he thought it was me being younger, got into his gun cabinet. He ran upstairs so fast to, sign, to find his rifle safe and secured in his cabinet. I truly think there was another suicide that we've not been able to research, but in a sense, witness second hand. If this was the only experience I was exposed to while living there my first 17 years of life, I'd be a happy camper. My family and neighbours lived in an old cemetery, Binh Hung Hoa, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Google it. It was odd to live with dead people around, but I couldn't complain. Sometimes at night, I saw ghosts in white blurry smoke, wandering, flying around their own graves or dark black shadow in human shape, just sitting for hours and disappear. My grandma dreamed of a little girl, told her to repair her house which submerged in water. My grandma asked the little spirit, who are you? Where is your grave? Little girl told my grandma her name and pointing out where her grave was. My grandma walked up and found the little grave indeed submerged because of rainy season in Vietnam. She died in 2003, born in 1998. Her father never visited her since her death. I'm a Buddhist and I understand many of you are Christian who don't really think there would be another life after we die. One occasion, my soul detached off my body when I was very sick. I saw my body just lying there and I was floating. It was really shocked to think, oh, am I dead? Is that me? I don't want to die. I could hear my relatives talking from another room, many years living around the dead, and after I hear thousands of real ghost stories, I can give my personal conclusion. Maybe it's different for you. Majority of male spirits have black, dark, smoke, shapeless or human shape. Majority of female spirits have white or blurry, white, shapeless or human shape, usually long hair. Ghosts, spirits, demons don't walk. Likely they fly, float above the ground about a feet. People who commit suicide, they would very likely become demons. Please do not have a suicide. When you were born and your fate was to be died at old age, killing yourself earlier, your soul have to wait for years until the day you really die. Many people who suicide at a hotel room, their spirits are likely can't escape that room for a very long time. So their spirits turn into demons and keep haunting that room. Some living people unfortunately have the same frequency with spirits, like radio. They can see ghosts even if they don't want to. The demon will make some strange noise to notify you that's their place and get the fuck out if they fail to scare you, because you don't see them. Ghosts can move objects, but a demon could even whisper. Only the Christian priest would deal, confront, threaten Christian spirits, ghosts or demons. Christian demons will never listen to a Buddhist monk who tries to convince the demons not to scare living people. The holy water actually works with Christian demons. Ghosts burns them very badly. People who are burned to death, their souls will suffer the pain over and over even if they don't have physical body anymore. I know that because in Vietnam, some esper could summon the spirit to enter strange body. Some tricky questions from family spirit will verify spirit identity. Best ways to know is if your house is haunted, having some dead people hiding or a dog keep barking to nowhere, a young kid keep telling you about a stranger in the house, or your food decomposes very quickly. Yes, the dead people can eat, not as living people. An uncle who was my neighborhood and cemetery, who was a communist fought in the Vietnam War. In 1972, when he was in his 20s, he was shot and killed two American soldiers. 
He later felt sorry because he recognized that he murdered two people. But he said if he did not, then he'd be dead. He buried two bodies in an unknown site. After the war, he was so poor and had no choice but to come back to the old battlefield to start a new life. He got married. He'd often wake up early to chop trees, selling them for a living. Then he heard some whisper, hey, in English. He did not know English much, but could understand very basic. He looked around and saw nobody. He kept chopping the trees and heard, hello. It was still dark and silent. This time he saw two big shadows of the bamboo five meters away from him. He said that he thought was unreal, but this time he was so scared and ran away. He got back to that place in the morning and started seeing this place as so familiar. His memory came back to realize that the bamboo, he buried two American soldiers. He came back to tell his wife what he did in the war. He never told his wife he killed people. In his dream later, two American soldiers, one black and one white, begged him to send them back home. They somehow told him that they were not mad at him for murdering them. They understood it was war. Finally, he contacted the US Embassy in Saigon. They sent a team with him to recover the remainings. After the corpses returned to the USA, they came into his dream to say thank you while smiling. He said now he could get a good sleep. At least they are now home. When my mother was young, she was on a road trip with her brother and sister-in-law. She got car sick and they stopped in the middle of nowhere so she could get some fresh air. No houses, nothing, just woods and fields. So this man came up to her wearing a suit, a long black coat and a black top hat, and gave her a glass of water. She drank it while her brother and sister-in-law were cleaning the car, and turned to give the glass back. But the man was gone, nowhere to be found. Now skip some years to when my sister was critically in the hospital, all dosed on morphine, thinking her breathing tubes, don't know the word, were a new scarf. Telling my mom proudly about the scarf, she told us she got it from a man dressed in a long black coat with a top hat on. Skip some more years, and I was travelling myself, having to drive through some dark places with patches of wood. All of a sudden, I see this man standing ahead, and it just felt right to see him there, but he gave me the feeling that I should turn back and find another way, so I did. Next day, I found out a girl had been found dead in that exact region I was about to pass through. At one point, later on, my mom and I were looking through some old photo albums from my family, all people who weren't alive anymore, but my mom could name all of them. But then I saw a picture with the man standing on it. She had never noticed before, and she doesn't know who he is. <laughs> Before I went back to work, following a few months off due to the pandemic, I was awake stupid late into the night. On this particular night, it was maybe one in the morning, when I heard my cat flight fighting in the basement. It's kind of creepy down there in the way basements are, but I went down anyways and broke up. Then I headed back upstairs. For context, these stairs are the type that have no backing, so someone could easily be under them for reach through to grab you, hence why I hate going through there. Anyways, my orange tabby was following up the stairs when just that seemed to happen. It was like her back paw was grabbed and dragged between the stairs as she clutched on and struggled to get away. I snapped. I rushed down there, picking her up as I did. It felt like I had to pull her away from something. I was spitting mad and told whatever it was in my house that this was unacceptable. This is my home. I will not tolerate anything doing something like that to my cats. That whatever was in my house was not welcome in my home and had to get out. During my little tirade, my two other cats quickly ran up the stairs as I held my orange tabby who clung to me for dear life. When I went to go back up the stairs, the basement door was halfway closed and slowly moving still. I ignored it, stormed up the stairs, out the basement and turned out the lights. There hasn't been any activity since then, and that was almost a year ago. I have only lived in two houses my whole life, but both have been haunted. To preface this, I want to say I am not influenced by scary movies since I avoid them like the plague. I'm a fraidy cat, always have been, so I don't need spooky movies making me terrified. I'll start with the house I lived in from the time I was born until I was 19. This house had three bedrooms, a super creepy basement, and just always seemed dark. The experiences start with my brother, who is four years older than me. As a child, he would 
often see a soldier marching towards him wherever he was on the property. It terrified him for a long time before my very religious dad did something and that particular activity stopped. Though this did not stop my brother from having horrible night terrors for a long time, he would scream and cry but couldn't be woken up. Skipping ahead to my own experiences, I will start with the most frequent one. I shared a room with my sister until I was 12. She was 14. Naturally, we didn't get along great, but we respected each other's space. She made me sleep in the bed by our door, so I looked out into the hallway. We always kept our door mostly closed at night, but with a crack open to let our cat into sleep wherever she wanted. I never told my sister because I didn't want to scare her, but like clockwork from the time I was eight, I would wake up in the middle of the night and see a man looking into our bedroom at me. He always stayed half hidden behind our door, but would just stand there staring. I tried to explain it away as my dad checking in on us, but since we shared a vent with my parents' rooms, I could easily hear him snoring while the man watched us. Time passed and after my parents divorced, I didn't notice this activity again. I had pretty much pushed it to the back of my mind when at 16, my sister's boyfriend at the time spent the night in our creepy basements. There was a bedroom down there, though no door on it since it was rarely used. He'd ended up staying late at our house so was off to that room to sleep in. The next morning, he seemed disturbed so I asked him what was wrong and he kind of tried shrugging it off and saying it was nothing. I insisted he tell me and when he finally did, I was horrified. All night, there had been a man peeking at him from behind our water heater that sat in the far end of the basement across from the bedroom. I confided with him and my sister about what I'd seen for the years here when I shared a room and we all agreed it was super creepy. A couple years later, my sister and brother told me that sometimes in the middle of the night, they'd wake up to me muttering, sitting up straight in bed. They tried to get me to stop, playing annoying older siblings while actually being freaked out since my eyes were always closed. Though apparently they never could make me stop or wake up. I would eventually snap my head in whatever direction they were in and, in their words, growl at them to get out. I've never been afraid of walking in the dark in any house other than that one. It's unnerving, but not terrifying in any way. But turning off the lights and going up the very dark stairs to my room always felt a bit scarier. There was one night in particular that stands out. I'd walked down those dark stairs without a problem, but when it came to walk back up, I just went cold with dread. I was staring at the dark space of the landing and I just knew something was there. The house was old and of course there were spots that creaked when you stepped on them, but that landing never made phantom creaking noises unless someone was on it. So when I heard it creak as if someone was adjusting their weight, I turned on every light I could, not caring if I w woke up my dad and for the first time in three years, I prayed. What convinced me this event was paranormal in nature is that I've never been struck motionless with fear before. The stairs in particular unnerved me, but not so much that I felt in danger just being near them. Besides that, lights have randomly come on, the most notable being the one on a dimmer switch. I couldn't put anything on my walls because it would always fall off and things constantly went missing only to turn up right when I got annoyed when I couldn't find them. For the most part, the experiences in that house were more annoying, but they could suddenly take a sinister and terrifying turn at any given moment. That house seemed to bring you down, leave you depressed and angry. Whatever was in that house was all wrong. Onto my new house, I moved halfway across the country with my boyfriend into a small three bedroom house. It's a comfy place and one I instantly felt more comfortable in than my previous home. At first, nothing happened. Then one day I was all alone in our bedroom when plain as day, it looked like someone lifted my kitten and gently placed her on the bed next to me. At the time he was in a corner against the wall. I was sitting up in that corner of the bed against the wall reading when I looked up and saw her back arched and her feet slightly above the mattress as she freaking glided over to me. It freaked me out. I couldn't rationalize this, so I just picked her up and went downstairs while my boyfriend was playing video games. One day was in, when I was in my backyard, I saw a light left on in the small bedroom that had become my office. I knew I'd turned it off, and the door was always closed so my cats don't knock anything fragile over. I decided to go in and turn it off, leaving my boyfriend outside, only to walk upstairs and see the door wide open and the light now off. I closed the door, made sure it wouldn't happen again, then went back outside and didn't say anything. Suddenly, that particular door opening became a regular thing until one day I walked in there and decided to try asking it to stop. I just said, can you keep this door closed please? It's so the cats don't break anything. 
After that, the door stopped turning up open. My boyfriend is in the army, so naturally he spends some time away from home. On one such night, I was sleeping when at about 2 in the morning, I heard a smash. Now, this is the day I realised I am fearless when still sleepy. I grumbled down those stairs, pissed to be woken up and peeked into my kitchen, angry at the cat for knocking things off the counter. I didn't see anything at first, but once I stepped into the kitchen, I stepped directly onto broken glass. Thankfully, I didn't cut myself, so I cleaned it up and went back to bed. It wasn't until the next morning that I realised, one, the glass was in the centre of the kitchen, and two, it was all piled into one place, every last shard like it had already been swept into that space. I scoured the kitchen looking for any more glass and didn't find anything. The last big experience I had was when I fell asleep on the little futon in my office. I was relaxing in there and reading late one night and fell asleep when suddenly I woke up. I wasn't scared, just felt like I was in the way or being annoying. Like after midnight I should be in my own room. I had to wonder if maybe that room was claimed by whoever or whatever is in my house. Like they're okay if I use it, but when it's bedtime, I should just be in my own bed. I don't think the presence in this house is malicious. Rather, I find it very helpful at times. When my cats are getting into something they shouldn't be in, I've seen them get pushed away. Like someone is using their front foot to get them away from whatever they shouldn't be messing with. They seem to help the cats too. I know the cats have gotten stuck in the bathroom, accidentally being closed in, and I'll hear a small knocking sound on whatever room I'm in until I let the cat out. This at first unsettled me, but now it's just very helpful and nice. Sometimes I also get a very strong feeling to check our door before bed and every single time I get that feeling, it's unlocked. I like my doors locked at night, so this has been very helpful. Many of you paranormal enthusiastics may have already heard by the now the word Nahul. No mistaking with Nahuel, which is a native people, here in Mexico. And I would guess that on also some other countries in Latin America, we call that way to people who can shapeshift into animals. Well, it was a cold night. I remember because it was really odd around that zone of the country. My parents' house is in a small town, and back in the day, it was one of the last houses on the outside of town. So not many neighbors, but a lot of trees and nature around. The house has a long backyard, where we used to have sheep, and on one side, a small water stream, and trees to the side. Suddenly, the sheep started to bleat very loud, something we could call screams. My father then went to give a check on the window in the back side of the house. I still recall his face when he came back quickly, and smoothing his voice, he told to my mom, go ask your father and brothers to come here immediately. They were four brothers, my grandfather and my father, when everyone was there, a few minutes later, my father started to tell what he saw. In the barnyard, we had 10 sheep. At the moment my father gave a look, all of them were heaped just in one corner. At the center, there was some kind of big animal. My father described it as a bear, which makes totally no sense. But he said it was big, hairy, and it seemed to be eating one of the sheep there. The one sheep was screaming really bad. Then, my grandfather told my mom to keep inside of the house and keep me in there also with her. If you go outside now, you may catch a bad air. Mal air in Spanish. So he made some kind of prayer, holding his machete. On his prayer, I remember he said the names of my uncles and also my father's. They went outside. My grandfather started to yell at the darkness, telling things like, go away, you have nothing to do here, leave this house. My father told me that he saw how this thing was in a pose, like eating the sheep, which was laying on the ground, still screaming by the way, and when my grandfather yelled at it, this thing seemed to stop and rise its head up towards my family. This being was only staring at them, not a single noise, also not red or shining eyes, only the shadow looked it looked like it was looking at them. So my father decided to do something at last. He took a big rock he picked up from the ground and threw it at this thing. Maybe not the best thing to do in this situation, but apparently this being was not that strong. Or maybe because on our side were six men armed with machetes. But when the rock hit it, this being turned his back and ran away into the forest, running on four legs like an animal would do. This was when they came close to the sheep. They saw how the sheep on the ground was still alive, but completely unskinned. It was horrifying to say the least. My grandfather sacrificed it to stop the suffering. 
After that night, a family friend who was known for being quite an old man, but still working on heavy farm labor, even heavier than young men, and that used to practice sorcery to heal people, told us a story about someone new in town that apparently was in Nahul. He told us he'd spoken to the man and asked him to leave the town. Indeed, we never happened to live something similar like that. Up. I want to share this experience that happened to me around 15 years ago, when I started studying in a town away from my parents' home. There was one man, let's call him Tony, who was a good friend of my father. He helped him at work sometimes, hence I hanged out with them usually. When I was 17, I moved to a bigger city to start university, so I travelled every two months to visit my parents for long weekends or vacations. After my second year away, this friend, Tony, died from alcohol abuse. My father told me on a phone call how that happened, or at least how he heard it happened. Around two months later, on Dia de Muertos, Day of the Death here in Mexico, I went to visit my parents, also to go and visit the tombs of the family as the tradition goes. And at this point, I literally forgot about Tony's death. The apparition comes around because I didn't catch the bus that arrives during the day to my parents' hometown, so I was forced to take one that arrives there at like 2 a.m. It's quite a small town, so since I didn't find any taxi near the bus station, I decided to walk home. Around five blocks away from the house, I had to pass on a bridge where people say that a decapitated donkey spirit scares people during the night. I was a bit scared, to be honest. But then, suddenly this friend, Tony, reached me on his bike. I didn't mention that he always moved on a bike, and asked me if I was just arriving from university. Maybe because I was originally thinking about the decapitated donkey, I completely forgot about the fact that Tony was supposed to be dead. So I started to talk to him, and he walked passing the bridge in a couple more blocks for around four or five minutes, talking about the school, the food in the other cities, stuff like that. Just one block away from my parents' house, he just told me, okay, I have to check some things over here, pointing in another direction, but keep safe, say hello to your father for me. We said goodbye and then I got home. Since it was early morning, I walked directly into my room and waited until the next day to go and see my parents. It wasn't until the next morning, when I was just about to tell my father about Tony, that I remembered that he was already dead. At that moment, I didn't tell my parents, but a bit later in the day, my father told me he saw me arriving. He asked me if I was drunk or something because he saw me talking to nobody. So then I told him. I think it was some kind of company on that bridge that I was afraid of because of the stories. And also because of that scare from the donkey story, I didn't even pay attention to the fact that my company was someone I knew was already dead. It is kind of funny for me, and actually never felt afraid in the moments. So thanks to that old friend that, that, that was there with me, even after death. I suddenly awoke in the middle of the night and there was a face with huge black eyes right in front of mine. I definitely didn't look human and it didn't show any expression, almost mask-like. It also seemed to look at me at the same time past me. It's kind of hard to describe. Because it was extremely dark, I tried to rationalize that what I was seeing must be my friend's cat. I remember that she once told me that a cat would often stare very closely at her face when she's hungry and wants food. I thought the huge eyes were simply the cat's face being too close to mine. Because I wanted it to move away from my face, I started to stroke it, just like I would do to a cat, and said Fiora, which is the name of my friend's cat. I could feel my hand touching it, but instead of fur, it felt like I was touching a person's skin. That's when I started to realize something wasn't right. My friend who tends to wake from the slightest bit of noise and who thankfully happened to be awake at that same time, replied, Fiora isn't here. The thing's face moved away from mine and I realized that the eyes remained big. I sat up abruptly and became scared as I noticed that it wasn't my friend's cat. I then saw it move behind my friend's head and on top of a pillow. I told her to look at her pillow, still hoping that my friend, my mind is playing tricks on me and that it's just the cat. My friend sat up, stared at her pillow. I can still see that thing sitting there, but she didn't see anything. I started to panic and asked her to quickly switch on the light, but that's when the thing disappeared. I insisted that we look around the room. The doors and windows were closed, so nothing could have entered or left the room, but I firmly wanted to hold on to the belief that it must have been the cat. We obviously found nothing, and my friend began to worry, as I was really panicking at that point. I tried to process what happened, and was so confused by the fact that I was stroking someone 
moments ago. Sleep paralysis usually means being unable to move and feeling the sensation of being touched or having some weight on top of you, but this was the opposite. I could move freely, didn't feel any pressure on top of me, but I could touch the thing and it felt like it was physically there. Has anyone else experienced something like this? Edit. I want to further describe the appearance of this thing as many of you have asked what it looked like. It's really hard to describe, but I'll try my best. The face was a bit smaller than that of an average adult human head. The eyes were about six centimeters in height and a bit longer in width. I described them as black, but they also had a thin dark gray iris, about three millimeters in diameter, and large pupils. The eyes were slightly popping out of its head. It had a very small mouth, no hair on its head and no ears. The skin was a muddy grayish color and also covered with a few brown stripes. Once it moved to my friend's pillow, I saw that it didn't have a neck, but a thin body that was only about a meter long. The body itself had a pitch black color and it walked on four legs. A couple of weeks ago, I had a dream in which I was back at my parents' house and somebody knocked on the door. My grandpa, who's long gone for at least 10 years, went to get it, opened it, stood there, asked something that sounded like drum, and then suddenly like in a freaking jump scene, a woman appeared right in front of me, tall, pale, long black hair, dead eyes, an inch away from my face, and that's when I woke up. What's even weirder, this dream happened two more times, to the point where I was able to recognize what my granddad said, and it was something along the lines of Daruma. I then googled it and I was creeped out when I found out about Daruma Sam Gakuranda, a Japanese game for kids, which is basically a hide and seek, but instead of seeking for your friends, you hide and a summoned ghost is looking for you. The creepiest thing about it is that neither me nor my granddad had anything to do with Japan. I've never heard or read about this subject before, but it gets worse. A week or so later, after the third and so far last episode, I've experienced something that I've later googled as night terror. I was sleeping and I woke up unexpectedly, feeling like somebody's arms were wrapping around my torso and arms and not letting go of me. I also felt like drowning and coughing, and the aforementioned kids game is also associated with falling, drowning, and also called a bathtub game. I jumped out of bed and only then I stopped feeling it. Up until that point, it felt so real, it's impossible to describe and for my brain to comprehend. I still can't believe how real and creepy that felt, but it gets even worse. The reason I decided to write this post is that while I'm dressing for the shower today, I've noticed three scratches on my right forearm. I don't recall hurting myself, banging on anything or scratching against anything, and it only started hurting when I noticed it. I've always believed in the paranormal, in UFOs, possessions, etc. But I also never thought something as random as this would happen, like why something I've never ever heard of appears in my dream several times, and then the extremely real night terror that happened a few days later is connected to it. Like. I was babysitting my nephew, who at the time was one and a half years old, a very active kid. You can't lose sight of him or you'll find him stuck in the oven. It was three in the afternoon and he always takes a little nap at that time, so I left him in his bed and closed the door. I went to the bathroom and when I came out I noticed that the door was open and I thought that he'd already woke up and he was making a mess in the living room. I called him and he answered me from the kitchen. I ran there and he was standing over the dining table. It's an old square wooden table, about 85 centimeters high, and my nephew was easily a few inches shorter. There were only four wooden chairs and they were turned over on the table. I put them that way to prevent him from using them to get on there. The chairs are heavy, even for me it's a bit difficult to put them like that. If he tried to move them alone, they could fall on top of him and hurt him. There is no way that he can move that chair alone without them falling on him or the chairs falling to the floor. And there's no chance that he would get on the table by himself. But there he was, standing in the middle of the table with the four chairs turned over around him as I had left them. He wasn't even scared. He just saw me and told me, Totti, Totti. I asked him how he got up the table. I carried him and he kept saying, Totti, Totti. I thought for a moment that this was some toy that he was looking for, and then I asked him, what's Totty? Where is Totty? And he turned and points to a corner in the kitchen, where there was no one or anything. I froze for a moment, and the first thing I thought was, is there someone in the house? Someone broke in, and I put him on the table? 
No way, that doesn't make any sense. But either way, I grabbed my nephew, I took him to his room again, I checked the kitchen, the living room, the rooms, and nothing. There was no one in the whole house, besides us two. I didn't want to think about the situation anymore. I just felt relieved that my nephew was fine, that he hadn't hurt himself in his little mischief. But I kept wondering, how did he get on that table? When my sister came, I asked her which toy he called Totty, and she told me that it's not a toy. That apparently was some like imaginary friend that my nephew had, and that he'd been talking and playing for like a week with him. I honestly hadn't planned to tell him what happened. I didn't want to get into trouble with her. I knew she would blame me and accuse me of leaving my nephew alone. But when she told me what it was, Totty, I told her everything. I didn't want to rush to think that it was something paranormal. I just told her how weird the whole situation has been, and she just told me, you know how Joe's way is. He managed somehow to find a way to get on the table. That's why I always ask you to keep an eye on him. He might have hurt himself. And I thought, okay, she was right. I kept taking care of him, but I was starting to get a little nervous because I always saw and heard him playing with Totty. And one day I got a lot of courage and I asked him, where's Totty? And he takes my hand, leads me to the kitchen and points to the same corner that he pointed out before. I freaked out for a moment, did my best to keep myself together and later that day, I waited for my sister and asked my nephew the same question, and he did the same thing. Took me to the kitchen and kept pointing to the same place. For me, that wasn't normal. That was really creepy, to be honest. But my sister told me to just stop asking him about Totty. If I keep doing it, I only feed his fantasy, and that it wasn't good for him. So I just did what she told me, and I never asked about it again. After that, I started to have this weird feeling that someone else was there with us. But I just ended up ignoring the situation. I didn't want to suggest it to myself, so I took my sister's attitude and didn't think about it anymore. I convinced myself that it was nothing paranormal, it was just a child's imagination. He kept playing with Totty for a while longer, until he grew up and didn't mention him again. That was about two years ago, and every time I remember that, I still wonder who was Totty, and how he got on the table by himself. The doorbell rang after 1.30am. The movie The Vikings with Tony Curtis and Kirk Douglas was on downstairs, music blaring while my mum was busying herself around. She was always a night owl, but this night she was up until my dad got home. They'd fought earlier and he went out for the night with business associates. She was supposed to accompany him, but refused, so we went alone. I had just returned from looking for him. He had called just before 1am. He thought it was my mum. He asked me to pick him up. I could tell he'd been drinking. Stay where you are, Dad. I'm on my way. At 1.06am, just as I'm walking out the door, he calls again. I'll be walking and waving my arms. He slurred on repeat. No, Dad. Stay where you are. I'm leaving now. When I got there, I couldn't find him. Every time I tried, I was pushed back by the blast of late December air. But there was a car turned the wrong way on the dark, rural, two-lane road, with a rumpled-up hood and the windshield busted out. Wow, I thought. They must have hit a deer. No cops yet. No ambulance. I got there before they did. I opened our front door shortly after I got home to a police officer and a minister. I'll never forget till the day I die the minister. His dark skin set off by his large, compassionate dark eyes that stared right into me, afraid for me, reaching out to me, knowing he was about to change my life. The officer asked me if my mother was home. Yes, I answered. If this is about my dad, I was just looking for him. I said with a casual, almost friendly tone to hide my apprehension. We need to speak to your mother, was the officer's cut response. His just the facts ma'am demeanor was more than matched by the compassion the minister gave me just by his full on profound stare. While I was hanging up my coat, I heard the minister tell my mom, there's been an accident and your husband's killed. He died at 1.11 a.m. Dad and mom were 40. I was 19, home from school. It was just after Christmas. My siblings were younger and all still in school. The rest of the night was a whirl of hospital identify the body visits, the priest, phone calls, drives to the place he died and back and back again, and sitting around in disbelief. What do we do now? He was the most powerful man in the world. He was gone. We were adrift. It was a long time before I could sleep again. I think it was not until later that next night. People were calling, small towns, so it was the headline on the front page that morning, pedestrian killed on XX Road. I know because my boyfriend at the time and I ran out and bought the paper at dawn. Papers. I still have mine. 
People kept coming over, bringing food, crying, needing comfort. The janitor from my former high school was the first person to call with condolences. Dad was very loved. We were very numb. Mom was melting. I had to step up. I finally had enough and went to bed. Everyone else remained talking downstairs. Mom was still up, so were siblings two to four. I decided to go lie down in Mom and Dad's bed, on his side of the bed, and buried my face in his pillow. It still smelled like him. Lying flat on my stomach, I silently cried myself to sleep in the darkness. He's been dead now for about 24 hours. How is that possible? At some point I was awakened by someone sitting on the bed, stroking my hair. It was a real, genuine sensory touch, comforting, loving. I felt it from a dead, exhausted sleep state, no mistake in it. So real that when it woke me up, I reached up expecting to touch my mom's hand. Empty space. Mom? I said as I rolled over. Silence. Mom, is that you? Electric stillness. I reached out from the bed and waved my arm back and forth in the darkness. Nothing. No one. I sat up. Mom? Dead silence. Dead darkness. I got up, ran out of the room, and sprang to the top of the stairs. Mom? Yes, she replied. Were you just up here in your room trying to wake me up? Pin drop. No, honey, she said softly. I just felt you rubbing my hair. I implored, almost begging. Pause. It wasn't me, sweetheart, she said flatly. But it had been surreal. It woke me up. I ran all the way down the stairs and just looked at her. We just stared. Tears started to well up in her eyes, then in mine too. We didn't say another word. We didn't have to. I turned away, staring at the floor, and just whispered to myself, I love you too, Dad. My house was built in the 1950s, but the land had been in my family since before the Civil War. There was a farmhouse there before the war, which was burnt down. I live in the southern United States. So my house wasn't old, but the land and the history sure was. My ancestors were white farmers who helped run escaped slaves up north before and during the war. We've always been proud of our civil rights involvement. My grandmother marched in several demonstrations in the 60s. This is all just background info. Let's get to the apparitions. My great aunt was as sensitive, as was my great grandmother, my grandmother and my mom. Though mom wasn't as sensitive as the other women in the family. I got my sensitivity from these incredible women. I'm not psychic, I'm not esoteric. I can only tell you what I experienced growing up. My house was a two-story with an attic and basement. It was a big house with so many rooms. My first memory of the paranormal was when I was in kindergarten. I was walking upstairs to my room when I heard an old radio show playing from another upstairs bedroom. Our guest rooms had old radios and TVs that didn't work, but looked very vintage and cool. I sat down and listened, laughing at the jokes. When I rose back up and took one step up, the sound stopped. So I went back to the step I sat on and heard it again. When I stepped down to the next step, it was silent. I could only hear it from that step. I didn't always hear the radio when I stood on that step, but that step is the only place I heard it. There was a ghost I would play with on those steps too. A little boy in brown short pants with brown shoes and a white button up shirt. He would appear when I was going upstairs, hanging his legs through the banisters along the upstairs landing. He would laugh and wave. Sometimes he would get up, get up and run. My mom played with the same child ghost when she was little. Sometimes when I was in my room sleeping, the sounds of a small party of people would make, wake me up. It was coming from the room where I thought the radio I heard on the steps would play. I, th I would listen to people laughing, hear them moving around, smell cigarettes even though no one in my house smoked. I would get fed up after a while and stick my head out the door. I would ask them to keep it down, I had school the next day. The ghosts would go silent after that. I would see a tall, sad black woman in my basement. She wore a long, simple brown skirt with a reddish pink skirt. She wore a white scarf on her head. Sometimes she would be weeping in the corner. I asked my great grandmother about that corner and she told me that the old house had a hidden tunnel that my ancestors would hide slaves in. While our house wasn't in the same location as the old house, the tunnel ran right through the spot where we would eventually have our basement. My father painted a Mona Lisa, the first thing that everyone notices when they come at my home. 
It's a big picture that is sometimes in the living room, sometimes the dining room. At the moment, it can be found on the wall in front of the large, rustic wooden table on which we eat our meals. My father paints very well, but his Mona Lisa was not so much like the original. Their skin is darker, their clothes are completely black, and the background is green with yellow, illustrated with random drawings and phrases in Italian. However, there is something that he managed to reproduce perfectly, something that, in my opinion, is the essence of the painting. The eyes. They seem to stare at you as if you know all your secrets. There's kind of a legend about the original Mona Lisa, which says no matter where you are, she always looks at you. And I can attest that, in fact, it is true. Or at least it is here at home. No matter where or from what angle you look, she always seems to look you in the eye. The main reason why people show fear of the painting when they visit us. I confess, I almost feel a little afraid of it. My mother is also afraid, my aunts, my uncles. In short, everyone who has seen it. Why don't we get rid of it? Well, to start with, my father would never let us. After all, he was the one who painted it. And besides, we kind of got used to it. It doesn't bother us so much. So there's no reason to get rid of it. Once, something strange happened, related to the Mona Lisa, here at home. I remember it well, despite being around eight years old at the time, because it was something that marked me a lot. Whenever we were going to travel for a few days, my aunt would keep a copy of the key to our old apartment. She lived in the apartment below, in order to feed our fish, or the poor fish would be dead by the time we returned. The aquarium was in the guest's bathroom, for some reason that I don't remember why, and to get to the bathroom it was necessary to pass in front of the living room wall, where the painting was. My aunt hated doing this, because she was terrified of the Mona Lisa, and claimed that the painting always looked at her whenever she passed by. One day she told me that, and I was slightly scared, I don't really remember if my father and I had left the apartment and gone up to ours while my mother had stayed there talking to her. I just know that we were both in the kitchen and I was afraid to pass in front of the pen painting before entering my dad's TV room slash work room. He said it was silly and went there, no matter how much I protested. I stayed at the kitchen door while he passed in front of the Mona Lisa and that's when I saw it. Her eyes, in which the black irises always rest on the right side, close in the corner, were moving to the left, following the rhythm of my father's steps. And as soon as he passed through the door, they quickly returned to their place of origin, as if they had never left there. Of course, I screamed desperately, stating that the Mona Lisa's eyes moved, but he didn't believe it for one second. The only thing I remember after that was telling my mother what had happened and hearing from her mouth that she too had already seen the painting's eyes moving that way. After that day, I never saw it happen again. And if it weren't my aunt and my mother witnessing it, I would have thought it was just my imagination. Back in 2015, my freshman year in college, my older sister and I became roommates and moved into a new home that she had bought. It was a nice home, fairly large for just two people. Four bedrooms, three bathrooms, two living rooms, laundry room, dining room and kitchen. Now my sister is about 12 years my senior, so I found it odd that she would want me as her roommate. Being that she was in her early 30s and in a much more settled time in her life, and I was the typical college party animal staying up late, coming home at random hours of the night with the occasional guest. We were total opposites. However, she told me I wouldn't have to pay rent or bills if I moved in, so I was, who was I to say no? Plus it beat living at the dorms at my university. Upon moving in, I only took a while to get a clue as to why she wanted a roommate so bad. As nice as a house that was, that home had some creepy and uneasy vibes to it that I picked up on fairly quickly. Maybe it was the fact that the place felt big for just two people, but almost immediately, I felt like I was never alone in that house. Like something was always watching me. But I never expressed these feelings to my sister. Not right away, anyway. The first few things I started witnessing were the moving diner room chairs. My sister had this set of dining room chairs that were relatively heavy for what they were. Like you actually had to apply some force to move the things in and out of wherever you were going to sit. And because they had some weight to them, they made a very distinct sound whenever you scrapped the wooden legs against the floor when pulling the chair in and out. One day I was in the TV room watching Netflix. It was about 6 o'clock in the evening and I was home alone. That particular day had been a lazy one, nothing lounging around for me. I'd watched Netflix for so long that I was no longer paying attention to the TV, but was rather fixated on my phone, scrolling through social media while the TV played in the background. So I was much more aware of the background noise than I would have been if I'd been focusing on the TV. 
I was scrolling through Instagram and suddenly I heard a quick eh, of the dining room chair being dragged. My eyes immediately focused towards the entrance of the TV room. Surely I was hearing things, right? I thought maybe my sister had gone home and had sat down without hearing her come in. But then again, this wasn't possible. She told me that she'd be at work at this time. I got up to go check who was in our home, but almost immediately I heard a much longer and louder smack. This one was the one that made my hair stand up and caused my heart to start beating fast. The first sound sounded as if someone had bumped into the chair. The chair had to have been dragged in order to make that second sound. Although my heart was racing, I can honestly say that I was about 20% scared, 80% intrigued. I opened the TV room door and peeked around the corner of the wall that allows me to see out the room through the kitchen and partially into the dining room. Fuck me. The father's dining room chair was leaning up against the wall in the back of the room. Someone or something had dragged the chair out and bumped it into the wall, which explains the smack I'd heard after the second sound. I stared out into the dining room for about a minute and had goosebumps almost throughout that time. I decided that I would not leave that TV room until my sister came home, so I turned around, locked the door and got back under the blanket I'd taken with me. However, the chairs did not stop creaking and I could clearly hear them moving around from time to time for the entire two hours that I waited for it to get home. That was the first paranormal activity, if that's what you want to call it, that I'd ever experienced, not just at home, but ever. I didn't tell my sister for some odd reason that I don't understand looking back, but those chairs moving would go on to become the norm for me. I'd be in any room and I could hear them move. I'd somehow accepted the fact that something is moving those chairs but never really feared the fact that it was happening. And so life in our home kept going. A couple months went by with the typical chair activity, when one night I got woken up by a voice calling out to me. I still remember the sound of that voice till this very day, and I'm getting chills just reminiscing about it in order to write about it for you guys. The day this happened to me was on the final day of final exams for the fall semester, so the previous night I had spent pulling an all-nighter for the final two exams that I had on that day. I got home and from school around 3 p.m., opened my closet, which was on the left-hand side of my bed, threw my backpack in there and collapsed onto my bed. I was out almost immediately. Now, I'm someone that never sleeps when my closet doors open. I've always found it creepy since I was a kid from all the scary stories, so I just grew up that way. I was so tired from my own night that day, but I guess I didn't think about the doors being closed open when I fell asleep. Fast forward, it's now late at night. I'd slept through the whole day and was still in a heavy sleep. I was in my heavy state of sleep when I suddenly heard a very stern whisper say, Hey. That woke me up. I remember sitting up in a sit-up type manner on my bed and looking at my left and that's where I heard the whisper come from. I look over to my closet and it's pitch black compared to the rest of my room. And I noticed that the door wasn't closed. I wasn't spooked at all at first. I was sitting up in bed looking around my closet and the rest of the room. I finally decided that I must have heard the voice in my dream. I'm just going to go back to bed. I lay back down, rested my head on the pillow, and immediately upon closing my eyes again to go back to bed, I heard it again. Only this time, wasn't much of a whisper. Hey, it called out to me from the direction of my closet. I shot out of bed and turned on my lights. This time I knew I wasn't dreaming voices. I had physically woken up and sat up in bed. I would looked around. I wasn't asleep. This voice was very real and it was trying to make contact with me. I looked at my phone and the time was 4 a.m. I finally mustered the courage to close my closet door and I eventually dozed back off to sleep. But that voice still lingers in my memory from time to time and it's made me into a believer that the paranormal is in fact real. When I was 14, I had a strange encounter that still puzzles me to this day. On the weekends, I'd sometimes go to my mother's place. My parents had divorced. The house she lived on was converted into several small apartments. It was a creepy old farmhouse. The house was at least 150, maybe 200 years old. My mom told me off and on of strange sounds that she'd been hearing and seeing things in the corner of her eyes, feelings of being watched. This one particular evening, I spent the night I brought my N64 because my mom would go to bed early and I'd still be up for a few more hours. I still remember to this day what game I was playing, WWF No Mercy. I was sitting Indian style on the floor, playing the story mode. I just finished a mission in the game and set down the controller to the left of me, behind me. Directly behind me was a recliner. I'll never forget what I saw next. 
I went to grab the controller and saw what appeared to be a hoof, like a horse next to the controller on the floor. Insects and blood were coming out of the silver that separated the hoof. I thought to myself, how strange. I slowly glanced up and this demonic figure was staring back at me. It leaned towards me, its face got down on my face and grinned the most evil smile. The eyes black, face red, one winged creature. Blood was dripping from its teeth. It was so surreal, I immediately went into a panic attack and blacked out. I learned later it was the fight or flight response. Several seconds later I came to, laying on the floor. I could barely move. The, de the demonic figure was in the chair, laughing at me. It was as if my fear and energy had been sucked dry from me. I lost all strength. I did all I could to crawl to my mom's room and woke her up. After I woke her up, we talked and she believed me. She told me that she too had seen the same thing earlier that week, but didn't want to scare me. I don't want to make of it all and still think of it to this day. I've no doubt about demons and angels are real and believe me, the last thing you ever want to encounter is a demon smiling in your face. When I was around two to five years old, my family used to live in a small apartment. We moved in our new home when my mom got pregnant. When we lived in the apartments, I didn't have a lot of friends since there were no kids my age living in the neighborhood. There was no nursery in my small town, and obviously I wasn't old enough to go to school yet. So I used to play by myself and with my good friend, Joe Bet. His name is relevant for later. The problem is I was the only one who could see and speak with Joe, and Joe was a grown up man. We used to play with my Hot Wheels and we'd talk together. My mom would sometimes hear me have a conversation alone in my bedroom and come by and check who I was talking to but could not see anyone in the room. Every time I asked, I answered, with my friend Joe. Up to this point, it would have been a pretty normal situation for a lonely kid to get an imaginary friend, and I would have thought that myself too if it stopped there. But the things got a bit stranger when my parents bought a house and planned to move out. I remember some of my Hot Wheels moving alone and some of my toys getting in the living room when we were not home. My mom also told me recently that she started to feel weird in my room at that time, like someone was watching her. My dad doesn't remember anything weird except some of my toys getting out of my room when we were not home. But as he said, he wasn't home often with his work, so we may have missed some clues. We moved to our new home and everything stopped. At first my mom assumed that my entry into kindergarten and me making friends was the reason why I didn't need Joe anymore. But the plot got even weirder. The other family who rented the apartment got in touch with my mom and started asking her questions about the apartment, and more precisely about my bedroom. Their son has got the same bedroom that I had, and like me, he started playing and talking alone in his bedroom. When his parents asked him who he was speaking to, he also answered, Joe. My mom told me that I did the same and answered the same when she questioned me about it. The only difference was his last name. I would always tell to my mom that his name is Joe Bet, and the other kid named him Joe Blow. In both cases, his name was Joe and his surname started with a B. It's a fairly strange coincidence if it is one. I still can't figure out exactly what was happening by that time, and if it was in fact a ghost or entity, or only just two lonely kids with a lot of imagination. At least Joe was a good guy, and helped me get through my childhood. For context, I'll try to describe what our floor looks like in the jail. There's an elevator bay with a big metal door that is controlled by motor and chain. This is what we call the main or main slider. All traffic comes into the floor from this door. You go down a small passage and then you're in a space that is the shape of a square with a smaller square room inside called the cube, which is surrounded by seven pods for inmates. Each pod has 12 cells and can fit two inmates. The cube is used for controlling doors and basically is an office space where paperwork can be filled out and where you can sit and watch the pods during a shift. I'm assigned night shift on a floor of non-violent inmates gen pop. Typical inmate you'd find on this floor would be drug users, dealers, petty theft, and the occasional drunkard kind of deal. I was working this floor by myself, and the night was starting off as usual. I show up, lock down all the pods for the night, conduct my head counts, and go back to the cube. An hour later, I conduct my hourly block check. Everyone's sleeping, I was chilling, so I'd return to the cube. Not the second I finish sitting down, I hear the sound of someone kicking a cell door. I get up and I start using my flashlight through the pods and eventually narrow it down to B pod 6 cell. One inmate is frantically screaming that his cellmate is coughing up blood and is shaking. I open the door, remove the inmate, 
and see that his cellmate is foaming from his mouth and is performing what is known as an agonal breathing. Essentially, we are listening to him take his final breaths. Long story short, medical gets called and he's eventually taken to hospital, but he doesn't make it to the hospital and is declared dead en route. Come to find out the inmate had swallowed heroin before he was booked and one of the packages ruptured while he was in the jail. It was unfortunate, yes, but it's not the first time it's happened and surely won't be the last I've filed the paperwork and continued about life as normal. As another thing for context, we have cameras in the individual cell blocks and cells we went back and watched the footage of the incident to confirm there wasn't any kind of assault or general rough housing that would have caused the packages to rupture. The next night, I'm assigned the same floor. Similar process comes and goes. Show up, lock down the pods, conduct counts, etc. Hour goes by, I do my standard check, go back to the cube. Again, as I go to sit, I hear three loud bangs coming from what sounds like B-pod again. I go in, I flash my lights, everyone is sleeping or chilling. I return to the cube. Three more bangs this time. I refer to my touch screen to see if the kicking is tripping the lock center on the door. Sure enough, B-pod 6 cell is showing that it is being messed with. The cell was still locked down due to the events of the line before, so no inmates should have been in the cell. I go to the cell, open it, and double check to make sure nothing and no one is in the cell. No one is in the cell. My next thought is that the lock is malfunctioning. I exit the cell and walk to the cube to call for maintenance. And as I'm on the phone, the door slams shut, which sends me back out to look. At this point, I'm at a loss for words and have no clue what to do. All the inmates of the pod are also trying to figure out what is going on in their pod, and I'm trying to answer their questions, but genuinely, I have no clue what to tell them. It eventually goes quiet. Maintenance arrives. I have them check the lock. Nothing in terms of it being a mechanical malfunction. After that night, I asked my watch supervisor to be placed on a different floor, which at the time we had just got a new batch of rookies in, so he gave me my choice of the floors. I've been on my floor for a little over two years now, and I still have things happen that I can't explain, such as audible footsteps from around the cube, the occasional tapping on the glass of the door to the cube, but nothing as drastic as that night in 2018. <laughs> My mother and her wife bought a big house in a small village in southern Sweden when I was younger. That's the house I grew up in. I never believed in ghosts or anything like that when I was younger, but that was about to change. I lived alone on the first floor of the house because it was only had one bedroom on the entire floor. It was a big house and the rest of the first floor was a TV room, laundry and a big inventory. I have stories for days about that house that I will only tell you the most scary one, in my opinion. This encounter took place on spring, when I was in the ninth grade in high school. I always stood up, stayed up late at night watching MTV in the big TV room downstairs because I didn't care so much about school since it was going to end in a few weeks and I'd done all my tests. One night when I was watching the replay of Jersey Shore, which aired at 3am in Sweden, I heard someone walking down the stairs. I thought it was my mom that was coming down to tell me to go to sleep, as usual. So I quickly laid down to fake sleep on the couch so I could blame the noises coming from the TV on that. But the footsteps didn't come closer. Instead, I heard it go up again. After the steps came to the top of the stairs, it went down again. This repeated itself many times, so I went to check on who was walking the stairs up and down. To my surprise, I didn't see anyone walking the stairs, but the steps continued. I thought to myself, now I've lost it. I stood there beside the stairs and followed the footsteps up and down with my eyes. I thought I was hearing things that wasn't there because I didn't sleep much at the time. So I went to the couch, fell asleep, and I didn't think about it too much. When the alarm rang at 7.30, I went up to get some breakfast with my mom and brother. She asked me why I was scared my brother at night by walking so much in the stairs. I explained to her that I saw that night, but my mother, skeptic as she always was, angry at me because she didn't believe me. A few years went by, I had some more scary encounters, but she always blamed it on the wind or that it was an old house. I moved out of the house to study in a different city about an hour away from my hometown. Almost a year after I moved, I came home to celebrate my grandmother's birthday. On that occasion, my mother pulled me to the side and said, you've always said there's someone else living in our house. How do you make someone like that disappear? I saw in her eyes that she was frightened, so I asked her what had happened. She explained that the night before, she and my younger siblings slept downstairs because it was really hot upstairs. She woke up because it sounded like there was an intruder in the upstairs kitchen. She said she froze and couldn't move because she was so scared and prayed that the intruder wouldn't go downstairs. The sounds from the kitchen started at 3am 
and stopped somewhere between 3 and 4 a.m. When she went to the kitchen the morning, nothing was moved or changed. I told my mother, I told you so, all these years and you never believed me. She said she was sorry and asked me where to go from here. I told her I had no clue, but that the house needs to be cleansed. She hired a medium and I can honestly say that the energy in that house has now changed. My old friends who had no idea that the house was ever haunted or that a medium cleansed it even said something felt different about the house. I lived and grew up in a haunted house, but it made me who I am and I don't regret a thing because now I know ghosts are real. A few years ago, my mum and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had been sort of scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually, at the top, we found a secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now, it was dark, and we'd been around the fire for a few hours. Our sight was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction and looked up. Two people walking out in front of each other, dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead, didn't acknowledge me or my mom whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Both had no lights, were barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark, and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching heart drop feeling when I saw them. I asked my mum if she saw that, and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on the edge of the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him, and told him what I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, Oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought it was paranormal, he said it was pretty damn sure. Got the hell out of there as soon as I could. I was a dumb fuck as a kid. I did a lot of ridiculous shit, but this encounter, just let me tell you, I learned my lesson about breaking into places that really should be left alone. I was in the middle of the summer, me and my friends sat on a wooden fence smoking cigarettes thinking about what the hell to do with ourselves. One of my friends suggested an abandoned hospital up the road from my house. We were unsure at first as we'd heard a lot of stories from people who had previously went years ago before it was boarded up again. After much discussion, we went. It was boarded up with wood nailed to the windows, the doors were sealed shut, so there was no way we could have gotten in that way. We were going to walk away and just go home, but luckily I remembered I had something at home that I could get the boards off with. As we climbed through the window, we finally got in. It was like going through a time warp. The place wasn't heavily damaged and the interior looked like it was from the 70s or 60s. There were still stale bloody towels there too. It was eerie as hell. Anyways, we fooled around, freaked each other out for a few hours until we had to go. Before we left, we fucked around with a fire extinguisher that had been left there. While everyone was in the centre of the hospital, I stepped out for a breather in the hallway, with the window we entered through. I was at the bottom of the hallway and I saw a pale, slender figure in a blue hospital gown climb out of the window while looking at me. He looked tired and sick. I froze and screamed. I left as soon as it happened. I will never forget how freaky it was. So let me start off by saying that I'm a huge horror movie fan and I've seen all major horror movies out there. I pretty much only ever watch horrors in my spare time and like watching anything paranormal. I find it very hard to be genuinely scared and most horrors don't really scare me. So I was looking for a decent horror movie to watch and I'm mostly into demonic paranormal horrors. I came across a movie called The Dark and the Wicked. I looked it up on IMDb and it had a fairly good rating so I thought I'd give it a try. I started watching it around 1am, and after I finished watching it, I was like, fuck, that was a really scary movie. This doesn't happen often, and it freaked me out a bit. My wife was sleeping, and I quietly got into bed because I didn't want to wake her up, but she woke up anyway. She asked me what time it was, and it was almost 3am at that point. 
I told her I watched a really scary movie and it freaked me out. She pretty much told me to shut the fuck up and go to sleep. She can't watch or listen to anything remotely scary. It's been like 20 minutes or so I'm in bed, trying to sleep, and all of a sudden I hear an alarm go off. Initially I was thinking it was coming from my neighbor's house, but then it sounded closer. My wife woke up and she said it could be the car alarm. I looked outside and it wasn't the car, so I thought I'd go downstairs to check it out. The fire alarm was going off. So I put the light on and went to the kitchen and there was no smoke. I went into the living room and there was no smoke. All the appliances were off. I didn't think much of it, so I turned the alarm off and went back into bed. I told my wife and we didn't make anything of it. I tried to go back to sleep again and it must have been around 30 minutes or so and I heard the fire alarm go off again. I did the same thing, looked all around the house, no smoke, all appliances were off. I did not have any explanation of it. I took the fire alarm off the ceiling and checked it, the battery was low and this was one of the reasons why it would go off. This particular fire alarm, you can't change the battery. It had an expiry date and it ended in 2028. I didn't put the fire alarm back on the ceiling and threw it in the bin. I went back to bed and needless to say, my wife was pissed. She was like, I always tell you not to watch these types of movies at night. We're Muslim and she thinks that if you watch movies with demonic shit in it, it can bring negative energy to the house. I thought that was bullshit, but after that day, I have second thoughts. I'm still going to watch horror movies. I just find it crazy how we've lived in this house for three years now and nothing like that has ever happened before. It could just be a coincidence, but it made me think. I've had friends who have told me that similar things have happened to them in the past. So I've experienced some really unusual, interesting things throughout my 26 years of living. And a few of those memories just won't give me peace of mind. Some of my earliest memories go back to the very first apartment I lived in with my parents. We moved quite a bit, which I only recently discovered was when I was only one year old. When I brought those memories up to my mother, she was shocked that I could remember the apartment and the gatherings my parents would hold there with so much detail, saying we moved out of the apartment before I turned two. That apartment is also my first vivid memory of what I've always believed to be a ghost encounter. It was a one room apartment. There was a small hallway going from the main door to the kitchen with our bedroom and living room on the left and the bathroom shower on the right. There was a vent up on the wall that for whatever reason always gave me the creeps as a child. My parents and I shared the one room with me sleeping on a small couch and my parents sleeping on the floor. Everything was covered in carpets, carpets everywhere. Well, we did live in Ukraine. One night I'm slowly shaken awake by someone and as I opened my eyes expecting to probably see my mom, I noticed the hands of the palest white I'd ever seen in person with long sharp nails. I look up and looking down on me is an extremely pale woman, long straight black hair, dressed all in black with a black veil covering her head and most of her face. I don't remember being scared, but I remember her very vividly. She just looked at me for a long minute, then turned and walked away. And from there, the rest of the memory gets foggy. Fast forward to age 16, now living in Israel, my father being a strong Christian wants to live on the Holy Land. I'm hanging out with two friends when one of them suggests we use a Ouija board to try and summon some spirits to chat. Not knowing any better, I agree. We made our own board with letters, numbers, and yes, no on a piece of paper, since we didn't have an actual board. And friend A offered to use her ring as the circling piece. Friend B didn't want to join, so she decided to wait outside the room. Both friend A and myself placed a single finger each on the ring, and friend A started calling out different names of famous dead people, hoping someone will respond. After a number of failed attempts, I got a bright idea. I tried calling the ghost I saw as a child. I didn't know her name, but her image was very vivid in my mind, so I figured why not try to concentrate really hard and what she looked like as we were trying to summon her. Maybe it'll work. Lo and behold, the ring started moving. I was skeptic, thinking maybe my friend was trying to pull a prank on me and pulling on the ring. So I paused and managed to convince friend B to join, asking her to help me stop friend A from trying to mess with me. We decided that we both will press down on the ring as hard as we can so that friend A won't be able to move it without proving she's messing with us. That did not go as planned. The more we pressed down on the ring, the faster and more fluidly it moved, like it had a life of its own. It answered all our questions, claiming to be the spirit of a dead woman who was brutally killed at the age of 26. 
Her name would probably be Abella or Abella. We did use Hebrew letters for the board, so I'm not sure how it would be pronounced. It even mentioned a vague section number where she's supposedly buried. I was enormously thrown in jail 10 years ago. I already was in a strange situation with my daughter's father and we were fighting over custody agreements and I thought for sure this could be used against me to have her taken away. Not to mention it was people I loved and I thought loved me who orchestrated this jail fiasco. So it's fair to say that I was at a low, probably the lowest point of my life. Betrayed by people I loved and the one thing I'm proud of in my life may be taken away. I was out late Saturday, got a hotel room and decided to get my favourite appetizer at a local bar and have a glass of wine to chill my nerves the following Sunday. I couldn't even take one bite. I love to eat and have never ordered something and just not taken a bite. I couldn't even eat a crumb. I decided to get the ball rolling and find a freaking lawyer because I knew I would need one to keep my daughter to prove I was erroneously thrown in jail, the cops lied. For slander, people I loved told lies. There was a myriad of reasons. I was in my car outside the bar trying to call this lawyer. It was Sunday, so I thought I would just leave a message. It stopped ringing one time. I call back. The voicemail never picks up. But something else does. It's a raspy, deep voice, and it's yelling at me in another language, going on and on. It was not like it was French, Italian, or Spanish, all I slightly know. It seemed archaic. It wasn't human. It hung up on me. I also instinctively knew it was something trying to just finish me off wanting me to think I was crazy hearing voices, wanting me to commit suicide or be committed to a psychiatric ward. I instinctively knew what it was doing. Honestly, I've been suicidal before on this day and the closest I've ever been to feeling that way again, but I did not get scared and spiral down. I dialed it back. I wanted it to yell at me again. I wanted to tell it I was not scared and that he will not win. I wanted to tell it to leave me the F alone. I dialed up back about five times and just got the answering machine, although it seemed jumpy and weak, like he was there. He never came back. In fact, just knowing there was a force out there that wanted me to spiral down again gave me strength. I was able to put one foot in front of the other and go back to the hotel, get a snack, gather myself. I got stronger from there. Turns out the father couldn't do anything about it in court. Everything ended up just fine. It was expunged although I still do not talk to a family member over this, and I'm happy with my daughter. I also am no longer afraid of anything, which is weird because I used to not be able to watch demon movies at all. I watch them alone now, nothing scares me. You can see how it would have been so easy to spiral down. I think I was so crazy, thrown in a mental institution, for real, have my daughter taken away, being suicidal. But in that instant, I flipped for the better. When it's all said and done, I don't think it was a demon, but an entity just trying to scare me. Perhaps the same one that was trying to bring me down growing up too. If I didn't believe, I would have spiraled down. You really do have to believe in this stuff first, then not be scared of it. This happened a couple of years ago in Manchester, UK. I lived in the north of the city, in a town called Bury, and worked early hour night shifts at the airport. I'll put the real place names on here for anyone that would like to google the areas in question. Anyway, one early morning in winter, around 2am, I set off for work. Around this time there was intermittent overnight roadworks on the motorway, which would send you off to a junction without warning, diverting you back onto the motorway further down. And this night was one of those taking me off at Worsley and sending down through Worsley skirting near Eccles towards Manchester's large shopping mall, the Trafford Centre. I knew the area, having lived there a few years previously, but this time of night seemed unusually quiet and deserted on the roads. Normally I'd see the odd person drunkardly staggering down the street, or late night taxis scurrying around. But tonight, nobody was on the streets at all. I drove down Barton Road, which, to my left, is followed by a dark canal, which was mist covered and slowed my car up to the red light at the intersection, just before you cross an old Victoria-era swing bridge, Barton Swing Bridge, which crosses the River Mersey below. As I slowed to the lights, I suddenly became overtaken with an intense feeling of dread and panic. 
The hairs on my arms stood up and I broke out in a cold sweat for no reason. I had this feeling like a smackhead or someone was going to jump out of a nearby bush and jump my car. Then, as cliche as it sounds, my car radio suddenly cut out and the only noise was my idling car engine. The lights turned green and I suddenly didn't want to go through them, over the dark and swing bridge that loomed ahead of me, almost like it dared me to cross it. I swallowed hard and nervously put my car into gear and crept forward to, across the junction. The bridge clanked and seemed to groan as I moved hesitantly over it, then followed the curve of the road around a sweeping bend to the left, then to the right, with nothing but tall, dark trees leaning over the road on either side. Around the bend on my driver's side, the right in England, is an old monastery, and through the gates of the monastery, I could make out the shape of a dog about to cross the road in front of my car, so I slowed. This dog was huge, it was black, it actually looked muscular from its outline. As I completed the bend, my headlights hit this dog. All I can describe it as, my headlights hit nothing. No reflection off its coat, no details, just like a void, a shadow. This dog turned to me and its eyes glowed yellow. Not reflections like you get off a cat or a fox, they glowed. This beast then ran across in front of me. It clearly wasn't a dog. It ran an emotion that wasn't a dog. As ridiculous as it sounded, it seemed to run in a jerky motion, like the really bad CGI motions of old Sinbad film sea monsters. I followed this beast till it ran to the side of the road and out of my headlight beam, and seemed to completely vanish from sight. I looked in my side windows, side mirrors, rear mirrors, nothing. As my car rolled around the next bend in the road, past this monastery, the car radio suddenly blurted back into life, startling me. That feeling of dread lifted, as this thought randomly came to me. You wasn't meant to see that, it wasn't for you. I felt completely normal, but absolutely perplexed by what had just happened to me. When I was around eight years old, I first met my three friends who moved to the neighborhood, which we have lived in for the past 20 years. The circumstances of them moving to the neighborhood was loosely told to me growing up by them. But as they were kids at the time, they didn't really remember exactly what happened. A couple of months ago, I was at my friend's house and we were talking about paranormal activity we've experienced. That was when my friend's mother sat down and told me in detail what happened in their old home, which made them move to the neighborhood. I knew it was crazy, but I didn't expect to hear what I did. I will try my best to detail all the things she told me. Apologies in advance for the bad spelling and grammar. This all took place in the early 1980s. As a young couple with a baby, they were looking for a council house. Council house is a form of public or social housing built in by local municipalities in the United Kingdom, around the Nottingham area. They came across a neighborhood which they wanted to live in and looked around the properties there. They were then informed of a house in that area which had become available. When they went to visit the house, they noticed that the door to the basement had been bricked up. The other houses in that area all had access to their basements. They thought it was odd, but nevertheless, nothing concerning. From what I was told, the first couple of years which they lived in the house, nothing happened. It was just a normal house. The father was still studying electrical engineering and the mother was a housewife. By this time, they had two more children. Later on, one of their neighbors who frequently visited the house told the mother that she sensed a bad spirit in the house and they should get the house blessed. They didn't do so when they first moved in. My friend's mother agreed, but told me she regretted it deeply as all hell broke loose after that. She thought the events that transpired were caused by the blessing. The first thing which started to happen was my friend who was the oldest at the time started to become restless at night and complain that something was scaring him. My friend's mom thought it was just normal as he just moved into his own room for the first time. But this started to become a daily occurrence and she started to worry about him. It became that bad that he refused to sleep by himself. He said he saw a black woman with long fingers and frizzly hair in his room. Eventually, all three brothers would sleep in the same room. Later, they started to hear scratching and knocking noises in the house. The way she described the noises was like ticking on the windows and scratching noises in the corner of the rooms. This would last for minutes. She couldn't understand where exactly the noises were coming from. As the months went along, things became increasingly strange. 
She told me how they started to smell rotten fish throughout the house, and then it would just suddenly disappear. My friends who were the oldest and youngest were the ones who were greatly affected by the events in the house. The middle child had become attached to the spirit. He would frequently play by himself and talk to the spirits when his brothers weren't around. Later on, the father started to become a target. My friend's mom told me there was an instance where he punished the three boys and especially the middle child for doing something wrong. Later that night, he had a dream of getting chased by a demon dog, which ended up biting him. He woke up the next day with a giant bite mark on his chest. One of the most frightening things which she told me was that, at night, she felt that something was standing near the windowsill, and then it would jump on the bed, and then jump back on the windowsill. She would get up and start to pray as the bed was shaking, and it would eventually stop. They would also start to hear sinister laughing throughout the house, as if something demonic was taunting them. There were also instances where she saw paw paw prints on the kitchen floor as if a dog had been walking around. Only problem was that they didn't have a dog. They asked one of their uncles to house it for them as they took the three kids for a day out. They wanted to get their minds off the events and have a normal day for a change. The uncle was told of what was happening in the house, but he was a skeptic. He said he would deal with what was in the house himself while they were gone. Later that night, when they arrived home, they were shocked to discover the front door wide open and all the lights in the house on. They phoned the uncle and asked him where he was. He told them that he challenged the spirit in the house and was thrown across the room. He started to hear laughing, at which point he ran out the door. As you can imagine, things became very desperate, so they contacted the local council and informed them of what was happening in the house. Eventually, a woman from the council came to visit their home to reassure them that they would do something to make it better. My friend's mother later learned that the woman who came to visit ended up in hospital with a mysterious illness and later refused to go anywhere near the house again. The meetings which they had subsequently all took place in a pub, which was half a mile down the road. Thankfully, the council found them another house, on the street where we live now. On the last day when they were packing their things into the car to move out, the middle son was walking in the house by himself, without a care for anything. He was the only one who didn't want to move. The family later discovered that numerous couples had left the house after their departure. No one stayed in the house for more than a few months. After doing some research, they were informed by local people that a black woman with a dog had committed suicide in that house. From what I understand, the house is now a part of a Chinese takeaway. So I came home on lunch break yesterday and the candle on my living room coffee table was lit. I, I know I didn't light it, and I walked by it on my way out of the house in the morning, like I do every morning to go to work. When I saw it, I went over, said thank you to the candle, and blew it out. It kind of freaked me out a little, and I was concerned someone was messing with me, so I checked all the locks in the house and made sure nothing was missing. Nothing was out of place, and I called all the people that had spares to make sure none of them had been in my house and lit the candle. So I'm sure people are going to ask, and before I even say this, no, I didn't forget to blow it out. The reason being is that I have this weird thing where when I blow candles out, I always say thank you out loud. I don't know why I really do it. It's just something I started doing when I blew out candles while living alone. But anyway, I distinctly remember blowing out the candle the night before. And I remember it was particularly hard to light in general because it's in a deep jar. It's in one of those prayers candles you find at the grocery store. So I used a spare birthday candle I had left over to stick down in the jar and light it. While it was lit, I was painting at my kitchen table, and at some point I got up, said thank you, blew the candle out, and resumed watching Twitch and painting. I checked online to see if candles could relight themselves, and people said they could given the right circumstances. However, I'm sure it was going out before going to bed. Furthermore, my neighbour has a security system with a camera that points at my driveway. And during the hours when the candle had to be lit, no one had come or gone. This happened two weeks ago and I can't stop thinking about it. I was sleeping, then I opened my eyes because the noise was bothering me. The noise was something was running in my room. 
I was still sleepy. I didn't realize it yet. I thought I had sleep paralysis, but nah. Then it got louder and the running became faster. I was like, what the fuck? I don't have any pets. My house is clean. There ain't no rats or nothing. It was too dark. I couldn't say anything. I swear I got so damn scared. I started saying some prayers and then suddenly the noise stopped. Then I felt the super cold air. It was so weird. I felt like there was a wind going counterclockwise motion. I can't explain it. Anyway, it was in front of my face. At this moment, I knew it was something scary, something supernatural. So I closed my eyes so damn hard, I was terrified I didn't want to look. Then this thing whistled at me. It was like a tune whistle, not just any normal whistle. I quickly grabbed my phone and switched on the light from the smart app. When I checked the time, it was four in the morning. I did encounter strange things in the past, but it wasn't something like this. Like once, I was sleeping and a kid woke me up by tapping my shoulder. I still remember what he was wearing. He was wearing striped t-shirts and knee-length blue jeans. Right now, I can't get the whistle tune out of my head. I don't intentionally whistle it out loud sometimes. This happened in 2001, when I was 13. The foster family I had just moved into was selling one of two old people's homes they owed. This particular one just so happened to be supposedly placed on the boundary lines of the old Templar kingdom of Walsingham. Not my words, but foster mothers. As it was located in a rough area of Leeds, Yorkshire, after all residents were moved to different care homes, staff laid off before the sale completed and money changed hands. My then foster mother, her ex-care home manager, friend, and myself decided to spend the night to make sure all clean and done, all items, knickknacks removed by removals, no damage to property, etc. The initial plan was I was to sleep in a camp bed in the living room, foster mother and her friend to sleep in a nearby ground floor room. Upon pulling into the driveway, I can only explain I got bad vibes, spidey sense, neck hairs tingling, off the place, mid-October, early evening darkness. Anyway, I got out of the car and upon walking up to the front door, I can only explain it as seeing a black cloud or amalgamation of moving darkness through the living room window, correlating in the left hand corner of the room. This furthering my bad vibes, I stuck close to foster mother and her friend as we ordered the basic chores before bed. As the room they were sleeping in had twin beds and was quite big, I asked if I could sleep on the floor so as not to be on my own. Surprisingly, they agreed. TV on until time for sleep. Foster mother and her friend were fast asleep. I was drifting into sleep between half sleep, but not what time when I was on my left side, right ear on the pillow, left ear up. I heard as though it was directly in my left ear a few seconds of loud sniffing, and I could feel the breath on my ear. As I opened my eyes, slowly, it was then I heard the most loud, inhuman, blood-curdling scream of a woman. I imagined woman as it was too high-pitched for a man. Then silence. My eyes opened, I jolted up, terrified, what was 30 seconds looking at both foster mother and her friends sound asleep. Seemed like an eternity, I screamed, what the fuck? My foster mother and her friend woke up to me in tears, explaining the scream as they did best to console me, and said go back to bed, we'll talk in the morning. I couldn't go back to sleep, all I could do was try and rationalise, yet I could hear a fake clang 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 coming from beneath the floorboards, almost like mining. To be fair, the next morning during last minute chores and waiting for removals, they listened intently, tried to rationalise it and make light of the ordeal while consoling me. Eventually they tried to make a joke of it so that they knew by how I looked I was telling the truth, which worked after a few days. After we left the next day after papers were signed, I was told apparently other staff had heard the same thing over the 20 years that had been a care home. I found out a rich family bought the place to be used as family home. And I remember two weeks after this ordeal, calming down, I asked if the new owners were told it was haunted. I got a grin and maybe. I have lived in this house with my husband and two teenage sons for two years now. Every one of us has heard the same thing, time after time. When sitting in the living room at night, you can hear what sounds like someone pacing back and forth on the front porch. Sometimes there will be light knocking on the door in the walls. 
When we check, no one is there. No wild animals, nothing that could explain the noise at all. We have kind of made a joke out of it. Oh, the ghost is back, haha. <laughs> None of us are really true paranormal believers, although I am open to the possibility. Just skeptical. I want to explore all options before jumping to conclusions. Well, my mother has been staying with us for the past week and has been sleeping on a pull-out bed in the living room. She tells me that it goes on all night long and can actually get pretty intense. We are all always in our bedrooms at night, on the opposite side of the house, so we had never really experienced what she said. About an hour ago, my mother and I are watching a movie in the living room, about 10pm where I live. My husband had gone out and the kids were playing Smash Bros in the back room. We had heard the pacing a few times and talked about it a little earlier. There was a few minutes of quiet and then three heavy distinct knocks on the front door that sounded just like my husband had come back and had his hands full of groceries. So I reach over and open the door, still looking at the TV screen, and say, you're back, come on in. Only no one comes in. We stop the movie and I look around outside. Nothing. My husband isn't back yet. Nothing else is around. My mum tells me again that this happens every night. I've never heard it so distinct, but she tells me it's happening every night. She then says, sort of jokingly, I think there was someone out there that wanted in, and I think you just gave him an invitation. At this very moment, as soon as that proclamation left her lips, the light bulb flickered about five seconds and then blew out completely, leaving us sitting there in the dark. We both panicked for a few seconds and then kind of tried to laugh it off. We restart the movie we were watching, and for the rest of the movie, we heard no creeping around outside. I don't want to admit it, but I am feeling scared right now. I went to the bathroom, and one of the bulbs in there had done the same flicker, but it didn't burst like the other. This isn't something that has happened before. It's not a wiring problem, at least not one that existed before the incident. From the time I was born until I was around six years old, my family and I lived in a townhouse close to the city's community college. It wasn't particularly old, and as far as my parents knew, the house had no dark past to speak of. There's a good chance the house was built on old farmland. I can explain this more in a second post if needed. And there was certainly a Native American presence in the area not long ago. But the house itself was totally normal. My parents moved into the house in 2001, and hadn't had anything out of the ordinary occur until after I was born, sometime around late 2004 to early 2005. This is the first odd experience my family had in the house, as told to me by my mom. My mom was very close friends with her supervisor. We'll call her Christy. Christy was over at our house quite often, since my mom often consulted her for help with her work, and she would usually bring her son over to play with me. On this particular day, it was just her, my mum and Christy were down in the kitchen, talking at the table. My dad was upstairs in one of the bedrooms, changing my diaper. My mum got up to use the bathroom, which was just across the hall from the kitchen by the front door, and Christy stayed at the table. As my mum was in the bathroom, out of nowhere she hears a woman's voice she doesn't recognise say something along the lines of, Hello, handsome. My mum, thinking a neighbour has come over to say hello, thinks nothing of it. And when she comes out of the bathroom, she asks Christy if anyone's over. Christy looks at my mom, baffled, and tells her that no one else has entered the house, and that she hadn't heard the woman's voice. As Christy and my mom look around the house, puzzled, my dad comes downstairs holding me and asks, who stopped by to say hello? He'd heard the same woman's voice. No one could figure out where the voice had come from, or how both my mom and dad on two separate floors at that time had both heard the same voice. Christy told my mom she got a weird feeling in the home, but my parents just wrote it off and figured it was just a strange co coincidence. This proved to only be the beginning. It was around this time as well that my mom began capturing these strange balls of light in every picture she took in the house. Now my mom acknowledges herself that capturing a picture or two containing an orb is nothing out of the ordinary, considering orbs can be caused by dust and tricks of the light, but this was different. These orbs were appearing in every picture she would take. My mom cut the camera straps off her cameras, tried using disposable Kodak cameras instead of our digital one, got the house deep cleaned several times, took pictures in different parts of the house to avoid light contamination, and even bought an entirely new digital camera 
but the orbs still appeared in every single photo. There are hundreds of photos sitting in albums in our living room with these massive orbs in them. These orbs show up again later in the story, but for the sake of trying to keep the timeline straight, I'll table this part of the story here. My mom hosted a group for mothers of young babies at our home, and Christy also happened to be a part of this group. One day, the group was over at the house and seated in a circle in our living room, when suddenly Christy looked up towards our couch and screamed, pointing towards it. She looked at my mom in a panic and shouts, there is a man standing behind your couch. The rest of the group looks over and sees no one there. It wouldn't have been possible for there to have been someone behind the couch anyway. The couch was pushed up against the wall. Christy, Christy grabbed her son and ran out of the house. And although she and my mom remained friends, they haven't seen each other in years, but they're still friends on Facebook. Christy refused to enter that house ever again. Christy had seen the pictures containing the orbs, since there were actually pictures of me and her son together that showed the orbs floating around us. Seeing this man behind the couch was the last straw. She stuck to her word and never returned to the house for the remainder of our time there. It was around this time that my parents began to feel off in the house, especially when spending time in the basement and in my bedroom. My mom would try as hard as she could to avoid spending too much time in the basement. Both of my parents have told me that they felt like they were being watched as they tucked me into bed some nights. And then one day, the activity presented itself while my dad was at work. For a little backstory, not sure if anyone else has experienced this as a child, but I was absolutely obsessed with these classical music CDs called Baby Einstein. They had these weird puppet creatures that represented different artists and composers, and all of the CDs were narrated by the same woman whose name escapes me now. Anyways, I was in the living room asleep while my mom was in the kitchen cooking. She was playing one of the Baby Einstein CDs over some speakers we had, so I wouldn't wake up and bother her as she cooked. As she's cooking, she starts hearing what sounds like a woman talking over the music. My mom could tell it was not the narrator, since this woman sounded younger and was not talking during one of the pieces. The narrator only came on between the songs. Although my mom couldn't take out exactly what the woman was saying, she described it to me as hearing the woman having a conversation. She sounded happy, and my mom could hear the tone of her voice changing as she talked. At first, my mom thought maybe she was just overhearing someone talking outside, but when she peeked through the blinds to the kitchen window, she saw no one. Thinking maybe it was just coming from somewhere else, she walked out onto the deck, looking out into the forest behind the house. Again, no one. At this point, the woman had stopped talking, and my mom was beginning to be convinced what she was experiencing was something paranormal. After this, the activity around the house came to her head. There was one night my aunt was over with my mom, helping her out around the house while my dad was at work. Another quick bit of backstory, my room was very dark and it was sometimes very hard to hear what was going on up there from downstairs. For this reason, my parents bought a baby monitor to stick in my room so they would know if I was crying or if I wasn't sleeping well. This was long before the days of video monitors, so all this monitor had was a cheap microphone and some red lights that showed how loud the noise in the room was. Also in my room, sitting directly across from my crib, was an old rocking chair that my mom had inherited from her grandma. My aunt and my mom had just put me to sleep and were sitting downstairs when they started hearing a noise over the baby monitor. At first they couldn't quite make it out, but very quickly realized what they were hearing. It was the sound of the rocking chair creaking back and forth as if someone was sitting in it. The only person that should have been upstairs at the time was myself, but I was fast asleep. My aunt and my mom were downstairs and my dad was still at work. The two stood up from their chairs in a panic, but as soon as they stood, the creaking noise stopped suddenly. They walked upstairs and into my room and found nothing out of the ordinary. I was still fast asleep, and the rocking chair looked as though it had never been disturbed. They walked back downstairs, and as soon as they sat back down, the creaking started again. This cycle of creaking over the baby monitor, walking upstairs to find everything undisturbed, and then sitting back down and hearing the creaking start again, continued for about an hour and it reached a point where my aunt was convinced we should leave the house and stay in a hotel for the night. Not too long after, my dad came home and the creaking stopped completely. At this point, my mom was convinced that here are my dad's feelings of discomfort surrounding my bedroom were justified and began looking for ways to solve the problem. 
Although my dad remained skeptical, my mom was convinced that what was going on in the house was paranormal and began trying to find ways to reach out to whatever was in the house. At this point, my mom had accumulated hundreds of pictures containing the orbs and wanted to see if she could capture something more compelling in a photo. Before, one day, she decided to take the camera and point it at a random spot in the house. Before snapping the picture, she said aloud, can you give me some sort of sign that you're here? She snapped the photo, and as she looked down at the screen, she was shocked. In the picture, several separate balls of light appear in the center of the screen, up against the wall, but they appear in a straight horizontal line. She is ecstatic that not only did she capture something more compelling than an orb, she also managed to capture some sort of intelligence from what she was now convinced was a spirit living in our home. She tried asking for more signs, but in the absence of anything else, she began coming through the hundreds of pictures she'd already captured, looking for anything else that could show that these were more than just a trick of the eye or dust particles floating in the air. After a good amount of time searching, she found what she was looking for, a picture of me and Christie's son featuring an orb, but the orb was different. Inside the orb was the outline of what appeared to be some sort of face. She immediately began searching around the internet for paranormal investigators and contacted a team in the area to see if they'd be willing to come and check out the house. The investigators asked her to tell them about the experiences we'd been having, and although they were a little apprehensive, they finally agreed to check things out. Before coming out to investigate, the investigators told her that normally they would not be willing to come check out a house if all the residents had to show for the ghosts were pictures of orbs and personal testimony but that they were convinced by both the sheer amount of pictures that my mom had and the two very bizarre photos, one featuring the line of orbs and the other featuring the orb with the face. The investigators did come over, albeit slightly skeptical, but they immediately began experiencing strange activity. Almost as soon as the investigators walked upstairs into my bedroom, all of their camera batteries died almost simultaneously. This actually freaked them out, with one of them looking at my dad and saying, your house is weird, man. These were all new batteries and they died in five minutes. The same thing happened down in the basement, with batteries dying left and right, affecting all sorts of equipment. Microphones and digital recorders picked up strange, staticky feedback, and their electromagnetic field readers picked up odd spikes, both in my bedroom and in the basement. My parents' suspicions about the house had been confirmed by professionals, and the investigators were convinced that there was something off about the house. After reviewing the evidence and doing some deliberating, the investigators told my parents that they wanted to return to the house a second time, this time with more equipment, since they were convinced there was more evidence to be captured. My parents eagerly set up the follow-up and waited. Now this is where this story becomes a little muddy. I do 100% believe my mom, and the fact that my dad, a skeptic, backs her up on a lot of these stories makes it extra compelling to me. But this last part of the story has always left a bad taste in my mouth. My mom was a very spiritual person. She always believed in angels, certain stones carrying supernatural powers and the like. She's a therapist and a hypnotist, so I get it. But I guess what I'm trying to say here is to maybe take this final portion of the story with a grain of salt. Yes, it's odd, but I don't want to make assumptions about what was going on and neither should you. I wouldn't be telling this story if I wasn't convinced it was real but this final portion has always seemed a little odd. Anyways, my mum had set up a consultation with a woman claiming to be a psychic medium well before the paranormal investigators came over to visit the house. The appointment was only a week or so before the investigators were scheduled for their follow-up. Anyways, during the appointment, the woman asked my mum about the strange experiences we've been having in the house, and the medium told my mum that she'd picked up on the energy of a man in the house. She said he was lonely, and that he'd latched onto my family since he'd been over on his own. Obviously, this doesn't explain the woman's voices we heard in the house, but whatever. Like I said, this whole thing seemed a little odd to me. The woman asked my mum if she wanted her to either cleanse the house or leave it be. Knowing that the investigators were returning soon, my mum told the woman not to do anything to the house. She wanted to see what could be captured with more advanced equipment. The medium told her she wouldn't, but when my mom returned home afterwards, she noticed the entire house felt different. It felt like a heavy weight had been lifted out of the house atmosphere. She began to suspect that the medium had cleansed the house anyway. Not sure how that's possible, 
considering the medium never actually visited the house. Maybe someone in the comments can explain how this works. And her suspicions were only confirmed when the investigators returned for the second time and captured absolutely nothing. No strange EMF readings, no cold spots, no electronic malfunctions, nothing. This takes place about two years ago in August, in my home, during a bright summer day. So my sister came over to see me and my baby son one afternoon. My son went for a nap, and as we were both a bit drowsy, we also went for naps in separate beds on two different floors. Now a bit about my house. It's old. So old we weren't entirely sure how, because if we look too deeply we might get into one of those naughty blue plaques. My house isn't haunted. It's got residual loving and warm energy, but that's it. Our wooden stairs, we've got two sets as my house is set over three floors. I joke that these stairs are demon stairs because they are beyond creaky. You cannot sneak, no matter how hard you try. Believe me, with a new baby, I've tried. So my sister slept in my bed and I in the spare bed, on different floors. We are only sleeping for an hour. Partway through the nap, I woke to hear someone on the stairs. I assumed it was my sister leaving to go to work, but chose to go back to sleep. Once I woke up, I checked on my sister, only to find her still in bed. I asked her if she had gone downstairs. She said she hadn't moved, but heard the stairs and thought it was me. So now both of us heard the stairs. I figured maybe it was my father-in-law who pops in sometimes. Check in with him. Nope, he was working all day. Checked with other family members who lived nearby. Everyone was out. It's not settling sounds and it has never done it before or since. So who was on the stairs? Rather sadly, this coincided with the death of my aunt, my sister and I loved. She'd only visited the house a couple of times, but part of me wonders if it was her. This happened when I was nine years old. All at that age, I never really believed in paranormal stuff, even though my mom had told me stories of paranormal stuff she'd experienced. But since I hadn't experienced any of that yet, I never took her stories too seriously. Anyways, I remember I was waiting for my mom to pick me up from school, and I was sitting next to this girl from my class. And she told me that there was a ghost in our classroom, and the ghost would sit in desks and run around. Obviously, I didn't really take it too seriously, but I told her I would check it out. The next day, again after school, they would make us sit in the hallways for kids who were getting picked up. And I remember my teacher leaving the classroom, with his things and locking up in the classroom. I decided since no one was there anymore, it would be the perfect opportunity to see if there really was a ghost. The classroom door had a small window, and walking up to it, I wasn't expecting anything, until I looked through the window. I saw a girl, probably about my age, sitting at a desk and was wearing a dress. It was red, white and black. She had very long hair and very pale skin, almost transparent, but she seemed like she was glowing. I remember being incredibly confused rather than scared, so I went to the water fountain to drink some water. Then I walked back and looked again, and she was still there. I was still confused, and then her head was slowly turning towards me. I could see her face I walked away. I wasn't ever scared until now. I'm still in disbelief that it happened. I told my parents, and my dad didn't really believe it. Years later, I tried to do research, but couldn't find anything on the girl. I still remain confused to this day. I'm a 20-year-old female. The first time I remember seeing someone who wasn't there, I was six years old. After these instances kept happening, my grandparents eventually fessed up and said she's been doing this since she was little. They told my parents how I'd see people on the boardwalk and asked to walk with them, or play with people in the ocean that weren't there. As I got older, they became constants and I was able to tell who was real and what wasn't. My dad died when I was 12, but up until the day he died, I made him sleep back to back with me until I fell asleep, and also walked behind me up the stairs because I always had this feeling on my back like someone was with me. Eventually, when I was around nine, I went to therapy for unresolved trauma happened at around four years old. My dad was all for therapy, but he made it very clear that I wasn't allowed to tell the therapist what I was seeing or feeling, 
because they take me away. Fast forward to me being 14 and hospitalized with anorexia. The psychiatrist that was treating me knew something was up and my mom went against my deceased father's wishes and told the doctor what I've been going through. I was put on Suprexa, which I was on for six years at high doses, but the visions and the presence never really went away. I just finished withdrawal from Zabrexa. My therapist, psychiatrist, doctors and my mom say it's just access to the spirit world that I'll always have. I've been screened for schizophrenia, psychosis, schizoid, all of it. They can't find anything but depression, anxiety, PTSD and anorexia. Nothing that explains what I experience. When I was younger, I was much more close to this entity that I will refer to as Victor, though I commonly call him Vincitor as well. If you look at the definition of that, it might be relevant. I'll make the explanation for this existence short, unless any of you would like to hear the full story eventually, but he's been actively stalking me and seemingly my ancestors for a long, long time. He's the pay for your sins of your father type. Now you might be saying pay for the sins of your father type, He's a negative spirit, no doubt about that. But over the years, he developed a strange kinship for me, going so far as to referring to me as his daughter. Now, believe me, I like considering everything and all the facts, so I've gone back and forth on being more sure of him even existing and not. Sometimes I feel crazy. What always gets me back to the believing anything is possible spectrum is when I think about all the strange occurrences that so far cannot be explained by mental illness or coincidence. The story I have to tell is now one of those many occurrences. I had been talking to Victor in the way we usually spoke. He'd move objects right, left, up and down to signal what he was saying in reply. This wasn't a board, it was just random objects. I'd heard his voice before, but he didn't talk as much. He was saying, or I guess more so agreeing since his talking is limited, that he felt weak and that's why he was moving things slower. I got the strangest idea right then and there and probably an incredibly stupid idea as well. Unfortunately, even though I knew it was stupid, I didn't care. I knew it would only come back to haunt me, literally, and didn't care about myself enough to avoid making it worse than it already was. My idea was maybe there was energy he could feed off, the power in my power bank. It had been fully charged, so I grabbed it and put it on my table, and I said to him, okay, take the power from this power bank. And I watched it with my own eyes drain completely. I was so surprised. I just never thought that anything like that would have happened. Sure, I asked for it, but even part of me sure wasn't sh if it was possible. Still wasn't sure that what I wasn't just crazy even after everything. I continued in the exact same manner as before, two times that day, and he again drained it completely. After the third one, I stopped charging it or saying he could take it. To me, that was enough to show it was happening. I ran a bunch of tests to see how it looked when it wasn't charged or when it was charged and was charging something else, something else being an actual electronic. And it looked exactly what it looked like when charging something except around 10 times faster. Now I've heard of paranormal entities feeding off electricity or things of that nature, but obviously more commonly people think that it's emotions and that the power comes from the emotions. What are your opinions on what paranormal entities feed off? I've had weird occurrences happen to me for years, some that can be explained, others not. I believe I've suffered from sleep paralysis, which could explain a couple of my experiences, but not all of them. So I'm going to skim over some of my easier explained experiences and cut out the one experience I can't explain as well. One of the times I saw my demon, he refers to himself as Victor, clear as day was extremely terrifying. I was walking around my room in the middle of the day listening to music on my Xbox with a headset on. This is relevant to the story. Usually when I listen to music, it's for inspiration. And I usually pace, in this case, I was pacing in a circle for reference. My desk right in front of the window was opposite to the door. So when I went in circles, I'd spend some time looking at the door, then turn around and look at my desk and so on. Well, I'd been repeating this for a while. I was on the part where I was looking at the door and all of a sudden I felt this overwhelming feeling that something was there behind me watching. I thought to myself, I'm just being paranoid. It's probably nothing. We should turn around slowly in case something is there. 
It might sound weird, but in my mind, I felt if something was there, it would be easier to ignore if I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, rather than staring at it immediately in the face. So, I slowly started to turn around, and there he was, crouched on my desk in the middle of the day. I literally fell on my ass. I don't know how long we were staring at each other. Sometimes it feels like it could have been hours. I was paralyzed with fear. He didn't say anything. He just moved in this weird manner, still in place, smiling something that to this day I remember as being so disturbing, more disturbing than heinous things I've seen because of the way it made me feel. Eventually, I got my wits about me. I scrambled to my feet, throwing my Xbox controller at him as a way to hopefully slow him down. If he was to follow me, I got to my door and ran down the hallway towards my grandmother. I told her that I was back and I had just seen it clear as day. She came in with me. Nothing was there, just my controller on the floor with a song playing. One that wasn't on my playlist. A song that shouldn't normally be taken as disturbing, but in this case, it was. Funny enough, it was a song to a Disney Channel original movie, Girl vs. Monster, specifically Fearless. I know it's funny, but still it kind of gives me the creeps that I walked in on the part. I'm stuck in your head and I'm back from the dead. Got you running and scared. Weird coincidence, right? I suppose you, you all should know some information pertaining to this entity. He's pretending to be my father. He calls me daughter. And that's something that makes the situation even worse. Because they made it more personal, especially considering who he was. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I were driving back to my house, and it was around 9 or 10 at night and dark. As we drove along, I turned right to go up a straight road on a hill. This particular road isn't in the middle of nowhere, in the surrounding area are houses etc. But on the right hand side of it is a small park of sorts, and to the left is a pavement with a bus stop, an embankment, so there were no houses right next to that, if it makes sense. Anyways, this night was foggy, and as I turned onto this road, it dips, then goes up the hill. I was about to go down the dip, my headlights shone across the fog, and I very clearly saw a figure walking from left to right across the road. Except there's no bottom half, and it appears to be wearing clothes that resemble a livery coat and hat, like Captain Jack Sparrow. Basically clothing that I guess are Victorian or older. Not an expert, sorry. This happens in a span of, I'd say, two or three seconds, before the figure vanishes into thin air. It didn't disappear into the fog, as I could see both sides of the road. The figure simply vanished. Since my girlfriend was in the car, I didn't want to freak her out or sound insane. So in that two to three seconds, I said nothing. She immediately said, did you see that? I was immediately relieved I wasn't going insane. And we both agreed we'd seen the exact same thing. When we arrived home shortly after, I got out a pen and paper and asked her to draw what she's seen in a separate room while I drew what I seen. Both images were remarkably similar, if you can forgive our poor drawing skills. I have the images saved to my phone, happy to upload them if anyone is interested. Anyway, I'm neither a believer or a skeptic. I enjoy stories and approach them with an open mind. There could well be a logical explanation for mine, but so far it's the only paranormal experience I've had yet. My girlfriend and I have also shared dreams from different rooms, so maybe we're on the same wavelength. So anyway, I wanted to run this dream I had past you guys. I know it's probably just a normal dream, but after everything I've read and the experience my mom told me about in the past, I'd kind of like to hear, I hope it, that it's something. My dad died of cancer when I was 10. A few months back, I had a really vivid dream that I was with him, walking around a seaside town near where we lived. I don't remember much, only that I could feel his presence, that it felt really comforting, and he told me he was really proud of me. I always never have dreams about him, so it was really special to me. We have very similar careers and interests, and I found a fair bit of success, so I've always hoped he would be proud. It went a bit more regular dream weirdness after that. There was a random cathedral plonked down in the middle of the town that we went inside. Although it makes sense because he loved cathedrals, and he would always go on day trips to visit them. I don't know, I'm waffling now. So, what do you reckon? Any chance my dad really visited me?
Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, female 19, decided she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I'd be her roommate. I didn't need a place to stay, but decided we'd do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for about three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I'd go to bed and at some point my eyes would see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate came home, so I'd get out of bed excited to see her, only discover I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom lights would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I'd lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, I'd think my roommate had come home. I'd get up to greet her, only to see I was still alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaning up against my wall in the bedroom, with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked. Each string, in succession, and slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor, with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used, and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while living there, never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom, learning how to play a song from it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flicking, I got curious and got up to look. The pages stopped flipping on the song, Hey You. And when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep. And I went back to bed. While laying there, I realized if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone the other way, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night, I'd been out with a friend until about 2 a.m. And when I opened my door and stepped in, I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, oh, hi, Pink. And I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. So that's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease, not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment or building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbours if they ever experienced anything, but I never did, and actually never really talked to them at all. And to answer some questions before they happen, my roommate and I are still really good friends, never dated, never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, And it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, but usually only when standing right there where they were. If I stand with them long enough, I usually get an image in my head of what they look like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I usually don't tell people this because they usually don't believe me and I'd just rather not go through with the ridicule and the name calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was male, but I'm not sure. I still wonder about it from time to time. Mm 
My wife used to work at the Great Wolf Lodge in Mason, Ohio. She worked third shift at the front desk for five years, and things would happen there constantly. Many times I would take her to work and hang out in the lobby until she got off, instead of making the long drive back home and then back to get her in the morning. Employees she worked with would share stories with me all the time of things that happened to them or to the guests. One room in particular that seems to be the most haunted had reports from guests that something in the middle of the night would jump on their beds. One day, the bathtub overflowed and the water leaked down into the basement. When they checked the room, nobody had been in there and the room hadn't been rented. It seemed as if a lot of the things that happened there either happened in the lobby or on the first floor. The lobby and the main floor are actually the second floor. Every night they had to print a report and get it from the main office on the first floor. My wife went down the stairs and while she walked, the elevator started following her from the lobby to the first floor. When she got down there, the doors to it opened and nobody was on it, nor was there anybody waiting for it. Another night she had to get the report and was waiting at the doors for the elevator. Behind her, she heard a man say, you never asked my name. She spun around, but nobody was there. She walked down the halls and found nobody with her anywhere. One night she got a call from the office, but nobody was supposed to be in there and it was locked at night. The night shift supervisor went down to check it out with security and found the door to still be locked and nobody in there. That happened quite a bit. One time he came back upstairs from checking and as soon as he reached the top of the stairs, a phone that sat on the host station at one of the restaurants there rang. So he picked it up. The extension it called from was the office and he heard nothing but dead air, pardon the pun. A religious man and skeptic, he just laughed it off as he always did and hung up the phone with a shrug. Another night, she got a call from an extension she didn't recognize. And when she answered it, she heard nothing but dead air. Not even her supervisor knew the extension. After hanging up, she decided to call the extension back and the phone in front of her supervisor, who sat right next to her at the desk, rang. He picked it up and they confirmed that it was her that called. Except it wasn't his extension at all. And upon further investigation, they found that extension did not exist anywhere in the hotel. One night I had to use the bathroom, so I walked down the hall off the lobby to the bathroom. As I got it, I looked up and saw someone walking in ahead of me. All I saw was their leg from about the knee down. It appeared to be a white guy, red shorts, white socks and red shoes. I was only a few feet away, yet nobody had been in front of me in the hall. And as I went into the bathroom, I didn't see him. So I looked in each stall and found I was alone. There was absolutely nowhere for him to go. Another night, sometime around Halloween, they had the lobby all decorated and there was a DJ booth. Right around quarter to five in the morning, it began playing a song really loud and scared the hell out of all of us. The supervisor went to shut it off and after we did, he informed us that it had been off when he came in. I mean, it had been off the whole time I was there too. The place is right next to King's Island, which is supposed to be haunted, and Ghost Hunters did a show from there once and found nothing. I'm not sure why they never bothered going to the lodge next door to hunt. They'd probably turn up all kinds of things, and stuff happens regularly there. Maybe the company doesn't want that kind of publicity. Guess I ruined that. Should you ever happen to do some hunting, things seem to happen mostly between 3 and 5 in the morning. I've shared my home experiences, but never my work ones. There is one place I worked for a year that to this day still freaks me out. This place had two floors in a basement in use. It was a bakery and I often worked in the second floor and main floor kitchens alone. I was the only evening baker who worked there and during the week, especially that left me alone for about five hours with the exception of the person who worked the front counter. The main and second floor kitchens were normal nice and well lit. The basement was purely storage with a door at the stairs that was closed and locked at night. 
The basement had a walk-in freezer and fridge that was fairly large, with tons of containers, boxes, old equipments, and even holiday decorations. It was a classic unfinished basement though. Super dark, with a couple naked bulbs as the only light sources. Lots of spiders no matter how much we cleaned, and a concrete floor. Basically just dark, dank, and creepy. But we didn't have to be down there much, so it didn't really matter. Now, the front counter attendants were all in agreement. The place was haunted, and there was something especially creepy about the basement. I quickly was enlisted to do all the closing things in the basement, as at the time, I had no fear of it. So I'd go down there, turn off the lights, and close the door at the end of the night. For a while, it was fine. Just the occasional thing falling for no reason, maybe a creepy feeling here or there, but nothing that couldn't be explained away. But one night, I went down, and as I turned off the light, the door to the basement slammed shut, leaving me in absolute darkness. I was terrified, but rationalized, door jam must have fallen out. I nervously whispered to myself as I walked over to open it. The second I opened that door, I heard the sound of someone running up behind me. I didn't even look, just rushed through the door and slammed it behind me before rushing up the stairs to where the front counter girl was so I wouldn't be alone. I didn't want to feed into the general fear, so I kept this to myself for some time, until another co-worker said the exact same thing happened to them on one of my days off. I shared my experience and from then on, when we worked together, we would close things up together. This, unfortunately, still left me on my own when she was away. On the weekends, I also opened, which meant having two days off, I would be alone in the bakery from 5am to 7am. Part of being the first one in was putting on coffee and I gladly did, needing the boost of energy to wake me up. As I went to pour myself a cup one morning, I was startled to see a stack of cups fly over like someone had smacked them. They went all over the floor, one even flying across the counter. I was so early into my shift, I just tried to ignore it. I quickly cleaned up, made my coffee, and got to work all the while refusing to listen to music as I normally did. I was glancing around, worried something else would happen, and didn't calm down until the next person came in at seven. Now my final experience came in my last week of working there. I was leaving for a job closer to home and everything was going well. There was one day, I went to put a tray of something in the freezer and get some containers. As I left the walk-in, I looked to the back of the basement, saw someone step behind a shelf. I knew it wasn't the girl working, as she was much shorter than whoever this was. So I called out another co-worker's name. He often came in to set up a couple of, th couple of things up if he forgot to before his shift ended. And it wouldn't be the first time I'd been startled by him showing up. But it wasn't him. As I walked around the basement, it quickly became apparent it was empty. And I had just acknowledged whatever it was in this place. Something I learned much later could be very bad for me. Needless to say, I was very happy to leave and get away from all that. I've worked in quite a few places before and since, many of which people claim are haunted, but never have I worked somewhere where those claims were proven as thoroughly as that place. We'll start with about two months ago. I was sleeping in. My boyfriend was already at work. In my half asleep state, I felt someone's hands as they pulled the blanket over my shoulders and placed my cat right next to my head on the pillow. Now, at first, I figured it was my boyfriend, but when I thanked him later that night, he insisted it wasn't him. I thought maybe he was messing with me, but then I remembered that it had been him if it, he would have kissed my head and I clearly remember him doing so as he headed out the door some time earlier. Next was a couple of weeks ago. I was sitting on my couch when a painting that hangs right over where my head was fell. It's not a big painting, but it would have definitely hurt if it smacked me on the head. It didn't though. Instead, it seems like it was pushed aside as it fell, so it ended up landing on the cushion beside me. This isn't the first time things have fallen off the wall. The drywall is very thin, so hanging things can be a challenge. At least now, I know there's something looking out for me. And of course the cats. Oh, the cats. Well, those little jerks got in a fight a couple days ago. 
We were sleeping and very annoyed. I woke up and went to separate them. As my orange tabby tried getting away from her tuxedo brother, he chased her and stopped very suddenly, looking up, like looking at something. They fight like this all the time, but it doesn't stop until you force them away. To my tuxedo cat, it's playing, but the orange tabby doesn't like it. So I usually have to stand right in front of him and make him go somewhere else. I watched him from the stairs as he tried going through the living room doorway to get to where my other cat was, then get stopped and turned around. Like someone put their hands on either side of him and just flipped him around to look the other way. He huffed as cats do and stalked off back to the kitchen. And after saying a quiet thank you to midair, I went back to bed with Tabby trailing behind me. Whatever is in my house seems very kind but strong, which worries me a bit since I don't want to accidentally piss it off and have it come after me. I wonder if it's the ghost of someone who committed suicide, since that is tragically a regular occurrence in the military housing where we live. Background. I grew up in the country, country. We had lots of strange, bizarre things happen to us during that time. Aliens, paranormal, etc. I lived in a house surrounded by fields and forests and no cable or internet. Not that those were really a big thing back then anyway. So I spent a lot of my time outdoors. This happened when I was in my early teens. My best friend and I were driving to go bring some food to my dad and his friend, who were working late at night on some scrap metal down the way from us. To get where they were, there were two ways to go. One was the normal paved back road, and the second was a long old dirt road that people didn't really get, go down. The dirt road was surrounded by trees on both sides, had some sketchy older abandoned houses on either side, and a very old cemetery at the end. After we brought the food to them, we decided to take the old dirt road back as a joke. We used to walk that road every now and then during the day, even though it creeped us out, but we tried to stay away from it at night. We were both laughing about how the other one was too scared to go down it. She was driving and we were laughing and listening to music when we made the turn onto the road. It was a right hand turn, so in order to make the full turn, she had to sweep her headlights across the cemetery. I remember looking at the graves and that's when I saw her. It was an all white figure in the shape of a female with a long dress and long hair. She was standing between the cemetery and the forest. I stared at her for what I felt was five or 10 seconds before she vanished. And then I continued to stare at that spot for a good 10 seconds longer. Once I kind of came out of it, I realized that the car had stopped. I have no idea for how long. My friend and I were both very quiet and we both kind of looked at each other like, what the hell? Neither one of us really said anything for a little while, but I finally asked her if she had seen something and she said she did. Not wanting to say what I saw first, I asked her what she saw and she described the figure exactly as I had above. Interestingly, neither of us were afraid. I remember when I saw her, everything kind of went in slow motion. Even though there was music going in the car, it was quiet and I definitely don't remember the car slowing down or stopping. I remember being in awe and thinking she radiated beauty and she still crosses my mind to this day. I've been back there many times during both the night and day and I haven't seen anything like it since. We got to the cemetery around 2.30 a.m. and we began walking around. First to the tombstone where the possession happened, which is the oldest part of the cemetery, but nothing happened. We walked around to various other places, including a massive statue of an angel, like being about 15 foot high. I got the heebie-jeebies, but nothing unusual. This cemetery is fairly large and after this section, we had one more we wanted to check out before we went home. At this time, it was probably about 3.30, 3.45. We approached the final section we had wanted to check, slightly disappointed. This section is near the wood line for context. As we approach, we start to hear noises over by the wood line. Figured it was probably a rodent or something, nothing unusual, but we check it out anyway and we don't find anything. 
Disappointed yet again, we turn to leave. I pass a grave of a soldier that died a long time ago. As I pass, I hear leaves crunching behind me and my shirt is pulled back to the point it's stretched across my chest. Obviously at this point I'm freaking out. I turn around to see if a tree branch could have gotten me, but the only branch near me was about six feet above my head. I told my friend and he said he didn't notice anything. I was in the marine reserves at the time. I feel the soldier knew that and that's why it reached out. Nothing else happened after that and we left. Like I said, nothing crazy, but that's my two cents. This experience happened several years ago, when I was still in elementary school. My dad and I went to visit some relatives on the Blackfeet Reservation, which we did often. When we arrived at my aunt and uncle's trailer, the first thing I did was run in to see my aunt. As I went past the bedroom in the hallway, I noticed an old woman and old man in the room. One was sat next to the bed and one was laying on the bed. When I reached my aunt who was in the furthest bedroom, we hugged and she gave me a kiss. I asked her who the people were in her daughter's bedroom. My aunt looked at me suspiciously and asked what I meant. I told her that I saw an old man and an old woman in her daughter's room. My aunt became angry and said that I lied and there was only one person in that room and that was her father. The woman could not have been in the room because she had died a year before. Later, when my aunt told my dad what I had said, he told her that I couldn't help myself and that seeing things like ghosts was something children were able to see. I still went to visit my aunts and cousins. I just learned to keep things to myself, knowing that if I were to see something again, it would only frighten some people. My friends lived in a small two bedroom house. On occasion, my friend would allow people to stay with her. When this particular incident happened, my friend, we'll call her T, had three people living with her. There was a woman, the woman's son, about three years old, and her boyfriend. On this particular afternoon, the little boy was laid down for a nap in T's bedroom. About an hour after he went to sleep, the adults in the house were startled by screaming coming from the bedroom the child was in. When T reached the bedroom, she tried to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. The other two adults tried as well, but no luck. They could hear the child screaming and saying that there were ugly faces in the wall and that they were trying to get him. The door gave way not too long after they tried to open it and the boy was rescued, but scared out of his wits. T inspected her bedroom and couldn't find anything that resembled a face or faces. When she called me and asked me to come over, she sounded shaken up. And when I got to her house, she explained what had happened context. I think the reason she called me is because of my upbringing. I was raised in a semi-traditional Native American home. My dad was a medicine man. So I had some knowledge about certain religious things, as far as Chippewa Cree and MT are concerned. She explained to me after the incident that the woman's boyfriend had recently learned about his Native American heritage and had delved headfirst into the culture. He really had no idea how to conduct any kind of ceremony and he had practiced some kind of ritual in T's home. So I concluded that because of what he had done, he may have brought something into her home. Nothing further happened after that day or prior in my friend's home. Her guests left not too long after that incident. And I will never forget that story. Growing up, I lived in a low-income housing complex. I had heard stories that the apartments were haunted, but I didn't really believe it. Well, one afternoon, my mind was changed. My best friend lived directly behind me in another apartment building, and we hung out so much, she and I became family. We spent the night with each other, I met a lot of her family and vice versa. One day my friend said that her family, herself and two of her aunts, we're going to the reservation for the weekend. So that left me finding my own entertainment. I was in the front of my apartment playing in the yard and someone caught my attention in an apartment kitty corner from me. 
I would clearly see a woman walking back and forth in the bedroom window. The apartment's a two-story. The reason I noticed the woman was the fact that she was wearing pigtails on either side of her head. Now, my friend's aunt had moved into that apartment a few months before and I knew her. As I watched her walk back and forth a few times, I just shrugged my shoulders and went about my business. When I spoke with my friend a few days later, I'd asked why her aunt was wearing pigtails because she was older than us and I thought it was an unusual for an adult to wear pigtails. My friend asked, when did I see her aunt in pigtails? And I told her, when you were in Browning. My friend said, my aunt was with me. No one was at her apartment. That was unsettling information to say the least. In the same apartment building, I had a friend that lived directly across from me. When this instance happened, I was in elementary school. One day, we decided to play together in the front of our apartments. Towards the end of the day, closer to dusk, my friend and I decided to climb a tree that was closer to my apartment. The tree had two large branches that split into a V-shape that were large enough for the two of us to climb into and sit. While we were climbing into that area, I recall over and looking into my living room window and saw my dad sitting on the couch watching TV. My friend could see him as well. And for whatever reason, my friend and I stared straight ahead and we both saw my dad walking from the parking lot into the apartment building across from us. We both looked at each other and then back in the front window of my apartment and saw that my dad was still there watching TV. Needless to say, my friend ran home and I ran inside my apartment. Several years later, I ran into my friend and she said ever since that happened, she was afraid of me and explained why she never hung out with me again. I guess what we saw was my fault. A few years ago, I was living in an older house in a small university town in northern Idaho. I had been living in that house with three other roommates for a few years at that point. My roommates had come and gone. My mental health was an ebb and flow, just like any other person. At this point, my sister was living with me and had experienced her own paranormal things that I was indirectly connected to. But for the purpose of this post, I want to just focus on one particular experience that I had with a little girl. This particular night, I had done my nightly routine, washed my face, brushed my teeth, scrolled through Instagram, the works. It was just like any other night. Eventually, I took my phone out of reach and fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night, not completely unusual. I usually wake up once or twice during the night. It's pretty rare for me to sleep through the whole night. Usually, I just turn over and go back to sleep, like usual. But this night wasn't usual by any stretch of the imagination. There's one window in my bedroom which faces the neighbor's porch light. They very rarely turn it off, so there's always a certain amount of light coming through my window into my room. But when I woke up, everything was dark. I didn't immediately think anything of it. I mean, at some point the porch light would have to burn out and be replaced. Honestly, it didn't even cross my mind. Something was up. My anxiety, something I'm medicated for, immediately spiked. My heart began to race and any ounce of tiredness I had in my eyes was gone as I stared wide-eyed at a little girl. Across from me, crouched by my bookshelf, only about two feet tall, maybe less, was a grey little girl. She looked emaciated. Her hair was almost sticky looking and matted. She was wearing a nightdress, think little house on the prairie, that was shredded at the bottom and dirty. She was crouched almost like a frog. And it was almost like she was soaking up whatever light there was that was coming from the window, making the room completely dark, except for a gray light emanating from her. If that was all it had been, I think I would have just rolled over and gone back to sleep. I had done something similar to a shadow figure over my bed previously, but it was her face. Her face told me she wasn't some innocuous child spirit, ghost, whatever. She was something awful and something I needed to fear. Her eyes were very large and she had no eyebrows. Her matted bangs covered most of her forehead 
so I could focus on her white iris and goat pupils. If that wasn't enough, she was smiling at me. But it wasn't a sweet smile. It was a menacing, evil grin. It stretched from ear to ear and bored into my soul. Once I realized what was going on, that there was an evil looking child in my room, I went into fight or flight. All I could get myself to do was hide underneath my covers. I didn't scream, jump out of my bed and run. Nothing. I was so scared I couldn't move. Eventually, I knocked myself out of whatever terrified trance I was in. I had regulated my breathing and my heart rate went back to normal. I peeked out from under my covers and saw that there was nothing there. I was so relieved and figured that somehow a bad dream had kind of leaked into real life for a moment. I got up from my bed, weary but confident that it was an absolutely terrifying dream. I decided if it was a dream, I would go downstairs to grab a glass of water. When I have bad dreams and I don't move around, I can get sucked back into it. And from my reaction to this one, I absolutely did not want to do that. So I got my glass of water, climbed back up the stairs and walked down the hall to my bedroom and put a half full glass of water on my windowsill. I didn't have anything else to put it on by my bed. The entire house was silent. I managed to fall asleep again. I don't know how much later, but I woke up again. The room was again so, so dark. I immediately knew something was wrong, again. I searched for the little girl across the room by my bookshelf and she wasn't there. I was relieved, but I knew there was something off. Slowly, I realized that there was light coming from the side of my bed and it was that gray light. I turned my gaze downward to the edge of my bed and there were those eyes, those white goat eyes and the sticky matted bangs. Then there was that smile. I could feel the weight of that glass of water on my bladder at that moment. The menacing, evil smile stretching ear to ear. I couldn't see the rest of her body. She was so close to me. All I could see was her eyes, looking up at me and the enjoyment she was receiving from scaring the ever-living shit out of me. This time I screamed. I yelled my sister's name and threw the covers back over my head and cried. This wasn't right. I'd done everything right. I'm gonna got a glass of water. I shouldn't still be in this awful dream. I don't know how long I stayed under the covers. I must have eventually fallen asleep because the next morning, I woke to the morning sunlight streaming through my windows and birds chirping outside. It took a minute to remember what had occurred the night before. I immediately went to tell my sister what happened and that I was very annoyed she didn't come to my rescue. After I told my sister, I came back into my room and noticed that the glass of water had fallen onto the carpeted floor. So I did get a glass of water. I wasn't just dreaming. I must have knocked it over when I reacted so fearfully to the second approach from the girl. Anyways, that's what happened. I'm wondering if anyone else has had an experience with something similar. A ghost girl? My cousin suggested it was a demon in the form of a girl feeding off of my fear. I'm not so sure about that, but I'm sure of one thing. I never want to see her again. It was 10 years ago and I was 15 years old. Me and a couple of friends were staying the night at my best friend's house and we had the house to ourselves. Although we had to look after my best friend's sister, who was three at the time. So it was around 9 p.m. My friends all went outside to smoke while I stayed inside to keep an eye on my best friend's sister. I was sitting on the couch with the TV to my right and the sister was to my left on another couch facing the TV. While I was watching the TV, I suddenly felt terrified. It was a paralyzing fear, like I had come face to face with a dangerous predator. And so I looked over the three-year-old to find she was already staring at me. And she looked just as terrified with tears running down her face. She then looked in front of me. So I too looked where she was looking. And that's when I saw it. A couple of meters in front of me was a shadow floating just below the ceiling. My fight flight response kicked in 
and I immediately jumped the couch and ran for the back door and completely forgetting about the little girl. I ran outside screaming for my friends. They came running and when we ran back inside, when I got inside I saw the sister was not in the living room and then she came running out of the hallway screaming and crying. The entity had gone. I don't know if what I saw was a demon or just an angry spirit, but the guilt of being so afraid I abandoned a three-year-old stayed with me for a long time. And from then on, I became a superstitious person. They still live there to this day, and I don't like visiting, even though I feel no presence when I'm there. When I was little, my parents said I used to say I played with a little boy in the basement. My brother is five years older than me. It started when I was six. I remember putting my shoes on with my dad to head to the gas station and looking down into the basement at the very back where my brother's room was. There was a small dark shadow outside his door with glowing red eyes. My dad said, do you see it too? We left. About a year later, I moved into the basement across hall from my brother's room. It was my first night down there. I remember waking up one day and seeing a little girl staring at me with red eyes. I was so scared, I couldn't even scream. I tried. I was crying though. My brother heard me crying and came out of his room to get me and our parents. The figure disappeared, of course. After that, I moved back upstairs next to my parents. My brother never reported seeing or hearing anything. Growing up, my household was hectic. A lot of darker energy could reside there, I think, based on what was happening there at the time. I don't feel comfortable going into it. I often escaped by PC gaming right after school and late into the night. I'd usually have headphones on one ear and off the other just in case my mom needed me or something got in the house. At this point, I heard a man's voice whenever I was in the basement. Gaming, it was speaking in a language I couldn't understand. I wonder if maybe I was making it up. The computer desk was right across the laundry room, which also had a bathroom on the other side of the laundry room. So it goes me, laundry room, bathroom. The door to the laundry room suddenly started to swing open and closed, and the light in that room would switch on and off. Sometimes I thought, maybe I left the light on when I went to the bathroom. After a while, I double checked I'd turn the light off, but the door would open and the light would turn on. I asked the spirit, dumb I know, but I was about 15 at this point, to keep the light off when I go to bed. And it did. Back to mom's house. This time, I was upstairs. Basically, we have a living room with a hallway that leads to the bedrooms. It has three chairs and one little table for cups. I was in the chair facing the hallway. It was about 3 a.m. I was gaming with my headphones on as not to bother my mama. I look up and saw this glowing gold outline that was shaped exactly like my mom. I took off my headphones and said, mom, but it kept walking from the hallway, past the chairs, and through the table next to me. I don't even know why I called out to it. Obviously, people don't have a glowing gold outline, but that was just strange. Once I was at my dad's house with his new family, I lived in the room next to the parents, then my brother and my sister, the bathroom is across from my room. I had gotten back from school one day and was calling out for my stepmom. Usually she was upstairs in her room. I looked inside her room and saw a shadow of a woman with her hair in a bun, just like my stepmom's. And I walked in and started talking for my stepmom only. She wasn't in her room at all. Upstairs, toys would also go off constantly with no one there. My stepmom was pregnant, so my sister and I had to move down into the basement. We lived in a three story. In the basement, I got the bedroom and my stepsister got the bigger open room. There was a bathroom down there, but the hallway had mirrors on both sides of the wall completely. I'd often find big handprints on the mirrors. 
and I'd hear footsteps walk from my door to the hallway to the bathroom and back all night. It sounded like shuffling. One night the thing sat on the counter of my bed. I felt the pressure of it sink in the corner of my fucking bed. I can't tell you how scared I was. My sister experienced the footsteps too. Sometimes we would sleep in the same bed. She said she would see a man standing in a room. I also once saw a big handprint on my bed and a baby handprint, which I think was my baby brother. This one was the scariest to me, of my minor stories. My sister and I were on the middle floor. It was about 11 or 12 at night. We were watching a horror flick and we look over to the left and see a dark figure of a boy standing next to the stairs. My sister pauses the movie and says, Matt, go upstairs, in a stern voice. It doesn't move, which confirmed to me I wasn't the only one who saw it. She then says again, Matt, nothing. She goes to turn the light and it's gone. We were spoke the fuck out. Decided to turn on a different movie. I think a kid's show, lol. This was my sophomore year of high school, living in a small Utah town at the time. And a pretty avid believer in things like this, despite not having any major experiences up until this point. I was in my weightlifting class and had to go take a piss. So I left and the only bathroom that was open was the one in the guy's locker room. So I go in and down a few steps, start playing music from my phone that I left on the bench as close to the toilets as possible which was on the opposite side from where my backpack and jacket were. I'd do my business, clean up, and grab my phone before going back to the steps that led out. But around halfway there, I turned my phone off. And when I got to the steps, I felt something behind me, barely breathing down my neck, and not anything nice from what I could tell. I freaked out and ran back to the weights room as fast as I could. The rest of class, I kept an eye on the door, just in case anyone came or went so I could ask them if they felt anything like I did. But nobody left, which makes it all the more haunting when we all went back after class and my bag was on the floor and my jacket was on the other side of the room. I froze when I saw it and it took two of my friends to snap me out of it. So yeah, that's probably one of my biggest anything when it comes to ghosts and stuff. Once again, this was my sophomore year and I was in the theatre department working backstage. We were doing Beauty and the Beast and wanted to see how many people were out. And since we couldn't walk out on stage, we had to improvise. There was a large mesh speaker front attached to the wall facing out towards the crowd that you couldn't see behind. But the only way to look through it was to climb up a ladder and led to the catwalks where someone had reportedly fallen from and died when hitting the chairs beneath. Me and a friend of mine, let's call him Jack, climbed part way up the ladder and looked out into the crowd. Full house that night. But we both decided to look up and saw the silhouette of a man's upper torso peering over the edge of us before shooting backwards out of sight. The two of us, reasonably, freaked out and ran down the ladder. Everyone freaked out when they saw us and what, asking what was happened. But we didn't have time to explain, because we had to get in place to start the show. Backstory. I was never really that close to my uncle. He stayed about an hour and a half drive away, but was close enough to like him. He was awesome, but he took his own life in 2011 which was a major blow to my entire family. He was one of those guys that everyone loved. He wasn't really into religion, but also didn't knock anyone's beliefs. Main story, at my mum and dad's old place, they had a canvas picture of a Buddha hanging on the wall between their bedroom and the bathroom wall. For easiness to try and picture it, you go to the top of the stairs and the spare room is in front of you. Small corner piece of wall, and then my mum's bedroom large enough space for the picture, then bathroom door, then my bedroom. 
The picture had been hanging up for months and my mum got bored of it. So she took it down and put up a picture of the rose. The first night was fine. The second night, there was only me in my room, my mum in bed and dad downstairs watching TV. All of a sudden there was an almighty bang. I got up thinking my mum had fallen out of bed again. <laughs> but as soon as I walked out my door, I could see the picture of the roses not on the wall, but at the top of the stairs. My first thought was I had slept walked, so I went into her room and she was awake. I asked if she heard the noise. She said yes. Asked what it was, so I told her. The next day, we put the Buddha picture back up and it never dropped once. So my grandpa has this ranch about 25 miles east of Payson, Arizona. For those in Arizona, it's between Hagler Creek and the 260. It's very secluded, but the land is good for grazing. I spend a lot of time running Jersey cattle on the range. Every night one of us rides out to check on the cattle in the field and to check the fence line for holes in the wire. A few days ago, I was riding out to check on the herd at about 1.30 a.m. And I kept hearing rustling in the tree line running along the fence perimeter. I figured it was coyotes or squirrels. I see a lot of them up there. It went away every 10 or 15 minutes and then I could hear it again. The second time I heard it, I was off my horse and walking him to a little water trough. The cows were about 150 to 200 yards away, just within my view within the moonlight. I heard the rustling again, but this time it was heavy. Me and my horse Vegas both looked up at the same time, wondering what the fuck we were hearing. At this point, I came to the eerie realization that whatever was out there was tracking me in Vegas. It didn't seem so interested in the cows. So in an attempt to scare it off, I got back on my horse and grabbed my whip and uncoiled it. I don't use it on animals, I only use it to make a loud noise to move cattle, and cracked it a few times rather than using my pistol. The rustling stopped and the forest was dead quiet once more. Not thinking much about it, I went back to count the head. I marked 38 heads, all the cows were there. I started my way back to the house. I was about three and a half miles away. It's a bit of a trial ride to get back. It was about 10 minutes of silence until I heard the rustling again. At this point I was getting pissed. I figured it was some dumb little ass coyote thinking we were gonna lead him somewhere. So I called my grandpa on my radio, there's zero service out there whatsoever, and told him I was gonna find my gun so he didn't get worried. So I reached down and pulled my revolver from my side. For you guys who like firearms, it's an Uberti replica Colt 45 Peacemaker, chambered 45 Colt. And I fired one round into the air. The rustling stopped as the shot rang out through the woods and mountains. My ears rang and the smell of gunpowder filled my nose as the smoke settled. After I calmed Vegas down, I started riding back, only for the rustling to come back five minutes later. I started getting really nervous at this point because usually coyotes run away when they get scared by a loud noise. I didn't have a flashlight on me because I'm dumb and I forgot. So I used my lame ass iPhone flashlight and dismounted. I slowly walked to the tree line where I heard the rustling as I had my gun out, ready for an animal to jump at me or something. I flashed my light around through clearing in the trees. And to my right, I heard rustling about 100 feet away and turned over and to my surprise and confusion, I saw a black silhouette of a horse run across the trail. I immediately thought, shit, is that one of our horses? Is that someone else's horse? So I rode over to where I saw the horse shaking with anxiety. I looked over and was confused as to how of a horse even ran out of and into the forest because it was so thick with shrubbery. And when I looked back behind me and started riding back, I stopped frozen in fear as I got the chills. I dropped my gun and heard the sound of it hitting the ground echo through the woods. Because in front of me, about 50 feet away, was the silhouette of a man wearing a flat brim hat and appeared to have chaps on. I picked up my gun and aimed at the figure, and it was gone. I got back on Vegas and rode like the wind to get out there, constantly looking behind me in fear of it following. 
I made it back and told my grandpa, who was trying to calm me down, and said he's had some weird experiences too. My mother went to Eastern Washington University and stayed in one of the houses the locals rented out to college students. I cannot give the exact age of the house, but it was old enough to have a built-in button on the floor that would call up to the servants in the attic, so the house was relatively old. During her studies, there she had three different roommates. My uncle was the first, who was then replaced by my mother's best friend, who was then replaced by my father. All three of them can confirm strange happenings in this house and be woken up in the middle of the night with people whispering. The worst of it was in my mother's room in the attic. My mother hated that house, but she didn't have anywhere else to live and the dorms were expensive, so she sucked it up and lived there until she graduated. She hated sleeping alone. The air in her room constantly felt thick and heavy. Her closet was constantly freezing cold and at night, she would hear multiple people whisker, whispering incoherent words at once. While living there, my mother had a cat named Puss who would constantly hide under the bed. One time my mother caught Puss out from under her bed, sitting, watching, and growling at one of the corners of the room. My mother went over to Puss confused at what she was looking at, until she saw a black figure in the corner slowly start to move upwards toward the ceiling. Puss started to become more aggressive, her hissing and growling getting louder, before she freaked out and shot off back onto the bed, still growling at the corner until the black figure was gone. My mother had never seen Puss act like this, since Puss was usually a very lovely and happy cat, but whatever that was, clearly terrified her. Sometime later, my mother was talking with a friend who was excited to be touring two famous paranormal investigators around the college and town, showing them and supposed haunted places. My mother brought up the fact that she has always had weird stuff happening in her house and thinks it may be haunted. Her friend got excited and begged her to let her bring in the, to the house. My mother refused since she wasn't willing to stay up late for some people that she had, didn't even know. My mother didn't know at the time who these investigators were since she never really kept up with paranormal stuff, believing it can let evil into your life. She only knew that they were on quite a few popular talk shows at the time. These two investigators were Ed and Lorraine Warrens. Around midnight, my mother's best friend comes to her and tells her that there are people at the door wanting to speak to her. Confused, my mother got on her robe and went to the front door. There, she saw her tour guide friend with 12 other students behind Ed and Lorraine Warren. Lorraine asked my mother if they could come in, as their guide told them that it's possible her house was haunted. My mother agreed and let them all in. Lorraine asked my mother where in the house is the haunting most, and my mother told her that it was her bedroom, that she would take Ed and Lorraine there, but everyone else had to wait. They agreed, and my mother took Ed and Lorraine to her room. When my mother entered her room, she sat on her bed and asked if they could feel it, how heavy the air was. They both agreed that the air was heavy, like how some of the haunted places they've been to. Lorraine walked around the room, then to the closet, and asked if she could hear voices here. My mother broke down crying and said she could hear them every night, and then it kept her up at night. Lorraine told that it was possible that her closet is a doorway for those who passed on, or a doorway to hell. My mother continued to cry before Lorraine came over to her and told her that the reason this stuff is happening to her is because of her mom's family, that the women have some connection with those beyond, and that it's possible that they're psychics, which makes the dead attracted to her. My mother then told Lorraine about the black figure, which Lorraine told her wasn't from this house, but was connected to her family, mainly her dad's side, and that it most likely went after her grandfather, her father, and now her. The figure isn't a ghost or a demon, but something pure evil, and that it wants her. Fearful, my mother asked them if they could bless her room, which they did, and after further investigation of the house, Ed and Lorraine told her that her house was the first place that actually showed activity and signs of haunting in the whole area. After they finished blessing the house, Ed and Lorraine left. Time passed and my mom's best friend moved out and my dad moved in. The activity in the house still continued even after the blessing. At first my father was skeptical of the house being haunted, 
Until one night, while sleeping in my mom's bed, he heard the whispering. He asked my mother what she said, and she told him she didn't say anything. After a few moments of silence between them, she asked if he could hear them. Confused, my father asked what she was talking about, and she told him the whispering. He then agreed that she heard the whispering and asked where it was coming from, which he then told her it was from the closet and it happens every night. Sometime after, my father got curious about whether or not the servant's button still worked. Originally, no one had ever been up into the attic. Both of my parents made their way up to the attic, but never reached the top, since on their way there, both of my parents felt like they couldn't breathe as the temperatures dropped to the freezings, and my mother started to panic as she felt like she was being choked. She quickly told my father to turn back around, because it felt as though they were not wanted up there. Not wanting to upset my mother more, my father turned back and, and never went up there again. Once my mother graduated college, they moved out of the house and strange events occur continued to occur, no matter where they moved. Around the time I was born, my parents lived in a rather small house with my two older brothers. Constantly, our cats would freak out, growling and hissing at the corners of the house. Not only that, but my mother would constantly see this black figure around the house. Later, my family had our new house constructed and we moved out of our old one. These strange events followed us and got worse. One day, when I was around five, I was walking outside my room to walk downstairs. The moment I walked to the balcony, I felt someone grab my arm extremely roughly. I turned around and I just see a black figure holding my arm. I screamed for my mother. She came running upstairs and she sees the black figure. She grabs my arm and tries to pull me away, but the figure wouldn't let go. She pulled as hard as she could and ripped me away from the figure. As she does, the figure disappears and a giant hand mark is left on my arm. My mother runs downstairs and screams at my father to get my brothers and that they're leaving the house until it's blessed. We later had a priest come to our house and bless it. Afterward, the activity stopped, but growing up, me and my second older brother would constantly have nightmares of this figure in our dreams, doing awful things to us, but it had bright red eyes and would chase us. Nothing else has happened since then and I still live in the house. Every once in a while I get this sudden fear from the staircase. I never go downstairs at night without the lights on out of fear of this thing that's possibly still there. I'd spoken to my mother about the dreams and stuff that happened to her, but she tries to avoid talking about it since she believes the more we talk about it, the more it will come back. She's told me that though she spoke with my grandfather about this figure who refused to talk about it since the first time she brought it up, he went pale as a ghost. He said that the figure used to torment him as a child and his dad would tell him about the figure and how it would come for him as it did with him. My mother didn't realize that it was Ed and Lorraine Warren until we were watching a documentary about them and she points out that they were the ones who came to her house. I was speechless and she was confused as I told her that they were the Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators, that they, they were the ones who started publicly doing investigations and there are famous horror movies that involve them. My mother freaks out and tells my father about it, and while my father was shocked, he didn't think much of it. I apologize if my story is a little all over the place, but this was my best attempt to explain my mother's story and my experience, since my mother doesn't like to talk about it, much out of fear. I live in a small condo or apartment. It's about 500 square foot and it has no shady history. It was built in the 80s. We knew who the last owners were and they owned it for a decade and are definitely still alive. We've been here for almost four years. It's just me and my husband. Husband and I, husband and I were getting ready for bed. I was out for a smoke, so he did his teeth and all that before me and got into bed, maybe five minutes or less before I got inside from the porch. You can see the door to the bathroom from the kitchen, but it's partially blocked off by a half wall, separating the kitchen from the entrance hall and then the bathroom at the other side. So I walked to the sink to grab some water. I saw a figurehead into the washroom and then heard what sounded close to dry heaving, like that gurgle backwash sound that someone makes when they might puke but haven't quite done it yet. The door to the bathroom was still open, 
but I couldn't see the toilet from where I'm standing. Knowing my husband is fairly private for that stuff, I stood there for a moment and listened. I heard more gurgling and dry heaving. He didn't come out, so I slowly crept up to the door to ask if he was okay, while still trying to maintain his privacy by not seeing the toilets. He replied from the bathroom, down the hall. He asked me to repeat what I said, because he hadn't quite heard me. Confused, I went fully into the bathroom, and there was no one there. I would just chalk up to the toilet or shower making noises, but I definitely thought I saw someone walk in there, and then the noises happened for a good half a minute after. So I'm feeling like I'm losing my mind. My name is Agnaldo Alre Ros. I'm 44 years old and I live in Brazil. I'm new to Reddit and this is my first post. I apologize in advance for my limited English. I would like to share my story and have your opinion. When I was 20 years old, the year was 1996. A couple friends of my mother lost their home. And as Brazil was going through a very severe economic crisis at the time, and my mother seeing the situation of the couple, she invited them to temporarily live in our house. They slept in the living room, on a mattress, and the guy was an alcoholic. He often fought with his wife. When he came home from the street, tired from work, he was always a person very nasty and grumpy, and always drunk. My brothers and I kept some distance from him, to avoid getting upset. But this guy always harassed us, and said bad things, which hurt us. A few days later, we convinced our mother to send this couple away, but they just left because he and his wife stole money from my mother, otherwise they wouldn't have been kicked out of our house. So on the day they left home, this couple stayed outside the house in the car, packing their bags, and my brother and I, we went in and out of the house with their bags, and they were packing in the car. It so happens that there was no one in the house, except me, my brother, and the couple who were on the streets, in the car. There was an old stereo in our house, which was ours, in the back room. And when we were on the street, together with the couple, delivering another batch of bags, this sound turned into a rock, very high. The four of us on the street looked at each other in amazement, and we commented, how can this happen? Since there was no one in the background, it was just the four of us, and we were on the streets at the gate. Then we entered the house and I myself not only turned off the stereo using the power off button, but I also unplugged it because I was very scared. We took the last bags and again in the streets, the sound turned on the same song for the second time, very loud. Well, I turned it off myself. I unplugged the power cord. That's unbelievable. We dropped the bags on the floor with the couple and ran to see how this happened. And to our surprise, in addition to the sound being turned on, the wire was plugged into the socket. Well, I'm a skeptical person and I'm not mystic, but I can't deny what I saw that afternoon. And really, I can't explain how it happened. I can assure you there was no one in the house but the four of us, and both times the stereo turned on itself. And it's a mystery, I can't solve it inside my head, as I've already thought about it, but it's inconclusive. The witnesses in the case directly are me and my brother and the couple who testified indirectly that day. This happened about three years back now. My friend and I were 15 and 14 at the time, me being the older one. In 2019, my friend, who I will call Nim, was house-sitting a friend's dogs. The family lived in the country, and most cars we saw drive by, there were less than five. Nim was staying the week watching four labs. He knew the house was haunted, because they'd hear the occasional footsteps on the stairs, or the dogs would start barking at the staircase and be too scared to go up them. They spent the first night along, the next three nights with our other friend. The friend got too freaked out, because they started seeing people staring at them through the windows, while outside, or they'd hear laughter and talking upstairs. The friend left, and Nim invited me to stay the last three days with them. 
Nim told me the house was haunted and everything that had happened. I'd never had any bad experience with the paranormal before, so I wasn't really worried. We were sleeping in the living room and the first night, nothing really went on. The second night, we heard footsteps go up the stairs and sometimes we heard someone talking, but neither of us really minded. We both have always been believers and neither of us wanted to upset any spirits that were possibly there, so we didn't talk about it. The third night was when shit hit the fan. Nim's dad had ordered us pizza, and we sat on the road while eating it. Nim had sent me inside to get something, maybe cups. I went straight to the kitchen and went back out. To get to the kitchen, we had to pass by the living room, but we wouldn't have been anywhere near the windows. When I went back out, Nim asked if I sat on the couch and looked at them through the window. I simply told them no, and we shrugged it off and continued eating. Nim had gone inside because neither of us remembered to grab napkins. I'm generally the protective friend, so I watched Nim go in, in case they got too freaked out or in case they tripped. I looked at the same window they saw me in, and I saw them looking at me as well. When Nim came out, I asked if they did what I did, and they said, no, I went to the bathroom first, then grabbed the napkins, and then came straight out. The bathroom was in the kitchen. Fast forward, we go inside, and Nim was fast asleep on the couch. It was an L shape, so it was fairly big. I had three of the labs with me, one by my head, another by my feet, and another on the floor next to me. It was past midnight, and I was scrolling through my phone. I heard the youngest lab next to me growling at the arched doorway, and when I looked, he was stood up and staring at the doorway. The one at my feet was stood up on the couch, but not growling, while the one by my head was still laying down. He was looking at the doorway like the other two. I didn't care too much as I had heard footsteps running up the stairs and giggling all night, so I thought they were growling at the stairs. I only actually looked at the doorway when the oldest by my head had climbed over my legs and was growling. I turned off my phone and sat up. When I looked where they were, I saw a black figure standing there. There was enough shining in the dining room to outline the figure. Of course, I panicked a bit because it just supposed to be Nim and I. I didn't move from the spot even when the thing looked at me. I don't know how long I held eye, con eye contact with it. All I knew was I was too scared to move from my spot. I felt like I was paralyzed. The three dogs by me had all stood up and were staring at the figure. Two were growling and one was whimpering. I didn't realize it was walking towards me until it got to the door frame. That's when I finally moved and jumped over to Nim and woke them up. The fourth dog woke up since they were cuddling with Nim and the other three still looked angry or upset at the doorway. I tried telling Nim what happened and even played out to them what I saw. I don't know if they believed me, but I'm sure me having a panic attack and almost crying from fear was convincing enough. Nim stayed up with me and I didn't sleep until I got back home. I don't think I've ever been so happy to leave a place. My first paranormal encounter was when my mom's college lost her daughter in a car accident and she was feeling so guilty, blaming herself about the loss of her daughter. Later on, found a person who I'm going to address as the lady could help her to communicate with her daughter's spirit. So the sorrowful mother managed a seance, the type where they summoned spirits through a host body and invited my parents and also a bunch of other people, including her colleagues. That night, I accompanied my mom too. We need a host body, as that spirit can possess, the lady said. My mom, without any hesitation, volunteered. It's kind of blurry for me, but as far as I remember, my mother knew my father wouldn't let her come forward. So before volunteering, she told my father to get my brother here too, because he's home alone. Fast forward to a couple of minutes later, as my mom was lying on her back with her eyes closed and palms facing up. She suddenly started saying some words. The lady looked at us and said a lost ghost had possessed my mom's body. The ghost, as the lady said, was a man and my mom started mumbling slowly and said, give me the book. The lady said she's asking for the Quran. As we handed her the Quran, the lady puts it on my mom's chest with her hands placed on the book. 
he started reciting some random verses in Arabic. Afterwards, my mom prostrates, lying stretched out on the ground with one's face downwards, to every cardinal direction as if he was praying. I was a little kid and didn't know what was going on though. But if stumble upon this scene now, I would wet my pants. The lady threatened the ghost that if you do not leave this body, I will do blah. Cannot remember what she said. Before I forget, let me mention that her daughter's name is Mardi. Eventually, the lady looked back at us and said, I believe she is Mardi. They first asked her name and my mom very slowly, with a voice of a dehydrated person, said, Mardi. Next, the lady asked her to write down her name on a piece of paper given to her. She barely wrote, Mardi. I remember vid vividly, it was like a kid's handwriting. Her mom couldn't contain herself anymore, and in a quavering voice said, Baby, it's all my fault. Forgive me. I shouldn't have let you go out that night. I'm sorry. I love you, mom, her daughter said. I have to go, she continued, as if somebody was calling her. Years later, when my mom was retelling the story, I asked her, so where were you the whole time? Somewhere bright and white, as far as the eye can see. And I saw heads floating around with no body attached to them, just faces, she replied. I don't remember whether she mentioned that she saw her father or not. That's one of the paranormal experiences. And I have encountered them myself, too. Back when I was 18, my friends and I decided to go on a trip to some rural area to relax on our own for a couple days. Luckily, my late grandparents owned a medium-sized house in a remote village. There were plenty of those where I'm from. So I got the keys from my dad and we packed food, water and a first aid kit and we headed there. It was a two hour ride from the closest city to get there. The car dropped us off in the middle of nowhere and told us to walk in a straight line until we get to the village. After about 30 minutes walk, we reached our destination. It was nothing fancy, but the village was definitely bigger than expected. Dogs, chickens and goats roamed around freely. I was a city boy, so that was a first for me. We got to my grandparents' house and settled in. We spent the first few days resting and decided to go to a spot that my father told me about the next morning. We headed out of daybreak. We packed plenty of water. The spot was close by, so we didn't think to pack any food. After about a 30 minute walk in the middle of a heavily wooded mountain, we got to our destination. It was a beautiful area with a huge tree and amazing view, but it wasn't enough for the five young idiots who came there to explore. So we kept moving forward, just looking around and having fun. Without, but without realizing it, we had spent an extra hour and a half up there. We were exhausted and more importantly hungry so we decided to head back. We followed the trail back, but we never reached that big tree again, even after an hour of fast walking. We began to panic and went from fast walking to jogging. But for some reason, even though we should have been backtracking, we didn't make it to the tree. It was there that we spotted an old woman walking the trail. We quickly approached her, said hello and asked her how close the village. She looked at us weirdly and told us we were walking the opposite way and that the village was like a three hour walk. We were super exhausted by that point. Three of us could barely stand, let alone walk for three hours. We explained to the old woman about our situation after she asked and she offered us to rest at her place as it was close by, get a meal so we could get home safely. One of my friends, Adam and I protested that it might be a bad idea to follow a stranger even though we were in a rough situation. But between the hunger and the state of the others, we gave in and agreed. We followed her towards her cabin, small with a tiny garden in front of it and a goat tied to the post next to the door. Overall, it was nothing out of the ordinary in these parts of the country. We got in and sat down on those long sofas with no back support. She told us to wait while she got us some food. The cabin was very clean. The tables, chairs and sofas were obviously old and worn out, but not dusty and overall the place looked very welcoming. However, Adam and I didn't fully drop our guard while the others were simply happily, they got a soft thing to sit on. 15 minutes later, 
She came out of the kitchen with two big plates of chicken with vegetables. A plate of salad and some olive oil came. She poured us tea and we dug in as she went back to the kitchen to prepare more. I was considering not eating, at least until I saw the others eat and are still good, but my hunger took over and I went right in as soon as the plates hit the table. Adam, however, didn't. He didn't lay a finger on the food, nor the tea, he was very paranoid and was the most fit out of all of us, so we managed to hold back. She brought two more plates of food that we cleaned up. She brought more tea and told us to rest and digest the food and leave whenever we felt like it. She then excused herself and went to her room to sleep as she was tired from cooking. We drifted off to sleep one by one. As I set up an alarm clock to ring after 30 minutes so we can move, I was the last one to drift to sleep, talking to Adam, who said he's going to stay awake and look around for a bit before we move. I was shaken awake by my friends who looked worried. I snapped awake after I saw their faces, and I looked around and asked them what was going on. One of them points out of the window and tells me to look. I didn't get it at first, but then I noticed. It was sunrise. I almost had a heart attack. I thought we overslept for a whole day, but it was worse. Adam was nowhere to be found. We went out of the cabin and called out, but no answer. So I went back in to ask the old woman. I knocked on the door to the room she went in before I fell asleep, but I got no response. The door was locked, so I decided to excuse myself and go in. When I did, it was the first time since I went on this trip that I was in full panic mode. There was no bed in that room. In fact, there was nothing, like nothing at all, just four walls and a door. The kitchen was the same as well. I ran to my phone to try and call Adam. The signal there was weak, but it still worked, but my phone was off. Dead battery. It was around 70% when I fell asleep. All of our phones were dead, so we got out and started running on the trail towards the village while calling Adam's name. After a while, we met some people from the village, my grandparents' neighbors. They looked almost scared when they saw us, and they dropped this bomb on all of us. Where were you the past three days? I was shocked. I was missing for three days. My parents got concerned because I didn't answer the phone and called those neighbors to ask about me. They even reported me missing. The whole village was looking for us for two days. We asked for help finding Adam, but after we told them what happened, they took us to a local mosque so the Imam could look into it. They believed it was witchcraft. We went back there the next day with some men from the village looking for Adam. We showed them the cabin and its surroundings we looked for hours on end, but there was no sign of him. And anywhere we gave up, when the police took over, even they couldn't find much. To this day, I still wonder what happened. I am religious, but I just can't accept that that woman was a witch. Even if she was, why only Adam? Why not all of us? Is it because he didn't eat? Or because he went snooping around her cabin? A part of me wants to get back there so I can uncover the truth. But every time I think about this incident, I just feel a f crippling fear of that fucking cabin. Towards the end of April, my boyfriend and I moved into a historic mansion. Of course, it's haunted. We expected it to be. I've been in tune with energies since I was younger and have experienced paranormal encounters most of my life. But this is something I've never come across. A little backstory about the place. It was built in 1850. It's converted into an apartment complex. We live on the third floor and it's attic. The walls are small and it's got a very vintage feeling. My neighbors told me that the mansion was built in 1850 and that was about it. As soon as we walked into the building, I knew something was there, but I didn't feel evil or bad. I was picking up a young female in her twenties. I could see she had brown hair, brown eyes and wearing a lace purple dress. I also saw an old woman at the staircase wearing a black veil and a black dress. Her face seemed to be hardened, like she was angry. I want to say she died of a stroke. In my dreams, I saw a young man, maybe in his thirties, with a black beard, green eyes, and a toddler wearing a white shirt, overalls, and black pants. I assume that this home belonged to a family a while back. I never thought anything of it. My friends that came over would claim to have been watched and they really don't like the staircase where the old lady stands. Since we've moved in here, we've heard knocking above us. 
we have an attic in our attic. I don't know, that's weird. And things have been moved or turned on. One night, when we had some friends over, we played Mario Kart and the TV turned off completely. I told Sam, the young lady in a purple dress, to turn the TV back on. And sure enough, she did. Also, I'm not too sure if this is her real name, but it's the first thing that popped into my mind when I saw her. I would also like to point out, the minute we moved in, I burnt Palo Santo out in the living rooms, and all the rooms. And if you're familiar with black salts, I made sure to put some on every window in the house, including my son's. So everything is going fine and normal in our new place, until last night. Me and my family and my good friend were staying the night with us for a bit, because we're in the middle of a heat wave and she has no AC in her apartment. We had a thunder and lightning storm. After I woke up with it, my baby was wide awake in pain, because he's eight months old and has his two button teeth coming in. So I thought he was in pain. We are all sleeping out in the living room, on the floor near the AC. My boyfriend and I decided to put our son in his crib, since his fussiness wasn't going down. For some reason, I had a strange feeling that I needed to check the baby monitor, so I did. I have our monitor connected to my phone, and I go and open the app. As I hear my baby playing in his crib, laughing and talking, I see that there's something moving on the left side of the screen. I go to examine the figure on my phone for a minute, until I realize that what I saw moving wasn't a bug. It was too big to be a bug. Then my second thought was maybe it's a dust particle. I then realized that dust particles don't move that fast. Unless, of course, unsure of what to make of this, I showed my boyfriend who is laying next to me. We both examined the monitor and we both concluded that what we were seeing were orbs. We both entered in the room and as soon as we do, the salt lamp flickered. Then it started to get cold. We both felt the salt lamp and it was freezing. And remember, we're in the middle of a heat wave. All of a sudden, I get this cold, sad feeling coming from the corner of the room. I grab my baby out of his crib and we move him back into the living room. As soon as I do this, we still have the monitor recording. The orbs are still there. The next morning, I posted the videos on Facebook. One of my friends took the video into Photoshop and saw a man's face at the end of the crib. Later, he finds two women and a toddler. He sent me these pictures via messenger and he commented on the post with them, but the quality of the pictures aren't too great. For the past couple of months, I've been working at a slaughterhouse and plant in Northern Wyoming. Great place, best job I've ever had, sincerely. I love it here. When I started, I worked as a meat cutter but I wasn't particularly good at it. I eventually ended up on a cleanup, a position in which I've rarely excelled. I was the daytime cleaner, and there was a nighttime cleaner who worked in the plant after everyone else went home. I don't want to use his real name. Let's call him Dorothy Zbornak. So Dorothy worked here for quite some time before I got here, and I assisted him with anything I could during the hours or shifts overlapping. Then, Dorothy started talking about quitting, he expressed a great deal of discontentment and a desire to work closer to home. He told me he'd probably be leaving at the end of the summer and asked me not to say anything. I obliged. It's not my business. Then, he randomly quit one Friday night, leaving the place untouched and a colossal mess. The plant manager called me in on Saturday and asked me to clean it up. He also gave me Dorothy's job. That's where things get... unsettling. My new shift has me working alone in this place until at least midnight every day of the week. No problem, I like being alone. But then the ghosts that apparently haunt this place began to mess with me. It started as random noises and shadows moving in my peripheral vision. Not frequently, but enough that I took notice. I asked another employee about it yesterday afternoon. Let's call him Wilma Flintstone. I said to Wilma, have you ever noticed anything strange or paranormal around here? Early in the morning I have, they replied. Before everyone else gets here, this place is a little lively. I noticed that it's a little lively when I'm by myself too, I said. Noises, shadows, voices. Voices? Wilma asked. Yeah, I explained. Voices in other rooms. Quiet whispering that I can't quite make out. There shouldn't be voices if I'm the only person in the building. 
You're not crazy, Wilma said with a smile. You're not the only one who's experienced things. Maybe someone died here or something. Like who? I don't know, Wilma said. Then, with a laugh, we do kill a lot of animals here. I can't imagine the ghosts of a thousand dead cows and pigs standing around in the packaging office have a verbal conversation, I told him. It got me thinking, though, and I told him as much. The area we inhabit used to be native land. I think Shoshone? Not sure. But it wouldn't be too far-fetched if our plant was built over some native burial ground or something, and we're actually working on top of a thousand deceased skeletons. Native American spirits tend to get upset when you disturb their eternal slumber. Well, whatever these unseen beings are, whether they are natives or just a lot of really unhappy dead cows, I decided to have a conversation with them last night after everyone left. Okay, ghosties, here's the deal. I don't know what your end game is. I don't know what you hope to accomplish. Are you trying to drive me away? Are you trying to spook me? I have no qualms with you, and I would prefer if we could find a way to coexist. I have a job to do, and the job pays my bills. I have no intention of leaving. You're apparently stuck here because... I looked around to emphasize the point. If it was me, this is the absolute last place I'd want to spend eternity. Well, I guess it beats the fiery pits, but not by much. So you can't leave and I won't. So could you guys just give me some space? Could you not mess with me? I don't think being dead removes your ability to be reasonable and I'd really appreciate it. This did not go as I expected. They messed with me even harder. They apparently didn't like being asked to socially distance. The shadows came more frequently, and there were at least two times when the shapes in my peripheral vision weren't shapes at all. They were people. When I'd jerk my head to look, they'd be gone. There was one point where I was going to dump a mop bucket and I heard what sounded like footsteps directly behind me, less than a foot away. I drove almost headfirst into the nearest room, slammed the door shut and locked it. I looked into the... I, like a lock on a door is going to keep a Casper the salty ghost out. I finished my work as fast as I could and then practically ran to my vehicle. I floored the accelerator and sped off like I was being chased. I'm not so sure they weren't chasing me. There was the briefest moment that I thought I saw someone in my passenger seat right before I pulled out. I don't know what to do. I'm actually afraid of these things. I can't go to my boss and ask him to move me off the nights because ghosts, I cannot and will not quit. I'm making too much money and my life has drastically improved and stabilized from what it was. I won't let them drive me away, but I'm scared. And I don't know if there's anything I can do to make it up. Maybe I ought not to have tried to reason with them. Maybe I should have acknowledged them at all. Either way, the damage is done. And I've angered something I don't really understand. Before I'm getting started, I don't really believe in ghosts. That's mostly because I've never seen concrete evidence for their existence, and because the thought of them creeps me out. But lately, I've been thinking that there might actually be a possibility that they are real. The house I'm currently living in is from my deceased grandparents, and it has a ground floor and a basement. It's in a really peaceful area, and I'm loving it here. However, the basement is creepy. I was around 10-ish when I first stepped into the basement, and as most kids would be, I was scared. I avoided going down there, and when my mother asked me why, I told her something along the lines of, I think someone is down there. Typical behavior for children. This fear never left me, though. I'm now an adult, and this area of the house still gives me the chills. It's not the whole basement, just the one room, the gaming room of my siblings. The rest of the basement is not creepy at all, since we have lights with motion detectors everywhere. However, when I get near the room, my heart starts racing, almost as if I'm about to have an anxiety attack. I don't know why, it's confusing. Once I'm in the room, I start sweating and I feel as if someone is watching me. Sometimes I see shadows out of the corner of my eyes. It's just creepy. The door to that room, which I always close, has milky glass in it. I've noticed it multiple times that I saw silhouettes moving, which shouldn't be possible. My fitness room is next to the gaming room, 
and I'm able to see the motion triggered up lights go on whenever someone goes into the other room through the little gap below the door. Often, when light goes on in the other room, I blame my family, thinking they might be there. But the light also went on when I knew for sure that no one was besides me was at home. This happened multiple times. Maybe the lights were broken? I already told you that I feel like someone is in that room, and for the longest time, I believed I was just crazy. Maybe some fears from my childhood stuck with me, or maybe it was just hysteria. The odd thing, my girlfriend also dislikes that room. When she first slept over at my place, we went into the basement to get some alcohol. She, however, stood in front of that room and wouldn't dare to go in there, and told me that she would wait for me. I didn't give it much thought and choked up to her not liking basements in general. A few months ago, I told her that there was a room in the house which always causes me to panic. And within seconds, she asked me, the room across the stairs, the gaming room? I asked her how she knew that it was that room, and she replied that she felt like something was in there. Therefore, she avoids that place. She also told me about seeing shadows out of the corner of her eyes. Mind you, I never talked to anyone about my feelings towards that specific room. It's been getting worse. I see the shadows more often and I've been started to notice some odd noises like rustling and something softly tapping on the door. It might just be my brain playing tricks on me and wanting to hear something spooky, but it's slowly driving me insane. I need to know what might cause this and how I can fight my irrational fear for that one room. I'm now really desperate and what one would be glad for any advice because if it goes on like this, I'll never step foot in a basement again. This actually happened just recently, in the past month. At my boyfriend's house, there's this doll. The doll is very old, plastic, it's got short brown hair, it's really creepy. Half of its face is melted into its shoulder, so the look of it gives off a really weird vibe. Not even the look, but being around it, the energy is off. It's pretty tall, maybe like three feet or so. I didn't really pay attention to it the first couple times I went over in the last month. My boyfriend's mom actually found the doll in a storage unit. She goes through storage units. They found this doll wrapped up in a bag and decided to take it home with them. When I first picked up the doll, I actually felt kind of scared, but comfortable at the same time with it. I'm a very spiritual person, so I know something was attached to the doll. When I had left their house, I get a call from my boyfriend, telling me it was moving around the house and ending up in weird places. He decided to mess around with the doll and threw it down the stairs, to which its leg fell off. Out popped a brown piece of paper. The message written on it was worn off from old age. I went over there a week after, and brought the doll upstairs with us, to which the dog was up there and started barking and growling at the doll. But I felt uncomfortable with it and didn't want to let go of it some, for some reason. I felt like something came over me and I was attached to the doll and whatever was attached to the doll. My boyfriend started asking me why I was acting weird and told me to stop and give him the doll. I don't remember how I was acting because it felt like something took over. I kept telling him that Amy will get mad and that she likes me. That's where the doll got its name from. My boyfriend finally took the doll from me and put it in the opposite room from him. Through his vent, you can see the room it was in. The next morning, we woke up and the doll was staring right into his room from the vent. I swore to never pick that doll up again because whatever was attached to it wasn't good. Ever since then, I've been having dreams about demons and the doll. So a few years ago, the night sky was clear and my mom and I had gotten off work at about the same time, around 2 or 3 a.m. The moon looked beautiful. We decided to go out and watch the sunrise over the lake. We lived about 15 minutes from Lake Michigan and it's pretty regular for us to walk, talk for hours. We took a back road through a wooded area to get to our usual location. Some info you need to know about the location in order to imagine this. The road we took was a very small road that had thick woods and swamp on both sides. The road is so small that if cars were going both ways, sometimes you have to pull off slightly to the side to let the other car pass. Lots of greenery surrounds this road and there are slight dips on either side. No streetlights or anything. 
So the only illumination is the car's headlights. Okay, so we're driving and chatting and I'm in passenger, mum's driving. As she's talking to me, I'm looking at her and she's looking at the road. She stops mid-sentence and I could tell that something was happening in front. So I glanced over. I said, what's a kid doing out here this late? I saw what I can only describe as a creature that looked like it was made to blend in with its surroundings that was standing on the left side of the road. It seemed to be made of twigs and leaves and branches, almost, but not quite, resembling a tumbleweed. It stood at most three foot tall. It seemed to be covered in patches of some sort of orange or copper or red fur, but not quite fur. As soon as the words left my mouth, I realized that's not a kid. My mom shouted my thoughts and slammed on the brakes. If you've ever seen TV shows depicting the way vampires move like super fast, almost glitching across. That's how this thing moved to get in front of us. It was on the left, then right in front of us in a split second. If I had to guess, we were maybe seven feet away from it. It lifted its head. Its whole body was kind of one big mass and it looked at us with its eye. Yeah, one eye, one completely black eye. We sat there in stunned silence for a moment, just as I was asking, what is that? It got down and slithered like a fucking snake past the car and into the brush on my side. My mom took off at full speed. I'd researched a lot about how one person's thoughts and recollection of a situation can influence another person's until the story is no longer the same. There was even a study done about people who had never been on a hot air balloon, being shown a picture of one, being told that they were on it when the photo was taken and asked to remember the day. Most people said that they remember it and make up a story about it. Really interesting stuff, absolutely worth looking into. So both of us knowing this prior to the event, I asked her what she saw, and she asked me what I saw. Both were the same. At first we tried to rationalize it as a tumbleweed, but no, it surely looked at us. Maybe a deformed animal, but no animal around here looks like tumbleweed. Maybe a really skinny deformed fox? Couldn't be, because the way it glitched across the road, it's the only way I know how to describe it. We then moved on to more paranormal creatures in our search engines. This proved fruitless, as nothing we could find matched the description of what we saw. When telling this story to friends, I often find myself referring to it as a realistic and nightmarish version of the Lorax. <laughs> to this day, when recalling this incident, it feels like we saw something we weren't supposed to. Like we saw past what we all know as fact and real and tangible, and saw a part of what this world really is. The feeling doesn't make sense, and neither does this story. If anyone has any suggestions about what this could be, I'm open to answer any and all questions. I just want to know what we experienced, even if it's just an animal we never knew of. My son was two years old when all of this started. I was sitting in the living room on the couch watching my son play with his ball and it rolled into the dining room. I looked at him and told him to go get it and he started crying and said no, that there was a man in the dining room who was going to get him. As you could imagine, I jumped off the couch and ran to the dining room. There was no one there. Yet my son was crying, saying he was standing in the corner. I told him there was no man in the dining room. I grabbed his ball and we went back to the living room. I had forgotten all about that encounter until he was around three years old and my twin sister and our friend were at my house. Our friend kept bugging my son, wanting to play hide and seek. She told him she was going to hide in our basement so that he could f couldn't find her. All of a sudden, in a different voice than he usually talked in, he pointed us at the basement door and told my friend, if she goes downstairs, the girl down there will kill her. I was shocked, for one because he had told her in a deep growling voice instead of his sweet baby voice. So I asked him who he was talking about, and he told me her name was Sarah. Then he went on to explain that Sarah was dead. I asked, how did she die? He then told me that she had died in a car wreck at the age of 16. She had been with her parents. They'd hit a tree and then the car had went through a house. I can't believe what you just told us. A couple of days later, we went to eat at a Mexican restaurant. We went to the restroom before we left the restaurant. My son then told my twin sister not to go in the bathroom stall next to the one we were in because Sarah was using that bathroom. My friend jokingly said, well, how did Sarah get there? My son told us she sat in between me and you in the back seats on the way up here. 
I thought maybe he just had a good imagination at his age. So a couple of months later, he grabbed my hand and told me, Mommy, come here, your friend wants to say hi to you. I went into his bedroom holding his hand. I asked, where is he? My son points and says, he's standing right there, Mommy. Then my son tells me, Jamie says to tell you not to be sad anymore. I asked him where he'd heard that from. My son says he's standing right there. That's what he's told me to tell you. Jamie was my ex-boyfriend. We had dated in middle school and then again in high school. In high school, he'd been in a car wreck and had passed away. A couple of weeks later, we were going through old photo albums. My son points to a picture and says, I know that man. I asked, how do you know him? My son said he comes and talks to me. I then explained that the man couldn't talk to him because of a picture of my father-in-law and he had passed away before me and his dad had gotten together. My son says, mom, I do talk to him. He told me about taking daddy for rides in his old Ford truck when daddy was little. I asked my husband about it and he confirmed that his dad had an old Ford truck and they used to go riding in it. Then me and my husband were sitting in the living room a couple of weeks later and we hear our son laughing and talking to someone. We both get up and walk into his room. I asked, who are you laughing at? He turns to us and says, I'm playing with Mama. My husband's mother had passed away when our son was two years old. I asked him what she was saying to him. He then threw his hand up and said, hey, his name. That was exactly what she used to do every time he walked in the room before she passed away. My husband had to be at work at 5 a.m. every morning. So I would always get up, make him breakfast and make his lunch to take to work with him. He leaves for work. I'm sitting in the living room and I see something in our bedroom. I get up to see what it is and I see two girls standing in the mirror brushing their hair. I'm thinking, I'm just seeing things. So I rub my eyes and nope, they're still standing there. After the notice that I'm looking at, they disappear. I ask my son what they wanted. He tells me that Sarah came for him and that she isn't leaving until she gets him. I was so scared after he told me that. The scary part is, my son was a healthy kid for the longest time. Then all of a sudden he started having stomach problems. The doctors have done all kinds of tests and can't find a reason for why he's sick. He's now 14 years old and when he was 11 he started having seizures. Of course doctors had done tests and couldn't figure out what was causing him to have seizures. They told us that usually one side of the brain triggers a seizure. Both but sides of his brain show activity for the seizures. That being said we moved out of the home we had been living in and he got better. So I don't know if it was the house causing his illness or whatever was in that house. Now we've moved back into the house we used to live in and his stomach problems have come back. Me and my husband had split up for about eight months. That's the reason we'd moved out of the house and then moved back in. Strange things are happening again. For starters, my son's stomach problems have come back and it seems to be worse now than the first time he had unexplained stomach problems. But anyways, we've been hearing strange things in the house. I'll be laying in bed at night and hear a man laughing. I will wake my son and husband up and the laughter stops. Then me and my husband, neither of us smoke and in certain parts of our house you can smell cigarette smoke really bad as if someone is smoking right at that moment. And we have started to hear noises coming from our basements. And I'm sure I'm not going down there to see what the heck it is. Then last night we were getting ready for bed and I was standing in my son's room. If you've read the first post, you know we have a door that is connected to our son's room so that we can keep an eye on him because of the strange things that have happened. And my husband was standing in our room and I asked him if he just saw our bed move, like someone had sat down on it and moved a little bit. He said yes, and starts to look under the cover to make sure neither of our dogs had snuck under the cover while we weren't looking. But there were no dogs in the bed. I woke up twice last night to a man's laughing. It's 10 past five in the morning as I'm writing this. My husband has left for work and I'm wide awake because I'm scared to go back to bed. If anyone knows of any ways to help, please let me know. I was asking some of my family members what they had experienced in our house. My stepdaughter's experience. My stepdaughter lived with us from the ages 17 to 18 and she stayed in the room that our son stays in now. 
She told me one night she went to use the bathroom and shower and she had a conversation with a woman that she thought was me. The door was shut so she thought I was sitting on her bed talking to her because whatever it was mimicked my voice and she had a 20 minute conversation with whatever it was. Now I remember this happening because me and my husband, her father, were in the living room with our son watching TV. I remember her coming in the living room and telling me it was rude to just walk off in the middle of our conversation. And me and my husband told her I hadn't got up on the couch at all since she went to her room. My husband's experience. This one happened when our son was around three to four years old. I had wrecked my car, so my mother had come and got me and my little boy. My husband had come home from work and he knew he was with my mother, but he came in and saw a woman that looked like me walk into our bedroom. He had a three or four minute conversation with her. He was in the living room. He lays his paperwork from at work on a table in the living room, goes into our bedroom, and the woman he was talking to was gone. He goes back into the living room to call me, and the paperwork he had laid down was ripped into pieces. My older sister's experience. Her ex has custody of their daughter, and they live in Ohio. We live in Tennessee. He brought my niece down for the summer to let her stay at our house. My sister stayed here while she was here and they stayed in our son's bedroom. My sister said she woke up to an eerie feeling and looked in the corner of the room. And the little girl that my son called little Sarah because she didn't know her name was sitting in the corner squatting with her elbows on her knees and her hands propping up her face just looking at my sister. My sister threw the covers over her head and started praying and said it felt like an eternity but she peeked out of the covers and the little girl was gone. So she sat up in the bed to go to the bathroom. We have connecting doors from our rooms to our sons. She looked in the room where me and my son were sleeping. My husband worked night shift at the time. And the little girl was in the corner of our room squatting. Needless to say, she never went to the bathroom that night. She lay back down, threw the covers over her head and didn't come out till daylight. Now this happened tonight. It's 4.45 a.m. and my son woke me up around 12. Something and said, Mom, was that you just whispering to me? I told him, I've been asleep. I haven't whispered anything. When my husband gets up for work at 4 a.m., he has to be work at 5 a.m. My husband and my son both watched me pick my son's AirPods up off the floor and put them in his AirPod case. Our son lays back down till 4.25 and something wakes him up. And my son came in the living room and says, Mom, where is my other AirPod? I watched you put both of them on my case. And we went in his bedroom to look. And it was laying on the floor and none of us had touched them since I stuck them back in their case when I woke up at 4am. I never really grew up definitively believing in the paranormal, although I had a few strange encounters as a child. Waking up to the featureless grey figure in my doorway, for example, as well as what seemed to be an apparition of a man in a white robe walking on the beach at night while I gazed out of our condo room while on vacation, only to call my parents to come look, and he was gone not a moment later. Most were just explained as my eyes played tricks on me, which I accepted. In college, in my dorm room, with a few friends just a room away, I heard a woman's voice whisper my name from the wall I was standing next to. It was well known a woman had been murdered in the building in the 80s, and many people had stories of encounters, but since no one else heard the voice, I chalked it up to being drunk. It wasn't up until a few years ago, I'm 28, that I didn't have an excuse for what I experienced. At the time, I was a waitress at a bar restaurant type spot. The first day I started, the woman who trained me warned the place was haunted by three spirits, an old man, a boy, and a woman. I listened politely as she explained the little boy followed her home, I made quick friends with her young daughter, but I had serious doubts. Months later, I was in my room, getting ready to go out for the night, listening to music from my phone, as my friend lounged on my bed. I had called off work that night, feeling like I needed a bit of a break. The carpet in my room is thick shag carpet, and you can bet that when you open and close the door to my room, it takes effort as there's no space between the two. As the music played low, I heard the creak of the door and whipped around, not expecting my parents to be home yet. My dog lay clueless and asleep at my feet, and no windows were open for a cross breeze. I looked at my friend on my bed, who was alert and no longer lost in the phone. I asked, did my door move? It was com completely still by the time I had turned around. I think so, she replied, 
Obviously not wanting to believe her own words. Okay, well, let's ignore that. Ten minutes later, I finished getting ready and get up to leave my room to go feed my dog before we leave. At this point, I turned off the music. Walking through the doorway, it felt like my lungs froze as I exhaled and immediately fell off. At that moment from my left, a voice from the dark, empty bathroom beside me spoke. The voice was that of, of a woman and was muffled, to the point that I could only make out the last word, you. I still felt the breath caught in my throat as I turned around to see my friend in my room on my bed with a horrified look on her face. Did you say something? I asked her, praying she would say yes. No, I thought you did. Needless to say, I grabbed my dog and we ran out of the house. When I brought this up at work, the owner who lived above the bar and who had been out of town mentioned how it had been quiet and not busy with the usual paranormal activity since she returned. So that's where Rebecca went, she mused. That night, I politely asked Rebecca to go home and haven't heard her since, but still don't know what she said to me. From the outside, it seems to be some average, nondescript house. The kind of place that you'd likely find in any city or small town. It's not, though. This house is like something else of the Twilight Zone, or a Stephen King novel. You see, I lived in this house when I was 11 or 12 years old. That was 93, 94. My room was the one above the porch with the double window. My sister's room was across the hall. My mother and my brothers lived downstairs. During the time we lived there, strange things occurred. Some of them you may find hard to believe, and that's okay. I can only assure you that they actually happened. Some 26 years after the fact, I can provide you no evidence and my only solemn word that everything I'm about to tell you is the absolute truth. For starters, sometimes our clocks would run backwards for no discernible reason. We changed the batteries and checked them for def defect, but nothing seemed to be amiss. They just randomly started running in, in reverse from time to time. There was also an issue with our basements. How do I describe this? I guess the best way would be to say the basement seems to be on a portal to hell. We would hear strange noises coming from down there that wouldn't be explained away as creaking pipes or the house setting on the foundation. Things like demonic growling, roaring. When someone had to go down there to do laundry, there was a sound like someone whispering and the whole area had an unsettling feel to it. We had this dog, a German Shepherd named Lassie. She was an exceptionally brave, loyal and protective dog, but she would not go near the basement or the basement door. Eventually, she became so terrified that she ran away and never came back. There was also a night when we all woke up to find a big black crow, or raven, I'm not sure, in the house, flying madly around. This has been the ungodly hours of the morning, mind you, so no one would have been up to open the door or window to let it in. If you can even imagine an intelligent bird like a crow or raven willingly flying through an opening into a human dwelling like some kind of idiotic sparrow. There were no holes in the roof and no place for it to get out. Where did it come from and where did it go? I have no memory of us actually getting the bird out of the house, but I never saw it again. Then there was the man. At the back of the house there was a hallway that led off the dining room and past the kitchen towards the lower floor bedrooms. The twins, mere toddlers at the time, had their nursery in the foremost room on the left. They would sit back there and have conversations with someone that none of us could see. They referred to this person as simply the man. The man seemed to enjoy keeping the boys company, but he was anything but benign. One day, while the rest of us were at school, my mom had the twins in their high chairs feeding them lunch. When she stepped away to do something, get something from the kitchen or answer the phone, don't remember. There was a crash and the sound of screaming. One of the twins that was on the floor was, was highly tipped over. He'd bashed his head really bad. The high chairs had been se secured on the footing before she started. When she asked the other twin what happened, he replied, the man did it. My little brother ended up in the hospital in a coma for a long time. 
You might be happy to know that he survived and today is married with two beautiful daughters. The CPS didn't believe that my mother was innocent and began to stalk us. They would park across the street from our house and watch us. They would drop in unexpectedly. They were looking for a reason to take us and put us in the foster care. This is how we ultimately ended up leaving the house. Rather than deal with any more tragedy or weirdness or stalking, we packed up what we could and moved across the country. What we couldn't take with us, we left behind. I asked my mother once, about five years before she died, if she'd ever actually seen the entity that the boys referred to as the man. She said she had, but only once. She said she was walking past the kitchen door one day and had caught sight of someone in her peripheral vision. A tall man wearing dark clothes, standing with pink hair to the side, staring out of the kitchen window. When she turned to get a better look, he was gone. That house scared the crap out of all of us. There was always a feeling like we were being watched. Thankfully, it's many years and many miles behind us. When we left, there was no one to pay the mortgage, so the bank took repossession. Because of this, today it's privately owned by people I don't even know. For that reason, I will not disclose the location. I won't even tell you what state it's in. If you've ever been unfortunate enough to stumble upon it, however, I advise you to keep walking. Don't stop to look back, because if you stop to take to look at a picture, there's something likely you'll happen to you taking a knee.